The preceding was a message on behalf of Major League Baseball. Now that is the story as far as the National League East is concerned. The Pirates right here in the bottom of the seventh, they lead Chicago three to two in the seventh inning at Olympic Stadium in Montreal. That's Philadelphia two to nothing over the Expos as Steve Carlton must be on up there this afternoon. Here's Dick Tidbro making his 65th appearance of the year. And Howard, as you said, what a year, 11 and five with four saves. Well, he had been racked up ceaselessly at the start of the season when a member of the Yankees, Bruce Kim, now in in place of Tim Blackwell. Tim had been pinch hit for by Kenny Henderson. He got a big hit in that role. But uh, Billy Martin, when he, the day he came back, remember we interviewed him. That's right. He was openly critical of the trade that sent Tindro away. He said, you've got to know how to use Tindro. And Billy felt that he did. Now it'll be to Colby to lead it off. Kim is hitting in the ninth position and Tindro in the eighth position. Now, of course, Joey Amalfitano doing that to get at the pitcher spot quicker. All right. Hopefully, got the mic fixed. Tidro, happy. Wrigley Field, half the season day games. <laughs> The one strike pitch and to Colby going to try and push a bunt and move his way on. Well now with that one run lead and everything boiling down to. Can think of one run scored in this ball game. And it's a very big run. And that was the drag bunt by Milner to lead off the fourth inning. Ooh, look at that curve ball and to Colby caught looking. Philadelphia up in the top of the eighth. Don Drysdale just getting to the very nub of the matter. The whole game at this point turning on a punt for a base hit by Milner. Called a base hit. Our replay indicated to us that Milner was actually out. But the first base umpire, Jerry Dale, was out of position. And the way the tag went, so was Bruce Froming, the home plate umpire. And we commented at the time we felt that in such a game, so critical a situation, they should have deferred to the second base umpire who had better vision. Now here's Omar Marino. He is 0 for 3 this afternoon. He has struck out. He's bounced to third. And he bounced to the second baseman, Dillard, with a pitcher covering. Balls and no strike. And we've said before at the very top of the telecast, there's a man you've got to keep off of the base. Ball three. Now the new battery of Tedro and Kim. There's the strike, and the count goes to three and one. Keep an eye on him. First walk issued by Tidro as Doug Capilla, left hander, is throwing once again in the Chicago bullpen. This is the second time that he's been up. Got to feel that Marino will be going. Seventy-seven stolen bases on the year. Here's Tim How many Cole. times was he caught? Twenty-one. Only twenty-one. It's not bad for Senate. One for two. He's walked and scored. He's singled and he's fly to left. Tedro, pretty good man to steal on Howard. He's got that high leg kick and, of course, the speed of Moreno. That's all you need. Another throw and a quick tag by Billy Buckner. The game is dictated that you've got to figure that Moreno's going to go. They've Has sent to. Madlock. Has to. It's the way Tanner plays the game. 
Look out, and he got hit. No need to go now. And that got Froming, the home plate umpire, and he's down. As the Pittsburgh trainer comes out, the Chicago trainer and Froming down behind home plate. That ricocheted off of Foley, and it got Froming. And this is a second umpire I've seen go down in the last two days. Bill Haller, the veteran umpire in the American League. And there was a third umpire earlier in the year. This is not regarded by too many fans as hazardous duty, but in fact it is. It takes a lot of courage. Well, Tony Bartarone, the Pittsburgh trainer out there, Dr. Joseph Feinkohl. There you look at it again. Let's now he look gets... at it in the left hand. He got it right in the stomach, or so it seemed. One who went down earlier this year got it in the Adam's apple, and there was a danger of his swallowing his tongue. But Bruce, look at him there, a tough cookie. But apparently it was in the upper left chest area, affecting the shoulder, the way he's using that arm. Trying to flex it. Now here's another look at it from another angle. See Foley gonna bunt. Now it takes a piece of Foley and it looks like it gets him right in the left side of the neck. Right off the tip of the shoulder. Hmm. Froming, of course. He's a scrappy little guy. Out of Milwaukee. Started umpiring when he was just 18 years old. He was the youngest professional umpire at that time. And after 13 years of working his way through the minor league, he made his National League debut in 1971. Well, there's been this break in the baseball action with two minutes remaining. Miami has just connected on the field goal after a greasy to hardy touchdown pass. The Jets lead 26 to 20. The Giants in the fourth quarter back in the ball game trailing 17 to 14 the rookie Sims connecting on an 11 yard touchdown pass to Kenny Johnson in New York that'll have Sims in the Hall of Fame. Minnesota winning by three over Detroit Pittsburgh has narrowed the gap Washington has lengthened the gap Buffalo with Knox doing a superb job spreading the gap on Baltimore. Houston crushing Cleveland. Tampa Bay clinging to its lead over Chicago. Well, here's the big guy, which we've said before. They call him the Cobra. Three for three this afternoon. Three base hits. Moreno at second base. With Foley at first, there's one out. And the Chicago infield, they will set for two. Now, they still put a shift on. As far as the shortstop is concerned, there's the banners here at Three River Stadium. De Jesus over towards the bag at second base. Now, try to keep an eye on Moreno and keep him close, but Parker certainly not adverse to hitting through that left side. That's where he singled his last time at bat. This will go to Buckner, and he'll go to the bag and do it himself. And that was a very big out. from yesterday's game losing era untroubled by it. the leader of this ball club I don't think they're even going to pitch to him he got first right. base open and they won't can't they be holding the hand out which means Bill Robinson and he's no easy mark now this will be the second walk in the inning by Tidrow it will load the bases on top three to two and the Cubbies trying to stop him right there and they're in the bottom of the eighth in Montreal and it is two to nothing Phils. there's Bill Robinson who came up with the Yankees they had predicted a brilliant career for him look at the difference however in his hitting this year against lefties and righties despite the 24 home runs Tidrell, a tough one for the right-handed hitters. Now Marino going to come down the line as 
far as he can. Kelleher playing back at third, and Tidrell will work out of the stretch. He will try and cut down some of that lead by Moreno at third. They appeal. They say no. One ball and no strikes to Bill Robinson. He has taken over for John Milner. He went in in the sixth inning for defensive purposes by manager Chuck Tanner, and now he finds himself at bat with the bases loaded two outs in the seventh. Inside, ball two. Bill Robinson with 24 home runs found himself as a major leaguer here in Pittsburgh. Used very well by Tanner. Another evidence of the use of a total roster. Wow, with the plate. Two and one the count. I think if you talk to all of the managers that have won so far this year, Howard, they will all make that one statement. The total use of the roster, Johnny McNamara at Cincinnati, Jim Fregosi of the California Angels, and even Earl Weaver over at Baltimore. Weaver may be the master of them all. There's a base hit right field. Here comes Moreno. Foley going on. He will score. The throw to second base. Two more runs, and the Bucks have opened it up five to two. Well, that's Bill Robinson for you. Despite the 212 average against right handers, he is not an easy mark. That's not representative of him in his whole career at the plate against righties. He got good wood on that pitch just past the outstretched glove of the second baseman. Now Dillard tried. He could Dillard. Not. He's a good fielder. Could not make the play. And here's Bill Madlock. And he had Kelleher back at third. If he gets that bump down, it was a good idea. Stargell is going to score. Stargell's at third. With Robinson at first, runners at the corners. Now the fans breathing a little easier here in Pittsburgh. The runner goes. The ball, the throw. And they don't get it. again. Robinson with the big jump. And in under the tag, the throw high. In the meantime, Willie holding at third. Number 13 on the year for Robinson. A high chopper, a tough play. There's De Jesus on the big play to throw him out. Now Madlock is gone as the Pirates score two more runs and through seven they lead five to two and we'll be back with more baseball after this word from our local station. Splendid afternoon and a capacity crowd here at San Diego Stadium in San Diego, California for the interconference battle between the San Francisco 49ers and the San Diego Chargers. And this could be a very tough week for the 49ers to get their first win of the year as the Chargers are trying to rebound from their loss last week. They are tied for first in their division. Good afternoon. I'm Dick Stockton along with George Allen. George, the Chargers are a heavy favorite. What must the 49ers do, if anything, to pull an upset? Well, the big thing is that the Chargers are a high-scoring team. They're going to have to score a lot of points to, to beat the Chargers. I think the uh, 49er defense is going to get a real test today, both running and passing, primarily passing. The Chargers are a, a good passing team. However, I think the 49ers offense can have a big game today. What would be the first order for the 49ers to pull the upset? Keep the ball away from Fouts and company. John Jefferson their burner they, they're going to have to stop him first stop the pass first and the run second all right so let's see what transpires as Ray Worsing gets set to kick off for the 49ers in their red or dark uniforms the Chargers 
receiving the kick. Artie Owens and Hank Bauer are back, and we're underway in San Diego, and the kick will be taken about the one-yard line by Artie Owens. Owens to the 25, 30-yard line, and he's still going, and he's finally brought down at the 40. A fine return by Artie Owens. Paul Hofer made the tackle. A 40-yard kickoff return, and the Chargers are charged up. The San Diego backfield, a uh, poise, and getting better every week, you'd have to say, for Dan Faust, rated third in the conference in passing. Clarence Williams, who leads the NFL in touchdowns, and Mike Thomas, who George Allen knows so well from his Washington days. John Jefferson, the man they have to stop. Kellen Winslow, number 80, starting at tight end in place of the injured Klein. Bob Klein not playing, first and 10 at the 40-yard line. To the air on first down. Flips it out to Williams. 45, gets to the 47-yard line, picks up of about seven yards. The offensive line for San Diego, and they welcome back with open arms Doug Wilkerson, number 63. Ed White acquired from the Vikings a key man. It's right guard number 67. Russ Washington has been the senior man at right tackle number 70. Second and three. Ball near midfield. Bouts gives it to Thomas. Thomas has a first down. Midfield to the 48-yard line of San Francisco. Well, you know, Mike Thomas, number 22, has as quick a feet, quickest feet of anyone I've seen in football. If you watch his footwork, now watch the footwork on Thomas. See that movie made here? Now watch his footwork again. You very seldom get a clean, solid hit on First and 10 at the 48-yard line as Mike Thomas picks up the first down. Kellen Winslow now is wide, way to the left. Out of your picture. Thomas won't go anywhere. And Archie Reese, number 78, the defensive left end, diagnosed to play perfectly. Let's look at the 49er defensive unit right now. Reese and Cedric Hardman, the veteran at end. Ted Vincent. Number 75 and Jimmy Wedge, 74, at tackles. They have not had much of a pass rush. Inexperienced linebackers, but Willie Harper, number 59, has been outstanding. Second and 11 with a loss of a yard. The ball at the 49-yard line of San Francisco. Opening minutes here in San Diego. Now coming in motion comes Winslow towards you. Bouts. Has some time. And the pass almost picked up, completed to Jefferson. And he's out of bounds inside the 30 as the 49ers almost pick that one off. A dangerous pass indeed by Fouts, but maybe, George, you can tell us if that's the fact. Well, Cornelius went for the interception. Misjudged it. Now watch this. Fouts threw it over him. We feel that uh, the, the Chargers are going to go to work on the left corner. Going to go to work on the 49ers' left corner. So Jefferson gets the ball, first and 10, 20-yard pickup inside the 30-yard line. Fouts with time, double pumps, and he completes the pass at the 25-yard line. Well, in this opening drive, the one thing that is evident is that Fouts has plenty of time to throw the ball. Now, Jefferson again, George. Here's Jefferson. you got to stop him first. He gets open. He's smooth. You see all that time he has to maneuver? There's no defense. Gerard Williams made a good play on him. By the way, I think the 49ers got a fine defensive back in Gerard Williams. He's going to help their ball club. In motion comes Winslow. He's in the slot. Second down and about seven. Here is Mike Thomas, and he'll go nowhere. He's piled up by Cornelius coming in from the cornerback position in Tim Gray, the strong safety number 30. Dick, you know, the interesting thing is last week, the Chargers made 39 yards running. I feel one of the things they're going to have to do is to establish that running game. They haven't done much running so far in this ball game. They've made their yardage throwing the football. If the 49ers can play pass rush and pass defense, it's going to help them. Third and eight. Ball to the 25-yard line. Four linebackers. Bob Martin, number 54, former New York Jet, is in there for San Francisco. Fouts has a lot of time here, and the pass is badly overthrown. 
It was intended for Kellen Winslow. The 49ers did something very clever there. They went with a 34 defense. It kind of bothered Fouts. He had the time, but by the by the time he read the defense, he overthrew the intended receiver. You're looking at Roy Girella, who was signed by the Chargers, the former Pittsburgh Steeler kicker, 11-year veteran. He was 12 for 26 last year in field goals. This will be a 44-yard attempt for Girella as he gets tested early here in San Diego. Holding his fuller, and Jarella's kick is blocked. Well, it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault the kick was blocked. Ted Vincent blocked the kick and stormed right in, and he had no chance. So Roy Jarella's kick is blocked, and we want to point out that Ralph Bernischka, the usual kicker, is ill and cannot play. Let's take another look, George. Well, the breakdown in, in protection, Vincent came right through the gap. You can't see it here. See him coming right in there. You see him coming up now. So the 49ers will take over when we return. Out of the infield area on the baseball layout of the Coliseum, and we expect from Berlin that may be a factor today as Jim Turner tees it up. A factor for kickers and for runners and uh, defensive linemen. Everyone who needs traction will have some difficulty in that newly sodded area. It's a deep sod, not the usual sod that they've used here. It's not as bad as it used to be, but it's going to be a factor during the game. So we'll watch for slips on those quick starts and cuts. Turner to kick it off to Ira Matthews and Larry Brunson. They stand near the Raider goal line and we're underway in Oakland, California. High, fairly short. Matthews at the 10. 15, 20, 25. And down he goes at the 31. He did not slip on the baseball area. That was the normal turf, the outfield. Charlie West was there to secure the tackle for the Broncos. Ken Stabler brings the Raider offense onto the field. Derek Jensen, his first start of the season with a veteran Mark Van Egan. So two big running backs behind Stabler to start the game. The receivers for the black jerseyed Raiders. Cliff Branch will start, although Gimpy. Rich Martini's caught 11 passes at the other wide spot. And Raymond Chester leading the AFC in catches as the tight end. All the uh, new starters for Oakland and Denver will be lifted in a different color to give you an idea about that at home. Van Egan on first down, gains about four out near the 35-yard line. So at second down and about seven, credit the tackle to Bob Swenson. There's the line for the Oakland Raiders. Dick Anberg with Merlin Olsen at the Oakland Coliseum. We welcome those who have been watching the Jets Miami game and a big upset in the National Football League as the Jets defeated the Dolphins first loss for Miami. We're just underway. This is the second play from scrimmage. Raiders ball at their own 34 yard line. Second down and seven and Stabler back to pass for the first time. He hits Chester and it's out at the 38 yard line short of the first down. Swenson number 51 made the tackle but the flag is down in the backfield of the Raiders. Now we've got a holding call Dick uh, obviously on the left side of the Oakland Raider line someone uh, using their hands to keep uh, Bryson Manor I believe out of that uh, defensive or offensive secondary. One of the things that Ken Stabler desperately needs is time to throw the football. Holding 66 10 yards still second down. Steve Sylvester at left tackle. Guilty of the holes, the five-year veteran from Notre Dame. So instead of third and two, it'll be second down and 17 for the Raiders. And this is just about how it's gone all year for Oakland. They've been outscored 42 to nothing in the first quarter. Stabler said that problems like this, the hold early. He gets pinned into his own end, into a pal. Oh, oh, oh. Did Derek Jensen fall on the loose ball? He did. Swenson again was right on top of him. Number 51 for Denver. Jensen starting his first game and a mistake on the handoff. The Oakland Raiders using two big backs, uh, really trying to get inside. We'll take a quick look at the defensive lineup. Chavis, Carter, and Manor. Manor, of course, starting in place of Alzado. The linebackers intact, and this is a fine linebacking unit of Swenson, Rizzo, Gratishar, and Jackson. Gratishar and Jackson just getting healthy. They've had some injuries early in the year. A loss on the fumble of a couple, so it's now third down, and call it 17, and another fumble. And Stabler falls on it. 
at the 11 yard line. He had thoughts of maybe continuing to roll and a younger Stabler might have tried to get it to the sidelines and throw it. He thought nope I better just fall on it and make sure we can at least get Ray Guy to kick it out of here. Let's see it looked like uh, looks like Stabler is coming out of there before the snap and I saw Dave Dalby shaking his head as he moved away but I think he was wise just to get down on that one not to lose it. And Merlin all four plays in that series number 51 and white Bob Swenson who played at California free agent picked by Denver was in on every single play. He's one of the quickest linebackers in the NFL. Runs a legitimate four seven or less, so probably a four six. Guy to Rick Upchurch who stands at the Denver 49, and he just did get it away. And is it a beauty? Upchurch fair catch all the way back at the 41 yard line. What a weapon Raymond Guy's right foot is. 48 yards with no return and Denver's Broncos have the ball for the first time spotted at the 42 in Denver territory Norris Weiss and not Craig Morton who rallied the team to victory last week against Seattle is the quarterback Rob Lytle a new starter along with Jim Jensen the fullback Jensen leads the team in rushing with 175 yards. right formation wide split of the backs and we skips it to Lytle of Michigan he's out to the 44 yard line it'll be second down and eight Mike Davis 36 from safety made the tackle for Oakland Raiders have made some changes in there but let's look quickly at the receivers first for Denver Broncos he's got a quick look at them Rick Upchurch of course moving into that starting lineup we were aware that Oakland was going to be doing some different things defensively. They really have shaken things up. They've taken Dave Browning and moved him over to the left end, Dick. And they've also uh, got Pat Toomey in there on the right side. Now they've gone to a four-man line. Reggie Kinlaw has come in. They're doing some different things than, uh, than they have in the past. Second down and eight for Weiss. His first throw. He likes to scramble. And gets across the 50 to the 49-yard line. Reggie Kinlaw, 62, the rookie from Oklahoma, was the man chasing him, had a hand on his jersey, but Weiss pulled away, and another fine scramble by Norris Weiss, who was averaging five and a half yards every time he tucks it away. Well, that's the reason that Red Miller wants him in the lineup. Uh, he's working behind an, an offensive line that's gotten much better under Whitey Duvall, the new line coach. Dave Stutter, the free agent, is the only new face there, but the others seem to be playing better. Glassick is healthy, and that's really a help to this offensive line. So Weiss brings him out of the huddle, looking at third down and less than a yard. Ron Eglaw has replaced Haven Moses as they bookend the line with the two tight ends. And give it inside to Lytle. He has the first down at the 48-yard line of the Oakland Raiders, the initial first down of this game. It's Ted Hendricks, one of the injured Raiders, but not serious enough to be out of the lineup. Look at that left hand. Well, there's a difference between pain and injury. A uh, broken thumb in this business, uh, not considered an injury, at least not by Hendricks. Defensive line right there, three new faces, Willie Jones, Pear, and Browning. But as we said, uh, Jones is not in there. We've got Browning switched to the left side, and we've got Pat Toomey in there playing at the right end. On first down from the 48-yard line, the Raiders make it the 47. Weiss. And gets it away it away as down he goes in the grasp of Rod Martin the linebacker from USC and Weiss able to get it toward the sidelines and save the sack. Well wisely done save some yardage one of the things that they really like about Norris Weiss is his mobility Dick he really does run effectively he is not the passer that Morton is but certainly against uh, against a solid rush you, know, you watch him here for yourself and he doesn't get it away they're going to call the quick whistle on this play Merlin. Well, that's wisely done. Let's look. That's the result of the new rule. They judge right there to be in the grasp and control, and they will whistle it dead there. It's going to be second at about 14. Now, the sack recorded as, again, the referee Jim Tunney protecting the quarterback. Lytle up the middle into Oakland Raider territory, gets the five yards back, lost on first down. It'll be third and ten for Denver. No score, just underway. Five minutes have been played in the first quarter. Oakland linebacking crew, the Mad Stork, the old pro Ted Hendricks, Rod Martin, the other outside backer in the middle, Monty Johnson and Phil Villapiano. The deep backs for the Raiders, and they're very young. Lester Hayes and Henry Williams at the corners. Mike Davis and Jack Tatum are the safeties. Tatum with seven years experience as the old man back there. Third and ten, five defensive backs with Charles Phillips in now for Oakland. Weiss, good pressure. Get him off! A 240-pound rookie from Oklahoma, drafted in the 12th round, gets the second Raiders sack of the game. They had only 
six all year. Now they're coming out of that four-man defensive alignment, doing a lot of stunning and looping. Kinlaw coming to the outside, just breaks clear right there. That was Claudy Miner who missed him on the outside. Kinlaw in for the sack. I think much of this game will hinge on who gets the pressure on the quarterback. So far, Oakland doing a better job than Denver. Luke Pressridge, the rookie, the punt to Ira Matthews. Dying spiral. Matthews going to watch it at the 15. Dances around and almost breaks loose. Gains five, but he had that last white jersey in his way. Charlie West saved a long gainer. 40-yard punt, four-yard return. The Raiders have the ball at their own 20. No score in Oakland. In the ninth. Builds two. Montreal nothing. Now this. Get the big curveball, and the count is 0-1. Decolvi trying to pitch out of it here in the eighth inning. Misses away, and the count one and one. Jackson and Romo continue to throw. Vail, a six-foot, 185-pounder. Side in the count two and one. Started his career in the St. Louis Cardinal organization, then was traded to the Mets. Was there for a couple of years. Perez has just struck out. One out. And on first in Montreal. Look out. Fastball inside in the count three and one. Willie Stargell will go to the mound and he will take a little time. Just trying to settle down is lanky right-hander. Jacoby odd out. Madlock, of course, the third baseman guarding the line. It that really is. That leaves that hole open between third and short. And, of course, this is what you have to do. Protect You're, against the extra base hit. They're exactly right. They'll give him the single through the hole, but they don't want to give him that extra base hit down the line. Both clubs with ten hits. The Pirates five and the Chicago Cubs three. Big gap out in left center, and now Moreno moving a little bit more towards left. Hit to the right side. Here's Garner. He will go to Stargell, and that is out number three. And the Cubs pick up a run. They lead it now Pittsburgh 5-3. to three. Right now, let's go to Al Michaels at Olympic Stadium in Montreal. And we welcome the viewers of the Cubs-Pirates game here. We have two out of the ninth inning. Steve Carlton has struck out. Perez and Camargo after issuing a leadoff walk to Dawson. Carlton has struck out 12. The Expos are down to their final out. The batter is Ellis Valentine. It's 2 0 Philadelphia. Valentine pops it up, and this should do it. Larry Boa is there, and now all of a sudden it's up to Pittsburgh. Montreal has lost 2 0. The Pirates are out in front in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh can wrap it up with a victory. So the Expos lose as Steve Carlton pitches a three hitter. And strikes out 12. Now back to Pittsburgh and Don Drysdale. Thank you very much, Al. Well, there's the big game as far as the Bucks are concerned. Howard, they've got to try and hold on. They've got three more outs to go. This place is going to go crazy. They're going to post that final score on the scoreboard any second now. Meanwhile, the Bucks with a two-run lead coming to bat in the bottom of the eighth. Dick Tidro on the mound for the Cubs. And yes, sir, Bill Robinson's hit the big hit of the ball game. The grounded ball past the outstretched reach of Steve Dillard. Didn't want to criticize him. Looked like he got maybe a bit of a late jump on Ladies the ball. And and looked like, there it goes. There it goes. There's the scoreboard. And they are standing. in the manner of the terrible towels of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And you'd love to see that pirate dugout right now. That is the Buccaneers of Pittsburgh as they realize that they have three outs to go. Look at this. They're sitting. And look at Tim Foley. Do you think he's not wringing his hand? Yesterday's starting pitcher, Bert Blyland. And he has Bill Robinson who got the big hit. Of so many of so many great baseball years here in Pittsburgh. 
This is up. And the first pitch inside. I never saw a greater World Series than 1960 when the Bucks, to the tune of Camp Town Races, did go all the way. Bruce Froming now. What's going on down there, Donald? That it appears they're trying to get somebody off, off the, field. the field. That's exactly what has happened. They're moving well, somebody off it. the field. But forget it. We have Steve Davis, a new second baseman for Chicago. We will not show that kind of thing anymore as a matter of policy. Not give publicity to a handful of kooks. There's Davis, the second baseman. So the infield of Kelleher and De Jesus on the left side. Davis and Buckner on the right side. The outfield the same of Kingman, Thompson, and Bittner from left to right. The battery of Kim and Tidrow. Five to three, Pittsburgh. One ball and no strikes to Ed Ott. He's 0 for 3 today. Two and oh. There's the strike, and the count goes to two and one. A depressed Montreal team now in its dressing room, probably looking at this game right now. Line down the left field line, slicing into the corner of fair ball. That'll go for extra bases as Kingman bare hands it and runs it down. Stopped at second base with a stand-up double. You can sense it now, but to you, Dick Williams, and to you, Tony Perez, and Andre Dawson, and Ellis Valentine, and Warren Cromarty, and everybody, Rudy May, Steve Rogers, our congratulations to you, because you're not losers. You had some season. What you've done for baseball in Canada is something they talk about in Old Montreal, in New Montreal, in Quebec, and all over that country. Now the leadoff double by Ott, and Phil Garner comes on. He is one for three this afternoon. He'll be trying to move it to the right side as Tedrow misses with that breaking pitch inside. Nobody out. He'll be trying to get his man over. Checking with his third base coach, that is Ott. At second base. The infield all up just a little bit. The deepest of the three is a shortstop De Jesus of the four, I should say. Now you see Tidrow thinking that maybe he's going to try and move it that right side, trying to make him move that fastball inside. Let me tell you something. Tidrow's pitching this game the way he pitched so many for the Yankees. He gives nothing. One hopper to Kelleher. He goes to Buckner, and they hold the man at second base, so Garner cannot advance him. That will bring on the pitcher, Kent Tocovi. Tocovi struck out his first time at bat. We welcome you viewers who have been watching the Montreal Expos and the Philadelphia Phillies right here. We have one out in the bottom of the eighth inning. The Pittsburgh Pirates leading by a score of five to three. Ah, to lead off double at second base. He could not advance as Garner bounced out to third. And to Colby comes on. He has struck out his first time at bat. Tidrow on in relief of McLaughlin. And he almost picks him off. Want to know the count. They're happy on one hand, Howard, as they know the outcome of the Philly Montreal game, but they just flashed the final score the Eagles over the Steelers 17 14. Narcusen fouls that away, and the count one and one. Quick final two Jets 33, Miami 27. The Pirates five runs on 11 hits, the Cubs three runs on 10 hits. The Cubs earlier in the ball game were taken out of some innings by four Pirate double plays in the first four innings. Good breaking pitch. Make that four out of the first five innings. As they had the starter Bruce Keeson on the ropes, but they couldn't put in that one big punch. Chuck Tanner realizing that all his team needs is three more outs. Got him. 
Good pitch. I told you, Tidro gives nothing away. Now there's two gone. Ott remains at second base, and we go to the top of the order at Omar Moreno. Moreno this afternoon. He is 0 for 3. He has struck out. He's bounced to third. He bounced to the second baseman with a pitcher covering, and then with one out in the seventh inning, was walked by Tidro. Foley trying to bunt was hit by a pitch. Parker grounded out. Stargell was walked intentionally, and with the bases loaded, the big key base hit by Robinson just eluding the dive of the second baseman Dillard. As Joey Amalfitano will go to the mound, and he will talk. You have a, a chance to talk a little bit to Tidro. You've got first base open. You've got the right-handed hitting Foley on deck. Left-hander Doug Capilla throwing down in the Chicago dugout. Chicago bullpen, I should say, as Amalfitano goes back to the Chicago dugout. that first pitch away if you're looking to the Chicago night that's where they're in trouble Don they've yes. gone to the bench so much already the upcoming batters Gallagher Tidro and Kim they got to go to the bench again now you see the graphic and they're down by two five to three Pittsburgh Just missing the outside corner. And the count one and one. Well, I think you hit it right on the head, Howard. And the Reds. And it appears that right now, unless something happens to Chicago, it could be the Reds and the Pirates. But boy, the two clubs that finished second, Houston and Montreal, what a battle they gave. There's a ground ball up the middle. Good play by De Jesus to get it. Now the Bucks are gone in the eighth inning. After eight complete, it is five to three Pittsburgh, and we'll be back after this message and the word from our local station. Well, next week on the Sports Spec, uh, looks like another entertaining afternoon of sports competition. The Pacific Invitational Gymnastics Championship. You'll see Kirk Thomas of the U.S. against some of the best from around the world, including a Chinese team, and the world's strongest men. They'll be lifting cars and tossing cabers and flexing muscles and having all kinds of fun. First down for the Chicago Bears. At their own 25. Robin Earl going straight ahead. Got a couple, maybe three. Backed up by the middle of that defense. Leroy Selman, number 63, the right defensive end. The man to stop him. As you see, Neil Armstrong sent Greg Latta in with the play. The Bears have won seven straight games here at home at Soldier Field, which is pretty good percentage. They're much tougher at home. Five, uh, the last five regular season and a couple of preseasons? Yes. Well, they're still very much in this ball game. There's lots of time remaining. 8.09, third period. They trail by only a touchdown. Second and about eight. Up the middle for Latta. Can't hold on. Incomplete. Garrett White nearly picked it off on the deflection. Pass a little high. Latta couldn't quite pull it in. Vince Evans, they, they blitzed one linebacker up at the top of your screen, but Latta went right down the middle of the field, and it was there. The pass was there, and he found the slot, but he couldn't quite hang on to it. And there's Jarris White almost with an interception for Tampa Bay. Notice all those Buccaneers around there, five white jerseys and one dark one. Buffalo Bills leading Baltimore 21 to 6 in the third period, our latest score from there. There have been 12 penalties in this game, and here in the third period, it has really taken the rhythm and the tempo out of this football game. Both teams would like to get it back. Evans on second down, and that's complete to Peyton out of the backfield. He's got three bucks waiting for him, but he has the first down yardage with a good effort, typical Peyton effort. Cotney and Richard Wood stopped him, but not before he got the first down. Well, he sneaked out of there and got underneath the linebackers who were dropping down for their coverage. 
That's what the Rams did against Tampa Bay last week, but uh, still only countered 97 yards uh, on rushing. There you see Peyton as he sneaked out, just came across the middle, and Evans was waiting for him. It was a planned play, and there are the linebackers and the defensive back way downfield as finally a host of Packers come up, including Curtis Jordan, number 25, who was in on that situation. First down, Chicago. Their own 37. Swing pass to the screen out there, and it's James Scott on a flanker screen, but it was broken up neatly by the right side of the Tampa Bay defense. Richard Wood was there. So was the cornerback, Washington. And there's just a wide receiver screen. He went down a couple of steps, came back. The line comes out in a hurry, but not too much yardage. Boy, look at that block by Noah Jackson. He came across. That's 270 pounds. He said, I got you. A gain of about two on the play. There's a later score on that Buffalo-Baltimore game. The Bills opening at the 28-6 in the third period. Scott goes wide left. Golden Richards wide right. Richards hasn't had a pass thrown to him yet. Three-man rush. Evans going deep for Scott. He's one-on-one -on -one with Washington. Just overthrown. ball landed on about the what the five yard line the 10 or the five and he threw it from his own 30. They could, 65 yards at least in the air. They could Cedric Brown well no Washington I think was the man step for step with him there and then Cedric Brown coming back to help but it was really a one-on-one -on -one situation. The Buccaneers are not putting that much pressure on Vince Evans with a three-man rush and that is why he's getting time to throw the ball throw downfield and uh, he has not been pressured all that much. We mentioned the penalties earlier, John, just to give the fans an idea of what effect they've had. Tampa's taken seven for 55 yards, the Bears five for 50 yards, and as we pointed out, most of them occurring here in the third period. The one time they got the Vince was when they put that safety blitz on. Third down. Let's see if the Bears can keep their drive alive, trying to get out of their own zone. Evans oh. scrambles out of there. Vince Evans Good individual effort got back near the line of scrimmage. Wally Chambers, the man to put the stop on from Richard Wood. He got about a yard, but it brings up fourth down. Let's take a look and see how many men they brought. Just three to begin with. See, a three-man rush, and they figure they can get somebody through, get enough pressure on him to force him to run, and that time they did, as the big three was after him. But he got away from uh, Kohler. And eventually, Wally Chambers, number 60, tripped him up, and here's the punt. Parsons punt, good one. Backing up Danny Reese to the five-yard line. Reese has got some room. Running hard, the flag is down. He's over the 20 to the 21-yard line. And likely a clip coming up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, nullifying a fine return by Reese. I think it was number 33, Mark Cotney. He through a block, which wasn't necessarily a clip, but you can't hit anybody low on a return. That's a new rule, as you know, and they're going to get him for that, so Tampa Bay's going to have bad field position. 52-yard punt by Park. Personal foul, blocking low during the return. You got it, Johnny. You cannot block below the weight under new rules in all kicking situations, and that's a safety decision and a good one by the league. And sometimes it's hard for the players in the heat of battle to read. They're so used to it. It's been that way for so many years. You could, if you could cut a guy on a legal block, it was legal. Now you have to go away from your instinct and not do it. And sometimes you forget what the situation is because you can do it on normal scrimmage plays. Blocking low by the receivers during the return. First down. What? Seattle leading Kansas City 3 to nothing in the first period. And an Efren Herrera field goal. We've got a timeout on the field with 5.27 remaining in the third period. The Buccaneers lead the Bears 10-3. They have a first down at their five. We're back here at San Diego Stadium. Field goal blocked. As you look at Don Coriel, a success in St. Louis and a success in San Diego. 11-5 under Coriel of the Chargers as the 49ers run into the line. They've been a passing team primarily. Wilbur Jackson, number 40, was out with an knee injury last year. As you look at Bill Walsh, who was the offensive coordinator two years ago here in San Diego and helped develop fouls. By the way, an interesting aspect of this ball game is that 
Both sides call all the plays on offense and defense. All the plays are sent in for DeBerg. All the plays are sent in or signaled in for fouls. Second and seven, the ball at the 36-yard line. Steve DeBerg has definitely improved to this point. Thirty-second clock showing nine seconds right now, and now they start it again. So they started at nine. O.J. Simpson can't go anywhere. He's stopped by Leroy Jones, the defensive left end, and let's take a look at San Diego's defense. Johnny Lee, number 69, is playing in place of the injured Fred Dean. Louis Kelcher is out, so Wilbur Young, formerly an end, now playing tackle, and Gary Johnson are in the middle. The linebackers for San Diego, Bob Horn, he's played well. Ray Preston has performed well, the Syracuse performer in place of the injured Don Good. Willie Buchanan acquired from San Diego, and Mike Williams, a strong cornerback combination for San Diego. Here's O.J. Simpson with Wilbur Jackson blocking in front of him, very close to a first down and apparently has it. Good acceleration well, for O.J., George. They lined up in an eye formation and a passing situation. Give the ball to Simpson. The fullback blocks. Simpson looks better this week than we have seen him in the past. I think the more he plays, the better he's going to get. Now, he made that in his own. He made that extra yard to get the first down on his own. The 49ers are alternating tight ends. Bob Brewer, number 82, and Ken McAfee, number 81. It is a first and 10. The ball is the 44. In motion goes Paul Seal. A second tight end. Flip over the middle of Schumann is complete into San Diego territory. So sure-handed Mike Schumann from Florida State catches that pass over the middle and a pickup of about uh, six or seven yards. And so the 49ers passing on first down. Bill Walsh likes to do that. I like what the 49ers are doing right now. They, they ran the football early, had some success. Now they're going to the short passing game, which has been their strength, throwing uh, delays, going to the back, going short so he doesn't get a chance to get sacked. Ken McAfee is the lone tight end now, second and three, and that's the kind of situation you want on second down. The ball at the 49-yard line of San Diego. Deferred. So O.J. Simpson, complete first down penalty marker is thrown as he goes out of bounds at the 40-yard line. A penalty marker was thrown downfield. Well, the reason they like motion and, and changing the strength with motion is that you're looking for a one-on-one -on -one situation. That's what the 49ers are trying to get. And they got that that time. They got O.J. on the linebacker. Not many linebackers are going to cover O.J. 49ers will be penalized right here. So what was a first down back at the 40 instead sets it back to about the 41-yard line. Offensive pass interference. McAfee, who is in motion, is guilty of offensive pass interference, so it's second and 13. The ball at the 41-yard line as the 49ers are back in their own territory. No score, first quarter. Eight minutes and 20 seconds remaining. Solomon, number 88, is wide to the left. DeBerg from San Jose State. Second down, going to the air. He has open field, gets away from one man, completes the pass. Bob Brewer, the tight end. And the 49ers will have a first down. Well, Randy Cross, 51, used to be a center. Now he's playing guard. Wilbur Young gets away from him. And DeBerg does a good job of wiggling out of that pressure and completing the big pass to the tight end. Nice play by DeBerg. So a first and 10 at the 41-yard line of San Diego. Paul Steele, number 85, who's a good receiver for a tight end, is in there now. Wilbur Jackson out of the backfield to Burke, up the middle, and it's picked off. It's deflected and picked off, intercepted by Woody Lowe, the right linebacker, number 51, who is a number five draft choice out of Alabama several years ago. It was deflected out of the hands of a San Francisco receiver. Well, to Burke, threw a strike in there, but when you throw into a crowd, you throw into a crowd, if there's a tip ball, it's usually intercepted. So the turnover and the Chargers have it again.
Dick Hanberg with Merlin Olson at the Oakland Coliseum. Uh, no score, each team with a possession. You said that this was a blood game. It is a blood game, and these two teams, you can throw out the previous games, put it right out the window, because they're playing on the field like there's no tomorrow, and that's the way these two teams have gone at each other over the last few years. I think we've got a good ball game going here in Oakland today, Dick. Six minutes have been played. Stabler up the middle, barrels Mark Van Egan for a gain of about seven yards. The veteran from Colgate. He's the leading rusher for the Raiders, 168 yards. They've not moved the ball all that well on the ground. Don't have a touchdown rushing yet this year. Joe Rizzo, 59 on the tackle. Second down and a short three. The snake now 33 years of age has been throwing the ball as well as he ever had. Gives to the rookie Jensen and he has a first down across the 30 yard line. That's the Raiders first of the game. Bill Thompson the all pro safety 36 made the tackle. One of the most interested men on the sideline Greg Morton. Red Miller says that uh, Morton's status is the same. And he said when the situation is right we'll put Craig in the game. And it doesn't mean we have to be losing he said. It just happens that would happen that we would want to throw him in there when we're getting good protection when we need someone to throw the ball. He's a great pure passer. Reflective pose on the sidelines rather interesting. He's not sitting down just off to himself thinking about maybe a roll. Dave Casper has his first catch of this new season. As you know he had secondary receiver. Casper pulls it in nicely, has some room, and fights for a little extra yardage. Stapler said he was going to try and use his tight ends today. We've got two of them in the game. We've got the two big backs in there, and they're going right at the heart of that Denver defense, trying to isolate one-on-one -on -one and blow them off the ball. Branch is the wide man. Chester on the near side. Casper is at the far side. Van Egan carries Packers with him out to the 46-yard line. It'll be first down Oakland. I think this is what Ken Stabler meant when he said we're just going to be plain vanilla out there today. We're going right up the middle. Uh, Denver's linebackers are not big by NFL standards. They're very quick sideline to sideline hard to run laterally and the Oakland Raiders have really apparently decided that they're going to go right up the middle on them until they can stop it. First down Oakland Raiders at their own 46 yard line. Derek Jensen. And he plows into Denver territory to the 47 yard line. First year runner from University of Texas at Arlington. He's 6 1 and 2 25. So far, the Oakland Raider offensive line doing a fine job of moving Denver off the ball. Usually a 3 4 defense, uh, very effective against the running game, but the weakness of a 3 4, certainly uh, Red Miller would be the first to tell you about it. You've got to be able to neutralize some of those big people on the line of scrimmage. If they're knocking you off the ball, you're in trouble. On second and five, Van Egan has what appears to be another first down at the 43 of Denver. Gratishar and Bernard Jackson made the tackle for the Denver Broncos. The Raiders continue to march. Five and a half minutes remaining in the first quarter. No score here in Oakland. The final have defeated the Cleveland Browns 31 to 10 the first loss for Cleveland and we welcome you fans who've enjoyed that telecast here on NBC the Denver Broncos and the Oakland Raiders exchange punts off the kickoff and now Oakland starting from its own 20 yard line has driven primarily on the ground to the Denver 43 yard line with a first down as Stabler sets him up Dick Kemper with Merlin Olsen at the Oakland Coliseum that's Raymond Chester at the 35 to the 30. Two tight ends in the game. That's one catch to each of them so far, and both of them for good yardage. He's working on the twos. He's thrown two, completed two, and he has 22 yards total thus far for Sabre. Touchdown at the Denver 30 yard line. Mark Van Egan. About three to the 20 
37, Reuben Carter, number 68, the nose guard, nose tackle, and the Bronco defense makes the up. One of the things that the Raiders desperately want to do is change their first half statistics on the year. They have been outscored so badly in the first uh, quarter of the game. One of the problems is that their opponents in the last three games have taken their first drive, gone all the way down the field against the defense and scored. There, that'll give you an indication of how badly they have done in the first quarter. And look at the third quarter for Denver. 42 points and 14, that's been their most productive quarter. But Oakland right now wanting to chase that zero in the first quarter of their scoring drive. Haven't scored all year in the first quarter. Looking for Cam! Touchdowns and Casper, the former academic All-American at Notre Dame, has the first score of this day. Jim Breach, the little five-six kicker, out of the hole to David Hum. It is good. Timeout. 3:38 remaining in the first quarter. Oakland jumps in front, seven to nothing. New Orleans has gone in front of the Giants, 24 to 14. The Giants have their rookie quarterback Phil Simms in action in that game. First down, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They lead 10 to 3. In motion is Morris Cohen. First down pass from his end zone. It's blocked by Hampton. Hampton got a hand on that. The big guy, the rookie from Arkansas, 6'5", 256 pounder. Hampton had two for him. He's number 99. He's being, being blocked by number 73, Hannah. Now, you can see right here, he spots Williams, times his leap perfectly, and knocks it down. Good nice play. play. Really good play. He was blocked well by Hannah. Still made the big defensive play. And he's only 20 years old. 20. And they've got another fine rookie defensive lineman, Al Harris. Their first two picks in the draft, and Harris injured as a knee injury, but they expect him back before the season's out. Ricky Bell. Bell pulls his way over the five-yard line, picks up maybe a yard, yard and a half at most. You can kind of sense the feeling of the momentum of this game is changing. The Bear defense has come alive as you look at this final score. Cleveland goes down the tubes as far as being undefeated. It was Houston 31, Cleveland 10. Pittsburgh, another unbeaten, has already lost. It's now final in New Orleans. The Saints 24, the Giants 14. The Giants are winless. Cincinnati leading Dallas 3-0 first quarter. It's just far field goal. Third down, about nine. Five defensive back from the passing situation for the Bears. Deep sideline, out of bounds. Hagan was the intended receiver, but Williams just chucked that out because there were two men there on Isaac Hagan. And so the Bears defensively playing very soundly throughout the afternoon, really only the one big error on the touchdown run, the long 61-yard run by Eckwood. Otherwise, they have uh, shut down Tampa. Now you're going to see a pretty good field position by the Bears because Blanchard's kicking against the wind. Standing near the end line. He's managed to it. The 45 of Tampa Bay. Blanchard. Punt drops at the 38. Schubert comes straight ahead. He's met by number 51. That is Dana Napsig, a reserve linebacker. But he made a good return, and the Bears have good field position. They'll spot the ball at the 32 yard line of Tampa Bay. And so the Bears have a great opportunity here. They're down by a touchdown. standing, chanting, waving their yellow bandanas. Let's go, Pittsburgh. Beat them, Bucks, says the scoreboard. Hold them, Bucks, says the scoreboard. They're only three outs away from winning in the National League East. Now it'll be Mick Kelleher to lead it off as a fan 
Cubs here try and get something going. They want to see the Bucks with three fast outs and the Cubs trying to prolong that. Kelleher, you see what he's done this afternoon. Has walked twice, sandwiched in between, hit into a double play. Jerry Martin on deck. Kent Tacovey trying to close the door and wrap up the divisional title for the Pirates. There's the strike. For those of you who may have joined us late, Montreal has lost to Philadelphia. Two to nothing. Colton with a 12 strikeout three hit performance. A call ball. We are in the top of the ninth. The Bucks leading five to three. The key hit a bases loaded single that broke up a one run game by Bill Robinson whom Tana had inserted as a defensive measure in place of Milton. Die Chopper. They've got to hurry and they throw him out. Out number one. There are two to go. This Pittsburgh team gets ever so close. They started terribly. Seemingly they always do every year. Do you remember the way it was? They're at the very bottom, even below the Mets. But then this team came together. Put it all at one point in the acquisition of Tim Foley and the trade to the Mets of Frank Tavares, who in fairness to Frank had himself a fine season with the Mets. If that's possible. This is Jerry Martin. <laughs> Martin trying to keep it going and the crowd roaring with every strike. But Foley glued that infield together and he got big hits and he advanced runners all the subtle skills of the game. And then Willie Stodgill the great veteran came on to have a great year. Dave Parker always great. Pops him up. It might be playable. Willie Stargell will have a play and makes a catch out number two. There is only one out to go. Throw in the acquisition of Bill Matlock, twice National League batting leader, who has come back to himself here in Pittsburgh, and Phil Garner, another of the unheralded ones. People like Bill Robinson and a manager like Chuck Tanner, who doesn't try conform but who lets them do their own thing and somehow there grew among this Bucks club a togetherness that is now manifesting itself next this is Bruce Kim one out away and if they win this it'll be their 98th victory more games than they have won in a season since 1909 when they won 110 in a shorter game schedule. It used to be 154. Now, as you know, it's 162. 0 oh and 1. 0 oh and 2, and the Pirates are one strike away. They can feel it now. It's on top of them. Colby trying to close it out right here as security moves on to the field as to Colby delivers outside as he overthrows the curveball and the count goes to one and two. Willie Stargell, he's been through it. He knows what it's about. To Colby with a new ball. Just trying to collect himself. One ball, two strikes to Bruce Kim. Pops him up and this ought to do it. Bill Madlock calling. He is there. He makes a catch and the Pirates win the eighth. The Pirates and all the fans out of the field. That's the Colby with Tanner. There's a starter, Keeson.
Cooper. And our congratulations to a gallant baseball team. We'll be right back. A key hit by Bob Horn in the middle here is the key to this play, George. Now watch where he hits him. Right on the elbow. Hits OJ right on the elbow, which allows you to not put the ball away. Takes away all the strength you have in your forearm. Big play for the Chargers. So San Diego has first and 10 on their own 37. Jefferson is the low split up to the top of your picture. Thomas 22 and Clarence Williams number 40 to setback. Spout looking and he flips it out. Greg McCrary the tight end loses ground loss of about five yards Archie Reese diagnosed it the 49ers have been playing better defensively so far than they have been. I think they've made some changes in personnel I believe that Ted Vincent is going to help them he's a, he's a good pass rusher he's a little bit a little bit more experienced than uh, Ruben Vaughn I think Gerard Williams is going to help him I've always liked Hart, uh, Hardman I uh, tried to make a trade for him when I was in Washington second and 14 at the 31 Al Cowling who was activated number 79 is Wayne Ford 76 in for pass rushing the pass and Jefferson can't hold on to it tossed up the middle and defending on the play was number 55 Scott Hilton so George they're going to Jefferson yes well they're going to have to stop Jefferson first like we talked at the top of the show and then then go from there he's open on that uh, jump for the ball and as he jumped for it he dropped it. So Hartman's out of the game now and number 54 Bob Martin the linebacker who was just activated a couple of weeks ago when he was acquired from New York in there. So it's third and 15 at the 31 yard line. Here comes the rush and bounce pass to Jefferson is complete at the 45 and they rule it a completed pass and the whistle blew. They rule it a completed pass the whistle blew. Jefferson wow. catches the pass at the 47 yard line well, so they'll pull it back and John is down and uh, maybe shaken up a bit. Here's what the 49ers did. They went went 34 again three man rush. Jefferson's a guy he has to stop. They had him double covered but was inside out. He threw a strike in there. It's a good good call by the official. All right, so Jefferson is still down, and that could hurt the Chargers. Still no score here in San Diego. Chicago Bears in excellent position at the 32-yard line following Blanchard's punt. Tim Ryan and John Morris with the action here as we look at John McKay wearing the white hat on the Buccaneers' sideline. Vince Evans brings him out of the eye. Ricky Watts, rookie wide receiver, is in number 80 for the Bears. He's in motion behind the ball. Straight ahead is Robin Earl. Earl dives through a tackler, Bill Fuller, over the 30 to the 27-yard line. The hopes of the Montreal Expos for a division championship are all over. They were defeated by the Phillies 2 to nothing. The Pirates have won that division championship. They are leading the Cubs 5-3 in the eighth inning. Actually, if the Pirates happened to blow that game, then Montreal would still be in it if they win both games tomorrow. See? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I studied right, that this got, morning when I got up good, and read the Johnny. paper. We've got some bad information here, <laughs> and you're on the spot. Second and six. Walter Payton trying the right side. Got to about the 25, really stacked up. Kohler, the first man to hit him. Cotney coming up from safety. It'll be third down and about five. So this is a key bay play for the Chicago Bears because they've had good field position. They have a third down and about five. And if they don't get the first down this time, to give Tampa a little bit of inspiration, you might say, because Tampa's offense has not done anything this year. The defense has kept them in, I mean, this second half. Greg Latta brought the play in. bounds at the 25 yard line and the Buccaneers have held. So the good field position for the Bears following Blanchard's punt. Good defensive work by the Bears. Didn't help now. Is there a flag down again? No, they're going to try for the field goal. All right, fourth down. At the 25. It's going to be about a 42-yard uh, field goal. 
Pittsburgh has defeated the Cubs five to three, and that does mean that you the got it. You champion. got it. <laughs> All right, Bob Thomas from the 32-yard line, a 42-yard try, and it is good. Bob Thomas, 42-yard field goal, and so the score: the Buccaneers 10, the Chicago Bears six. is the best kept secret at NBC. Third down in 20 for Kenny Anderson. Throws it out here. He's got a man wide open. Fast first down at the 42-yard line. Right on the money, Ken Anderson to Don Bass. And Sam, in all honesty, Kenny Anderson has taken a lot of heat. They say he's too shy. They say he's tired of getting hit. But when it comes to throwing the football, I don't think you can find anybody can, that can throw it on a line 25 or 30 yards right there. Laces up on the right foot. Bass catches it. That's first and 10. With Bob Trumpy, Sam Nover. Nice to have you with us. Texas Stadium, 94 degrees at game time, about 115 on the floor of the stadium. And as you see, the Bengals already lead it 3 0. A 48 yard boom by Barr and Archie Griffin. Grabbed by Harvey Martin around the neck, and he'd like to take his head off. Grabbed by Harvey Martin? That's an understatement. Jim Corbett and number 89, Dan Ross, are the messengers for head coach Homer Rice today. He has used his guards in the past. He has used his running backs. But he has an injury-depleted offensive line, and so today it's Corbett and Ross, and they alternate on every play. Corbett wears 81, Ross 89. Second down, 10, Cincinnati of the Dallas 42. Anderson. Trying to get it, I believe, to his running back, Archie Griffin, and Brunig had the coverage. And some pressure on Anderson that time. And so on third down, the nickel defense being employed by the Dallas Cowboys. And Charles Alexander comes into the game, as does Jim Corbett with the play from the bench. nothing Bengals third down and 10 and as soon as we get a chance there's one final and a one that has a bearing on Cincinnati of course 31 to 10 the Astrodome Houston Texas for those of you who are watching that football game welcome to ours at Texas Stadium it's three nothing Cincinnati he's got fast again first down and out of bounds and fast is killing the Dallas secondary and you know who he's doing it on Hollywood Henderson man-to-man -man coverage Linebacker on a wide receiver, and they expect Thomas Henderson to make this coverage, but Kenny just puts it one, once again right on the money. This wing and this wide set that the Bengals are using is making Dallas go to the single coverage. Bass just runs a, a good out pattern on Henderson. That's a good 15, 16 yard gain. Three catches, 39 yards for Don Bass, and with the loss by Cleveland today and Pittsburgh's loss to Philadelphia, there are no undefeated teams in the Central Division of the American Football Conference. There is one winless team, the Cincinnati Bengals, but they lead here 3-0 and are driving for more. Anderson, they've got him back at the 35. Randy White is the man who made the tackle, but Bob Trumpy, in our pregame discussion, hit the nail right on the head. The Bengals are throwing on first down. Randy White, nicknamed the Manster, on Mark Donahue, who is a second-year man from Michigan. Tough assignment for Mark, but I think he'll get it done. White might get through a couple of times, and if I'm not mistaken, that's Randy White's first sack of 1979. Last year, he had eight. Dallas was very concerned about his inability to get to the quarterback. Well, concerned no more. They had only seven total sacks going into this game, but they've had a couple today. Second down, 16 Bengals. And the draw. He reaches the 32. Here are some more finals from around the National Football League. The Washington Redskins have beaten Atlanta 16 to 7. Dallas will be interested in that. There's the biggest upset of the day. The New York Jets have defeated Miami. That's three straight. Walt Michaels over Don Shula. Two last year and now this one. Has him in his hip pocket. <laughs> New Orleans beat the hapless Giants again. That's the other undefeated team in the profession. Whoa. There's a big upset. 
Philadelphia and Washington are now four and one. Dallas must win to keep pace today. We'll continue in a moment. Anderson, third down, throws it out here. It's intercepted by Randy Hughes. Ken Anderson is the only man back. 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, out of bounds at the three. Charles Alexander knocked him out. The first time that formation worked, they ran Diane Ross in motion. Nobody went with him. The second time, Kenny was pressured slightly. Probably should have not, should not have thrown the football. Randy Hughes taking over for Charlie Waters, probably the third best safety there is in professional football. All three of them play on the same team, and that's what you call your turnaround. First and ten, Dallas on the four. 68 yards on the return by Randy Hughes. And while Anderson did not make the tackle, he saved the touchdown, enabling Alexander to get back. So the Cowboys have the ball at the three-and-a-half-yard line and a chance to get on the board. What a turn of events this has been. The Bengals leading 3-0, driving for more, and Anderson is picked off by Randy Hughes. Let's check the other scores. New Orleans has beaten the New York Giants 24-14 in his final. Houston, you saw, over Cleveland 31-10. We told you the Redskins beat Atlanta 16 to 7. That's final. Walt Michaels and the Jets upsetting Miami 33-27. That's final. And Philadelphia beat the Steelers 17-14. That is final. One more. Minnesota 13 to 10 over Detroit. That is final. You saw on the screen there, Roger Staubach talking to Tom Landry, Jim Myers, the offensive coordinator, assistant head coach for Dallas. And Jim LeClaire talking on the Bengals sideline to Homer Rice and Dick Mojaleski. Somehow got to keep him out of the end zone here. A true test of a defense. First and three and a half. In the third quarter, Buffalo. Boy, they are amazing. They have played some excellent football this year. Baltimore is still winless after four. Try to get in the victory column for the first time in 1979. Unfortunately, though, Buffalo does have to score 50 points a game because they can't stop anybody from scoring. They're doing it today. They've held Baltimore to six. So the time out here, we get things straightened away. The Cowboys huddle now back at the 15-yard line of Cincinnati. Fitzgerald over the ball. Dorsett and Laidlaw, the running backs. Saldi in motion. Laidlaw, touchdown Dallas. It did not take long. Three-yard run by Scott Laidlaw. Saldi went in motion and led the way. Tight end trap. Tight end trap up the middle. Good blocking. Offensive line by Dallas. Just left it all up to Jay Saldi and Scott Laidlaw. Watch Saldi block on Wilson Whitley. Just enough to get Laidlaw up through the line of scrimmage. That's an easy three and a half yards. Six, three, Dallas. And so Rafael Septian will attempt to tag on the extra point. Danny White will hold. It is six to three, Cowboys. And we may never know as this day progresses just how big the interception by Randy Hughes really is. Or was, for that matter, as we look back on it because the Bengals were driving for at least three more. Zephion puts it up, and it is good. The Raiders, seven. Broncos, nothing. 3.38 remaining in the first quarter. Raymond Guy to kick it off. Chris Payne will be deep with Canada, and Dixon on the wings, and there's the story of that last drive, and there's the deep man, Payne, for Denver. I know you want to see that touchdown pass again. You're going to see it. You're going to see it from Dave Casper's perspective right after the kickoff. High. Payne at his nine. To the 15. And down at the 19-yard line. First down Denver at the 19. Let's go back to the touchdown play. As Casper connects with uh, Staber, 30 yards. Stabler back, gets some time. They're holding out the 
defensive lineman. They're trying to get it with a three-man rush. There, the ball thrown perfectly downfield. Both both wide receiver, both tight ends in the same area. Obviously, a break in the pattern. There's the shot of Casper. You see how open he is there. And there's Chester coming in. Somebody blew that pattern. They're not supposed to be together. But a great catch and a great throw puts him into the end zone for a seven-pointer. I think he has a great hand. He clears it out to Ron Egloff and a nine yard gain to the 29 yard line. Boy, Weiss, a good scramble effort. Well, some tremendous pressure on him. 67 Pat Toomey there. Let's see, let's see Weiss as he goes back. They just didn't pick up Monty Johnson coming in right there from his linebacking position. And you've got to wonder if maybe he wasn't in the control of Monty Johnson. They blew the quick whistle earlier. They did not on that one. He goes to his number two tight end, Egloff, for a fine gain, second and short. Is this a throwaway now, Dick? Let's see how he uses it. I always like it when they just rear back and try to go for a bomb. Let's see whether or not Weiss does. Second and one at 29. Armstrong and Keyworth are the running backs behind Weiss. A fake to Armstrong. Weiss complete to Riley Odoms at the 49-yard line in a first down. Now they did go for the extra money on second and one. And Riley Odoms, what a target for the Denver Broncos. That is his 12th catch of the year. Superb performer. Norris Weiss has improved as a passer. He's always been a fine runner. Here you get an idea of how he can throw it on the run. And Odom's wide open. Oakland has had some real trouble in the defensive secondary. Two new faces back there. And they've been very vulnerable to that kind of passing. Odom's catches him on the best of them. Well, there's no embarrassment in that. Boy, 244, is he graceful? He jumps so well. He high jumps 6'9 in high school. Moses in motion from the 49 Denver first down play Otis Armstrong to the 45 of Oakland a healthy gain of six let's run down all the scores for you these are finals Houston 31 Cleveland 10 while an upset Philadelphia beat Pittsburgh 17 14 that means in the AFC Central Cleveland Pittsburgh and Houston are all tied four wins one loss Washington beat Atlanta 16 to 7 the Jets upset Miami 33 27 New Orleans over the New York Giants 24 14 Minnesota has defeated Detroit 13 to 10 those are all finals second and four Moses in motion Armstrong no game good play by Dave Payer number 74 he's the man who penetrated into the backfield of the Broncos. Just to recap the other scores in progress in the third period. Buffalo 31, Baltimore 6, and it's Tampa Bay 10, Chicago 3 in the third quarter. Early score, Seattle 3, Kansas City nothing first quarter. Cincinnati 3, Dallas nothing first quarter. And in baseball, let's look at this final day in the National League. Final, Philadelphia beats Montreal. It's over Pittsburgh and Cincinnati in the National League playoffs. You'll see that beginning Tuesday night here on NBC. the signal the penalty against the Raider defense for the illegal Chuck. Well, that's sad. Illegal contact number 37 defense five yards and a first down. Lester Hayes at the corner trying to hold up the Bronco receiver first down at the 40 yard line of Oakland. The Raiders with less than a half minute remaining in this first quarter lead seven nothing. Certainly one of the things that Hayes is asking himself, hey, I didn't do anything, but he did make a very grave error there. They had him nailed way back, and now Denver's got another shot at it. Rob Lytle and Jim Jensen, a new set of running backs behind Norris Weiss. He has up church left and Moses right. Oh, a little dipsy do, and Weiss has a man wide open, Haven Moses, at the 23-yard line, and that's where he goes down. Mike Davis made initial contact, number 36. Phil Villapiano, 41, helped him out. Let's go back and look at the kind of pressure that Weiss is getting here. Martin delays a little bit, comes in, he's wide open. If Weiss is not agile and quick on that play, he is set. He gets it off, he completes it, Denver is driving. 
Four seconds, three seconds. That'll be the last play of the first quarter. As you see it again, the lateral back to Weiss, and Weiss then, although the pass was a little short, Haven Moses making a fine shoot top grab, and so goes the first 15 minutes in Oakland. We have a break after the first quarter. Oakland 7, Denver nothing. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. 42,176 people refused to leave Three Rivers Stadium. Their team has won the National League East title. Let's go. And there it is on the scoreboard. And let's go now to the Pirates dressing room with Steve Zabriskie and manager Chuck Tanner. Steve. Thank you, Howard. Chuck Tanner's already got some champagne on him here. Chuck, the beginning of the year, people said it might take only 90 games to win the National League East. That certainly was not the case. No, it wasn't. I thought the league was so well balanced, that's what it would be, but it took 98. Last year, we went down to the next to the last day of the season, and I'll say this, this is the happiest moment of my, <laughs> of my career in baseball, and I'd like to say this to you. I like, I'm, we dedicate this pen to my mother and my dad. Your mother's got to be one of the biggest fi pirate fans, and certainly your biggest fan. Yeah, she's the biggest one of all, and she told me today that we were going to win it. She knew what she was talking about. She really predicts a lot of good things. Uh, you have finished second a number of times, Chuck. I know that this is extra gratifying for you to now oh, I be in a pennant. I love it. I love it. It's great. To, this is just one third of it. We have two more things we have to do. Best team I've ever managed. Best 25-man unit. Great attitude. Everybody contributed. It was 25 men that did the job for us. You think the momentum you've gained now from a hard-fought pennant race and having it go down to the wire is going to help you and carry over it into the playoffs? Well, it's hard to say. I think that uh, in a five-game series, anything can happen. And I know one thing. We'll be ready, just like we have been all year. All right, Chuck. Thank you very much. Congratulations from Don Drysdale and Howard Cosell as well. Okay. Bill Robinson, a fellow who's kind of had a tough year this year, had a big two-run RBI single in the seventh inning. Bill, I know it's especially gratifying for you. It is, Steve, and I just thank and praise the good Lord because he gave me the strength to guide that ball through and to swing the bat, and I just, I just thank him every day for not only today but for everything he's done for me. You contributed in a lot different way this year. Coming off the bench, you were in as a defensive replacement here in this ball game as well. How do you feel about the role you played? in the Pirates winning this year? Well, any time you can play and uh, any way you can win, I think this is probably a little more gratifying to me. Uh, this is my second playoff. Uh, we're going to go to the World Series this year, but this is second, my second playoff. And the first time in 75 is when I first came to the Pirates, and I didn't get a chance to play much during the season or to help the club or to be instrumental in helping the club reach a divisional championship. So this is a, a little more gratifying than the first one. Do you think it's a test of this team's character that they were able to hold off an excellent Montreal ball club and take it right down to the wire and win it? I tell you what, I'm not saying because we did win, and I, I hope that they're watching me now, but uh, my hat's off to the Montreal Expos. They're one great bunch of guys, and they, they battled us all the way, and uh, hey, they're going to be tough to reckon with from here on in. I don't think anyone will ever take it for granted, and congratulations to you guys. All right, Billy, thank you, and congratulations to you. These guys have got it up all year. We don't have a lot of 300 hitters, a lot of guys driven in 100 runs or 20 game winners but collectively we got some junkyard dogs here to just scratch and claw and bite and there's just no giving up and that's the one thing that I'm extremely proud of we could have tucked our tails between our legs many times or threw up the white flag for surrender but we just don't know what giving up or giving in is all about so everything that we've done has just been a total team effort and Damn it, I'm just thrilled to be a Pirate in 1979. 71 was a tremendous year, but in terms of a total effort all year, uh, I don't think nothing can compare with these guys this year. We have just some of the guttiest guys that I've ever been associated with, and I tell you, I'm just so, so proud for all of us that we've been able to put it together and come through as we did. Well, Willie, I know that they're proud of you, and Pittsburgh is proud of you in particular, and, of course, the team in general. Congratulations on another victory, and good luck in the playoffs. Thank you. All right. Willie Stargell with two RBIs, including a big home run today. We'll be back at Three Rivers Stadium. Don and Howard will be wrapping it up here from Three Rivers in just a moment. Thank you. 
We're back. You know the result. The Pittsburgh Pirates are the Eastern Division title holders. There is yet the big job against Cincinnati, but done by way of wrap-up, I'd just like to say this. The folks have heard from Chuck Tanner, from Bill Robinson, there's Harvey Haddox, there's the locker room scene now, and they heard from the great statesman, Willie Stargell. From those three, you got a sense of what these men are all about, and a very good sense. And Willie Stargell used the term junkyard dogs. Now, this is Pittsburgh. It's not the south side of Chicago, and it's not the world of Leroy Brown. It's the Steel City, where they've got the Steel Curtain. And right there, that's the Bucks Curtain. Chuck's Bucks all the way, put it however you want. There are a together team, and Stodgell put it very well, and the manager has used them all so well. So we congratulate them. But Don, what a task ahead against Cincinnati. Oh, they certainly have that, Howard. This will be the fourth time that they have met the Cincinnati Reds in the championship playoffs, the sixth time overall that the Pittsburgh Pirates have been there. And the last time was 1975. They have yet to defeat the Cincinnati Reds. So we'll wait and see what happens. That will all take place next week. Once again, the final score, Pittsburgh 5, Chicago 3. And be sure to join us tomorrow night for ABC's NFL Monday Night Football. The New England Patriots meet the Green Bay Packers at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, and 6 Pacific time. Travel arrangements made through and a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United is building the largest airline in the world around you. ABC's Major League Baseball has a presentation of the leader, ABC Sports, bringing you exclusive coverage of the Lady Olympics. Well, Jefferson comes off the field. He appears to be all right, and here's what happens. He was sandwiched. Two defenders well, there. They got him covered inside out, but as he jumped, he was hit hard inside, outside. The ball came loose. The official blew it dead. I think he just got the wind knocked out of him. Charlie Joyner is wide to the right. Jefferson has caught four passes so far for 53 yards. First and 10 for the Chargers at the 49er 46-yard line. Mike Thomas for a couple of yards. Let's take a look at some final scores in the NFL. Minnesota defeats Detroit 13 to 10. So the Vikings are now three and two. Detroit now one and four. Washington four and one. New Orleans defeated the New York Giants 24 14. So the Giants are still winless. An upset the New York Jets send the Dolphins to their first loss of the season and the Eagles upset the Steelers 17 14 Philadelphia is four and one Pittsburgh's first loss and Houston after beating Dallas or uh, Cleveland after beating Dallas loses to Houston complete inside the 40 yard line to Greg McCrary number 88 well the interesting thing here is that the Chargers are doing all this through the air they're they're throwing screens they're throwing to the backs they're throwing downfield they haven't they haven't done much running uh, I think that sooner or later that's going to catch up with them. I think they're going to have to establish a good running game to beat this 49er defense. Under five minutes to go in the first quarter. Still no score. First and 10 at the 36 yard line. Clarence Williams breaks the tackle and gets inside the 30 yard line. A fine change of direction for Clarence Williams. And if you wanted to know why he's doing so well with eight well, touchdowns, this is an example. I tell you what Clarence Williams does. He has good balance, real good balance. He's tough. He reads the blocks, has a nice hole there. He keeps going. He's the surprise of the year. Eight touchdowns. Paul Lowe scored nine. He is the Charger record holder for touchdowns rushing. Here's the flip to Williams again. He doesn't get much going wide. And Dan Buns, the middle linebacker, number 57, who was questionable before the game, pursued well. Williams. 
Clarence Williams reminds me a little bit of Larry Brown. He's about the same size. He might he might be uh, maybe five pounds heavier, but he runs like Larry Brown. He's better inside than outside. He's a good receiver. He's a good blocker. Maybe we'll get a chance to see him block today. Penalty against San Francisco and an automatic first down for the Chargers. 59 defense, offside, first down. Willie Harper, linebacker, was offside, so a first down for the Chargers. Pittsburgh Pirates have won the National League East, defeating Chicago 5-3 as the Phillies shut out Montreal 2-0 on the final day of the regular season. First and 10 now for San Diego. They're moving the ball. Here's Thomas. Thomas is brought down by Buns, the middle linebacker again. Pick up of maybe a yard and a half, call it two, maybe even three. <laughs> the Chargers have a potent passing game. They do a lot of things that, that give every defense a problem. Again, I'll repeat, they get that running game going. Now the passing game will be twice as effective. San Diego's an explosive team. With Winslow, an up-and-coming tight end, and Jefferson, they have a lot of backs. Lydell Mitchell, Bo Matthews, a tough big back. Got a lot to work with. Second down, and seven to go. Fouch. Completes the pass. Kellen Winslow, who also can play wide receiver, he's that fleet. Their top draft choice out of Missouri, another penalty marker down. And backfield in motion called against the Chargers. You know, Dick, that's one of the problems of using a lot of formations and motion and shifting. You have a tendency not to be set or to be going forward and make mistakes like this. Number 18 offense. But it was Charlie Joyner, the wide receiver. Here it is. He's going forward on the snap of the ball. So the designated pass rushers are in there now for the 49ers. Al Cowling's number 79 and Dwayne Ford 76. Cowling's played in Canada. I think Al can help this ball club. He's a good athlete. He can rush the passer and he's got leadership qualities. Second and 12 at the 25 yard line. 319 to go. Cornerbacks come up tight for the 49ers. Fouts has enough time. Going deep in the end zone. Overthrown and intercepted it's intercepted in the end zone by Mel Morgan number 46 it's a touchback the former Cincinnati Bengal defensive back makes the interception and so the 49ers stop the charges again this is a big play Fouts has time to throw the ball he's well covered I thought the two defensive backs were going to knock each other off Thomas banks one off the upright from 42 yards out. So the Bears did not come up empty. The Bucks stopped them from going in for the touchdown, but Thomas got the field goal. It's now a four-point game. Thomas's kickoff taken by Ragsdale at the five. Ragsdale through the wedge over the 25 to about the 28-yard line. Piled up by number 74, Jerry Myers, putting the stop on him. Help from the linebacker, Muckenstern. Let's see that field goal again, Johnny. We've had a one that was stopped when O'Donohue at the upright. This one got the better bounce. They say it's a game of inches, and watch this one. It's deflected off the upright and stays and goes through. So the heavens were with Bob Thomas, number 16, and he says, he leans, he leans, he leans. He says, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so a close game is even closer. Pitch out now to Bell on first down. Bell running hard. And Bell close to a first down on the play. Mike Spivey finally stopped him, and it looked like he might have got first down yardage. Oakland in front of Denver, 7 to nothing. First period. The Rams lead St. Louis, 7 0 on a touchdown run by Cullen Bryant. Buffalo really opening up on the Baltimore Colts. Just short of the first down. Less than a yard to go on a good hard run by Ricky Bell. 10 to 6 Buccaneers lead the Bears. Time winding down third period. 
Eckwood. Eckwood trying to get outside, can't do it again. Fensick, number 45, putting the tackle on him, coming up from the safety spot. Gary Fensick comes up with a lot of key tackles for the Chicago Bears, and he's one of those lucky players who was playing in his own hometown. You know, probably the greatest break a football player can get is to be born and raised and go to college and come back and play pro in your hometown. He's from Barrington, Illinois, right here in a suburb of Chicago. He went to Yale. Free agent signed in 1976. Eckwood got the first down yardage, and Fensick prevented it from being a whole lot more. Buccaneers on the move again. Good play. Intended for Gordon Jones. He couldn't hold on as Williams really drilled it. A little play action. That was kind of a nifty play, Tim. The fake of the pitch out, then the, just a quick post. And it was almost complete. If he'd have caught that in stride, he might have been gone. Eckwood, by the way, has now carried 15 times for 102 yards. He opened the season as a rookie going for more than 100 yards into this game with 332 good for fifth spot in the nfc second down nowhere to go for ricky bell we'll make it eckwood eckwood again page and heron stopping him right at the line of scrimmage and there may even be a little loss let's we'll see where they spot it loss of about a half a yard bringing up third down Jones brings in the play for Tampa Bay. And there's Alan Page, number 82, who sniffed that one out right from the very beginning and had no chance because he uh, was not fooled. Gordon Jones is wide right. Hagan's wide left. Pass for Hagan's. He's open. First down to the 41-yard line. Duck Plank on the tackle. Boy, what a rifle game. arm he has, huh, Tim? Really? It's a rifle arm. As he goes back, Hagen's down and in on the simple sponge pattern. And you'll see, you'll notice number 88, Giles, was wide open on the inside of him. They had two receivers there. Both of them were pretty open. There was Giles, 88, and there's Hagen's making the grab. And finally, up comes Doug Plank for the tackle. Tampa Bay on the move again. The ball at the Bears, 46-yard line. Buck leads 10 to 6. The motion is Morris Owens behind the ball. Eckwood drives the right side, gets a block. Tom Hicks forces him out of bounds at the 40-yard line. A pickup of six yards for Jerry Eckwood. Jimmy Giles with the lead block on the play on the corner. And a former Oakland Hopeman man was out there, too. Greg Roberts, number 61. He pulled out and was really on the move there, which helped that play be a success. As you look at the score right now, Tampa at 10. Chicago 6, actually Tampa Bay. Last time these teams met, last November, Bears won 14-3 here at Chicago Stadium. In the overall series, the Bears have won two, and the Bucks have won one. The motion is Jones. Eckwood, straight ahead, met by Muck and Sturm, and pulled down at the ankles by Alan Page. Short of the first down, he gained about three yards on the play. They seem to be going more and more to the eye formation now. Eckwood's running out of that eye to hope to give him a little bit of running room, you might say. That's the end of the third quarter with the score. Tampa Bay Buccaneers 10, the Chicago Bears 6. We pause now for a word from your local station. Now for the kickoff, here's Zepty on stick. It is deep, Deacon Turner, a yard deep in the end zone. 15, reaches the 20, and will go no farther as he's pushed back. Steve Wilson, 81 downfield to make the tackle, so Kenny Anderson will go back to work now from the neighborhood of his own 20 sports world. Pete Johnson gets outside to the 25-yard line, and when he gets outside, he is a lug. Brunig had to ride his back to bring him out at the 27. Still not healthy, Pete Johnson. Cracked his uh, wrist last preseason game, still playing about one arm. 
Weighs about 255, 260, and you're right. When he gets rambling, he's tough to bring down. And I'll tell you, Bob, where they sorely missed him in the opener at Denver, where they lost to the uh, Broncos 10 nothing at a third and fourth at the one-yard line. You did the game. You yes. know better than I do. Yes, you're right. And had you had Johnson in there, it might have been a different story. He's a load. There's no doubt about that. Second down, four for the Bengals, now trailing 7-3. to three. Anderson to throw it. Johnson could not hold on. Henderson had the coverage. And speaking of Thomas Henderson, that 68-yard return by Randy Hughes was the longest since Henderson's uh, return of 79 yards against Tampa Bay in the third game of the 1977 season. There's Thomas Henderson. Quiet it down a little bit. How many linebackers in the NFL do you know that got enough speed to have to their credit a 97-yard kickoff return? Well, there's one right there. I wouldn't want to try to outrun that fella. I think you're 100% right. I can't think of anybody. Third down here for Kenny Anderson. Four yards to go. Bass and Curtis is receivers. Throws it out here to Receiver, Bob. I think he had it. And I'll tell you what, Kenny Anderson really got leveled by Harvey Martin. Martin just around Mike Wilson. Kenny in desperation throws it. Still gets enough on it to get it out to Bass. I want to see this. I hope I see his feet. I think he caught that. I don't know how he got that over Aaron Kyle's fingers. In fact, Aaron Kyle tipped it. I think he came down with just one foot inbounds. We cannot see it, I don't believe. Yeah, but that was a good enough catch you should give it to but him. I'll tell you one thing about Don Bass. He's the second best uh, number 84 the Cincinnati Bengals have ever had. Oh, you're very kind. I didn't do much to that jersey. I very seldom got it dirty. I know that. Steve Wilson, number 81, back in single safety for Dallas. Awaiting Pat McAnally's punt, and he arches a high spiral. Wilson at the 25. Avoids the first wave. 30 and out of bounds. And McAnally promised a 70 yarder today. That was not it, but he says before the day is out, 45 yards by the number five punter in the AFC, a four yard return. We open the second quarter at the Oakland Coliseum. Dick Enberg with Merlin Olson. Pleased you've joined us on a beautiful Bay Day. Sunny and in the 70s, Norris Weiss and the Broncos. First down at the Oakland 24. The Raiders lead. Long count, play action by Weiss. Wide open is Rob Lytle, but he was out of bounds. He did not have both feet in when he caught the ball. His momentum was carrying him out of bounds. It's incomplete. Second and ten. Lytle just lost track of that sideline, Dick. Did not have the feeling for where it was, and that's a critical error because it would have been a fine gain. There's the first quarter official statistics and Oakland a slight advantage and they have the lead seven nothing but Denver's on the march second and ten at the twenty four the Raiders Charles Phillips the fifth defensive back is in for Oakland East to throw. wide open up church at the fifteen and he has the first down at the Raider 12 yard line but before number 32 Jack Tatum can make the tackle final comes in the final game of the season so the Pirates did it themselves they beat the Cubs five to three Montreal had lost just a few moments earlier it'll be Pittsburgh at Cincinnati you'll see that game Tuesday night right here on NBC Tuesday night the National League playoffs begin Wednesday night the American League the Angels and Orioles from Baltimore. to Keyword. Fine play by 53, Rod Martin, who slashed across laterally and drove Keyword to the sidelines after a one-yard gain. Martin, quite a story. A 12th round pick was released by the Raiders. They re-signed him, and now they say he's playing as well as anyone. Keyword trying to get off tackle. They're an excellent uh, stop right at the point of attack by Toomey, who stretches it out. And you see Martin right there, staying on the outside, gets a good tackle on Keyword. Keyword's been bothered by stomach pains over the last week. He's been a lot of the week. Moses. No, he dropped the ball. Couldn't hang on. 
coverage by Lester Hayes on that right corner. I bet Ross Johnson was hoping that one would end up in, in his hands as he goes to the sideline. Red Miller is saying, hey, let's hang on to the ball. Third and nine, critical, critical down. They'd like to get seven points and put this back in even footing for them in the game. You saw number 90 Willie Jones come into the Raider defensive line and the veteran Jim Turner anticipates his role. It, rather he had a choice. I know it'd be for one not three points but this will decide third and nine from the 11 yard line. Rookie number 90 Jones in there just in time. You've got to generate some pressure to keep these quarterbacks in their place. At least that's what the def defense has to say about it. You see Browning coming in from the outside. Number 90 Willie Jones right there sweeping back. And Norris Weiss just took too much time getting that football out of there. And he's sacked. Turner will have a shot at it here. 32 yard attempt. Weiss to hold. No good. It's wide. and the Denver Broncos nothing. So it'll be good to see big Bill Walton back playing in the NBA in a new uniform and Magic Johnson perform his tricks for the Los Angeles Lakers. NBA comes back to CBS. We anticipate a big year. First and 10 at the 20 yard line. Schumann number 84 is split to the left for the 49ers. Steve DeBerg the quarterback threw eight touchdown passes last year. Will exceed that this time. And the handoff goes to O.J. Simpson. Simpson gets a couple crosses to the 23 yard line. 
Bob Horn, the middle linebacker, number 55, makes the tackle. O.J. Simpson, of course, has some goals, the Jim Brown mark, but according to the scheme of things of Bill Walsh, it's basically a passing team, and for Simpson to be pretty effective, George, he's got to carry the ball a lot, and it doesn't seem to be the plan. Well, plus he's in and out of there. They're substituting back, so he won't get the opportunity. Paul Hofer, number 36, who they feel is an underrated back, is in there now. Simpson, by the way, is 11 yards and four carries. In motion. And the handoff to Wilbur Jackson. Going outside, Jackson has a first down past the 30-yard line. Paul Seal was in motion there, and that's a play we've seen earlier so far. Randy Cross. Let's, let's watch 51, Randy Cross, playing right guard. Ha had good position on Wilbur Young, stays with him, keeps driving him. There was also a good block by Paul Seal on that play. He went in motion that made it possible. At the 31, first and 10, less than two minutes to play in the first quarter here is Simpson. Simpson cuts in, but not this time. As Preston came in from his linebacker position to stop O.J. Simpson as they are alternating the backs. Get on the tackle. Number 51. Second and nine. And number 69, John Lee. Cross is the right guard. Fred Quillen has done so well at center. But what about Randy on this play, George? Well, he's trying to pull around and he trips. In fact, the number 79 put yep. his hand out and Gary tripped him. Gary Johnson. That's why they call him Big Hands, George. The smart play. Smart play by Johnson on the defense. Second and nine now to 32-yard line. Seal is in motion. The bird, and he got tough rush, and he completes the pass to Paul Hofer. Hofer has a first down to the 43-44 yard line. Willie Buchanan made the stop, and so DeBerg, using the backs coming out of the backfield effectively, and the 49ers have another first down. I like Paul Hofer. I think he's an underrated back. Every game we've done, he's, he's looked good. He doesn't make mistakes. He's not the burner that you're looking for, but you don't need that type of play. They, they cross the backs on this. It's a check down to Hofer. Blowing coverage. Blowing coverage by the Chargers. Less than a half a minute to go. First and 10, Simpson gets a good block. And O.J. Simpson almost broke one. He gets into San Diego territory at the 48-yard line. Mike Fuller, who hits hard, number 42, the strong safety, makes the, makes the stop. Watch, Look at the block by yeah. Wilbur Jackson. Wilbur Jackson is a good blocker. Let's watch his block here. Watch 40. Now, defensively, Preston 52 should use his hands. Don't let him get into his body like that. Jackson blocked well for Delvin Williams when he gained 1,000 yards and had some good seasons in San Francisco. There's the gun. And the first quarter is history. And so we came in wondering whether we had possibilities of an upset. And after one period of play, no score between the Chargers and the 49ers. leading Cincinnati 7-3 in the first period of their game. Oakland in front of Denver 7-6 in the second. Buffalo way out in front of Baltimore. Third in the yard to go here. The Buccaneers leading by four points. Trying to drive deeper into Chicago territory. Bell in motion. Pitch come out on, to Eckwood. Cuts behind his blocker Bell, but the Bears cover extremely well. Hampton, the rookie number 99, doing the job on the left defensive end and Doug Plank coming up from safety. Hampton may be having his best game as a Chicago Bear. He has got to learn to pass rush. They've been working with him quite a bit because he just hasn't had that much experience at it, but he's been strong against the run game, and his pass rush has improved. It's a fourth down situation for Tampa Bay at the Bear 38-yard line. So they're not going to uh, give it a try. I guess they're going to punt unless they're going to surprise everybody here. Tampa leading statistically by a considerable margin as we look at Steve Schubert 157 yards rushing through three quarters 141 passing 73 rushing 73 passing for the Bears but there's only a four point difference on the scoreboard a low snap Blanchard good effort good kick gets it into the end zone it'll be a touchback and I'm sure he would like to add some more time to try to angle it Johnny but he made a very good effort fielding that ball and getting it away 
another look at it as the snap came a little low, but he was able to scoop it up like a shortstop and get it off, which did ruin his efficiency of putting it out of the corner because they only netted 18 yards out of it. They were on the 38, and the Bears have a first down at the 20-yard line. Uh, knowing John McKay, I'm kind of surprised at the 38 that he might not have gone for it, but I guess he's going to depend on the strength of his defense, which has carried him for the last uh, couple of three years. It's been the strongest part of the game. Well, the Bears have only got uh, two field goals. Remember, NBA action Friday, October 12th, the Lakers and the Clippers. Jabbar against Walton, and the first network appearance of Magic Johnson. Richards in motion, and the pitch out to Peyton. Peyton cutting back inside the right corner and picking up about three yards before being pulled down by Jarris White, number 45. It is second and seven, a gain of three for Peyton. You can tell that Peyton is carrying his left arm just a little bit gingerly compared to his right arm. It doesn't swing as he walks, and obviously it has uh, affected his his uh, mobility a little bit. As you see, he's moved past Bill Brown as the NFL's 18th all-time rusher. is going on 5,900 yards, and he's only in his fifth year in the NFL. How about that? Great, great performance. Second down. Bears trying to get it going here. They go to Peyton again. He's got a blocker in front of him, and a good defensive effort by Richard Wood. Diving for an ankle tackle just as Peyton was about to turn it upfield. He got about three as it was, and it'll bring up third down and about two. Okay, here it is, the quick pitch as Peyton goes to the outside. Looks like he might have some, uh, some running room here. Notice how he carries that ball as Vince takes a look at him. Now he'll switch it. Usually he'll switch right to the left side just before he's getting hit, but that time he did not. So he does not want to carry with his left arm that much down less than two to go oh robin earl is stacked up short of the first down polar number 77 number 58 dewey selman and now you know why john mckay chose to punt because he was depending on the defense and the defense did a job for him they sure did and uh, now the bears will have to punt Natives getting a little restless at Soldier Field, but there is a long way to go. 12-20 remaining in regulation time. It is just a four-point margin, 10-6. to six. Two outstanding defensive clubs really doing a job today. Parsons, high punt. And he reached, and even that one, he didn't try the fair catch, John. I mean... Lenny Walterscheid was practically in his pocket along with Brian Bashnagel, and <laughs> he got the ball anyway. So it'll be first down at the 32-yard line when play resumes in a moment. Came from Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati, the Pirates and Reds, and we'll have both the American and National League playoffs. coverage but Tony Hill can run like the wind and he had five yards on both of them and Rogers a little mad at him mad at himself well, you see the shadow on the stadium which is tough for the players and also tough on our cameras Sam did you know that when they designed this stadium they had a mock-up with a lamp sitting off to the side of it and that sun is not supposed to show into this stadium <laughs> somehow they had the lamp in the wrong position and that's what they end up with but by the uh, third quarter it should be gone with all the architectural genius and all the money down here in Texas, uh, they couldn't figure it, it out. It is a pretty place, so it is a very, very nice place to watch a football game. However, it's probably among the three hardest surfaces in the National Football League. And the three hottest. Yes. Draw to Dorset. Breaks the tackle. Trying to get outside. Into Cincinnati territory and out of bounds at the 47. Run out by Lewis Frieden. But Dorset broke a tackle at the line of scrimmage. Gerard is the man who ran him out, 23 yards on the carry. And for a little guy, he has amazing strength. You'll see him run right through the tackle of, I believe, no, it was Gerard. Dick Gerard, uh, yes. Dick Gerard, right through the tackle of Dick Gerard, and he is right now in full stride. Three steps, and he's in full stride. And that guy makes 23 yards look so fast. He's not the only Heisman Trophy winner on the field. Griffin's got two, Staubach's got one, and 63 for Navy. We got hardware all over the place from the college ranks. So it's a first down at the Cincinnati 45 and a half yard line. 
There is good reason why Tony Dorsett gained more yardage in college than any living human being. Brinson inside the 45 and maybe the 43 yard line. Easy, Jimmy. Jimmy Claire, the middle linebacker, getting tough. This telecast is presented by authority of the National Football League. I don't think Dallas has run outside uh, their offensive tackles yet. They've run inside the offensive tackles, right straight at the Cincinnati Bengals defensive lineman. Second down and a short eight. Duke Pearson goes in motion. Dorsett again looking to spring inside the 40. Close to a first down as he reaches the 36-yard line. And the trap blocking up front has been outstanding. The guards Rafferty, number 64, and Scott, 68, are really having a ball with that young and inexperienced front four of Cincinnati. And people in professional football say that there's a difference between offensive linemen and defensive linemen, that offensive linemen are somewhat passive. Well, Dallas fixes that. They draft defensive people out of college and make them offensive linemen. So they've got a mean streak in them. There's the man behind it all. Tom Landry, Tex Schramm, Irmo Allen, Jim Myers. They know what they're doing when it comes to that oblong-shaped thing down there on the field. Third down, less than a yard for Dallas. Dorsett averaging nine yards of pop already. 62 yards, seven carries. Princeton gets the first down as he reaches the 35-yard line. Jerron coming up from his free safety spot to make the tackle. But I believe he has the first down. Close enough to measure, though. Have they waved in the sticks? I think they're going to. There's Homer Rice. He's a, he's a disciple of the man he works for, Paul Brown, and also Tom Landry, who was the head coach and athletic director at Rice University, no relation. Also helped a great deal in the, de in the development of some very, it's a first down Dallas, some very good quarterbacks. Oh. Greg Cook at University of Cincinnati, Rick Norton at Kentucky, and Tommy Kramer at Rice. Look at Buffalo's doing to Baltimore in Whoa. the third quarter. And before we get off the subject of Homer Rice, he got what has to be termed a vote of confidence from Paul Brown this week. Brown uh, quoted as saying, I am not a musical chairs man. I am sticking with Homer Rice. Tampa Bay leading Chicago 10-6. Defensive struggle. Oakland has gone on top of Denver first quarter. And Seattle 3-0 over Kansas City. Here it's 7-3 Dallas. Staubach on first down. He wants Drew Pearson. Breeden with great coverage had the interception, but Pearson came back to break it up. Excellent coverage by Louis Breeden, whose best day ever was in a 9-7 loss to Pittsburgh. He shut out Lynn Swan last year. He has the basic ability to do it, too. There's Drew Pearson and Roger Staubach. You talked about a vote of confidence earlier, Sam. The all-time vote of confidence went to Tom Landry in 1963. The Cowboys were not winning. Everybody wanted Tom Landry's head. So Tex Ram, Clint Murchison got together and said there's only one way to settle this. And they gave him a 10-year guaranteed contract. And they've won ever since. That was Bob Trumpy speaking. This is Sam Nover. We're nice. Uh, got a nice football game here. Seven to three Dallas on a very warm afternoon in Irving, Texas. Roger Staubach is not particularly enjoying his stats today. One out of six with one interception for five yards. But this man has had an absolutely outstanding afternoon. Tony Dorsett reaches the 22 yard line. And a flag is down. First down. It appeared as if they threw a flag, or was that just a piece of paper that No, I think they threw a flag, face mask, against Cincinnati. I want to tell you, that young man has such great acceleration and runs kind of hunched over a little bit, so there's nothing to grab but his thighs. And when you try to, here's the call. 67, face mask on the tackle. First of all. And oddly enough, 67 is Gary Burley, one of Tony Dorsett's closest friends, having played at the University of Pittsburgh with him. And watch the way he accelerates through the line and breaks tackles like that, although he was not, not touched. But great moves, great acceleration, and he's an absolutely tireless runner. And if I fail to mention it before, the gentleman who spoke to you from the field was referee Fred Silva. Dorsett again. Reaches the 11-yard line. Dumped there by Reggie Williams, 57. Burley... At practice here yesterday, probably uh, said it better than anybody else when he looked at the field and said, I just dread having to chase Tony Dorsett around on this thing. And chase is just about what you do with that guy. Gary Burley last year had a phenomenal year for Cincinnati. Came to training camp this year about 15 pounds heavy. Is still fighting to get down to playing weight. And with this heat today, I don't know. Playing at about 275. Second down and five. Dallas leading seven to three, looking for more. 36 behind a door set block. Cuts it in at the 10 to about the six yard line. 
And the three-year veteran from the University of Florida may have picked up another Dallas first down. And a devastating block by the rookie tight end of the Dallas Cowboys, Cosby. I don't think you're going to be able to. You'll see it just as Dorsett passes, or just as Laidlaw passes. Great block by Cosby. He gets to turn up. And they're going to measure for the first down. Princeton has been uh, plagued by injuries. He had a shoulder separation, a slight one in the St. Louis game. Also, a rib injury was diagnosed. So that young man hasn't really played since the opener at St. Louis. It's a first down, Dallas. Excuse me. I said, I said, Laidlaw, Princeton. They're both replacing Robert Newhouse, who was out with a bad leg, been bothering him for a couple of weeks now. Well, they're doing a whale of a lot better than that today. 3.9 per rush isn't bad at all. But you can rest assured that Dorsett well over the 80-yard mark here in the first quarter. And the Cowboys are rushing the daylights out of the football. Laidlaw and Dorsett are the setbacks. First and goal, Dallas. It's Laidlaw. Puts his head into about the two-yard line. Scott has the Dallas touchdown. Reggie Williams, 57, having to make the stop again. Sam, this Dallas offense is averaging through four games, 400 yards a game on offense, which is awesome. Then explain to me why they've had uh, three very, very difficult football games that haven't blown anybody out. Yeah, they've won three games by 13 points total. They played St. Louis. O.J. Anderson had a great day. They played Chicago. Walter Payton had a great day. Last week, they had five turnovers. Roger Staubach threw an interception for a touchdown. They've had some bad breaks.
or the playoffs ought to be something. What a season. The Pirates win it on the final day of the regular year. They'll meet the Reds. Game one, the National League playoffs, Tuesday night here on NBC, 8 o'clock Eastern time. Then on Wednesday, you'll get a doubleheader, the Pirates and the Reds in the afternoon, and the Angels in Baltimore from Birdland on Wednesday night. Van Egan on first down from his 20. football we want to control it and we want to play a better first quarter offensively and defensively Van Egan right there showing you some of that left side power that they've been so sorely without in the early part of this season they have not yet scored a touchdown rushing this entire year they have scored very few points on the season and have given up too many they certainly appear to be changing that trend right here let's see if they can stay with it going with the two tight ends Chester and Casper and Van Egan on second and short yardage has the first down to the 32-yard line. Randy Gratishar, great middle linebacker, or inside linebacker from Ohio State, the AFC Defensive Player of the Year last season, made the tackle. Averaged 18 tackles per game last year, 12 of them, an average of 12 first hits. He's off to a slow start with uh, injuries in the early part of this year, only 25 first hits and four games, well below his average. But uh, he is feeling better. He's come around from torn ligaments in his foot, deep thighs. Dumps it out to Van Egan. Good move by Van Egan. 35 up to the 39-yard line. There were three white shirts in front of the Oakland fullback. And he made a little fake right and cut left. And he got by two of them and almost broke it up the sidelines. Downfield, Dave Casper. Fine tight end. Getting a chance to play more today than he has in a long time. You see him actually running Jackson out of there. He's going to come back now. Watch him as he'll come back and get a piece of that block. Well, we didn't get a chance to see it there. Maybe we will on the second shot here. Stabler has time to throw the football. A little dump off to take advantage of Van Egan's running ability. You said, Dick, an excellent move there. Casper coming in behind, trying to get a little help for him. Actually did a shielding job more than a blocking job. Back to the live action, and Derek Jensen hit in the backfield, still able to fight forward to the 40-yard line, and he's still fighting. As Bob Swenson, 51, and it appeared to be... 72 Don Latimer wrestling him back. We're going to see three nose tackles out there today. Uh, Reuben Carter and Latimer have both been hurt, and Red Miller wants to make sure that he doesn't tire them too far today. They have, they're just now getting healthy, so we'll see uh, both of those players at uh, nose tackle along with John Grant, who will also get some playing time. Van Egan comes out. And Booker Russell, 34, is in. That's surprising that the veteran Van Egan would come out. And on third and a yard and a half, the Raiders have two young backs, Jensen and Russell, behind Stabler. Ooh. Jensen didn't get a thing. The 40-yard line and right into the Bronco stone wall. And a flag late is thrown after the tackle had been made in the pileup. It appeared Pat Hart of the umpire tossed the yellow hanky. And we'll see whether or not there's uh, left against or Denver. It is against Denver, so Denver makes a stupid play. That's, the, that's really a stupid play. You've got people stopped, and you saw the disgust registered on the face of Red Miller. We talked about this being a blood game, Dick. It really is that kind of a game, an emotional game. But you still don't want to lose control of your emotions, and I think Red Miller is saying, all right, who did that? I want to have his number because you marched up 15 big yards keep a drive alive. Personal foul, late hit, number 29, first down. Bernard Jackson up from the secondary trying to help out, put a little extra, and picks up the 15 yards. And, of course, you'll hear about that later. Don't want to confuse you. There are two Jacksons in that secondary for the Broncos. Tom Jackson, 57, the linebacker. Bernard Jackson, 29, who plays at free safety. And, of course, the Raiders, although he's injured, have their Jackson, 42, Matty, a cornerback. Martini, wide left. Two tight ends for Stabler. Van Egan back in, and he gets the call, and he's down to the 40, a gain of five, and he's averaging about five yards a carry, and that uh, is exactly what Tom Flores could have ordered for this Sunday afternoon. He needs to look at the second and fives and second and fours, not the second and thirteens. Now, the 
Raiders trying to take advantage of a little bit of a physical mismatch. They're bigger up front than the Denver Broncos, and they're trying to, as we said earlier, isolate those big backs and those big linemen on the linebackers one-on-one. -on -one. As Kenny Stabler said, plain vanilla. We're going right after him. away intended for Raymond Chester first miss for Stabler he's now four for five Gratisher did an excellent job of reading the quarterback as he must out of that zone Stabler again has plenty of time to throw the football and boy that's that's dangerous you can't give him time watch Gratisher excellent ball reaction had he not knocked it away it would have been complete second down and ten as Dave Casper comes out Cliff Branch and Rich Martini two speedsters out to the left Chavis, number 79 from South Carolina State, playing a defensive end. Another pretty good player, an old friend of yours, came out of that school, David Deacon Jones. Chavis doing a fine job on that last play. We talked about getting pressure on the passer. Both teams doing a better job today. They, they came in with five and six sacks, respectively. Uh, Oakland with six, Denver with five, and both seem to be able to get more pressure today than we expected. Stabler, even when he was not sacked last week against Kansas City, hit the deck. He's taken a lot of punishment. But a great quarterback he is, and you can't afford to give him time. Guy to kick to Rick Upchurch, maybe the most dangerous of all the Bronco players. He is, in some eyes, their top offensive threat. Guy hits it deep toward the end zone. It'll be a touchback. I don't think they want to kick it to Upchurch. <laughs> Do you blame him? Not a bit. Touchback, ball at the 20 for Denver. They trail 7 0. Tim Ryan and Johnny Morris. Yeah, let's see that punt return again. Now, Lenny Walderside, number 23, could have really crucified him on this play, but he's being blocked. And, you know, he may have lost sight of the receiver sometimes, and sometimes you're not quite so sure whether he fair caught or not. But once you determine it, then you go ahead and make the tackle. But uh, I'll tell you, he's got a lot of guts on Reese, doesn't he? He sure does. He doesn't uh, know about uh, the fair catch. I don't think anybody told him. First down, Tampa Bay in motion can go and back toward the ball. They go back behind him, a pitch out to Bell. Bell got just a couple before he swarmed under over there by a pack of bears. Before the game, speaking of a pack of bears, they introduced Dick Butkus, who went into the Hall of Fame at Canton this year, received his Hall of Fame ring in a pregame ceremony, the great former Bears linebacker. And we welcome back uh, George Hallis, Papa Bear, who's been in the hospital not too long ago and is out and healthy as usual here at the game today. And he's going to have homecoming for all the old Bears tonight, so it's a big night in Chicago for ex-Chicago Bears. A lot of great, famous old Bears attending the game today. Second down and eight. Swing pass out to Bell, can't hang on. Bell tried to haul it in with one hand, never got two on it. And it'll be third down. Tom Hicks out there on the coverage, but he had room to catch it. That's a good play. They have worked that with Eckwood a couple of times. They don't really swing their back way out in the flat. They just swing him out, but not straight up the field, kind of in between. They cut the difference. And so he catches it in full stride on his way downfield. And they have had some success with that play in this ball game. They'll probably come up with it again. Third down. Let's see what they can do here. Three, four in against them defensively. They've got extra linebackers and defensive backs in. Williams for Hagen. Intercepted roller side. No incomplete. The official right on the play ruled that the ball touched the ground. And Waller Shide does not get his interception. It was intended for Hagen. Badly overthrown. Good coverage downfield by the Bears because Williams couldn't find anybody to throw to. He had to pump a couple of times here. Finally, he threw in desperation, and it was not accurate. It was overthrown right there. And let's see if he did indeed trap the ball. Very hard to tell. Very hard to tell. But the officials ruled he trapped it. The Tampa Bay will punt. So Blanchard will punt as the Bears defense rises up and stops the buck. Blanchard hits from his 25. The short punt taken at the 35-yard line by Lenny Walterscheid. 
And the Bears have pretty good field position here. And remember, they trail by only four points. We have 11 4 remaining in the fourth quarter. 10 to 6, Tampa Bay. Dick Stockton and George Allen back in San Diego. No score as we start the second quarter as the San Francisco 49ers have played intelligent football so far on offense and they made the big plays on defense. Second and one passing situation. And a fake flip. First down to the 45-yard line. Wilbur Jackson. Well, they had, big pitch out. They had two tight ends in there and they went for the first, got first down. Try to get the first down. We call that a switch block. Picked it up. Good, good sound play. Get the first down. Bill Francis, number 48, who played for Walsh at Stanford, is in the game, and that could usually mean one thing, George. He's a good receiver. They like to throw it over. They like to pass period when Francis is in there. First and 10 at the 45-yard line of San Diego. The flip to Simpson, looking for blockers. Fumbles, and it's recovered by number 27 for the Chargers. Len Edwards, Sim Simpson fumbles, and Len Edwards recovers. But let's see if the whistle blew. The offensive team is still out there. And the penalty marker is down there, and it looks to be against San Diego. It is. It's against the Chargers. What a break for the 49ers. This was a quick toss to Simpson. And again, the helmet from offside pursuit on the ball caused the fumble. Number 79, defense, offside. Gary Johnson, the defensive right tackle, was offside, so the 49ers get a life here, and instead of losing the ball, they have a good situation at first and five at the San Diego 40-yard line. Mike Schumann, number 84, to the bottom of your pitcher. DeBerg looks over the defense. Paul Hofer is in the game as well, number 36. And a play-action pass, and DeBerg flips it Bill Francis was the receiver, but it was off his hands. Did he throw it a little bit too hard? He did. He, he threw that ball hard, and the nose was down. Now, Francis has good hands, and is a fine receiver. We've been looking at Leroy Jones, 6'8", as a defensive end, but here's how they handle it. Well, they got, they got two men on him. They got McAfee and, and Fonhurst. That, they made a good trade when they got Jones from the Rams. He's going to help their ball club. He already has. Solomon wide left. Schumann wide right. Second and five. Movement in the line. We saw Wilbur Young, but was he drawn off? That's the question. Wilbur Young moved for San Diego. Number 99 Young, but it That's might have been the center. And that, it's going to be against the Chargers. When that happens, usually the defense is guessing. They're going on on cadence going on the quarterback's voice 79 defense Johnson offside, again that's the second time down. and it's given the 49ers two first downs George you can't make mistakes like that at the 35 yard line 49ers after playing some clubs very tough regressed a bit against New Orleans but they're looking good so far here in San Diego first and ten cutting through the middle OJ Simpson and Simpson gets to the 25-yard line. He's oh. very close to a first down. I tell you what, I like what the 49ers are doing. They're running the football. They're establishing the running game. They're mixing in a short passing game. You got a big hole here. Simpson put a move on. Looked like the Simpson of old a little bit. George, you wonder why the Chargers didn't come out with the running game with this situation instead of passing it. It's cost them so far. Yes, it has. First and 10 at the 24-yard line. So Simpson got the yard. It's Paul Hofer, 36, is in the game. Ken McAfee, 81, is the tight end. In motion is Phil Francis. DeBerg is back. Up the middle. Complete to Freddie Solomon. Solomon inside the 20-yard line, and he's driven. Out of bounds by Mike Williams. But it'll be another first down, I believe, for the 49ers. Let's see where they spot the ball. Well, they used motion on this play. The bird goes backside. A hook pattern to Freddie Solomon. 
He didn't realize he was covered so loose. He turned around and put it in overdrive. Another first down. Wilbur Jackson, number 40, checks into the game. Bob Brewer, the tight end, 82, as they're alternating all three tight ends, the 49ers are. First and 10 at the 14. This is a test for a club. They move the ball, but can they go in? Hammer it in there. Three tight ends are in there now, out of the eye. Wilbur Jackson to the 10-yard line. Well, I think what they're doing there is good. They're going straight ahead. They got three tight ends, and M. Man for man blocking. You're going to see Fuller make the tackle. He is a 5'9 strong safety, but he loves to hit number 42. He has some help in the secondary it, by Leroy Jones. Give it to your best back that can go straight ahead, your most powerful runner. So Bill Walsh, who was an assistant at Cincinnati, coached at Stanford for a couple of years, mixing them up. Second and six at the 10 yard line. Francis and Simpson. And it's O.J. going wide, penalty marker is down, as Simpson is piled up at the five-yard line, but a penalty marker down against the 49ers backfield in motion. You, you can't have penalties like that when you get down inside the 20-yard line. Just can't have it. That's how you beat yourself. O.J. Simpson gained 25 yards last week against the Saints, 73 against the Rams. Illegal motion, number 32 offense. It was O.J. who was guilty there, so this is what we're looking for. Can the 49ers get some points on the board, and that penalty hurt them. Pete Shaw, number 44, is in at safety. Fuller is out, second and 11 now. The ball at the 15. Hope for 36 is in the game. Second and 11. In motion goes Hofer. Gaber looking to throw. He loops it off the fingertips of Bill Francis, and that was one he should have had. Yeah, well, they, they got a one-on-one -on -one situation. The ball was thrown before Francis realized it. Francis wasn't looking. Then he saw the ball the last minute. Watch him. He should have had it. It was a tough catch. Was behind him. Francis, of course, was a wide receiver. Good protection. At Stanford under Walsh, they moved him for the purpose of being a back as a receiver. And as you pointed out, George, he waited a little bit too long. So it'll be third and ten now at the 15-yard line. A timeout called by the 49ers. They want to take their time and try to get in if they can. We'll be back in a moment. You have it. Is it meshing all right with you, yeah. George? You have Fine. over 4,500 feet Fine. We do listen to suggestions. We don't take them, but we do listen to suggestions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're going to have to throw again now. So we can get get uh, tight end. Yeah. Well, I. Uh, what 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 do we got? Third and ten. Third and eleven. Yeah. Well. Solomon or the tight end. Tight end, maybe a uh, curl in the middle or something. 85. Seal. Uh, Let's see, they're coming in with 20. Dwight Clark is in, 87. 20 is a uh, rookie oh, wide receiver. Oh, oh, and the racehorse. Well, Bill Walsh is bringing in some speedsters here at third and 10 at the 15. James Owens from UCLA, number 20, and number 87, Dwight Clark, a high draft choice as a wide receiver. What do you think he has in mind, George? Well, with 20 in there, if I were on defense, I'd look for a reverse or some sort of a gadget. Freddie Solomon also in there, and Phil Francis. So right now, Bill Walsh has five solid receivers in the lineup third and ten to 15. and he's got solomon as a running back don't forget solomon as the bay area fans know can be used as a passer he now moves into the slot third and ten here comes the rush on the bird he was hit the pass incomplete it was intended for dwight clark the rookie who just entered the game and a severe oh. pass rush Ray Preston well, blitzing from linebacker watch, caused a bird problem. Watch Dwight Clark. I don't know whether we can see it jump too soon. 
He had a chance to get this. Now watch him jump too soon. He's coming down when he should have been going up. So it's fourth and ten, and in a scoreless game, Ray Worshing, who is four for four, or six for eight in field goal attempts, will attempt from the 23, a 33-yard kick for Ray Worshing here. And the kick is good. So the San Francisco 49ers, who are underdogs coming into this game on paper, have struck first blood with 11.39 to play as Ray Worshing splits the uprights for a 3-0 lead. Immediately following our football telecast, we'll go to Akron, Ohio for the World Series of Golf. Larry Nelson, the leader, but look who's lurking behind. Along with Bill Rogers, there is Tom Watson. First down for the Bears. 11.04 remaining. Latta brought the play in for Neil Armstrong. Earl and Peyton, the running back. Vince Evans, the quarterback, play action. Green pass. Peyton, running hard. Peyton's got room. And then Peyton turns on his feet. It looked like he had it, had it, uh, had him trapped her for a moment. He carries it with one hand, gets through the hole, turns on the speed. Good block by Golden Richards downfield. You'll see him out in front. And then Peyton just dives. He started to cut back and then decided, I'm going to fly the rest away from the five yard on line on. He flew five yards into the end zone for the touchdown. Thomas for the point after. It's good. And so the Chicago Bears who have been hibernating for most of this football game offensively have got themselves in front with 10.50 to go regulation time. The Bears 13 and the Buccaneers 10. Back in Dallas, Texas, we're about set for second quarter action. First quarter stats very revealing. 
104 total yards by Dallas. Tony Dorsett has 81 of them, all on the ground in eight carries. Cincinnati in a goal line defense, 72 Mac Mitchell, 63 Mike White, 52 Tom Dinkle are all in there. Ken Riley is a lone back. They've got four linebackers and six down linemen. Second and goal! And to the goal line, I am waiting for the official signal. Staubach tried to sneak it in, but he did not get there. That was pretty tricky. That was Fitzgerald and uh, Roger Staubach all by themselves. Nobody else was even down in their stance. Sam, I might tell you one thing. Tony Dorsett holds the single game rushing record for Dallas, which is 206 yards. He has amassed 81 yards so far in the first quarter for Dallas. Keep an eye on that statistic. So we're just a, probably the length of the football shy of the goal line. Third down and goal Dallas. They lead it seven to three. Early second, second quarter. Late Law is the other back. In motion, Late Law. Touchdown Dallas. Same player. Two touchdowns, both the same play. Both the tight end in motion. Both the tight end in motion on Wilson Whitley, just trying to trap him. They let him come across the line of scrimmage. Salda gets him out of the way just a little bit. Laidlaw up the middle for another touchdown. Laidlaw reminds me a great deal, not so much in style, but in uh, accomplishment of Don McCauley at Baltimore. He produces. Very consistent. We'll do anything offensively for you to get it in the end zone. Seven touchdowns in six games last year, replacing Robert Newhouse. He's got two today, and Seption will try to make it 14-3. to three. Placement, kick is up, and it is good. So the Cowboys, after trailing early on 3-0, have answered with two touchdowns. Randy Hughes, the catalyst, the 68-yard interception, will return to Texas Stadium in a moment. Working pretty well. Arthur Whittington and Otis Sistrunk. Right and left on your picture and part of the walking wounded along the Raider sidelines. Two outstanding players, and they've got a lot of company, unfortunately, on that Red Cross list. First down at the 20 for Denver. They trail Oakland 7-0 with 9.24 remaining in the first half. Jim Jensen, Otis Armstrong in the backfield, and that's Jensen. Up the middle for three, maybe four, goes the three-year back from the University of Iowa. Claudie Miner, number 71. Deck, uh, real concern for the Denver Broncos. Had gout, had a real problem with his foot. Woke up with uh, so much pain uh, in the evening that he had to go to the hospital and have x-rays. And there was real doubt about whether he would be able to play today. They would have missed him because that would have meant putting another rookie into the lineup and shifting Stuttered over to the other side. They're happy uh, the problem is apparently abated for the time. Second and seven from the 23, Lytle and Jensen behind Weiss. Complete intended for Riley Odoms, a late flag, and they're going to call Villa Piano for an early bump. I was wondering why the flag hadn't been dropped because he clearly did bump Riley Odoms before that ball was there. Uh, Villa Piano uh, really more effective against the run out of that middle position than against the pass, and usually they try and put Monty Johnson in there. He was in an impossible position. How do you possibly defend a man like Odoms on that play once he gets in front of you? Well, you can't. I guess he did whatever he had to do, which was to bump him. <laughs> hoped, he, uh, hoped he wouldn't be called on the play, but of course he was. And Well, they didn't give up that many yards. Uh, if you're lucky, the official's not in a position to see that one, Dick. Villa Piano with that musical name, and he has some musical talent. He plays the accordion and the tuba. His father plays the violin. His brothers play the trumpet and drum, so they got a little band going for them whenever they congregate back east. First down from the 26. Jensen, the only running back. And they were waiting for it. Villa Piano led the defensive charge for the Raiders. That's his kind of music. That's the kind of thing he does best. Very quick reaction by Villa Piano. They shot Martin to the inside, uh, forced Jensen out, forced him wide, and Villa Piano scraped to the outside, was right there to make the tackle, forces him into a sure passing situation. We'll see some changes in their lineup as they insert their pass defense. Monty Johnson goes in, fifth defensive back Davis goes in. Using a four-man rush, Tume, 67 in at one end. Play action on the draw. 
Flag down. Odoms has the catch at the 40. And finally wrestled down by three of the Raiders. It would be a first down, but hold on. Let's go back to the flag dropped at the 20-yard line. Uh, Dave Pear in there pointing at Tom Glassick saying, hey, you can't hold me like that. That's what the officials say, too. <laughs> yes, they did. As a matter of fact. Oh, that's a big play, too. You lose the yardage of the possible uh, first down. Watch it for yourself in there. Glassick would be on the right side. There he is right there. They're calling, apparently, the hold on the leg. You saw number 74 pair going inside. And as I said, you lose not only the 15 yards. Take down offense. You lose not only the yardage of the pass, but also the 15 yards on the penalty, 10 yards on the penalty. Yeah, the ball was out about the 41-yard line. Instead, it's back at the 13. So that's a 28-yard penalty, and not just a 10-yard penalty. That's the kind that really hurts you. Second down. will accommodate that Raider defense looking for the throw. Odom oh. not quite there at the 27 yard line. Mike Davis 36 second year back from Colorado on the coverage. Alan you would like to have had Craig Morton there to throw the pass. He's a better passer than Weiss but Weiss didn't miss the mark by far. Unfortunately uh, anything out of their hands is not a reception. Davis there a little bit late would not have been able to cover him. Babe Perilli to the right of Red Miller. 20th year of the American Football League, the old teams, Broncos and the Raiders. Oh, they've had some battles, some wars in those two decades. And here they are again today. 7.45 left, second quarter. 7-0 Oakland, third down, 21. Raiders have two of their backs, 15 yards downfield. Weiss. Needs a big chunk. Tatum was coming up. He had his eyes on an interception. It was intended for the rookie Steve Watson, 81, overthrown, and the Raiders will get the football. And you get an idea of how these Raider fans feel about their Raiders. They were a little bit worried about the reception they'd get, having lost three ball games in a row, but they're doing well today, and their fans appreciate that. Prestridge back to punt. His first kick was for 40 yards. Matthew stands at his own 48. Oh, Hayes didn't get the ball, but he got the kicker. There'll be a roughing call. Matthews at his 35, 40, and that's all. But that one's going to be brought back and a penalty against the Broncos as Hayes actually was too close to the kicker. Had he been farther away from the foot, he would have blocked it. You've got to go to the point where that ball is going to come off the foot of the kicker. Hayes made the mistake of getting in too tight, as you said. Watch him here. He's coming in. He's got to go across in front of that ball. Had he done that, he probably would have blocked it. As it is, big penalty. First and ten. You stop people like that, and you make a, a play like that. Hey, that's the kind of thing that, that uh, Oakland and just got a break on that. Now Denver gets a break. If they can go down and score, they put themselves back into the ball game. Not by day, bemoans Hayes. That could have been six points for us. I was that close. Instead, Denver maintains possession, and Craig Morton, number seven, has just ducked his head into the Bronco huddle. Brett Miller said he wouldn't be afraid if he had a situation that called for Morton. Apparently, this one calls for Morton. And reflecting back on that last play, that's another one of those dumb plays that we don't like to see on either side of the line of scrimmage. First down, Denver. Gets across their own 18-yard line. Morton's first time in the saddle today. Sends his backs in the pattern. Incomplete to Upchurch, but a flag is down at the 35-yard line in the secondary of the Raiders. Morton's first throw just off target. The number one draft pick out of California by the Dallas Cowboys in 1965. Holding is the call against the Raiders. Five yards and a first down go with it. Raiders, Raiders have had trouble, as we'd indicated, in their defensive backfield. Defense number 41, first down. Villapiano undoubtedly hawking Odoms again. Maybe we can look at what Villapiano did to get that penalty. He's not allowed to chuck the man when he gets by him. 
And it looked like he did get by him and then gave him a little extra push there. And I think that's what he was called for. 24-yard line of Denver. First down. The Broncos trail the Raiders 7-0. 725 left in the first half. 25 Moses in motion. Armstrong threw a big hole. Gets out near the 30-yard line. Or he's hit by Rod Martin, 53, and Jack Tatum, 32. Got an idea of the movement from Villapiano. Comes quickly to the side. Claudy Miner, number 71, right there to stick him and drive him back. But Otis Armstrong ran right over the top of him. Well, oh, there's some good physical action down on that field today. Some good hitting going on. Give Armstrong five yards, second and five. Moses left, up church right. Boy, what a comeback. They say it was one of the most exciting games ever in Denver last week as they rallied to beat Seattle. And it was Morton's arm that did it. He's back to throw. Incomplete. Intended for Lytle, and it's a good thing it was too high because Ted Hendricks had him well covered. Mad Stork over there with his arms up high and uh, Lytle with no chance. Morton certainly not starting his first series here with the hot hand he dealt with last week. There's Norris Weiss on the sideline. Probably he's wonders, not, wonders how I got here. He's, <laughs> he's not happy, obviously, I, being there. I got seven points for us. I don't think I made that many mistakes, and here I am on the sideline. Four of eight, not that bad, 57 yards. But Miller uh, obviously got over that feeling that he couldn't change quarterbacks quite a while ago, and he's been doing it for two years now with, with mixed success. Third and five, the Raiders have their giant end, Silvio, 6'9", in there for the first time. He wears 77. Morton, lots of time. And he hits Riley Odoms. No, he was out of bounds. Just missed. Odoms didn't get both feet down. A close call, but the official was right on the spot. We'll see it again. Let you look at it. Morton again, back with time to throw. And he puts this one right on the money. He looks across and then back. A nice pass, but watch Odoms here. One foot down, right there. But the second one, obviously out of bounds. And they can't count that way. Tried to drag that right toe, but I guess he just missed with it. Ira Matthews back at the 30-yard line of Oakland. Press bridge to kick. Short. Matthews, good return possibilities at the 40, but can't quite get up in time. So a short kick. The Raiders come up with good field position. 6.24 remaining in this first half. And hold on, we have a flag down, and it's against the Oakland Raiders. Oh, it has been raining mistakes here in the first half. See if this one does. You cannot afford to, uh, to make that kind of an error against this. Well, no, it's not going to. It's after the uh, change of possession, after the ball is kicked, so they're not going to take the ball away from them. But they'll still march it back 10 yards. So it'll be first down, Oakland at the 30, not the 40, and we do have a timeout. 6:24 remaining in the first half at the Coliseum in Oakland, where the Raiders have a seven-nothing lead over the Broncos. Take a look at the end of that screen pass again as Peyton takes it with one hand. You have to have big hands to carry a ball that way because your, your arm is going up and down, up and down. A lot of people would drop the ball, but not Walter. And then this last five yards is really beautiful for anybody, even if you're a Tampa Bay rooter. As Golden Richards out front, and Peyton takes off from the five and flies in for the touchdown. And there he is, sweetness, they call him. Noah Jackson says, nice job. Thomas will kick it off. Tim Ryan and Johnny Morris here at Soldier Field. A low bouncing kick is taken by the linebacker Dana Nafziger. Nafziger does a good job getting up over the 45 to the 46 yard line and the Bucks start with good field position. Johnny, what do you think? Were they trying to stay away from the return or did he just miss kick it? I think they just didn't want to take a chance on, uh, I don't, I'm sure he didn't miss kick it. They just didn't want anybody to get a full head of steam. Now, the Bears have not blitzed all that much in this game. There it is, another one-play drive, 65 yards, this time by Chicago. We might see a little bit more blitzing because Williams hasn't seen too much of it in this game. Spivey continues at the corner for Terry Smith, who suffered an injury earlier in the game with elbow. Ricky Bell, straight ahead, running hard, picked up about seven. Hampton and Hicks, the linebacker, 99 and 54 on the tackle. Good hard run by Bell behind Greg Robertson, the center, Steve Wilson. You go back to that field goal attempt by 
O'Donohue that uh, when he hit the upright turns out to be a very big one inch miss there. Well, it was a big one inch uh, good one for Bob Thompson. <laughs> 10 14 to go at his second and a little more than three and motion back to the ball Jones Eckwood close to the first down but not quite there he'll have less than a yard to go Osborne made the tackle number 68 Williams signaling over to John McKay that uh, less than a yard to go right out comes in defensively for the Bears to give them five down lineman the linebacker Campbell comes out on the third and short Eckwood goes out for the Buccaneers and Obradovich is in double tight two tight ends in for Tampa Bay Bell has the first down Spencer to kicks him but the Bucks keep it going and they're in Bears territory at the 44 yard line 9-17 remaining in the fourth quarter. There is the sophomore pro, Doug Williams from Grambling, 6'4", 215 pounds. Their number one pick a year ago. They don't roll him out so much as uh, they used to. Last year, the Tampa Bay beat Chicago on Doug Williams rolling out and throwing on the run. That's because he had to to save his skin. <laughs> <laughs> They've got some more protection. First down, Tampa Bay. Ricky Bell, the lead back, and good running by Bell. He had a good hole behind Greg Horton and the center, Wilson. Then he exploded through two Bear defenders and had the first down. Five in, Hicks finally got him down. Some good power running by Bell as he comes back and watch him collide with 58 is in there. And then he just turns it on, breaks out of the grabs, and they were just dragging. Tom Hicks, number 54, dragged him down. Ricky Bell wanted that yardage. Boy, that Hicks is uh, not easy to drag at 6'4", 235. He's a strong guy, pumps a lot of iron. First down, the Buck on the move now. at the 31 of Chicago. Eckwood. Eckwood cannot break the tackle. It was Campbell and Hicks, the linebackers, combining on him, 59 and 54. He got maybe a yard. Now well, they're going to give him a little more. Let's call it a two-yard gain, second and eight. Kansas City in front of Seattle, seven to three. The Chiefs coming alive the last couple of weeks. Marv Levy's squad uh, doing a whole lot of rebuilding. Rookie quarterback, Fuller. Seattle been struggling a bit. Figured to be doing better this year. Second and eight. The motion is over. Eckwood taking it outside. Rags one tackler, Hartenstein, and picked up about three more yards on the play to make it third and five before Fensick finally stopped it. He came very close to breaking that one. You know, it's ironic, you know, Tampa Bay controlled that first half a couple, three times. They came so close to scoring, uh, breaking the game open. They settled for that uh, seven-point lead at the half, and now they cannot afford a mistake. Osborne out, extra linebacker in. Third and five. A little less than five for the first down. Sideliner complete. Did he have it inbound? Yes, he did. Gordon Jones, the rookie wide receiver from Pittsburgh. Spivey on the coverage. That was very close to not being totally in control inbound. It is a first down at the 16. An excellent pass protection. Williams had plenty of time to throw the ball. Didn't use his body. He went up with his hands, and he had control. I believe he did have control. Well, it was very close. And the official was right at the sideline, and the Bucks keep it alive, and that's all that's official at this point. 13 to 10, the Bears lead. 6.39 to go in the fourth period. Tim Ryan and Johnny Moore. As this game has really picked up the tempo here in this fourth quarter. Ricky Bell. Ricky Bell off tackle. Batters his way for about five, maybe six yards. They sure run a lot of pitches, don't they? They've got Johnny Davis in there to help lead on the blocking. Barry Fensick made the tackle again. He's been a busy man against the run in the Bears secondary. We'll call it about a five-yard gain, just a little under that, it would appear, from the marker. John McKay 
keeping the sun off his head with that hat. Calling the plays. High formation. Davis, number 38, the lead back. Davis, the ball carrier, straight ahead. Short of the first down. Picked up maybe four yards before being thrown back. Allen Cage to tackle number 82. Main man on the play. Hampton was there. Helping out. Neil Armstrong, the Bears coach. Hoping for his defense to make the big play here on third and about two. And now the decision for John McKay. If he's going to go for it twice, he runs twice into the line. Is he going to take the risk on the pass, go for the touchdown, and then settle for the field goal? That's his decision. He trails by three. He's got Davis out on Eckwood back in. Two wide receivers. Wide right, Hagan. Wide left, Owen. Williams will throw. Pump once. He's got him open. Touchdown. Oh. Hagan over Spivey. And the Tampa Bay Buccaneers go back in front. And Doug Williams showing his enormous poise. Very coolly found the open man. That's the play they wanted. And was he open? Yes, he was. He went down on the flag, went in on the quick goal, and then turned to the outside. You notice the pump by Williams, and he was wide open as he beat Spivey. Spivey was going to the inside. And, of course, Spivey hasn't been playing that much on the corner. He's replaced uh, Terry Schmidt, who was injured earlier in the game. Now, this here is a big point, a very big point, extra point. It's 16-13 right now. Neil O'Donohue with Blanchard holding. And it's good. And so the... Well, flag down. Is there a flag down on the play? Flag or a towel. Doesn't look like it's a flag. Just a towel. All right. And so... It is 17 to 13 for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. 5:07 to go, regulation time.
There you see the stats on the scoring drive for Dallas. Their second touchdown in that drive of 69 yards. They had seven first downs. Interesting in saying that in the first quarter, Roger Staubach, as you said, was one for six with one interception. Kenny Anderson, four for eight for one interception. And here's Raphael Seption to kick it to Browner, 21, Turner, 22, Nathan Poole, 35. And he drilled it right at Turner. About three yards deep in the end zone. 15, 20, crosses the 20 to about the 23-yard line and stopped by number 81, Steve Wilson, and number 84, Doug Cosby, a couple of rookies, 25 yards on the return, and the Bengals will set up shop at their own 22-yard line. Don't forget that uh, NFL 79 uh, moves into the sixth week of the season next Sunday. Full schedule of regional coverage games. NFL 79 at 3.30. Our 3.30 games of Steelers and Cleveland. Won't that be something? Mm. Trumpy and I will be in Denver. San Diego, Denver. That should be an outstanding ball game. And the Jets at Baltimore. Then at 4.30, Seattle and San Francisco. Preceded, of course, by NBC's coverage of the baseball playoffs. Alexander reaches the 25-yard line. The rookie out of LSU, a couple of yards stopped by Larry Cole. And you know, oddly enough, Bob, the left side was supposed to be suspect with the retirement of Too Tall Jones, and, or rather, the retirement of both Too Tall and, and Jethro Pugh. But Cole and Dave Stalls have upheld uh, their end of the bargain. Stalls has been a surprise for him. Larry Cole has played consistent football for this football team for an awful long time. I think it's his 13th year in professional football. And he tries desperately not to get any publicity. If there has been a disappointment along the front line, it's been 54. The man they say is the best defensive tackle in the game, Randy White. He has not played up the par. Throws it out here, Isaac Curtis, and he can't get it. Badly thrown pass. The pressure was on Anderson. And for just the fifth time in five games, they threw at Isaac Curtis. If he's not open and takes something away, you're wasting a receiver. Kreider, the young man in there now, is an excellent receiver. I imagine he'll get a lot more business. Third down and eight for Anderson. Over the middle, Kreider couldn't hold on. He got his hands on it. And they say if you get your hands on the football, you should catch the pass. It may have been high, but Kreider is the rookie out of Lehigh. And in defense of Kreider, that's the first pass that's been thrown in his direction as a pro. So you are going to be a little nervous. Kenny zipped that one in there, too. That's three downs and out again. So Steve Wilson, number 81, is back in single safety. McAnally, number 87, to punt it for Cincinnati. McAnally was the number one punter in the National Football League. I know you thought that distinction always belonged to Ray Guy of Oakland, but this guy just went out and just clean beat him last year. And an excellent punt driving Wilson back to the 22. Looking for the blocking. Got to the 30-yard line and knocked out there by Jim Browner, the Notre Dame rookie. 54 yards on the punt by McAnally. So the United States with their best gymnasts against the best from the rest of the world, Japan and the People's Republic of China in the Pacific Gymnastics Championships in the car lift featured next week and the world's strongest man on the CBS Sports Spectacular will be in Portland for the gymnastics competition. A line drive kick taken by Artie Owens. Owens to the 25. 32-yard line. Owens had a fine 40-yard return to start the game, but it's the 49ers who have taken the play away so far, George. That last drive, they went 82 yards and 13 plays, took the three to nothing lead. The drive consumed six minutes and 32 seconds. So that's what you want to do. We talked about keeping the ball away from the Charger offense, and that's what they did. There it is. Three to nothing, San Francisco leading. First and 10 at the 32 for the Chargers. The capacity crowd quieted down considerably. Larry Burton, number 87, formerly with New Orleans, and a wide receiver along with Charlie Joyner, 18. So Jefferson's on the bench right now. Bounce gives to Clarence Williams. Tough runner inside is Clarence Williams, who is leading the Chargers in rushing and pass receiving. He picks up a couple. Middle linebacker Dan Buns makes the tackle. Well, Danny Buns, a first-round choice, is, is playing with an injury. We uh, had a report that he might not play today. Let's everybody know that he's he's tough mentally and wants to play and wants to win. He's gonna he's gonna be a good football player when he gets a little more experience. It's an inexperienced linebacker call, with the exception of Willie Harper, with Scott Hilton, and the pass. Out to Mike Thomas on the flat. Thomas gets up. 
and has a first down. Mike Thomas. Maybe short of a yard. We'll check. Did that on his own with those quick feet. Let's watch this. Fouts going back, looking downfield. Nobody open. Dumps it off to Mike Thomas. Now watch his footwork. He's always on balance. Always on balance. Short of a first down, it'll be third and one. Number 88, Greg McCrary is in the ball game now. Ralph Peretta, number 53, has come in at guard as well. Third and one at the 41-yard line. Bout, getting rushed and hit hard as he lost it up to Mike Thomas. And the pass out of bounds completed. Well, for a first down to Thomas right near the sideline. What a rush he got from Gerard Williams. Well, from the back side. Good, good rush. He just, just got the ball off, and Mike Thomas is an excellent receiver. He made a couple of catches uh, in Dallas one year when we upset the Cowboys. 18-yard pickup for Thomas, who has averaged 18 yards a catch, which is pretty uh, good for a back. When they picked him up for a fifth draft choice, they made a heck of a trade. Larry Burton to the top of your screen. Charlie Joyner to the bottom. First and 10 at the 41. First back through is Williams. He picks up about three yards. Second and seven. As you pointed out, George, last week, the Chargers did not run well in their loss to the Patriots. They fell behind 20 to nothing. They, I think that, that that's probably their goal. That should be number, one of their number one goals this ball game to, to make 150 yards rushing to establish the running game because then the passing game will go against Buffalo in the previous game Williams scored four touchdowns and they rushed well Winslow trying to get away from a shoestring play by Tim Gray picks up a couple of yards so it'll be third and about five one thing about Winslow he's a consistent four seven runner now that's real good speed for anybody especially a guy his size he's got the speed to play outside and he's got the size and the strength to play inside. Third down and five. Dwayne Board, number 76, Al Cowling, 79, in there to put some pressure on Faust. Third and five at the 37. Three to nothing, the 49ers lead, 8.45 to go in the first half. Flips it out to Williams. Can Williams get away? He does to the 30-yard line. First down inside the 30-yard line. Some good running outside by Clarence Williams. And Cowlings makes the tackle downfield with help of Dan Bunn. Let's Willie Harper, the strong side linebacker. Well, Willie Harper did all he could do there. He has to turn the play in. He's the contain man. He gets blocked out, but he turned it in. Now you need inside pursuit on the runner. The 49ers have not defensed that play properly today. The 29-yard line, Charlie Joyner, number 18, is split to the left. Williams, hampered back there and stopped. Archie Reese just burst through and made a key play for the 49ers. You know, it's a good thing he did because Harper was a little bit late getting over there. And Harper was off the line and could have been hooked. Nice play by Archie Reese. This 49er defense... Now watch Harper late getting over there. See, he's not even he's not even set, and he was he was handled. Archie saved him there. Mike Thomas may have an injured shoulder as you look at the end of that play. Harper's been a consistent linebacker of the 49ers, having his trouble so far. Artie Owens, number 24, is in the game now. Second and 14 at the 33. Bounce with enough time. Tries to flip it against Kellen Winslow. Winslow bucks his way to a first down. What? Second effort strength by Kellen Winslow out of the University of Missouri. He can go wide. He's a tight end, and there you see why he's a blue chipper. And the crowd is on its feet following that 15-yard gain. Well, what, what Fouts and Winslow did, Fouts, a lot of poise, uses Winslow, Winslow's height there. Now watch him throw the ball up. He's covered. He went up and took it. Now he... Driving hard and picked up the first down. Now that's the finesse that you learn as you get experience as a quarterback. Good, good throw. First and ten at the 18. Chargers moving. They trail the 49ers. Three to nothing. Williams. 
backs his way inside the 15-yard line. Scott Hilton, number 55, the free agent linebacker rookie, makes the stop with Harper. So now it looks as if the Chargers have a more balanced yes. attack with more they, running. They are. They have the 49ers on defense. And by that, I mean they got the 49ers thinking, we have to stop the run, we have to stop the pass. Then, Don you're, then you're on defense. Excuse me, Don Coriel, coached at San Diego State. He's had a winning record, a solid record. Second and six at the 14-yard line for the Chargers. Quick toss to Kellen Winslow, one-on-one. -on -one. Winslow gets inside the five to the three, and another first down. Winslow's been a key man, and they've been isolating him one-on-one, -on -one, Mel Morgan and Hartman. You have to play him a little tighter. Gray played him a little loosely here and then missed the tackle. Let's see if we can see that. See, now he comes up. He missed the tackle. You've got to play this big guy tighter than that if you're going to stop him. How do you like the way Winslow carries that ball? He likes to hold it out, yeah. but he thinks he has some uh, room. First and goal at the three. Hank Bauer, good short yardage man, number 37, is in in the backfield. The fans love him in these situations, but it's Clarence Williams' touchdown. Clarence Williams has tied Paul Lowe's record, nine touchdowns rushing for the San Diego Chargers. He is the leading scorer in the NFL, and San Diego, moving the ball smartly, has taken the lead. Well, San Diego did what they had to do to get a touchdown. They hammered away. They gave the ball to their best back, the best straight-ahead runner. This guy, I can see why everybody's so high on him. He's a powerful runner, tough, good balance, and that's why he has nine touchdowns. They open up a big hole, and now Roy Girella, who had a field goal blocked in the first quarter with Fuller holding, will try to give the Chargers a 7-3 lead. Five minutes and four seconds remain in the first half in a surprisingly tight, hard-fought ball game. And Girella's kick is good. So the San Diego Chargers, after a rough offensive Start have recovered and they have the lead seven to three. Back in Dallas, Texas, Irving, Texas, to be exact. The Cowboys leading the Cincinnati Bengals 14 to three, and Dallas will go to work at its own 31-yard line. Drew Pearson split wide right. Tony Hill to the left. Dorsett dots the eye, takes the pitch from Staubach. the stop and why Bob Pumpy is Dorsett getting outside so easily well that was a block by Jay Saldy who is not only a tight end but also a split receiver at 228 pounds there's the final 31 10 let's go ahead Sam I'll tell you later have. Houston 31 10 Redskins beat Atlanta 16 7 one of the two big upsets of the day the Jets over Miami by six New Orleans has beaten the Giants by 10 the second big upset Philadelphia 17 14 over Pittsburgh Minnesota 13 to 10 over Detroit. More in just a moment. First down Dallas. Dorsett got the 10 yards and a little bit more. Play action. Throws it out here to Tony Hill and he threw it in behind him. Ken Riley might have had the interception. And Staubach is not throwing the ball well today at all. Let's continue with the scores. Fourth quarter, Buffalo blowing out the windless Baltimore Colts. Also in the fourth, the Bears blood over the St. Louis Cardinals. That does it. Second down and 10, 14 to 3 here, Dallas leading Cincinnati. Straight ahead, Jim LeClaire making the stop on Laidlaw. So it'll be third down and long now for Staubach, who is one for eight in the passing department. Sam, one of the real pluses for the Dallas offense, something that Cincinnati really suffers from, that is that Dallas, with the running back like Tony Dorsett, they use a lot of play action. They keep the linebackers up tight, and therefore the wide receivers can get 10 yards down the field and be relatively open. Cincinnati really doesn't have the running game to go to and use play action to keep those linebackers up. Cowboys are three out of four in third down conversions uh, thus far. This is second quarter action, and they are moving into the sun. Shotgun used for the first time today. Staubach has a man. Preston Pearson, he couldn't hold on. Bo Harris had the coverage, and Pearson came up a little lame. He is limping. Danny White kicking it to Vaughn Luster. Good hang time. Inside the 10, Henderson tipped it back, and they kill it at the two. Well, Thomas 
Henderson is the first to tell you that he's a remarkable athlete and he just proved it. <laughs> Not the least bit modern. Hollywood Henderson, 55 yards on the punt. Vaughn Leslie on the fair catch signal. And Henderson has the presence of mind to stay out of the end zone. If his feet touch the end zone, he's a very gifted athlete. And it's also amazing he's the starting linebacker and still loves to play on a special team. So the Bengals trailing 14 to 3, but that's not the worst news. Solid drive for Tampa Bay. 54 yards and 10 plays using up 5.43 on the clock, culminating in the touchdown pass from eight yards out to Hagan. And a 17 to 13 lead. Back to the four point margin. A Donahue kickoff taken by Ricky Watt. Watt gets to the 20 yard line, met there by three or four Tampa Bay tacklers. Or by uh, three or four of the Bucks uh, trying to take that ball away from him. Well, here's an interesting statistic, John. The Bucks came into the game with the poorest third down offense in the entire NFL. They came in at 24%, 15 of 62. But today, they're 10 of 19 on third down. And in a couple of key situations, particularly the last one, they kept the drive alive with third down conversion. Bell has rushed for 48 yards. Eckwood for 118 yards for Tampa Bay. First down, Bears. Let's see what they can get going here. Evan complete and immediately Peyton is hit by Cecil Johnson by a Dewey Selman number 58 I think they'll be looking for Walter out of that backfield for the rest of this game five yard gain to Peyton Latta brings the play in Cobb comes to the Bears sideline Williams is 14 for 31 168 yards one touchdown, one interception. That came in the end zone on the final play of the first half. They're not going to let Scott stay man for man out here. Richards in motion. They haven't thrown to him all day. They go to Peyton out of the backfield. He has the first down. Walter Peyton, Richard Wood stopped him out at the 35-yard line. Now let's correct our interceptions on Williams. He has had two interceptions. Liburn's picked off another one. They're going to have to watch for Walter out of the backfield because, like with some, a lot of other teams, you let the big fullback or average back catch it out of the backfield. You can get these good linebackers who can stop them for two and three-yard gains. But Peyton is so elusive and so explosive that they're going to have to start worrying about playing him inside-outside with the linebackers coming out of the backfield. Somebody waiting for him specifically or the Bears could go right down the field. Dewey Selman being helped to the sidelines over there. Holding his left arm, it appears. Aaron Brown, number 55, has come in to replace him at left inside linebacker. Don't forget 60 minutes tonight. Fidel Castro talks with Dan Rather. In motion is the tight end, Latta. And Evan uh -oh. in traffic, loose ball, and a rule. in their number 63 and the play was called before the ball came loose evidently Walter Payton having quite a day as usual 88 yards via the pass route he's rushed for 46 yards did you see Noah Jackson pick up the hanky for the official <laughs> that was nice of him he wouldn't have if the penalty had been against the Bears you can bet on that <laughs> It is against the Buccaneers. Let's hear referee Gordon McCarter. Face mask, number 60, defense. Five yard penalty, automatic first down. Well, it's against Walter Raleigh Chambers as Peyton was wide open over the middle again. Here comes Chambers from the outside as Evans tries to. Well, I didn't pick it up, did you? Well, that's why the ball came loose. Yeah, he grabbed him by the mask as he had his arm up yeah. and pulled him around, and uh, that caused Evans to drop the ball. Evans back to pass. He's got Golden Richards open. 
Richards out of bounds at the 38, a gain of about seven on the play. First pass today to Golden Richards. Second down. Three yards to go for a first down. 3.29 to play. Tim Ryan and Johnny Morris. We've got a thrilling finish here with the Buccaneers leading by four. And they have to wait for the play to come in from Greg Latta, but that's no fun for the receivers because what's fun is when you can stand next to the quarterback and say, I can do this, I can do that. <laughs> you can call your own plays, but now they send them in and ruins the whole game. <laughs> Spoken like a wide receiver, Johnny. They're in the pro set. Richards in motion behind the ball. Vince Evans, number rated quarterback. Up the middle for Richards, intercepted. Cedric Brown in the 34. Drops immediately, but he made an outstanding interception. Richards is still down as he took the collision from Brown and just stole that ball. Big defensive play for the Bucks with 3.21 to go. Well, he's their man down there, that free man, and he kept his eyes open, came up, and helped out on the on the pass defense and made the interception. He hasn't had all that many interceptions this year, but he's knocked a lot of passes down. As Evans waited, waited, finally throws the ball, and look at that. He comes up. He's the second man helping out. Nice play by Cedric Brown. His first interception of the season, but as you pointed out, he's been in the thick of knocking a lot of balls away, and he is a good ball hawk. Next week... On our NFL coverage, Chicago at Buffalo, Detroit at New England, Green Bay at Atlanta, Philadelphia will be at Washington, Tampa Bay will be at the Giants, St. Louis at Houston. Those are our first games, and the doubleheader games, Dallas at Minnesota, Los Angeles at New Orleans. Check your local listings for the games and times in your area. Buccaneer ball. And they are in command now. The Bears have to get the ball back immediately. Johnny Davis carrying it for the first time. Muckenstern made the tackle. Gain of about two. Baltimore has scored in their game against Buffalo, but they're still well behind. Next week, Johnny and I will be in Buffalo for the high-scoring Bills against the Chicago Bears. 17 to 13 here at Soldier Field. Brilliant sunshine all day. Johnny Davis again. Davis picked up a couple of more before being swarmed down by the right side of the Bears defensive line. Davis, the second year man from Alabama. Number two pick a year ago behind Doug Williams. Third down about five. Hampton, the man to stop him. The Bears have used one of their timeouts because I guess they're trying to take advantage of the two-minute warning, too. It's 227 left on the clock. They are now down to two timeouts. Tampa Bay will have a third and five or six, which is an interesting situation. And will they try to pass and garner that first down, or will John McKay go conservative and run the ball and try and wind it down to the two-minute warning? He's over there now with Doug Williams uh, mapping this play out. Looks like he's drawing a few lines. Maybe they'll bring up a new play. <laughs> well, he can certainly do it if he wants to. He's the boss, right? That's right. Monday night on CBS, uh, quite a lineup as usual, starting with White Shadow. And you can find out why Reese wants to quit the team. Don't do that, Reese. And on MASH, Hawkeye gets caught between a wounded civilian and a military interrogator. Have you ever been caught between a wounded civilian and a military interrogator? I want to find out what that's all about. Then a special showing of The Last Resort, followed by Lou Grant. That's all on CBS Monday night. Bell and Eckwood are the running backs. Third and five. The Bucks want to keep the ball here and use up the rest of the time in this game. Eckwood behind Bell. Eckwood cannot get to the first down. Good defensive play. Virgil Livers was there, number 24. Tom Hicks and Lenny Walterscheid all getting in on that one. That was a big play for the Bears. Brings up fourth down. These two teams defensively have been very, very solid today. We've had two long runs for touchdowns. Otherwise, uh, the offenses have been closed down completely. Another timeout on the field with the two-minute warning. The Buccaneers lead it 17 to 13. Along the sidelines, Frank Morton, 
staying loose while his defense hopes to get him the ball. 6.24 remaining in the first half in Oakland where the Raiders lead the Broncos 7 to nothing. Ken Stabler, the snake, brings him out of the huddle. 33-year-old left-hander. 30-yard touchdown pass to Dave Casper. First quarter, the only score of this game. Gives it ahead to Van Egan for two or three yards. Catching that shot of Horton on the sideline, I'd ask him earlier, I said, is, is there an advantage to sitting for a while on the sideline and coming in? He said, well, I suppose you get a look at that defense, but he said, you come in cold. It's like asking a pitcher to come in and throw when he's been sitting for a long time. Now we got a great lineup tonight. Last Sunday, great programming, and, and we're part of the NBC team, and we're pleased they were number one last week in your little house on the Prairie Show as part of it, and so was the Sunday night doubleheader, and we've got another outstanding adults and youngsters alike. How about that? The Million Dollar Duck early, and hit from left field is the second half. Casper inbounds or not? Yes, it is a catch at the 41-yard line is the call. sign and some confusion on the signal now they're saying it is not a completion we had talked about the kind of pressure that Stabler has had and the kind of uh, physical abuse that he has taken over the past few weeks you've got Tom Flores's reaction to that particular call by the officials watch Tom Jackson number 57 at the top of your picture there coming in he gets around Dan Medlin number 68 and just levels Stabler as he gets that ball away but I'll tell you, that's a, that's a tough kind of shot to take. I'll tell you about Ted Hendricks. He has a great idea for a Christmas doll that involves Stabler. We'll tell you after this play appropriate for that replay you just witnessed. On set, third down and 15, trying to hit Branch, and ooh, a little bumping there between Branch and number 20 right of the Broncos, but no flag. Well, as you watch Stabler on this replay, Maybe it makes all the more sense. Hendrick says for Christmas doll, he'll call it the Ken Stabler knockdown stand-up doll, but there won't be any guarantee because it won't last long. <laughs> well, I tell you, that's hard on quarterbacks. He's been knocked so many times uh, the last couple of weeks that you wonder how long that uh, body of his can hold up to, the, uh, to that kind of pressure, Dick. He's a tough man. Ray Guy has rooted out two long ones. Rick Upchurch, dangerous at the other end of the 26th of Denver. The Raider roll to the 15-yard line. Guy's foot again pins Denver deep in its own end. Five minutes and 27 seconds left in this first half. The Oakland Raiders lead the Denver Broncos by seven. Big night on CBS following 60 minutes. What a great evening for fun. Archie Bunker's place one day at a time. And the Jeffersons follow. What a group of comedy. Alice is in there as well. And a new show, Trapper John M.D. with Pernell Roberts. That's been a successful early show all tonight on CBS. Well, the Chargers went 68 yards in 11 plays. They consumed five minutes of playing time. 625, Mike Sheets says 504. Roy Girella will kick off. The 49ers have James Owen from UCLA, number 20, and Lenville Elliott, the former Bengal, number 35, back. And it's going to be Owens at the goal line. Doesn't get to the 20, stops at the 17-yard line. Cliff Thrift, a good linebacker prospect for the Chargers, makes the stop, and maybe San Diego is pumped up at this point, George. Well, they, they should be. They, they went ahead. The difference is that the 49ers went down and had to settle for a field goal. The Chargers took it in for a touchdown. This telecast is presented by authority of the National Football League. It's intended for the private use of our audience. Any rebroadcast or other use of this telecast without the express written consent of the San Diego Chargers and the National Football League is prohibited. They're looking at Steve DeBerg, first and 10 at the 18-yard line. Wilbur Jackson, the up back. Pressure on DeBerg, and he gets hit as the pass intended for O.J. Simpson is incomplete. And big pressure by Leroy Jones, the man you were talking about, and a former L.A. Ram. Yeah, the, the Rams had Leroy Jones 
traded him to the Chargers. Originally, he played two years in Canada. He was a little bit light, had to put on some weight. They gave a, I think, a second choice. Heck of a trade. Johnny Saunders made a great trade there. Tampa Bay. Well, Tampa Bay could be on their way to a quick, healthy division title if they can continue what they're doing. Buffalo giving Baltimore a tough time. Here at second and ten at the 18-yard line. Paul Hofer is in the lineup. DeBerg getting the rush again. And the pass is complete, but it will be for no gain. Woody Lowe makes the stop on Paul Hofer. Uh, It'll what, be no gain. What's happened to DeBerg the last two plays, he's had delivery sacks. Just as he released the ball, he's been sacked. Penalty marker down in the backfield appears to be against the 49ers as Horn talks it over with the referee Gene Barth. Let's check other scores. The Rams leading the Cardinals 7 to nothing at the Coliseum. North of here. Offense holding refused. Third down. Dallas trying to rebound from their loss to the Browns, leading the Bengals 14 to 3 in the second quarter. John Ayers, number 68, holding on the play. Oakland and Denver 7-0. The Chargers will play Denver next week. And Kansas City, one of the surprise teams in the NFL, in front of Seattle in the second quarter. Bill Walsh looking at a third and eight situation at the 20-yard line for Steve DeBerg. Schumann, number 84, wide to the right. Rolling out now is DeBerg. A dimension we haven't seen, and he's brought down by number 68. Leroy Jones is playing a marvelous game. To be a great pass rusher, you have to have the quickness and speed that Leroy Jones has. And you know, this Charger team has been built not just with draft choices, but from some very astute trading and signing free agents. And watch Leroy Jones come over here and make a play. Got away from number 71, Fawners. The Berg is, I believe, four for nine and only 46 yards. Well, if you look, here's Leroy Jones, but Louis Kelcher isn't playing. Fred Dean isn't playing. So they have a lot of depth in this defensive line, this San Diego team. Dan Melville, who went to high school here in San Diego. A high kick. Fuller is back there. He's one of the better punt returners. Fields it at the 47-yard line and gets to midfield and a little beyond, but it'll be good field position for the Chargers when we resume. We have exactly four minutes to play in the second quarter, San Diego 7 and the surprising 49ers 3. Pete Johnson gets it to about the two and Brunick rides into the ground. I think they'll rule that his forward progress was stopped at the two, although he reached the four. And Sam, I want to tell you, it is discouraging to go on the field with 99 yards to go for a touchdown. And that's the fifth time this season that the Dallas Cowboys punt coverage team is down the ball inside the five-yard line. And that's an interesting graphic right there, too. Yes, they have the same schedule as does Pittsburgh, except they play the teams away that Pittsburgh plays at home. And but the team that appeared to be the easiest opponent in the first four weeks is the team that beat them the worst, Buffalo, 51 to 24. From his own end zone, Anderson throws it out here to Archie Griffin. Five, ten, may have gotten the first down. I believe he did on a great second effort Close. by the two-time Heisman Trophy winner. Randy Hughes made the tackle. But I think Cincinnati is out of immediate danger. Archie Griffin came out of college from Ohio State, where until this year, the only time they threw it was from the center to the punter. And he made himself a good receiver. I was going to say, let's give him credit. He has worked very hard and very diligently at catching the football, and he has become a better than adequate receiver. And I'm telling you, Sam, I have never seen anybody on the Cincinnati Bengals football team work harder than Archie Griffin does. Just short of the first down. Oh, it is a first down. Thank you, gentlemen. He is... He is a guy whose heart will not fit in this stadium. If he were 6'3", that's high praise. And I think one of the things that's made him a better football player this year, at least it's conjecture on some people's part, is the drafting of Charles Alexander. I do believe that Archie Griffin, whenever he is pushed, he tries 130% instead of 110%. I like that little kid. Don Bass goes wide left. Isaac Curtis to the right. 45 is Griffin. He gets the football. And Larry Cole has him 
as he reaches the 13-yard line. Cole, the 12-year veteran out of Hawaii, in the past has been accustomed to playing tackle, was moved outside with the retirement of uh, Tutal Jones. And there you saw an example of that flex defense. I think, as put as succinctly as you can possibly put it, the flex defense is designed for one thing and one thing alone, and that's for pursuit for all the defensive linemen. They'll, they'll put one off the line of scrimmage so that he can get to the play going the other way. Would it be oversimplifying to say the flex is his own defense against the run? Yes, I do believe that's right. That's exactly right. Second down for Kenny Anderson. He's got a long eight. Throws it out here. Oh, look at the hit on Griffin. Thomas Anderson. <laughs> Little shrug of the shoulders there. He did that to Brian Sipe last week, and Sipe admits that he didn't see clearly for about four series. And this doesn't only take strength. It takes a great deal of timing. Boom. You say you want to play football, do you? You want to drive a Rolls Royce and wear a mink coat? Well, that's the price you have to pay. Dan Ross, 89. Steve Kreider, 86. And 40, Charles Alexander, all come into the Cincinnati backfield. And as Bob diagnosed, when Preston Pearson missed the pass on the last possession, he has a slight hamstring injury. That's on the Dallas side. Here it's third down and eight for Kenny Anderson. Straight ahead. Crosses the 22 to about the 24-yard line, and I believe he's got another Cincinnati first down. And in college, excuse me, Sam, in college they called him Alexander the Great. Played right down the road from here to LSU, a guy with legitimate 4-3 speed. Good block by Mark Donahue, trap block on Harvey Martin, and that time Mr. Henderson didn't help. Excellent call from the Cincinnati bench. That is a first down for the Bengals. They trail 14-3. 8.50 to go on a turning clock here in the second quarter. They got to get the ball down the field to Isaac Curtis, Sam. Aaron Kyle has single coverage on him. Anderson, down he goes, back at the 15-yard line. Let's pause briefly for station identification. This is... Sam Nover and Bob Trumpy back in Dallas, Texas. And Anderson has just been thrown for a sizable loss. Second down, 18, Cincinnati back at their own 16-yard line. Anderson forced to throw it. As Archie Griffin out of bounds at the 20, Henderson had the coverage. So a very short gain on second down, and it doesn't erase the problem, Bob. Kenny's got a fourth quarter. I'm sorry, it is late fourth quarter. It is not final. Late fourth quarter. Third down for Kenny Anderson. Throws it down here, and it's caught. Dennis Thurman had the coverage on Steve Kreider, and they ruled he caught it out of bounds. Oh, I'd like to see that one again. Well, that's one of the first things a rookie receiver has to learn is without looking where that sideline is and it just comes with practice nobody shows you how to do it you just gotta have to McAnally back at his own five yard line Steve Wilson in single safety at his 30 I think respecting McAnally a bit more than he did on the first two punts of the day giving him a good 60 yards Bob I think that's safe now he might get one here didn't get all of it, but it's good enough. Wilson fair catches and goes out of bounds at the 32 yard of the change of possession. Well, then why was the flag up here? Let's the, listen. Maybe Fred will tell us. Post possession, number 57. Personal foul.
Welcome back to the Oakland Coliseum. Second half of our NBC doubleheader at final scores. The Oilers beat Cleveland a three-way tie for first place in the Central because the Steelers lost today for the first time. The Redskins made it 16 to 7 over Atlanta, and they're now 4 and 1. The Jets in a big upset over Miami. The Dolphins' first loss, 33-27. New Orleans wins its second game. Giants still looking for that first victory. Philadelphia upsets Pittsburgh for bragging rights of the state of Pennsylvania, 17-14. Minnesota wins another close one, 13-10 against Detroit. Buffalo bombing Baltimore, 31-6 in the fourth quarter. Tampa Bay leading Chicago by four in the fourth quarter. Tampa Bay trying to remain the only unbeaten team that would be. Rob Lytle gets it out to the 23-yard line. Yes, that's right, with uh, Miami losing for the first time, Pittsburgh losing for the first time. If Tampa Bay wins. They'll be the only unbeaten team after five weeks. There's Dave Studdard. It's kind of an interesting stat. He caught a touchdown pass last week. Here he is doing what he does a little bit better. Well, he's trying to keep uh, Pat Tume uh, occupied on the line of scrimmage, but uh, tackle eligible pass rather unusual for uh, the NFL. At the moment, Dave Studdard is tied with Rick Upchurch and Haven Moses, and Dave Preston with a lead and touchdown reception. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he's rubs it in, too. Second down and three from the 23. Armstrong to the 26-yard line, pretty close to the first down. We may have a measurement. Other scores, Kansas City leading Seattle in the second period, 10 to three. Across the bay, San Diego seven and the 49ers three in the second quarter. Dallas, after Cincinnati kicked an early field goal, now leads the Bengals 14 to three in the second period at Irving. And the Rams draw first blood against the Cardinals, seven nothing down at the Coliseum in Los Angeles. It is a first down for the Denver Broncos. Now under the whip of veteran Craig Morton. Let's pause briefly for station identification from Oakland. This is the NBC Television Network. Superintendent William Johnston tonight on news conference. Boletnikov. Well, he's down south near the San Diego area's home. And uh, Ken Staber said, you know, I think Fred Boletnikov would be an outstanding assistant coach. He's a compassionate man. Obviously, he knows how to run patterns, and he had to learn the hard way. He wasn't blessed with the great speed of other receivers. I imagine Fred Boletnikov might get his wish next year by someone. Long pass complete to Riley Odoms to the 50, all the way to the 44 as he carried Lester Hayes an additional five yards. A big gain as Morton finds Odoms open down the middle. Lester Hayes, uh, very unhappy at that one, picked off two against the Rams early in this season and the lone win for the Raiders. Morton got quite a bit of pressure from Pat Toomey, 67 right there. In fact, just able to get that ball off. But what a perfect pass he threw. Odom's finding some open territory down there and then just attacks Lester Hayes and carries him for another four yards. First down at the 44 of Oakland with three and a half minutes left in the first half. Broncos trying to tie it up. Quick out. Complete up. the 38 and rookie Henry Williams didn't lose his man but he lost his helmet. Upchurch showing uh, Henry Williams what a straight arm is all about. Absolutely knocked his helmet right off the top of his head. Give you a look at it from field level. Morton throwing a pass as straight as a string and the rookie had given Upchurch too much room respecting speed. Look at the helmet right there. He just popped it off. Rick Upchurch to the 38 of Oakland where it's second down and call it four. signal by yes, holding that'll just I don't know of anything that worries and concerns coaches more than just that How, it's like the errors in baseball you can't give a team the extra outs and expect to win and the penalties are like giving the other team an extra down or extra yards oh well, you hate to make mistakes and certainly again the penalty not only a loss of uh, yardage as they mark it off but the, you lose the yardage that you made on the play in that case, uh, first down or close to a first down. And what a, we've talked about the fact that uh, there are mistakes and there are stupid mistakes. Uh, we've seen some stupid mistakes, uh, mistakes on turnovers that uh, would have given the other team the ball. Uh, keep an eye right here as you see Tume working to the outside. I wonder if it was on that particular block that they threw the flag. We didn't have the referee's mic working, so we won't know. Morton. 20 yards. 
yard line as he tried to hit Haven Moses cutting on the angle pattern. And it looked like a good call by Morton. He had his receiver isolated out there and open but couldn't find him. Morton's story in Denver has been one of being hero and goat almost alternately. Uh, he's watching him throw the ball here off target. I think he was just getting rid of that one. But uh, of course uh, came in and put the Broncos ahead against the Rams early and then uh, went back dropped the football on a fumble as he was hit. Uh, the Rams scooped it up went on to win the game with that touchdown as they walked into the end zone. Of course the great comeback last week. And here he is trying to do some of that magic today against the Oakland Raiders. Up first to the right Watson in the game three wide receivers only Jensen behind Morton. by Jack Tatum first and goal Broncos with 247 left in the first half. You said it earlier Dick Upchurch may be the most dangerous man on this Bronco team. Morton facing a four man rush uh, Oakland trying to get pressure on him. They couldn't get to him and he just drilled that ball. Lester Hayes was right on Upchurch's back but he put it right in the hands of Upchurch and he went down the field. A chance now to get into the end zone put seven points of their own on the board. He's to the five and inside the five yard line before they drive him back. And that's going to take it to the two minute warning unless we have a timeout. 209 208 showing. Ted Hendricks spearheaded that last defensive charge. Villapiano helping out. The Raiders have a seven to nothing lead here in Oakland. Two minute warning has been given to both teams. The Broncos, when we return, will have it second and goal at the Raider five yard line, trailing seven nothing. Honey Bears getting a few rays out there today. Here it is, almost October and nice sunny day for the girls. Two minutes to play in the game. Steve Schubert awaiting the punt from Tom Blanchard. Blanchard at the 45-yard line of the Buccaneers. The league's toughest defense against the rush will be seen from aerial work when the Bears get the ball with two minutes to go. Another low snap, another good job by Blanchard. Schubert's going to let it go in. It does, and the Bears will start from their 20 on a touchback. And they have one minute, 53 seconds to score. Not a field goal, but a touchdown. They're four points down. they got to go for the, for the big score. Well, they have had the opportunity to figure out the strategy for the final two minutes. Neil Armstrong and his offensive coordinators. Kenny Myers upstairs. Vince Evans is ready. Let's see if the Bears can move it against this tough, tough Buccaneer defense. Well, the Bucs will probably give them those short passes and give them five, ten yards a clip. It just depends whether they can get all the way down the field. First down from the 20. Richards in motion. Flag down. Evans for oh. in intercepted by Jarris White, intended for Bashnagel. Earl pulls him down. Now let's see who the flag is again. Jarris White on the interception, a bad pass or a bad route. The penalty against the Bears for illegal motion. Let's see it again. The wide receiver down at the bottom of your screen. I think that's uh, James, uh, James Scott. James Scott Illegal moved motion. too soon. They had two minutes motion, and he threw the ball way overthrown. And there was the easy, easy interception Jareth White. by Jareth White, and that could be the old ball game. What a way! That's really a downer for the Chicago Bears as Robin Earl makes the tackle. But they had two men in motion at the same time. It was James Scott for being illegally in motion, as Johnny described it. Richards was legally in motion, and Scott left early. Bashnagel appeared to be running that route correctly, and uh, at this moment, we'd have to say Evans overthrew it. Bell for the Bucks, bashing his way for five, maybe six yards, down to the 36-yard line as these Buccaneers show continued maturity and poise. Campbell and Muckenster made the tackle for Chicago. And we are looking at the only undefeated team left 
in the National Football League and the only undefeated coach, John McKay. They'll be 5-0 and in the Central Division. In front of McKay is Bill Nelson, their quarterback coach, offensive strategist with Kenny Meyer. And with a timeout on the field, it is second and five, and the Bucks lead it by four. Tim Gray was defending on the play. Well, that was a good call. He was open. The ball was thrown just a little bit behind him. The big look-in play. Johnny Unitas did that a lot in uh, wow. his championship days with the Colts. And that's tough for uh, small defensive backs to cover. You've really got a, a tight end flanked out there coming across the middle. Gordy Saraceno, number 58, rookie from Stanford, replaces Dan Buns in the middle. He's inexperienced. Let's see if they capitalize the charges. Winslow in motion, second and 10 at the 49. Bounce his throw to the sideline to Thomas is complete and out of bounds. Well rehearsed play and Fouts is down and he's helped up there by number 79 Al Cowling. First down however for the Chargers. Al Cowling can rush the passer. We talked about that. He keeps coming. They have two men on him and he splits them. He still keeps coming. He's hit by Webb and Collins. Went to high school with O.J. College in the pros at Buffalo. So he has followed the trail with O.J. Simpson. Larry Burton, top of his screen. The handoff here is to Williams, who scored the touchdown for the Chargers and gets nothing on the play. And off to Clarence Williams. Blocked by the right side of the line. So it'll be second down, clock running, three minutes and 35 seconds to go in the first half. Ray Wershing's 33-yard field goal after a scoreless first quarter put San Francisco in front. And then following a good mixed drive, it was Williams' a three-yard run to give San Diego a 7-3 to three edge. There's Saraceno, the middle linebacker, in place of Bunn. Second and nine at the 37. Cowlings and Board, their pass rushes in. Thomas. Stopped at the 35-yard line. Scott Hilton, number 55. Let's see how the rookie middle linebacker performed on this play. Saraceno. Getting rid of the blocker, working laterally. Overran the play a little bit, but not too bad. Uh, Fouts, Fouts is 13 of 16 for 115 yards. Bob Martin, number 54, is in at linebacker now, and Hartman goes out. Four linebacker alignment, third and seven at the 35-yard line. For the Chargers, two and a half minutes to play in the first half. Fouts. Quick pass up the middle. Winslow, a fine catch by Kellen Winslow. He has a first down at the 27-yard line. Mel Morgan to stop, but Winslow is showing why he's a top draft choice today. You know what? When you have Winslow in there, you're playing with three wide receivers without having to substitute another wide receiver. 11-yard pickup. Winslow adept as a wide receiver or as a tight end. We don't know about his blocking capabilities, but we know he can that's, go deep in there. That's pass. something he has to improve on. He has to improve on his blocking to play to play tight end. And a two-minute warning now, as the Chargers, who got off to a slow start, are seemingly on the move again. When we resume, it'll be first and ten at the 49ers 26. In this series, on their own 17-yard line, Staubach. Tried to give it to Laidlaw, cutting back, and he was stopped for perhaps a yard loss on the play by Eddie Edwards, the third-year man from Miami of Florida. Texas Stadium in Irving, Texas, beat Atlanta 16-7. The Eagles shot Pittsburgh 17-14. Second down, 11 now for Staubach. Good protection. Throws it out here short. Dorsett. Spins around and goes down to the 22 yard line. He looked like he was screwing himself into the ground. A pirouette. What a talented guy he is. And he looks a little bit tired, but as you said earlier, Sam, just rounding into shape for the 1979 season, out for a number of weeks with a broken toe, dropped a mirror on it on the team bus after a football game. But he's one of those guys that he runs 25 yards. Gets up like somebody shot him, and the next time they give it to him again, he runs 65 yards. Bob, I had the uh, the real pleasure of watching every home game he played at the University of Pittsburgh during his four years there. And uh, he not only is a great football player, but he's handled his publicity and notoriety better than anybody I have ever met in professional sports. It is third down, and from the shotgun, Staubach can throw it. Throws it down here. He's got a man. First down to Tony Hill. His first catch of the 
of the day, I believe, at the 40-yard line. And Dallas going with the spread formation. That makes the Bengal defensive back single cover. Three very gifted receivers. Tony Hill out of Stanford, as I said in the pregame program, Dallas took a chance and let Golden Richards go to Chicago and hope that this guy would develop. Well, I think he's developed about 10 times faster than they thought. That's not a bad statistic right there. Tony Hill's license plate here in Dallas reads dial 80. And Starbuck has <laughs> called that number a few times, hasn't he? And you know what his teammates call him? What? Drill Hill. <laughs> I like it. From the 41 of Dallas, the Cowboys already leading 14 to 3. Drew Pearson in motion. Dorsett trying to cut it back, and this time they were waiting for him. Browner forced him in, and Leclerc filled the hole, and the net result is a loss of the yard. And if for some reason it does appear that everybody's moving like they have sand in their shoes down there, ladies and gentlemen, it's about 115 degrees on that field. The sun is just now leaving the field of the stadium here in Texas. It is very warm. And the clock continues to move, 5-10 to go second quarter. Pearson goes wide right and Hill to the left. And again, Brimson and Laidlaw alternating on every play. They're bringing in the uh, the offensive calls from the offensive coordinator, Dan Reeves. The flag is down as Dorsett reached the 43-yard line. Now it is final. I was premature a moment ago, but Tampa Bay has won its fifth straight, 17-13 over the Chicago Bears. Here's another final, Buffalo, and another <laughs> reasonably amazing football team. They go three and two on the year. Could be four and one had Tom Dempsey made a 26-yard field goal against Miami in the opener. They beat Baltimore 31 to 13 today. And the Colts are 0 and 5. Second down and about 20 now for Staubach from the shotgun. They got him. He got rid of it. And the pressure caused that incompletion. Eddie Edwards was there, so was Ross Browner. And Wilson Whitley, I guess they were all there, or at least in the vicinity. And one, one thing about the shotgun, it may be good, but when you go back there, you know you, everybody knows they're going to throw it. There's Eddie Edwards, Ross Brown on the outside. Eddie Edwards from Miami just about gets to him. Wilson Whitley and Eddie Edwards were the first two, first two, the two first-round draft choices a couple years ago for the Bengals, and that's what they're going to build their defensive line with. You know, you add Mac Mitchell, who was the number one draft choice of uh, Cleveland, I believe, and of the six defensive linemen, the Bengals carry four of them first-round choices. Well, Starbox got a quarter of a mile to go here on third down at his 30-yard line. Steps up in the pocket, throws it down here to Tony Hill. Oh, Drew Pearson, first down and more. Carries the man to the 32-yard line. Drew Pearson, number 88. third and 20 and if the Bengals have suffered from one thing in the first four football games it is the fact that their defensive backs have not been able to cover anybody and Drew Pearson once again Starlock is kind of flushed out of the pocket with a decent pass rush but he stands up there and watch how thrown behind him not bad coverage by Dick Duran but poor tackling once again by the Bengal defensive backs not bad. I, I would say that was excellent coverage by Jerron because Pearson had to turn the other way to catch the football. Jerron behind him. It really was not on the money. Pearson just made a remarkable catch. 38 yards on the pass to Drew Pearson and Staubach wants more. Almost intercepted. Ken Riley, the 11-year veteran, cut in front of the intended receiver and almost had the interception. He's the elder statesman on the Cincinnati Bengals in his 11th season. And he, you're right, he almost had him one. A receiver, no matter who it is, no matter how many years he's played, when he goes out for a reception, he must remember one thing. Come back for the football. That's a lousy day for Roger Staubach. So the clock stops with 3.54 to go here in the second quarter. It is the third down. It is a second down and 10 to go. Dallas leading 14-3. Steve Wilson replaces Drew Pearson in one wide receiver spot. Here's the screen to Dorsett. 25, 20, 15. Look at him change direction to the 10-yard line. Gerard made the saving tackle. First down, Dallas at the Cincinnati 11. Well, we very seldom give a pat on the back to the offensive line, but watch the Dallas offensive line. Fitzgerald, Scott, Donovan. 
they set the whole thing up. Rayfield right at right tackle. Dorsett knows what to do with it when he gets it out there, cuts it back inside, then to the outside. Look at the acceleration that guy has. An amazing athlete. So he, get, he gets it quickly, doesn't he? Oh, he's outstanding. There are not enough adjectives to describe this young man who, as I said earlier, is playing in probably his equivalent to the first game of the year. He missed four preseason games. Tony takes it again. Outside. Out of bounds at about the five-yard line. Ken Riley is the man who ran him out. The pulling guard, or the left tackle, Pat Donovan, tried to lead the way. And it looks like he's ready to faint dead away. And they give him the ball again, and he does it again. And did you notice the strength he had shoving Ken Riley to the ground? Wasn't that an old Jim Brown trick to get up very slowly after every uh, carry and then lug his body back to the huddle and then go again? Beat you to death with it. Oh, he's wearing the wrong number, though. <laughs> Second down, five at the Cincinnati six-yard line. <laughs> Look at Dorsett. Brinson is the other setback. I bet Dorsett gets it again. He does. Inside to about the three. Leclerc holding on around his waist as Tony goes to the three-yard line. It'll be third down, two to go for the first down, and three for the touchdown. And Dor Dorsett has carried uh, three straight times if you include the screen pass. There's no doubt he's tired. And with as hot as it is, I'm sure that they will platoon their running backs as best they possibly can, but Tom Landry's got a starting team and he wants to stay with it, and I don't think he cares if it's 215 degrees on the field. And Cincinnati goes to the goal line defense now. Four linebackers, six down linemen, and the lone uh, backfield man is Ken Riley, and I believe we have a timeout on the field here called by Dallas. And maybe he wants to give Dor ring. You huh? got it. You got it. There's a fairly big play for Cincinnati to stay in it here before halftime. Third down and two. they do is they fake a sweep behind Dorsett. He comes all the way across the line of scrimmage, right at the goal line. Staubach does a good job of disguising it. And Dupree is supposed to outrun Bo Harris. I don't think Bo could have done much better covering Billy Joe Dupree right there. And he's now the fourth best receiver in the history of Dallas. 184 catches behind Bob Hayes, Drew Pearson, and Frank Clark. Very select company for Mr. Dupree. And Raphael Septian to tack on the extra point. It is perfect. So the Cowboys have delivered a very crushing blow to Cincinnati here just before the two-minute warning. It is now 21-3, to the Cowboys over the winless Bengals. Well, I think I included Kenny Meyer on the coaching staff of the Bucks. Of course, he's with the Bears. Apologies to all concerned. Second down, Tampa Bay. And Johnny Davis. Oh, what a pop he takes right at the line of scrimmage. Still scrapping, but play had been called. And he got maybe a yard. Third down for the Buccaneers. 119 on the clock. Tampa Bay. John McKay. Bill Nelson down there. Giving the play to Morris Owens, number 85, to bring in. Third down and three. Remember, the World Series of Golf follows immediately here on CBS. Don't the Bears have a timeout left? Boy, I'd sure take it now, stop that clock, and then worry about stopping it other ways later on. But they let him roll off 30 seconds right there. <laughs> Williams brings out the buck. Big hole for Bell. Bell has first down at the 30-yard line of the Chicago Bears, and that is going to wind it up down for Tampa Bay and Tampa Bay is going to win their fifth consecutive game without a defeat they are handily atop the central division of the National Football Conference and the Bears in Detroit and Minnesota and Green Bay will do all of the chasing the rest of the way as time ticks away here at Soldier Field and we'd like to uh, thank our producer Bill Barnes director John McDonough the fine technical crew from WBBM in Chicago for another outstanding job here this afternoon. And that is it. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have won it 17-13 to, to go 5-0 and as McKay hustles off. The Bears fall to 2-3, and, and Walter Payton 
And Doug Williams shaking hands down there. Two fine athletes who have had a fine day today. Tampa Bay, 17. Chicago, 13. Tampa Bay now the only unbeaten team in the National Football League. Walter Payton with an exciting touchdown run to his credit. 65 yards on a screen pass. Jerry Eckwood, the rookie running a 61-yard touchdown score for the victorious Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I think you have to hand it to Tampa Bay. They had to score there at the last moments of the game. They went down, and they did it. They deserve the victory. All right, remember, coming right up is the World Series of Golf here on CBS, live from Akron, Ohio, the final round action. And they've got a dogfight going for that big championship. Tim Ryan for Johnny Moore saying good afternoon from Chicago, Illinois at the NFL on CBS is a presentation of CBS Sports.
reception by Rick Upchurch. Three for 53 yards today has positioned the Broncos closest to that Oakland Raider goal line for the entire first half. They trail seven to nothing. Ball at the five yard line. It's second down and goal. Greg Morton, now the captain of the Bronco offensive ship after Norris We started the game. Broncos missed a field goal from 32 yards out. Morton now using his steady veteran hand. And there's Jim Turner as he awaits his possible turn. A reminder now, we want to underline the fact that NBC Sports World, I know you've enjoyed it thoroughly through the course of this last year, is now on Saturday. Saturday is during the football year. Two o'clock Eastern time, 11 o'clock Pacific time. Next Saturday, some great bowling. You sent auto racing, gymnastics from China. Sports World Saturday. Second and goal. It's Lytle to the three, maybe the two and a half. Reggie Kinlaw, 62, came in behind the play to make the tackle. The Oakland Raiders uh, trying to stop it up at the goal line. The Broncos pulling. Paul Howard, number 60, right in the middle of your picture, getting a good block from Jensen. Lytle just slides in there behind the blocking of the big guard. Gets good yardage. Takes it all the way down inside the two. They have a tough situation here. What do you do on third and two? That's tough yardage down there. Third and goal. Ball right on the two-yard line. Only one back. Lytle behind Morton. He's going to throw. To just that fly swat trick. I wonder if he bounced it away with his cast. He has a problem catching the ball with that one thumb broken as it is, but he's a tough one. Give you a look at it. Morton back decides the best thing here is a pass. He gets time to throw. But right on the line of the scrimmage, right on the line of scrimmage, Hendricks up in the air, bounces that ball cleanly away. It'll be a short field goal try by Turner. It's up and it's good. So Jim Turner, the number two score in NFL history and number two in field goals to George Blanda in NFL history, has just kicked his 296th. Oakland's lead is cut to seven. Sam Nover and Bob Trumpy, we are in Dallas, Texas. 94 degrees at kickoff time. About 115 on the floor of the stadium. And the Cowboys are about as hot as the weather. They lead Cincinnati 21 to 3. Except on to kick it deep. And he drills another one. Deacon Turner five yards deep in the end zone. 15 does not reach the 20. To about the 18 yard line. And as they unpile, 57 is Bruce Hover. And also Ron Springs, number 20, combined to make the stop of the 19. And if you didn't see our pregame program, we featured the flak jacket that Kenny Anderson is wearing. Uh, comes out of Houston, made the famous last year by Dan Pastorini to protect his lower back. Thing only weighs four ounces, and it covers his entire rib cage. Rather warm, though, I imagine, on today. No, he has not gained 15 pounds. That's the flak jacket. Why would anybody have missed our pregame show? For the life of me, I can't figure it out down for Anderson. Throws it over the middle. He's got Archie Griffin to the 25. 30. Dragged down from behind by Randy Hughes but that's the first down. And we have reached the two-minute warning here in Dallas. That will be a first down at the 32-yard line of Cincinnati and Anderson now will put the uh, two-minute offense into operation. Some surprising scores in the National Football League today. Brian and Mike with the highlights, the details at halftime, so stay with us. We do have a final we can duck in now. The Buffalo Bills have defeated Baltimore 31 to 13. So Buffalo now three and two. And Tampa Bay, would you believe after five weeks of this season, the only club with an unblemished record, the Buccaneers of Tampa Bay. They have defeated Chicago 17-13. You think Johnny McKay is smoking a cigar right now, feet up and just a smile curling at the corners of his mouth. Out of bounds, the kickoff by Jim Turner. So they'll have to do it again. 
Turner lays that ball almost flat on top of that elevated tee of his and uh, just got his foot under the side of that one and rooted it out of bounds. Obviously doesn't want to give them field position. You get an idea of the size of that tee as you look at it there. And the length of the grass. You could hunt uh, Easter eggs in there. Well, he has to put that down in that sodded area, and that uh, sodded area happens to have long grass. They want to protect it when it first goes in. Dick, one of the things we could say that missing that seven points, ending up with the three, uh, certainly a, a moral victory in a way for the Oakland defense. Uh, they they want to go in with that lead, and they have played good football in this first half. Uh, Denver, with a chance to put it even, I think would have gained a real edge if, had they put that one in the end zone and, and tied this ball game. As it is, uh, Oakland will go in apparently with a 7-3 lead and with their best first half performance probably of this young season. Had to be frustrating for the Broncos. They moved the ball 82 yards, Merlin. They started on the 16, got all the way to the two-yard line only to get three points. That's a lot of work. You don't want to squander that kind of opportunity. Larry Brunson and Clarence Hawkins are deep for the Oakland Raiders as Turner now has to tee it up after the five-yard penalty at his 30. See how deep that grass is. That's about a two-inch tee he's using. <laughs> you can just barely see it in that deep grass. signaling timeout for this commercial break. <laughs> 56 seconds remaining first half. 7-3 Oakland.
Dan Fouts after conferring with Coriel and Jim Hannafan who is with Coriel in St. Louis back in the huddle is Bill Walsh with the headset on the San Francisco side first and ten at the 26 two minutes to play joiner number 18 wide to the left they're using Winslow as a wide receiver in motion is Thomas 22 Fouts to Winslow stopped at the 20 yard line Needs four yards. Clock is running. Willie Harper makes the stop. 145 coming up as you see on the screen. Well, they're really using Winslow's height. Fouts is putting the ball up and he's taking it away from the defense. Second and three. The ball at the 19 yard line. Joyner goes to the left. Thomas again in motion. And the pitch goes to Williams. Williams has Russ Washington blocking in front of him. He's close to a first down. Harper again. Linebacker makes the stop. Russ Washington, who's been a standby. First down for San Diego. Clock stops, 113 to go. At the 16-yard line, another timeout. And Winslow already has five catches for 43 yards. Well, that's enough for an entire game, and that's in the first 30 minutes. And he's not finished yet. We have a minute 11 to go. Halftime. Brent Musburger, Jane Kennedy, and Irv Cross. The NFL today will bring you up to date with scores and highlights in the NFL. So the Chargers have called, indeed, a timeout right now. And this is a very crucial moment, George. Uh, as far as the 49ers are concerned, because they want to stay in this game, and a yeah. TD here will hurt them. If they can uh, hold them to a field goal, They've done their job. If they give them a touchdown, it puts them uh, at a great disadvantage. The big guy in this drive has been Winslow. Winslow wasn't scheduled to start. He's listed as a tight end. Bob Klein was hit in the eye in practice and was not able to play. We've seen Greg McCrary perform a lot, but Winslow has been more prominent than even John Jefferson, who was shaken up a while, and Charlie Joyner, the veteran wide receiver. The way to the defense Winslow is hold him up and jam him and don't let him get off of that line of scrimmage. When he gets off that line of scrimmage and puts his hands up, you've got 10, 11 feet to defense. You've so done that a few times when you were coaching with some burners, haven't you? The toughest way to play defense is to cover people. Jam them, hold them up, give them a different look. I would think he'd stay with Winslow in this area. You're looking at Dan Fouts. Look at those statistics for Dan Fouts, who is becoming a poise. He was third in the league last year. He's got to be ranked in at least in the top five, maybe higher. He's third so far this week as a quarterback. He sat out almost an entire year as a holdout. Larry Burton, number 87, and Winslow 80 are the wide receivers right now. First and 10 at the 16. Winslow to the bottom, to the left. 102 to go in the first half. They're looking for six points. Here's the Lucas pass. Penalty marker down, but he drops the ball. Tim Gray might have pushed off. We'll see. He did. Tim, uh, Tim Gray made, made a move on him. We said he might go to Winslow. Watch Tim Gray come up and then hook him. Now he drops the ball. You, uh, a receiver like that reminds me a little bit of Carmichael of the Eagles. You have to double him front and back, long and short. Well, he's like a basketball player out there. And the way he has that balance with his Number hands to catch balls that a, that a lot of other people that a lot of other people drop. It is holding, it's defensive holding, so it's an automatic first down. The ball now is at the 11-yard line. 57 seconds to go, but it's that balance. Dave Logan also has that uh, yeah. Cleveland Browns, that ability. Uh, Gray did the proper thing. Don't, don't let him score. Follow him if you have to. Chargers can get a first down without scoring. First and 10 at the 11-yard line. In motion is Charlie Joyner. He looks to him, but the pass to Winslow, and he drops it. Then takes the lick. So Winslow's dropped the last two. Well, they're throwing, they're throwing them no every down. Perfect. Yeah. And, and the ball, if we, I don't know whether we can see that. The ball was nose down and out in front of him. Watch it. Now watch. It's a tough catch. See how the ball nose down. He should have had it. But it's a tough catch. He took a hit by Tim Gray. Scott Hilton's territory out there. 54 seconds, second and 10 at the 11. This time Burton comes to the left. Joiner to the right. 
Seven to three, San Diego Chargers lead. And the give to Williams up the middle. He gets inside the 10 to about the eight yard line. And Willie Harper makes the tackle. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers defeated the Chicago Bears 17 to 13. So the Buccaneers are now 5-0, and oh, and they could have as much as a three-game lead. And what do you think about that division, George? Well, I think Tampa Bay, we said that last week after they beat the Rams, Tampa Bay is the team to beat. They are the only undefeated team in the NFL because Pittsburgh lost, Cleveland lost to Houston, and Miami lost to the New York Jets. And the reason they're for real is their defense. They have a solid defense. That's the first rule of winning, build a defense. So Minnesota is in second place, two games behind Tampa Bay in that division. Buffalo is an easy victory over the Baltimore Colts, 31 to 13, and the Colts are now 0 and 5. Buffalo 3 and 2, starting to make some progress. And I know you like that quarterback, Joe Ferguson. I tried to make a trade for him. I think Ferguson is an underrated football player. He can run, he can pass, he's tough. He's never had a lot of material to work with. He's always had. A poor defense. Most good quarterbacks have a good defense. As we look at Bill Walsh, how do you feel O.J. Simpson is thinking these days? He left Buffalo, wanted to come to the West Coast. It was a running team. It's a balanced team. It looks like the Bills are on the threshold now, and the 49ers are still starting over. Yes, I'm, I'm sure uh, O.J. wishes he were healthier, and uh, but I still think O.J. is going to help the 49ers. Third and seven at the eight-yard line. This is a big play for the 49ers right here. As George mentioned, if they can get away with only three, they're in good shape. Joyner and Burton both to the left. Third down play. Quick toss and a mix-up. Incomplete. It was intended for Winslow. And it'll be fourth down. And so the 49ers, by hook or by crook, have managed to hold, and Jarella comes in. Well, they had a miscommunication on that. You don't want to make mistakes in here. Now, now that's that should give the 49ers a lift. Defense, the 49er defense is not playing badly. And they they haven't been playing that, that badly on offense either. Compared to some of the things they've done in the past, but uh, they have done better offensively. So it'll be a 26-yard attempt. Fuller holding for Roy Girella, who had an earlier field goal block. This kick is good, but the 49ers won't complain because the Chargers had first and 10 at the 11-yard line, and the 49ers held, and now the San Diego Chargers have upped their lead to 10-3. to 3. 42 seconds remaining in the first half here on a beautiful day in a packed house in San Diego. Now, of course, George, the thing for the 49ers do is that they have to do something offensively. They can't well, all of a sudden get... First thing they got to do is get a good kick return so that DeBerg has some field position. Buffalo, 42 seconds to go. If you're Bill Walsh, what do you do now? You got the Berg, and he hasn't gone too deep in this no. game. What if I get the ball to the 35, we get the ball to the 35, We'll go with our two-minute offense. We'll use our timeouts. We'll go deep at least twice. Hope for a, a break. Hope to get a penalty. The worst thing we should come out of it is an incomplete pass. There is Lenville Elliott, number 35, to the right, and James Owens, number 20, to the left. 42 seconds to play in the first half. Roy Girella kicking. It's a short kick, and it's taken by Owens at the two-yard line to the 20. Bauer, one of the Chargers, in on the play along with Keith King, number 57, a former safety move to linebacker, an 18-yard return by James Owens. So 37 seconds show on the clock, first and 10 of the 20. That last drive was 41 yards and 10 plays for the field goal. Uh, speaking of Owens, I'd like to see Owens run a little harder in his kickoff returns. Usually the, the real good kickoff return people just drive through there. They don't wait for the opening. The opening is there or it isn't there. You make it on your own. O.J. Simpson is out. Paul Hofer, number 36, is in the game along with Wilbur Jackson. Three men are split wide. Solomon wide on the left. Rolling out is the bird. He has a lot of protection. And the pass 
coming back complete to Freddie Solomon at the 30-yard line. The clock is running, 25 seconds to go. Nine-yard pickup. And now the 49ers use one of their timeouts. Freddie Solomon has not figured so far. He caught eight passes last week. Well, th this is a uh, what we call a transcontinental pass. The quarterback rolls out one way and throws back across the green. It's kind of a dangerous pass. Solomon comes back for it, which shows good judgment on his part. And uh, he was an off, off receiver on the play. He was looking to the side. He was rolling. Nobody was open, so he threw back across the green. It was good, good communication on Solomon and, and the bird. Denver trailing Oakland 7-3 to three in the second quarter. Oakland 1-3 coming into this game, but they have played all their games on the road. And this is their home opener. Well, it's a big game for Oakland. They've lost three straight. They have to win this or their season is over in that division. We've seen DeBerg rolling out as an option quarterback would in college in the last few yeah. series. Uh, DeBerg is not not real nimble. He's not the type of quarterback that uh, you're going to do be able to do a lot of things with rolling out, sprint out, scrambling. But he's just active enough that you can you can get away with uh, a few rollouts. Time of possession. This first half, Chargers 17 45, 49ers 1215. And that's about the difference in the score. Second and one now for the 49ers at the 29 yard line, but the big story at the time 21 seconds remaining. The bird to the air. Good protection for the moment. The pass is intercepted by Horn. Bob Horn, the middle linebacker, still with the ball inside the 30, 25-yard line. And a timeout is called. And it was Bob Horn who had a key interception against Steve Drogan last week in New England. Dick, we talk about what to do and what not to do. With 21 seconds to play, to throw short intermediate passes is quite a risk. If you're going to throw, throw deep, throw deep, and the worst you get is an incomplete pass. If it's intercepted, they still got a long way to go. Now, that, that's something that shouldn't have happened. That's really bad judgment on the Berg's part. Second interception and a 14-yard return. Second interception today, Woody Lowe. Linebacker made the first one, so... On the season, DeBerg has thrown eight interceptions. He's, I would think Fouch is going to go into the end zone right now. Jefferson going into the dressing room early now. First and 10 at the 24, 11 seconds to go. Charges to pick up some more points before we're through in the first half. Fouch loops it downfield, and Joyner has a touchdown. Carly Joyner. He had two defenders on him, and they finally went to the veteran who beat him deep. Charlie Joyner, a 24-yard play, and San Diego opens it up. Well, he had time to throw. Good protection. Look at here. Plenty of time to throw. He can't cover him all over the field. Just fifth touchdown pass of the year, thrown by Dan Fouts. And Charlie Joyner has caught his first of the season against the outstretched hands of number 29, Gerard Williams. Five seconds to go. Durella will try to make it 17 to three. And he does. A big boost for San Diego. And he could be on the verge of blowing the 49ers out. Good call, good protection, smart football. 49ers only have themselves to blame. The worst they could have gone in was 13 maybe or 10 is 10 something like that but throwing that ball short with 21 seconds to play throwing it into a into a crowd well the 49ers have, as you look at that pass again just well executed Williams was right there, trying to right cover there. it and Joyner was right there when you can run from one side of the field to the other there's no way a defensive back can stay up with him Joyner's a fine receiver another one of those acquisitions we talked about that have helped this football team. Former Cincinnati Bengals. So the 49ers have had to face some tough offensive clubs. New Orleans last week, San Diego this week. They have Seattle next week. They can put some points on the board as you look at Jurella. And then the week after that, the 49ers go to New York to play the Giants, actually to Giants Stadium in New Jersey. 
The Giants have not been a good offensive team. Actually, they're pretty shaky. That last score can take it out of your ball club. When, you're, when you have a chance, you're playing pretty good football, and they get a score with four or five seconds to play, can take it out of you, especially your defense. Five seconds to go. Lenville Elliott. And after this tackle, the half will be over. And it is. So the San Diego Chargers catching a break, and some uh, late spurts have a uh, walloping 17-3 lead over the San Francisco 49ers. That's the end of the first half here from San Diego. He's doing everything, trying to call time out now for the Raiders. He's doing it all. You better give him some pom-poms. When his shoulder gets better, you get an idea again of the emotion on the sideline. Not only Matuzak, but players on this Oakland sideline really excited about the way their offense is playing. And Stabler not satisfied to sit on a four-point lead. He wants more. Excellent pass right on the money. Super, super catch by Branch. Ball is at the 17-yard line, and we'll be back. As you can see, just a very small quadrant of the field is still bathed in sunshine here. And by the time we start the third quarter, we should be entirely in shade. And that will be to an advantage, I imagine, on both sides. I see a lot of fans uh, going over there in that corner. I mean, fans, hand fans to cool people off. <laughs> you can get a heck of a suntan down here. You can get a suntan in the shade. <laughs> From the 32-yard line, pass goes wide left, Isaac Curtis to the right. Alexander, 40, and Griffin, 45 of the running backs. And to about the 35-yard line, the ball carrier, Charles Alexander, as Anderson tried to cross him up a little bit, and he didn't fool anybody. Larry Bethea, 76, and Bruce Thornton, 77, are the men who combined to make the stop. And they have the nickel defense in there now for Dallas. Second down, six. Throws it over the middle. He's got a man. It's fast to the 45-yard line. Bass is one of many... Texas natives playing in this game for Cincinnati today. Billy Brooks, of course, is not here. Bushnock is injured. Blair Bush, Vern Holland, Wilson Whitley. Great catch by Jimmy Corbett at the 43 of uh, Dallas. And Cincinnati slowly, inexorably moving downfield. But you know what, Sam? A lot of people ask people in football, why are you, why is it so easy for you to gain yards the last two minutes of the half of the game and you can't do that during the football game? Well, the reason is Dallas is sitting back far enough to make sure that they don't get a touchdown. They'll give up 10 yards. They don't want to give up six points. Okay, we'll return in just a moment. The announcement was furnished as a public service by the National Football League. A minute 12 showing here in the first half. Cincinnati has moved the football now to the Dallas 43-yard line where they have a first down. And a score here before halftime for the Bengals could be very, very valuable. Griffin inside the 40 to the 38. Upended there by Randy Hughes, the strong safety. It'll be second down and five. The Bengals have two timeouts remaining. As we move under one minute, Anderson back to pass on second down. Has a man back at the 21-yard line. And he held on to the football. A great catch by Don Bass. Great concentration on the football. And he took a good lick. A very good hit from Dennis Thurman and hung on to the football. The Bengals will call a timeout. Now they got it on the 20-yard line. And to add one more thing of what I said, why it's so easy to get yardage with two minutes to go in the half, and that is the defensive backs are protecting only one part of the field within the last two minutes, and that's the field behind them. The rest of the game, they're, they're, they're protecting all the field. 45 seconds remaining in the first half. Larry Brunson's 50-yard kickoff return has positioned the Raiders in Denver territory. Red Miller looks at Ken Stabler, set his line on the 17, second down and four. Open, Rich Martini, first and goal at the six-yard line. 
year receiver from the University of California, Davis, has his first catch. The There's Raiders no going huddle. without a huddle. They're going right after two passes in a row, thrown to Louie Wright, one of the best quarterbacks in the business. From the six. He threw that one away. He wanted to save the timeout. 22 seconds now remaining as Stabler now has its second and goal at the six yard line. That allows us to go back and look at the completion to Martini. We're going to give you a look at both of those passes by Stabler. The first one to Branch and watch the bumping that Branch takes as he gets his hands on this football. Louis Wright right on his back hits him there. The ball bounces loose for a second and Branch who was questionable for this game with a thigh injury or a hamstring injury just absolutely clutches that with one hand. The second pass again thrown on Louis Wright who is an all pro and one of the toughest in the business. Right now we're going to go back down to the live action. 22 seconds remaining second and goal from the six Stabler. Incomplete for Branch. Penalty flag down. Interference on Steve Foley number 43. The right cornerback from Tulane. That'll make it first and goal at the one yard line. Branch going into the end zone catch Foley just gave him a little shot Stabler back here again has time to throw the football zips that ball inside see if you can see the bump right there Foley over the back on the one yard line first and goal tough call but it appeared to be a good one so the Raiders after seeing their lead cut to seven to three trying to make it 14 to three 18 seconds the Bronco defense Defensively, but they put points on the board offensively. They go into the locker room with a very comfortable lead. Let's see if it's going to be even more comfortable after this kick by Jim Breach. Out of the hold of David Hum. Bly Levin for Pittsburgh. Good question. He worked yesterday. We'll have to wait and see. It all begins Tuesday night at Riverfront in Cincinnati. At the 20-yard line, Brinson with the football, 35, and he's tackled on the far side of the field. Over there to make the stop was Tom Rude, 51. And so the Cowboys, I would imagine, will be content to run the clock out here with 31 seconds to go and starting this series at their own 35-yard line. You just did a baseball promo. I think we got at NBC got to say uh, congratulations to the Montreal Expos with all the double headers they had to play in the last two and a half weeks in the season. Dick Williams has done a marvelous job with that baseball team that is very young and they really deserve to get in the playoffs and I'm very sorry to see them lose. Ditto ditto. I don't know if I can ditto the last part of it but I'll ditto the first two. To the 40 yard line lead law number 35 the ball carrier. Ross Browner 79 is the man who made the stop. And they are letting the clock run, as one might expect, leading here 21 to 6. And the Cowboys have had themselves a first half. Now, there's a big question to be answered here, Bob. And that is, the Cowboys haven't hurt anybody this year as regards blowing them out of a football game. Can they do it to Cincinnati? Well, I do think that, that Cincinnati has kind of been snake bitten this season. Dallas has not played very well, and still they're up 21 -1.
all the scores. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, they want me to go on the radio. Have I got time to go on the radio next? No. Okay. No. No. Okay. They're going to have us. We're going to New York. I can't. Twice. Back live in New York, I'm Brent Musburger. The Oakland Raiders have just struck again. They lead Denver now 14-3. Let's get you up to date on all the scores. Final, Minnesota 13, Detroit 10. The Vikes are now 3-2, and two, two games behind the amazing Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Washington runs its record to 4-1 and one as they down Atlanta 16-7 the final there. The New York Giants are now 0-5 as they lose to New Orleans 24-14. Archie Manning and the Saints are 2-3. The Pittsburgh Steelers are unbeaten no more as they lose to Philadelphia 17-14. Both those clubs now 4-1. Next for the Eagles, the Washington Redskins in Philadelphia. Miami loses to the New York Jets, so the Dolphins are now 4-1. The Jets are 2-3. Cleveland also unbeaten coming into this Sunday. Loses for the first time 31-10 as Houston runs its record to 4-1. Cleveland, Houston, Pittsburgh all tied at the top of the AFC Central. Buffalo downs Baltimore 31-13. Look out below for Robert Ursay and Ted March of Rhoda as the Colts slip to 0-5. The amazing Bills are 3-2. Chicago next for Buffalo. And here it is the only unbeaten team in the NFL. 5-0, Tampa Bay. Next for the Buccaneers, the lowly New York Giants. Chicago slips to 2-3. and three. All right, now partial scores. Los Angeles ahead of St. Louis, 14-0. Cullen Bryant has one touchdown for the Rams today. The game you're watching at the half, 17-3. Should have been closer, but the 49ers made a costly error toward the end of the first half. The Cowboys run it up 21-3 after last Monday night's embarrassment in Cleveland. Scott Laidlaw has rushed for two touchdowns. Robert Newhouse is not playing. The Oakland score I just reported, 14-3. Casper has caught a scoring pass from Stabler, 28 yards in that game. Ted McKnight runs in from 24 yards out, and Kansas City leads Seattle 10-3. And, Jane, we got the last baseball race all over. Yes, we do, Brent. The Pittsburgh Pirates clinch the National League East title this afternoon by beating the Chicago Cubs 5-3, while the Montreal Expos were losing to the Philadelphia Phillies 2-0. The Pirates' victory was their 98th of the season, the most wins for a Pirate team since 1909. They now meet the Cincinnati Reds in the best-of-five National League playoffs. Game one is set for Tuesday evening in Cincinnati. The Pirates were led today by two of their old pros, Willie Stargell and Bill Robinson, who drove in two runs apiece. And Montreal, however, was thwarted by the three-hit pitching of the Philly Steve Carlton. Jimmy the Greek, who do you favor in that best of five? Pittsburgh. For the simple reason that I was born 37 miles from there. No, they got a slight, <laughs> they got a slight better bullpen, I think, than Cincinnati. And That's in a, a short reason. series, in a short series, it'll be a little bit better. Jimmy remembers the 09 team, I think, Jane. He knows <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Ray Guy to kick it off. It's it. Payne at the 7, 10, 20, 30. Bronco fans looking for that same kind of return magic that helped the Raiders to the touchdown, but Payne couldn't break it as the Raiders had it covered well. Booker Russell, 34, made the tackle. Well, you talk about the action today, Merlin, and you look at that first game next Sunday, Pittsburgh and Cleveland now both 4-1 and one as they both lost for the first time today at Muni uh, Municipal Stadium Cleveland, over 80,000 fans. Oh, I want to... Boy, those two, those two teams, that's another blood battle, too, just like this one. That's a grudge match in a, in a street fight every year. Flags are down, and so is quarterback 
Craig Morton, but it did appear that the Raiders jumped the gun defensively. Like Dave Pear uh, decided he was going to get there a little bit before everyone else, and he certainly did, but not much before the flag. Pear from the University of Washington, Baltimore's third round pick in 75, then Tampa Bay picked him up in the expansion draft, and it cost the Raiders a number two and a number three draft pick to get him. Now you talk about the Raiders and the fact that maybe they aren't playing up to the standards of their past 14 consecutive winning years. They have not had a number one draft pick in the last four drafts. And that has to hurt a club. Today. It's hurt them not to be able to go after that top flight talent. Day. No question about it. Morton flares it out and incomplete to Jim Jensen. Try to screen it in that left flat. And now only five seconds remain in the first half. Got a feeling for Martin's view of things right there. It drops back, a little screen pattern. I think Morton realized there was no way to get that thing off. Just flipped it out there. It falls incomplete. Drops out of the hands of the receiver there. We're talking about the draft picks. Oakland has really traded those picks for what they thought would be first-round players or front-line players. Mike McCoy, who's since been traded away. Monty Jackson, who's hurt, who has played well for them. Ted Hendricks said. Ted Hendricks, probably, probably the most valuable money they've traded for. And certainly one of the reasons they have played well. second count. Well, I think Morton just figuring we're going to run this out. Uh, a lot of field to cover in that quick a time. Of course, uh, I hate to see uh, hate to see a team giving up. You, you never want to you never want to give up an opportunity to get some more points on the board. Red Miller, not the most aggressive uh, of offensive coaches. Uh, very often would feel that uh, his team would rather be would rather have them conservative and uh, save their punches for the second half. Very Cirillo. Keyworth, big yardage, but the Raiders were giving him that kind of yardage out to the 45. The first half comes to an end, and the Oakland fans liked what they saw. At halftime in the Coliseum in Oakland, the Raiders 14, the Denver Broncos 3. I still sometimes insist on using the words. Blair Bush out over the football, first down Cincinnati, and they send Bass wide left. And Isaac Curtis, despite what appeared to be a little hamstring problem, to the right. And the pass out here intended for his running back, Charles Alexander. Cliff Harris had the coverage. It goes as an incomplete pass. And Isaac Curtis is limping and limping badly. I'm not sure if it's hamstring or his hamstring or what, but I think he was the primary receiver on that play. And Kenny threw it out to Charles Alexander in the flat. Hopefully we'll try to get a picture of it. I think it's his left leg. Nobody has caught more touchdown passes in Cincinnati history than Isaac Curtis. A total of 37, but he has been uh, rendered ineffectual for all practical purposes here in 1979. Well put, well put. Second down, Kenny Anderson. Hegman faking the blitz. They throw it out here to Alexander, and Hegman got over to make the stop on it. Same play, different coverage. Ah, you remember number 58? I think the last time you saw him was in Super Bowl 13 when he stripped the ball from Terry Bradshaw after Thomas Anderson stopped him. And there they are. That was the nasty duo, wasn't it? Well, it was if you were from Pittsburgh. I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> you know, the odd thing about that play is that it cannot happen again. You're right. Because of the new rule, the whistle blows when the quarterback is in the grasp of the defensive player. Absolutely. Anderson needs to play to stay the least. Trailing 21 to 3. Tried to throw it ahead to Alexander and it proved an incompleted forward pass. Larry Bethea broke it up. He picked up the football. But that will be ruled an incompleted pass. Randy White was there. It almost worked. That's the old shovel pass. The first down, first team I saw ever do that was Dallas from just about the same thing in shotgun formation. What he tried to do is a an underhanded forward pass to Charles Alexander on the back side of the pass rush. There's nobody left. Everybody else in the back, the defensive backfield has got coverage on somebody. Bill goal time. Well, it was a great uh, play theoretically. It just didn't work. And so Barr will attempt one now from the 29-yard line. Look good on paper. Yeah. Ryder will hold at the 29. An attempt of 39 yards. Chris Barr is second attempt of the day. He's one for one. 
He kicks this one, and he nailed it. So Barr has been the only offense Cincinnati has had this afternoon. With 39 seconds to go in the half, the Bengals now trail 21-6. to six. Irv, let's take a look at some highlights now. We have got the Giants at New Orleans. Phil Simms did take over the Giants after Joe Pisarsik started, but the game really belonged to Archie Manning and the Saints. They were the leading team as far as yardage is concerned coming into this game, and Chuck Muncie out of California did not disappoint. You saw 42 earlier. Now he's in for the New Orleans score as he barges across. That made it 10-0. Now watch the Giants coming on the blitz. Manning gets it off, and here's Ike Harris. Touchdown, Saints. Here's the youngster, Phil Sims, handing off to Billy Taylor, and it was 17-7 New Orleans at this point. Manning again. Now watch this Giant defense. Carson has been feuding a bit with Perkins, and here's the middle linebacker, the Giants, dropping off into that pass zone, picking it off. And here's the young man out of Moorhead State, Phil Sims. New York fans have been clamoring for him, and they get him. Ken Johnson, touchdown. Manning, one more time. It's Muncie, and the Saints win again. Irv, what do you got? Well, the Atlanta Falcons and Washington Redskins went head-to-head -head down in Atlanta today, and the Redskins, who are averaging about 24 points a game, scored enough to win it today. 16 to 7. But in the first quarter, it was Atlanta getting the first call as William Andrews, a rookie out of Auburn, goes over his left guard for a touchdown, and they draw first blood and lead 7 to 3. Joe Theismann had a pretty good day throwing the ball. Brent completed 19 out of 26 passes for 233 yards. Ten of them went to this man, Danny Bugs, 10 for 134 yards down to the one yard line. And from there, John Riggins goes over. Washington Redskins lead held up, and they wound up winning the ball game 16 7. All right, Minnesota and Detroit. The Vikes now in pursuit of those amazing Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And the quarterback they're going to be counting on is young Kramer. How about the year Ahmad Rashad is off to? Seven touchdowns already. Here he is getting free right in the middle. No one around him inside the 20-yard line. Kramer goes to Tucker. And the Vikes get to the two-yard line. Chuck Foreman didn't start, but Ted Brown was shaken up. In came Foreman. He got the two-yard touchdown, 10-3 Minnesota. Now here's Kramer looking this time for Sammy White. Two talented receivers as he gets them working. Rashad on one side and White on the other. It was 13-3. Ricky Kane got a touchdown pass before it was over to make it 13-10 on the screen play. And Comlo took it on in. And Irv? The amazing Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You're going to see it, folks. They wound up beating the Chicago Bears by a score of 17 to 13. They are now the only undefeated team in pro football. Jerry Eckwood, a rookie running back, keep his name and number in mind. Number 43 goes 61 yards in this run. One of the most exciting plays of the day. Eckwood on the day, Brent, carried the ball for 23 times, ran for 120 yards, had a pretty good rushing day. Of course, the Bears had to answer that play with a superstar of their own. You know who he is, number 34, Walter Payton, taking a screen pass. All you can do is sit back and watch an artist go to work. In the 10-yard line, he says, I'm going to go ahead and blast in there. And away he goes, and the Bears get on the scoreboard. But Tampa Bay was still in the ball game. The Bears leading 13-10 at that point. Doug Williams coming back late in the ball game, hitting Isaac Higgins for a touchdown. It held up, and Tampa Bay defeated the Bears 17-13. Irv, I tell you, Don Shula better not ever sit down at a poker table with Walt Michaels. Michaels will win his money, his clothes, his wife, his house, his car, anything. You name it. He's beaten him three straight times now. The Jets don't have that much talent. There's a Jets blocking that punch. Johnny Lynn scrambles in for the touchdown at Shea Stadium. 7-0 after the extra point. Now here's Greasy. He came back from that injury. He wants Cephalo number 81. 26 yards. Touchdown. Dolphins, it was tied. Here it is. Todd. 43 yards. Derek Gaffney with a sensational catch. And from there it was Newton. And Newton banged in for a couple of scores, as a matter of fact. But the combination you always got to watch out for when you play the Jets is this one. Todd, Walker, 70 yards, touchdown, Jets. And New York upsets Miami. Dolphins lose for the first time. Let's send you back now to San Diego. Dick Stockton and George Allen. Evan Moore, County, firstly, please report to security. 
We're back here in San Diego Stadium. Dick Stockton and George Allen and George for a while. It looked as if the 49ers might be doing the right things to pull the, the upset we talked about. Yes, Dick. One of the things we said is they had to keep the 49ers offense had to keep the Charger offense off the field. Fouts has, has fine receivers, good running backs, good offensive line. They, they passed for 166 yards the first half. They can't make the mistakes they did. We had, had a real good ball game either way until that last interception. Now the 49ers offense is going to have to open up and throw the ball more. You know, up until that mistake, toward the end of the half, they were in pretty good shape, weren't they? Yes, they were. I, I think that uh, the Chargers have so much ammunition in the passing game that you have to defense the pass first and the run second. Now, the Chargers only made 34 yards running this first half, but when you get the ball in the 24-yard line or 21-yard line, you have field position like that, you can do anything you want to. This is a real test of the 49ers character now. Uh, this is the first game we've done where they've been behind this far early in the, uh, this early in the ball game. Usually they're ahead at halftime or tied or a point or two different. So this is a test of their character. And the San Francisco defense, which has been suspect so far this year, played well for a while. And the thing is, how long can they stay on the yeah. field? They're not that powerful to begin with, and they've been on there a long time. Yes, they have. Uh, that's a good point. They're also giving Fouts too much time to throw. And that last touchdown pass, he must have had five seconds to throw the ball because uh, uh, Williams had to run way across the field to try to stay with uh, Jordan. Now, if you are a San Francisco fan watching this game in the Bay Area, do you come back and you start to throw immediately, or you still think you have some time to do the short passes and keep into the plane? Uh, I think you, you still go with a short passing game, screens, draws, just enough runs to keep them honest, but you got to throw more to get back in. you got to throw deep a little bit. you got to try to get a big play, because when you're behind 17-3, to three, you can't just grind it out. All right, we'll see what happens. The second half is about to start. The teams are back on the field and will return for the second half of this game in just a moment.
bearded Dan Fowl, 16 for 22, 165 yards, one touchdown, his longest toss, 24 yards, and that was a score to Joyner that made it 17 to 3. He played at Oregon, and as many people in the Bay Area realize, his dad, Bob Fouts, one of the outstanding sports broadcasters. 17 to 3 to score. Fouts also threw one interception as Roy Girella tees it up, and the 49ers will go on offense. To start this half, Lenville Elliott, number 35, is back there along with James Owens, number 20. So the 49ers picked up 98 yards total offense in the first half. San Diego 166 passing, 34 rushing. First down, 15 to 8 in favor of the Chargers. We have a report that Buchanan has Bruce Ribs and, and will not play the second half. Jerome Duff, number 48, will take his place in the left corner. And he's had experience starting there in the past before Buchanan got here. Ready for the kickoff. 17 to 3 to score. And it's going to be Owens at the goal line. And he's derailed at the 20 yard line. Pete Shaw, a backup safety, makes the stop. So let's see what Steve DeBerg and Bill Walsh have in mind here at the 21 yard line. O.J. Simpson, number 32, and Wilbur Jackson, number 40, of the setback. Simpson gained 32 yards on six carries for a 5.3 average. That's better than his season's mark. Jackson averaged four and a half yards per carry. It's up for the offense now to, to put the team back in the ball game. they got to control the ball and put some points on the board. To the top of your picture, number 88, Freddie Solomon. 84, Schumann. 84 to the bottom. And Brewer, the tight end in motion. Here's Wilbur Jackson going wide, and he'll be out of bounds after picking up and off number 40, Wilbur Jackson. a couple now of yards. Ray Preston, 52, the linebacker, makes the stop. Number 99, Wilbur Young. Let's watch him. 290 pounds. Another smart acquisition by the Chargers. Watch his lateral pursuit, and he took the right angle. He took the right angle to run the ball carrier out of bounds. He's more effective at tackle than he was when he was in an end with Kansas City. Second and seven, the ball of the 25. Paul Seal, 85. Bob Brewer, 82, in there. Solomon is out. Here's O.J. Simpson, and he's tackled. Penalty marker thrown. Penalty marker down as Simpson gets to about the 26th middle linebacker Bob Horn who has an interception and holding is called against the 49ers and these things can kill you. Well you know I've I've always felt the first series on offense and the first series on defense the second half are critical. They're especially critical when you're behind like the 49ers. The first series on offense you've got to move that football. You can't run three plays and punt it and put your defense in the hole. Number 82, offense, holding, second down. It was the tight end Brewer who was holding on the play. The offensive line for the 49ers, Ron Singleton, number 67, Keith Bonhor, 71, the tackle, John Ayers, 68, and Randy Cross, 51, the guards, and Fred Quillen, who's played well so far this year, the center, number 56. Second and 17 now at the 15, Freddie Solomon back in there. Paul Field goes out. The Berg in a tough spot back at the 15-yard line. A lot of pressure, and he is down by Gary Johnson, number 79. He had no well, chance. See, you, you, you can blame the, the offensive line for this, but when you get in a situation where you've got to throw the football, come up with long yard situation, the defense can tee off. Look at here. Tee off to the outside. Play pass all the way, pass rush, pass coverage. Puts a lot of pressure on the quarterback, any quarterback. So it'll be third and, and miles, third and 25 at the four-yard line. He had, he, him had by, he had him by the face mask there, Dave. Got to hold him by the face mask. Nothing called, third and 27. And that's 49er Schumann started to move. Simpson carries. And it's going to be another penalty against San Francisco. That's something that should never happen. An outside receiver should never be offside. The Chargers will refuse the penalty and force the 49ers to punt the ball. So the 49ers come out flat as a pancake in the start of the second half. Well, we talked at halftime about character. See how much character you have when you're down. 84, refuse, so fourth down. 
Bill Wall sees his team goes backward, uh, go backward on the first series, and Dan Melville, who's averaged around 40 yards a kick, will punt. And the four, the Chargers are assured, barring a penalty or a turnover, of great field position because Fuller's at the 45-yard line of San Francisco. Opening minute here of the third quarter, 17 to three, the Chargers lead, looking for their fourth victory in five starts. Good kick and good coverage. Fuller is back there. Penalty marker is down. Let's see if we have a clip as Fuller is set back at his own 40-yard line. Jeff McIntyre, number 52, makes the stop. And a clipping penalty called against San Diego, and that'll set him back. So the 49ers get a break on this situation. A 48-yard punt by Melville. Melville came through. The putter is a the defense best friend if he doesn't come through with a good kick they're in trouble Jerome Dove, number, number 48 clipping number 48 Jerome Dove on the clip so <laughs> we said barring a penalty we'd have a great field position that's not the case tonight on CBS 60 minutes a great show followed by Archie Bunker's place then one day at a time more great comedy with Allison and the Jeffersons and Trapper John MD you'll love that show all tonight on CBS First and 10 at the 26-yard line for the Chargers starting way back. Into the line goes Clarence Williams. Whistle had blown. It was a loose ball. Number 24, Artie Owens, the ball carrier. It was Artie Owens who carried the ball, not Williams. Artie Owens starting in the backfield. With this lead, the 49ers should be probably more concerned about stopping the run. The Chargers have a chance now to get that running game going we're talking about. They only picked up 34 yards running the first half. Second down and six. The ball at the 30-yard line. Charlie Joyner across the touchdown pass is to the left. In motion goes Artie Owens. And Owens is the receiver there on a back screen. Fights his way short of a first down by perhaps a yard. Pass complete. Archie Reese, number 78, makes the stop. Chargers offensive line has Billy Shield, 66. Russ Washington, number 70, at the tackle. Doug Wilkerson, 63, and Ed White, 67, the guards. Don Masick, number 62, is the center. Here's a, here's a big play for the 49er defense, third and one. And Hank Bauer, 37, is in the game as Owens goes out. Good short yardage man. Used as a decoy last time when Williams scored a three-yard touchdown. Third and two here at the 35. Fumble! And Faust is going to be tackled behind by Hardman, and so that fizzled. You know, that looked like it, it was going to develop into a bootleg. He was stopped by number 86, Cedric Hardman. Watch him. Maybe not. Maybe he's trying to give it to the fullback so for the first time today the Chargers are punting Jeff West who's averaging 35 and a half Freddie Solomon and Tony Dungy who had started until this game back long count high kick Solomon is back he can return them he's at the 23 but he goes nowhere gets to the 29 yard line Hank Bauer makes the stop. So the 49ers look to be in trouble before. Now they wind up with the ball, but they still trail 17 to three early in this third quarter. He hits this one, a sailor. Payne at the seven, 15, 20. Leaps to the 30 and somersault to the 34 yard line. An acrobatic return by Chris Payne Broncos will start it at their 34 yard line. The official halftime statistics are in. And here's how the numbers look. Just our first look at them ourselves. Uh, actually, Denver out gaining Oakland 175 to 132. Oakland having a better average uh, on passing than Denver, but uh, everything pretty even in the uh, stats.
field goal the key play that's Rick Upchurch at the 40 spinning away slippery on the sidelines and a first down before they can finally bump him to the sidelines at the Denver 49 yard line Jack Tatum 32 made the play let's reset that Denver offense Rick Upchurch number 80 dangerous wide receiver working with Haven Moses quarterback Craig Morton has his tight end Riley Odoms his backs well four men have been sharing the duty Rob Lytle and Otis Armstrong at halfback and Jim Jensen and John Keyworth at fullback Craig Morton did not start the game Norris Weiss did unable to manufacture any points in the first quarter Morton relieved him and as he did last week his assignment is to bring his team from behind in the second half Rob Lytle at the 50 the 45 he's to the 40 and that looks to be another first down for Denver before Rod Martin 53 can make the tackle in the Oakland defense well, the games are all played in four quarters not two and Denver coming out hot in the second uh, quarter of this one or in the third quarter start of the second half uh, Oakland now has got to get that defense fired up a little bit see if they can shut them down if Morton can march it all the way into the end zone he can certainly get them emotionally back into this game defense for the Raiders has pair Kinlaw Browning and Tume up front Villapiano Martin and Hendricks the linebackers Hayes and Williams at the corners Davis and Tatum the safety first down from near the 40 of Oakland and Morton down the sidelines for Upchurch well covered by Lester Hayes this telecast presented by authority of the National Football League intended for the private use of our audience any rebroadcast or other use of this telecast without the express written consent of the Oakland Raiders and the National Football League is prohibited with that toss by Craig Morton he's now three for nine in the game 71 yards Weiss was four for eight before Red Miller took him out. Jim Jensen right into the thick of that Oakland defense. Dave Pair, Villapiano and company. Kinlaw in on another tackle after a gain of about three yards. Make it four and call it third down six Denver. Bonnie Johnson into the game on a passing situation. He and Villapiano have alternated that middle linebacking spot. Two defensive backers coming in. Phillips and 36 Davis. And 38 Rufus Bess is in there also as a defensive back from South Carolina State. Norris Weiss now a spectator but itching to get back into the game. Got to wonder what's going through his mind as he sits and watches. Three wide receivers and only Jensen behind Morton third and six. Deep down the middle. Odoms can't quite get it at the 15 yard line. He drew a crowd and we may have another Raider injury and it appears to be Jack Tatum who's getting up slowly. Two Raiders collided Davis and Tatum. Not unusual for players on the same team to hurt each other you see it right there Tatum up in the air and just absolutely bends Davis right over backwards and as flexible as Davis is I don't think he's that flexible and he is hurt now Mike Davis 36 still not up for the Oakland Raiders shaken his Tatum but I believe he'll stay in the game so the injury list that we showed you early in this game continues to grow for the luckless Raiders Watch that. You see the bend right there. The legs bent right back underneath Davis. Tatum took a stomach, took a helmet right in the stomach. <laughs> He's, huh, I wonder who's yelling at. I, maybe he's yelling at Tatum. I think so. He said, <laughs> hey, Jack, you are a hitter. Hey, I'm, I'm, the black guys are the good ones. So you don't, don't, please don't hit me. I'm on your side. Fourth down, seven yards to go. Interesting choice here, the kick, obviously, for the sideline, maybe a poocher. Let's see what Prestridge will do with it. Now the Raiders' defense played very well the first half, and they stopped the Broncos' first drive of this second half. Larry Brunson stands at the 10, aiming for the sidelines. Good-looking kick. They're going to mark it at the 7-8. Eight yard line nicely done by the rookie Prestridge Oakland's first possession will start at the eight. Hold on. We may have a flag. Ineligible receiver downfield against the Broncos and so the Raiders may ask Prestridge to do it again. 
Well, they want to see a repeat of that. And there you see the man who say, hey, come on, let's not make that kind of mistakes. That's the reason we're down by 11 points here in the first half. He wants his team to get a little more on the ball, and I don't blame him. That's, you hate to see mistakes, especially when they take away from a great play like that punt by Prestridge. Red Miller will watch his rookie kicker from Baylor. Prestridge try to aim it out of bounds again. Guys, you can see NFL number three. You get the feeling that by the end of this year that Grupp and Parsley may be in trouble. The guy will be attacking their lead. Prestridge, not bad. First year, 41.8. Aiming again for the right sidelines. Another good-looking kick. Good this kick. may be better. Oh, just missed it. Now it goes into the end zone as he had that coffin corner zeroed in, but missed by about 10 yards. Don Coryell getting refreshed. A six-second hang time for West on that punt. First and 10 at the 29-yard line. Hofer, 36, is in there with Jackson in motion is shooting for DeBerg. Let's see how he plays it. 17 to 3. He goes deep and back is Hofer. He has it at the 40-yard line. And they went deep here to Paul Hofer out of the backfield to the 25-yard line. Well, that's what we were talking about. They had to go deep. They needed a big play. Hofer was open. If he didn't have to wait for the ball, he might have scored on it. Good play. Pretty good execution. The 49ers had a total of 108 yards total offense up to that play. Woody Lowe gets him from behind a 46-yard play for the 49ers who have first and 10 at San Diego's 26. Solomon is out of the game. Hofer with a fine play. O.J. Simpson, number 32, is back in there now out of the eye. The up back is Wilbur Jackson, number 40. And it's Jackson cutting off tackle. He gets a couple of yards, and it was big hands again. Gary Johnson, who got a hold of him and wouldn't let go, picked up a couple of yards. Well, this is a vital drive right now to get back in the ball game. They have to score. They have to get a touchdown here. They can't even settle for a field goal. They got to put seven points on the board to get back in this ball game. Second and seven. The ball at the 24-yard line of San Diego. 49ers, one thing you can say about them, they are competitive and have been this year. Paul Steele, number 85, Ken McAfee, 81. Two tight ends in there now. And here's Simpson going wide. Simpson fights his way close to the 20-yard line. Lane Edwards forces him out. So it'll be third down. It'll be third and, let's say, five for the 49ers. A big play here at the 21, George. They could be thinking four down. They're in the four down area. They're, they're behind 17 to three. They may have to go all four downs to keep the drive going. Freddie Solomon, number 88, back in the game. Bob Brewer, 82, is the tight end. Solomon at the bottom of your picture. Third and four at the 21. Play action. Pass. He's got it, and Brewer has it inside the five-yard line to the two, and another first uh -oh. down on a good fake inside, oh, yeah. good cross pattern inside yeah. by the rusher. A good throw, a good catch. The bird was rushed. Nice play action fake, crossing pattern to Brewer. Now watch him. Watch the ball is low. First down. Brewer felt he should have scored. He tripped there, slipped up. He'll take it. First and goal at the two-yard line as Walsh. Checks the plan. 9.42 to go, third quarter. 49ers trying to get back in the game. Three tight ends in there for San Francisco. Jackson gets to the one-yard line, and that's all. It'll be second down. That, that's the play to run. Straight ahead, give it to Jackson. Two hands on the ball. No mistakes. Same play again. Coming up. So Jackson comes out of the game, and Phil Francis is in, so he might look for a pass here. Don Coryell likes to put the ball in the air. Right now, he's trying to stop San Francisco. Second and goal at the one. Francis, and it's O.J. Simpson touchdown. O.J. Simpson has scored the touchdown, and San Francisco coming out so flat and stale have rallied and Simpson has his second touchdown of the season rushing. Well, that was a big series, a vital series for the 49ers. The big play was the pass to Hofer. This should give their defense a shot in the arm. 17 
to nine the score and Ray Worshing will attempt the point after with Montana holding. It's blocked. The kick is blocked. And that could hurt because now the 49ers need more than a touchdown to tie Gary Johnson. Came, and in fact, the Chargers defensive line played a great game. Let's came see right to the inside. Let's see if we can see that. Beat him inside. So it's 17 to 9 here in San Diego. There that's indicative of the first half. Well, one of the things that the Bengals rely on a great deal is, is play action passing. And they only have 53 yards rushing the football, so the play action does nothing to the Dallas Cowboys, to their defense. Uh, I really don't think that Cincinnati has played that badly. They had one very bad turnover, which resulted in the, the Cowboys' first score, but they haven't played that badly. They're Waterloo in the person of a 68-yard interception by Randy Hughes, and it was all Dallas after that. Short kick, Turner at the three. 15, 20. Outside, out of bounds at about the 27-yard line, run out by Dennis Thurman, the former Southern California star. 24 yards on the return, and so kicked by Dr. Trumpy near the end of the first half. And he is back. First down, Cincinnati. From the I formation, deep back, Archie Griffin gets to the 28. Randy White and Bob Bruniger, the men who make the stop, a gain of a couple of yards by the two-time Heisman Trophy winner in his fourth year now out of Ohio State. Seems remarkable that he's already in his fourth year. It does seem like yesterday. Sam, you'll remember in the first half that the Bengals did most of their throwing on the first downs. I hope they don't go away from that in the second half only simply because they're trailing 21 to 6. That seemed to work very well for them. Number 84, Don Bass, comes wide left. And Isaac Curtis still in the starting lineup, wide right from the I formation. Pete Johnson, the up back, but it's Griffin to about the 34-yard line carrying the football. And he's dragged down by Henderson, 56, and White, 54. And it'll be third down at about four yards to go for Cincinnati. And Corbett comes out. Danny Ross goes in. They are the messengers today for Homer Rice. And you see the third down conversions there. The Cowboys have been very effective. The Bengals have been rather ineffectual. Actually, he's got about third and five, doesn't he? They split the backs again. Nickel defense by Dallas. The fifth defensive back is Thurman. Martin offside. Free play for Anderson. Throws it down here for Isaac, and he scores. Couldn't hold on. Curtis, single coverage with the uh, rookie Aaron Mitchell, and he could not hold on to the football, but I think they'll get the first down nonetheless. And a neat little bit of inflection by Kenny Anderson drew Harvey Martin off. That's legal. Defense offside, as long as you don't bob your head or anything like that, you can yell and scream and whistle it, anything that you want. I am more concerned about Isaac Curtis. That appeared to hit him right in the hands. Well, I don't think I... 29, offside, first down. And Isaac Curtis is coming off the field. So on the offsides by Harvey Martin, it's a first down for Cincinnati. Their drive is kept alive, and Steve Kreider, 86, replaces Isaac Curtis. Line of scrimmage, the 38-yard line of Cincinnati, trailing 21 to 6. Throws it out here to Kreider. He caught it. Out of bounds at the 47. Aaron Mitchell playing a little bit off him. But a pickup of about seven yards, and Anderson had some pressure on. Him. And Kreider is one for one with the sidelines. Once again, this is a time pass. Kenny goes back. The receiver goes to set distance. He sets and releases it quickly. D.D. Lewis almost got to him on a linebacker blitz. Fine catch by Kreider. Good play. Keep that up. Gain of eight, second down and two, Cincinnati. Now they ship Griffin to the top of the eye. Pete Johnson is the up back. He gets the carry. First down as he reaches the 48-yard line, I believe. Brunig is the man who made the stop. But Johnson is a lug. 250 pounds. Six feet tall, third year out of Ohio State. Would nine pounds make any difference as to whether or not he's a lug? <laughs> no, is, is he he's 259. Wow. They're and he can still run, and he can catch the ball very well. Unfortunately, he's playing one-handed. There's a big part of the football game right there, time of possession. That normally tells you who's winning and losing. Well, it's a, 
rather accurate barometer today, isn't it? Yes, it is. Bengals moving now, have a nice drive going. Anderson on first down, throws it over the middle to Bass at the 40, at the 35-yard line. Stopped by Aaron Kyle, but Bass has had himself a great afternoon. Absolutely. Getting nothing but single coverage out there, and Bass is making Aaron Kyle look bad. He's a big kid, too. He weighs about 218 pounds, has sensational speed, is from right here in Dallas, went to Houston, has a lot of players on the Dallas team that were teammates of his. Six catches, 81 yards unofficially for Don Bass today. And when Billy Brooks comes off the injured reserve list, the Bengals are going to have some, uh, some outstanding receivers if they can get Isaac going. Griffin for a couple of yards. And while I gave you that statistic on Bass, it reminds me that I want to tell you that here in Dallas, you get about as good a spotting and stats core as there is in the National Football League. Bruce Jolish is our stats man. Doug Adams and Ted Davis are the spotters, keeping Trumpy and I in business as usual as you see a third quarter score, 21-6. That's us here, Texas Stadium, Irving, Texas. And we'll keep you up to date on the other late games as the scores come into us. It's an excellent drive by Anderson. It's brighter in motion. He gets the football and out of bounds at the 25. Very close to another Cincinnati first down. And that one on Aaron Mitchell. Once again, just motion. And they're trying desperately to get single coverage, which they're getting with motion through the backfield by Kreider from Lehigh University. Not what you call your football power, but the Bengals also have a player from Dartmouth. They have one from Yale. They have one from Harvard. So they all sit around and play bridge, I suppose. <laughs> the intelligentsia of the National Football League. How did you make that club coming from Utah? By the seat of my pants. First down. Second man is Archie Griffin. He's got a hole to the 15-yard line. He'll be just a little bit shy of a first down. Great block, Sam, by Pete Johnson. He just blasted D.D. Lewis. Watch Pete Johnson on this lead block. He just leveled D.D. Lewis and Archie Griffin, little guy but with a lot of moves, and almost busted up through there for six points. You know what the D.D. stands for in Lewis? Down and dirty? Dwight Douglas. Oh, he's got I like mine better. After Dwight Eisenhower and Douglas MacArthur, he's got some big reps to live up there. Really? You smoke a pipe? I don't know. Second down, two. Johnson puts his head into the pile and may have gotten the first down for Cincinnati inside the 15-yard line. Oh, did he ever. He broke through that pile. I hadn't seen where he landed, but he's down at the 12. Cliff Harris had to make the stop, but that will be another Cincinnati first down. And when he gets healthy, gets healthy he's going to be something else. I repeat, playing just about one-handed. And the offensive line of the Cincinnati Bengals captured the line of scrimmage there. And that's why you come up with a first down. This is the best drive for the Bengals today for sure, maybe for the season. They have really moved the football, and Dallas hasn't challenged them at all. First down again. Anderson inside handoff about the eight yard line Johnson again maybe the nine I may have given him a bit too much on that one Harrison scores now into the third quarter Oakland continues to surprise Denver 14 to 3 Kansas City at the Kingdome still leading Seattle 10 to 6 San Francisco coming back at San Diego now it's 17 mm. 9 the game being played in San Diego and the Rams still cruising over the Cardinals Sam, the Bengals can't go away from their game plan. They've got to throw it down here just like they have in the middle of the field. Second down and eight. You called it, Bob. Over the middle. Touchdown. Don Bass. That's six catches. He's had a heck of a day in front of the hometown folks from Fort Worth Polytechnic High School right here. Just a slant pattern. Kenny's got good protection. Throws it low. Make sure no interception. Brunig, Aaron Mitchell on the coverage. They kind of bumped into each other. Six points. Thank you, sir. And so Chris Barr will attempt to make it 13 points for the Bengals. So that field goal at the end of the first half gave them a little bit of impetus, and this drive has really been magnificent, as engineered by Anderson. Ryder holds it, and Barr drills it. So Ray Wershing will kick off. O.J. Simpson scored his 60th career touchdown rushing. Artie Owens at the three-yard line.
and gets to the 25. George, the point. 71 yards, six plays in that last drive. Nice, nice drive, time of possession, 239. But it was that big 46-yard pass to Hofer that made it possible, and the 49ers, for the first time, went that route, and let's see if they continue. But the Chargers have it, first and 10 at the 21, with just under nine minutes remaining in the third quarter. Let's see if they come out passing or running. Burton, number 87, to the left. Charlie Joyner to the right as Jefferson has been on the bench, shaken up since early in the game. In motion, Kellen Winslow, who's been a workhorse. Clarence Williams up the middle, a couple of yards. Scott Hilton, the linebacker, made the stop, number 55, for the 49ers. Scott Hilton. There you see the pass rushers go, and Al Cowlings came in along with Dwayne Board. Board, former Steeler, got some compliments from Harvey Martin with his work. Second and seven at the 29. Artie Owen trying to get loose, gets to the 31. Let's watch the middle linebacker, Buns, who was out and then came back into action. Flag on the play. Here's Danny Buns, 57. They're running a sweep to, to his left. Plays it nice, comes in and makes the tackle. Penalty will be against the Chargers, and it should be declined by the 49ers if it is uh, depending what it is. Well, they're going to take it, all right? Well, it's a major penalty. 67, offense, illegal hands, second down. What, watch the holding to the to Ed the white to There's the right of the frame 67 white is is holding there there's the call right there second and 17 now the former minnesota viking guilty there second and 17 ball at the 20 yard line Fouch is looking deep and he's going deep to burton and burton does he hold on to it no he does not he does not hold on to it and burton try to make a superb diving catch but right there was the official incomplete as Fouts went deep. Burton had, Burton had them both beaten deep. The ball was short. Let's watch it closely. It's kind of fluttering in there. Good call. It's a good call. He trapped it. Here it is again. Let's take it from another angle. It's a good call by Fouts. Burton's covered deep, but he outruns him. He made some good catches for the New Orleans Saints for a couple of years. Third and 17 at the 20-yard line. Another one of those deals that the Chargers utilized. Bout penalty marker down. He was rushed hard there by number 79, Al Cowling, who was activated for this game. But let's see what the penalty marker is. Might be against San Diego. We'll wait. If it is, it'll be declined for sure because it'll be fourth down and a punting situation. Well, the 49ers have been fairly successful with that 34 defense. They ran a stunt on that last play and, and got in there. Billy Shields from Georgia Tech holding on the play. So now Jeff West will kick from the five. He had a six second hang time last time and a superb as that ball sailed to the top of the stadium. We have Tony Dungy and Freddie Solomon back for San Francisco at the 40. So field position could be on the 49ers side here with 8.01 to go in the third. Uh, Freddie Solomon, number 88, is one of the best returners in the business. I like the way he returns punts. He's averaged eight and a half yards returning punts this year. Junkie has returned just one for 11. They are standing at the 40-yard line, their own 40. High kick and an excellent kick. Solomon back at the 26. If he breaks it, he'll get some yards, and a penalty marker down could be a clip here. And if it is, the 49ers are backed up some more. The well, you know, since they changed the rules, there's so many clips on punts, and that's what it is. You Bob Martin. You can't block below the waist. Uh, we have more replays on the kicking game than anything else now. I, I think if we're not careful, we're going to have a game that lasts three hours and a half. Might be on Bob Martin, the linebacker. We'll see. Personal foul, clipping, 
number 38 on the run back. We're getting, uh, Dick, we're really getting less returns on kickoffs and punts than we had before since we changed the rules. Bob Farrell was flipping on the play, so the 49ers are way back to their 19 when we resume. Helmet, and uh, that's an alteration to the uniform. I think he might get a letter from the league office or a telephone call. The dress code being challenged. Mark Van Egan. Power running his way for four yards on first down out to his own 24. Ken Stabler, as he goes to work for the first time on offense, 7 for 11 passing and 86 yards. The twos. <laughs> Is he a man? <laughs> I think he... I think you like that. What a tremendous difference uh, with this in size. Uh, the defensive line uh, shrinks in size with Matuzak and Philly out of there. You see some of the power of Van Egan here as he just refuses to go down. Takes about three of them to take him down. Then we're getting better play, more aggressive play defensively. They need to do more of it. Derek Jensen off the left side to the 27-yard line where it'll be third down and three. The Raiders have been bemoaning, understandably, Tom Flores' ill luck and all the injuries, but primarily because they've taken all of his speed away. Arthur Whittington, the outside running back, he can't, uh, uh, Flores, challenge that defense on the wide speed running, and with uh, Bradshaw and Branch out, although Branch is playing today, he didn't have the speed in his receivers. Uh, that's really getting nicked. Well, it's tough to run wide against Denver. They run laterally so well. So it doesn't hurt them as much against this team as it might against the slower team. Yeah, Miller making a trip down that sideline. He's like, saying, hey, you guys, you want to win this game? Let's get, a, let's get going. Well, Jensen does, and he has the first down. He got the ball across the 30-yard line before Bob Swenson, 51, could make the hit. Raiders have a first down, and we may have an injury. A Raider player, Dave Dalby, the center, has not gotten up yet, and Dalby rolls in pain on his back. Left tackle takes Dalby's spot at center. First down at the 31. Stabler, Van Egan. He's not fast, but you can see there the quickness off the ball. That first step by Van Egan is the key to his success. Not only a first step that's very quick, but also the ability to adjust as he gets into the defensive line and into the secondary. But having to adjust their lineup is certainly not a good sign for Oakland with already uh, already having to do without the services of so many of their veterans. O.J. Simpson has just scored for the 49ers in a one-yard run, but the extra point was blocked, so San Diego maintains the eight-point lead, 17-9. Offensive line did an excellent job of picking it up. You see Gratisher 53 coming in right there. It gets picked up by 31 Derek Jensen. And there's the pass. Defensive man all over him right there. Bernard Jackson. Casper wouldn't be denied that football. Penalty is against the Broncos. And of course the Raiders decline. Take the first down at the 47. You get an idea of the kind of pressure they're bringing with two defensive backers Jackson and Gratishar both coming excellent pickup gave Stabler time to throw that ball and that was one of the keys to the success of that play along with a great catch, catch, catch by Casper. That wasn't just by accident that they brought the linebackers right at Bella in his first play. First down at the 47 Derek Jensen plows ahead for a couple but Bob Swenson has paid a big game on defense number 51 made the play. To John Bella as he gets himself uh, loose in a hurry. Bella has never played over at that left tackle position. He's practiced there a little bit, but has never played there. You see him doing a good job there of warding off the defender, Bryson Manor, keeping him to the outside. But that's a big responsibility. Step off the bench cold and go into a position that you have never played during a game. Bella from the University of Southern California, drafted in 72 in the second round by the Raiders. You know, through the years, picked a lot of former USC players. Denver defense 
defense, of course, one of the quickest in football, reacting well to this kind of play. Van Egan, just a little delay pattern, stepped out of the backfield, isolates one-on-one -on, -one on Swenson, who does a good job of stacking him up with a little help from Billy Thompson. But that's a big pickup, first down play, Oakland down well into Denver territory, and Denver cannot afford more points on that board. They need to get them stopped and take the ball away from them. Every time you see that stapler pass in slow motion, you appreciate how beautiful a spiral he throws. Looks as if he just can't miss catching it. Van Egan gets about three off his own left side before 72 Don Latimer. Bryson Manor and he company stack it up. Does anyone throw a, is it because he's left-handed or does Stabler indeed just put the kind of rotation on the ball that makes his passes so pretty to watch in slow motion? They seem to be perfect. Well, he does put a beautiful rotation on the ball, and they say he throws one of the most catchable balls in football. In other words, the ball comes softly into your hands, and he does have the finesse of the great ones, uh, able to loft it over the top. Right now, the Denver Bronco defense not worried about finesse. They want a turnover. They haven't been as aggressive on turnovers this year, have not been taking the ball away as much as they did last year. Red Miller, I'm sure, hoping they'll get it going here. Eight minutes left in the third quarter. Uh-oh, that one didn't work. John Latimer, number 72. Read it well and drags down Derek Jensen for a loss. And that'll make it about third down and uh, about 12. Look at the inside as Stabler takes the snap from his center, Sylvester, playing for the injured Dalby. And there's Latimer, just burst through to the inside. Big defensive play by him. And that's the kind of play they're going to need if they're going to get this Oakland offense stopped. Now they spotted it back at the 40 yard line, so it's third and nine. Neither team all that successful on third down, although the Raiders two out of five for his 10. They need nine for the first down. That's Brunson out of the backfield in motion. Stabler caught by Derek Jensen or did he catch it? No. Nice effort by the second year former quarterback at Kentucky. Jensen, 6'4, 220 target. And on fourth down, Raymond Guy has to put it away. Check apparently that Vince Kenny was the man. Vince Kenny. They're apparently the official saying the ball was trapped. You can look for yourself. And Jackson smothers him right there. Hard for us to tell, although, well, hard for us to tell from here. I guess maybe we just stop right there. I'll tell you, he wishes he'd gotten up and gone out of bounds or somewhere <laughs> or else. Throwing it, the ball to the official. Somebody burped him right there. I was right. Finally, I was right for once. It was Derek Ramsey and not Ben Skinny who wears the 84 in the other uniform for the Denver Broncos. Bill Thompson is the solo man back at the 10. Guy will try to get this one out of bounds. Floats it into the end zone. He just missed. So it'll be Denver's ball at the 20-yard line. They stopped the Raiders. Neither team able to score here in the third quarter. And now six minutes, 56 seconds remaining in the third period.
Two grand horses in action next Saturday from Belmont Park on CBS. Well, in this situation, George Allen, first and 10 at the 19-yard line, what kind of passes would you well, suggest? you got to get, get rid of the ball quickly. That, that Charger rush has been putting an awful lot of pressure on him. So they got to get rid of the ball quickly whether they throw short or long. Hofer comes toward the line. He was in motion, and the pass goes out. Penalty marker is down. It was complete to Wilbur Jackson out of bounds at the 24-yard line. Mike Williams covering on the play, and DeBerg was hit hard. And it's a holding penalty against San Francisco, and they're in even more trouble now. Well, they did what we said. They threw the ball quickly. He can't hold the ball too long, or he's going to be rushed and pressured into a bad play. 17 to 9. The Chargers are in front. 7:45 remaining in the third quarter, and the ball is spotted at the nine. Number 67. Offense holding former San down. Diego Charger Ron Singleton, who was waived by this club in 1976. Bob McKittrick was the coach here. He was the man that didn't want him, and now McKittrick is working for Bill Walsh, and he's now working for McKittrick again in San Francisco. You never know what's going to happen <laughs> in this game. Don't burn your bridges, in other words. Goes first and 19, the ball at the nine yard line. Paul Hofer 36, and Phil Francis 48 of the setbacks in motion. Bob Brewer, the tight end, or one of the tight ends. DeBerg, heavy rush, and he's down. Uh, uh, Leroy Jones, among others. What took place is exactly what we said. The protection is such with that rush that he can't set up too long to throw. The pass has to develop quickly. It took a little too long. They're playing pass. They've disregarded the 49er running game. They disregard the 49er running game. They're playing pass rush, pass he coverage. 6'8", Leroy Jones, and there's his wife who loves the fact that he's got three sacks in the game. And this is Jones, we'll call it. It is second and 26, going live. O.J. Simpson, and Simpson gets stopped to the 10-yard line. Woody Lowe makes the stop. When you have a Louis Kelcher, who is hurt, who's an all-pro rusher, and you come up with a Jones and a well, Fred Dean who's not playing in Johnson, that really says a lot for the depth in your... Dick Stockton and Georgia Allen, and there's Don Coriel. Here's a big shift. Drafted five of their defensive players in the 1975 draft including Kelcher, who's not playing today. Two backs, a linebacker, and two men up front. Up the middle goes O.J. Woody Lowe stops him at the 16. It'll be fourth down, however, and he'll have to kick. Fourth down. Six minutes and 12 seconds to go. So penalties hurt the Chargers in this series. They certainly have. Now they should have field position. Chargers should have field position. But the 49ers are in the game, and they have been in every game they played. Dan Melville from the University of California beat out a lot of veterans for the punting chores for the 49ers. Mike Fuller is deep at the 45-yard line. Mike Williams and Pete Shaw are short. It is a short kick, but Fuller is coming up. They're going to let it drop. It takes a San Diego bounce. And it's picked up there by Pete Shaw, and Shaw runs it to the 23-yard line. As the 49ers watch, Shaw picked it up alertly. Pete, Pete Shaw showed me that he's alert. Very smart football. The ball was short. The 49ers had lost it momentarily, was behind them. Pete Shaw got a good basketball bounce and almost scored. He might have lulled the 49ers into thinking they were going to let it drop. He didn't even need any blocks. Talk about field position. How about the 24-yard line? And that's where the Chargers have it, first and 10, leading 17 to 9 with 5.33 remaining in the third quarter. Charlie Joyner, number 18, is wide of the right. Could be a time to go deep, maybe, George. Strike while the iron's hot. Well, good idea. Artie Owens, though, picks up a first down to the 12-yard line. And you're looking at firepower in depth for the San Diego Chargers. You've seen it with Kellen Winslow. You're seeing it with Owens and a few of the others. Well, it, 
Good block by Artie, Artie Owens lined up in the eye formation. They got a wing set there with 80 in there. He went over Washington's block. See the hole there? Nice hole. Number 70. First and 10 at the 11-yard line. Artie Owens gets to about the 10-yard line. Let's check some final scores in the NFL or third quarter scores. The Rams lead the Cardinals 14 to nothing. A good defensive effort so far for Los Angeles. Dallas trying to rebound from their first loss Monday night to the Browns 21 13. But that's a tight ball game against the Bengals and Oakland 14 to 3 in their home opener against the Denver Broncos. Kansas City leading Seattle 10 to 6. Barb Levy doing quite a job for the Chiefs. Yes, he is. Second down, eight to go at the nine-yard line. Bounce the play action in trouble. He was trying to pass. Let's see what they rule. It's incomplete. He was trying to pass. I thought his arm was going forward. I thought so, too. It should be an incomplete. No! Oh, they call it a fumble. It's a fumble. Boy, what a big break that is. Let's, I thought his arm was going. That let's he was let's take pass. a look at it again. It's a play action pass. Oh, yeah. He was throwing. Yeah, he was trying to throw the football. Now, maybe it was in. No, it wasn't. It, it was not intercepted. That was the only other possibility. No, it was. A, it hit the ground. Yeah, it was. Watch his, watch his arm come forward after the play action. The Chargers are incensed. There's no question that Fouts was going to pass here. Watch there is that. no doubt about it. No question that he was trying to pass. And the Chargers had 22 people arguing Boy, with the official. That's a big break for the 49ers. So, first and 10 for San Francisco on their own 12-yard line. Charlie Desjardins, number 73, in the game. He's been a steady backup defensive lineman for several years. O.J. to the 16. Bounce from Oregon. Unhappy, but really not showing it that much right here. No, that failure to score right in there is going to put the ball game away. Number 99, Wilbur Young. Now, the 49ers need a big play to get out of the hole here so that if they do have to punt, their defense doesn't have bad field position again. Second and six at the 16-yard line. Three minutes and 40 seconds remaining in the third quarter. They're in the ball game, the 49ers are. As Mike Schumann, number 84, comes to the right. He is the lone wide receiver. The up back, number 40, Wilbur Jackson. And it's Jackson Carey. Gets to the 20. Good inside running. He's short of a first down by two yards. So he has third and short. Len Edwards, number 27, former Steeler, came up from free safety to make the tackle. You know, the, the Chargers haven't done anything this second half. Ken McAfee coming in with the play. Usually with McAfee in there, he's a better blocker than than Seal. They got all of them in there. Three tight ends. Uh, with, with three of them in there, they're going to get a, a run or a play action pass. Third and two. 49ers have to get out of trouble here. Brewer, one of the tight ends in motion. And here's Simpson. He's going to reverse direction, and he may be in good shape. Simpson has a first down, 30-yard line, and Glenn Edwards brings him down at the 41-yard line. And a tell you what, of O.J. of old right there. DeBerg did something there. DeBerg threw a block. I don't know whether we can see it. Watch DeBerg come back here. O.J. had no chance on this. Young piled it up. Now watch DeBerg come over here and throw a block just enough to allow O.J. to pick up that extra yardage and get the first down. He's, he confused or at least distracted Fuller enough so that he could get through. 22-yard gain for O.J. Simpson. And you were talking earlier, George, if O.J. can have a good ball game and get some yards, that could really kind of rev him up. That's right. That's what he needs to get his confidence back. Ball seal, shake it up, goes out. What does Simpson have so far? In this 80 game? yards. If he has a chance to get over 100 if he gets a big play in here. Freddie Solomon, number 88, comes into the game. This game could turn around now with that, that fumble recovery. First and 10 at the 42. It was almost in this position when they scored the touchdown that they went deep to Hofer. 17-9, San Diego in front. Third quarter, closer than most people expected. 
And Brewer, the tight end, gets a couple of yards. Tight end cutting across the line, Brewer for two yards. We well, haven't seen that, have we? No, that's a tight end reverse. Uh, usually you like to, to do that when they're pursuing pretty well, and you got a tight end that's a real good runner, fast runner. McAfee, who's been kind of a disappointment up till now is in the game as Brewer goes out. Second and eight at the 44-yard line. Penalty marker down, two of them down, and the pass is complete to Simpson. And he's held up right at the 47-yard line Ma by Ray Preston. McAfee is going downfield. McAfee, watch back. McAfee in motion. And he was he was called for downfield. Here's a pass to OJ. He was wide open. Quick recovery by Preston. He didn't let him get away, but in motion again. And that's a, that's at least two times that they've had illegal motion. Brewer earlier was uh, involved in the same play. What about the complexity? This is a complex offense that Bill Walsh has in there. Well, it takes a lot of timing, and uh, you have different people. Illegal in motion, number 81, second down. Different people in every play. They're, they're probably going to make mistakes, but you're not going to win if you make mistakes like that. At the 39-yard line, second and 13 for San Francisco, 128 to go. Paul Hofer, 128 in the third. Paul Hofer, now in motion goes Wilbur Jackson. Up the middle, complete to Schumann. Schumann to the 44. It'll be third, and I would say about eight or nine. Woody Lowe makes the stop on Schumann. I'll tell you what, that last play, they covered Wilbur Jackson real loosely. I wouldn't be surprised if they come back to it again. Wilbur Jackson. He was in motion went way wide toward the sideline. Stayed out there, hooked up, and the corner, the corner was way off. The linebacker's supposed to adjust on that and help short. Let's see what they come back with. Jackson out with a knee injury last year. He was a great blocker for Dell Williams. He's got OJ to work with. 49 seconds remaining, third quarter. Third and seven at the 45. McAfee in motion. Jabir to pass. He's got time. His pass is tipped away, intended for Paul Hofer. And a fine play by the San Diego defense. Mike Williams, number 29, one of those top draft choices in 75. Well, the Berg's got pretty good protection, and Hofer is open. He just underthrew him. See that? He throws that up and over. He's got a completion to Hofer. So with fourth down, Dan Melville will kick once more from his 30-yard line. Mike Fuller is back. There's Melville. Fuller is at the 15, but we have Pete Shaw. Line drive kick, Fuller tries to break something, gets to the 30-yard line, so the Chargers will have the ball as Seymour makes the play. It is still 17 to nine as the club parry and go back and forth with 30 seconds to go in this third quarter. All right. There's some orange can be spotted. Can't help but wonder if maybe Ross Johnson didn't sneak in here to watch his Broncos play today. Maybe that was Ross and that chicken out this close. Maybe it is. Morton play action on first down from his 20. Has a man complete. And Haven Moses dragged down at the 38-yard line. Forward progress. First down for the Broncos. As Morton now 5 for 12 and right about 100 yards throwing. Tatum made the tackle, number 32. Martin dusting himself off. Uh, a 5 for 12 average on the day, but certainly a beautiful pass there. I think his first connection to Haven Moses, who's one of the best control receivers in all of football. Broncos at about the same point in the game that they caught fire last week, about five minutes to go in the third quarter, and they need to do it again right now. Red Miller over there doing his own cheerleading on the sideline, and hoping they can get it going here. They were down by 24 points last week to Seattle, but won 37-34. They trail by 11 today, and Rob Lytle meets a rude greeting company. It was number 41, Villapiano, wearing the same number as Lytle that made the tackle as we pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. Shaving Cream Commercial Challenge, 7.30 Monday on Consumer Byline. 
quickly back to a look at that last play. The blitz coming with Villapiano shooting from the outside. Gets excellent penetration. Goes right in behind Tom Glassick, 62 the guard. You see Villapiano there just diving into the legs. 53 Martin coming in to help pick it up on the, on the back side. Well, he may be a nine-year veteran, but he'll still sacrifice his body. Morton dumps it off to Jim Jensen at the 40, and he struggles out to the 45-yard line, where it'll be third down and four. Don't forget tonight on NBC, the Million Dollar Duck on the World of Disney at 7 o'clock Eastern time, followed by Gary Coleman, that sensational kid from different strokes, and the kid from left field. You won't want to miss it. Kansas City now leads Seattle 10 to 6 in the third quarter. Excuse me, uh, Merlin. Efren Herrera has kicked the field goal for Seattle. 10-6 in the third. And it's uh, 13 to 3 now. Dallas over 21-13. Dallas over Cincinnati. Anderson has hit Don Bass a 10-yard touchdown throw. Third down four at the 45. That was Odom's in motion. Good protection. Open as Lytle. First down at the 48 of the Oakland Raiders. As Morton hits his running back, Rob Lytle. Rufus Best, 38, made the tackle. Morton doing a good job of getting that ball on target, but uh, Lytle made a fine catch. He had to hang on to that ball as he was hit just the minute it arrived. Morton getting time to throw the football here. Uh, Oakland rushed him, got three sacks on him earlier in the game, or three sacks on he and Weiss. But right here, you see him zipping the football. Lytle takes it, is hit immediately as he accepts the football. Rufus Best, the defender there, but it is a first down. Let's see if they can keep this drive alive. Four minutes remaining in the third quarter. Denver on the drive, trailing 14 to 3. Good play action. Screened off church, 45, 40. Takes a good lick, holds onto the ball, and drives to the 39. That appears to be close to another first down. Rod Martin, USC, wears number 53. He's on the inside. He's got a feeling for the screen, breaks to the outside. He's coming in actually behind it, gets a piece of Upchurch. Watch, watch the balance of Upchurch. He's just like a dancer as he rolls across the top, out of bounds, very close to the first down. And now Wart, uh, got to wonder if Wharton <laughs> isn't saying, well, there's the bandana we talked about uh, hanging out of the back of his helmet. What a great player Upchurch is. Wharton may have a throwaway down, second and just a crack. Just inches from the first down. Broncos passed in this situation in the first half. Don't this time take the first down. Jensen slamming up the middle of the 36-yard line. Dave Pair made the first hit for Oakland. 3.40 remaining third quarter. Denver on the drive trailing 14-3 here in Oakland. Defensively on a play like that, Dick, when you've got a second and inches or a second and a half a yard, you almost have to play pass. You know that a team can afford to give that down away, and you, you literally almost have to give up the first down or hope you can make a big play because you cannot afford to play the run and give them the opportunity to hit a big one on you. Upchurch, who has averaged over 17 yards every time he touches the ball, is to the left. Moses to the right. Morton facing a literally 11-man line. That's coming. Everyone up on the line. Dumps it off. Incomplete to Upchurch, and the only man to stop Upchurch was rookie Henry Williams, San Diego State, number 45. Inside right 32 in the middle of your picture, uh, Jack Tatum trying to get a little pressure. He's getting a little more pressure than he wanted from Bill Bryan there, the center. And he comes back and says, hey, that's uncalled for. Bill doing a good job on the nose. I'm surprised that Morton didn't hit that pass. He reads the blitzes very well. The receiver running exactly the pattern he wanted, but it looked like he had a little too much pressure to get it on target. And Morton knows it. You've got to believe that Craig Morton is kicking himself all the way toward the sideline as he walks over to greet the play coming onto the field. Watch the move right here. The break right there. Sets him up for the quick one and then goes deep, and he's got the touchdown right there. The ball just thrown short. I can't help but feel that maybe he uh, did that on his own. Morton throwing to a point on the field, maybe did not read the break. The ball delivered where he was going to be. Morton just 
almost overthrew him on that particular play. Odom's batted himself, but that ball was not a catchable ball. Prestridge apparently to punt. Aims for the coffin corner, but it appears that's going to go into the end zone. Did not catch it inside the five, so the Oakland Raiders will begin at their 20-yard line with two minutes and 49 seconds left in the third quarter, and the Raiders still in front, 14. Wilson, 81. Wilson had an 84-yard kickoff return for a touchdown against the Bears called back, but this is Springs, two yards deep. The former Ohio State star, and they got him down at the 11-yard line. Okay. Nathan Poole, number 35, and getting off the bottom of the pile is 59, Howie Kernick. And so the special team of Cincinnati does the job, and Staubach will have to begin at his 11-yard line. And it'll be interesting to see just what Dallas does offensively. In the first half, they gave it to Dorsett enough times to get the ball in the end zone. Let's see if they do it again. He had, what was it, 98 yards in the first half on 12 carries. And do you remember what I said to you as we bowed out at halftime? The Cowboys haven't blown anybody out. Right. They haven't got the killer instinct. You're right. They can't put them away when they have the chance. Let's see whether they can answer uh, Anderson's touchdown with one of their own. Slant pattern to Pearson, first down to the 25, 27-yard line. Well, that's a good start. That's a heck of a start and a great call by Staubach, or whomever called it, on first down. Well, Tom Landry calls them all, and once again, Louis Breeden playing off, and Louis Breeden is on the ground. Louis Breeden playing off of Drew Pearson, trying to protect for the touchdown. <laughs> Scott Perry comes in to play cornerback now, replacing the injured Louis Breeden. First down and the give to Dorsett. Following a block by Scott to the 34-yard line. And a pickup of about six yards as Browner and Cobb combine to make the stop. Let's pause five seconds for station ID. If for any reason you have just joined us, Sam Nover and Bob Trumpy, we welcome you to Texas Stadium in Irving, Texas. Third quarter action, eight and a half minutes to play. 21-13, Dallas leads it. But remember, they led it one point, 21-3. Second and five for Staubach. That's Larry Brinson. Nothing doing. Good pursuit. Got a flag. Flag is down. Bo Harris made the stop. The five-year veteran out of LSU. Had it diagnosed perfectly for no gain. Louis Breeden is back in the ballgame, Sam. I think he just got the wind knocked out of him. Bo Harris is making signs like it's illegal procedure against Dallas, and I do believe we're going to get it that way. If so, I would imagine Cincinnati will refuse it, Bob. Wouldn't you think so? Well, I don't know. With Tony Dorsett averaging about seven yards a carry, <laughs> I think I'd take it back. Ah, you see, I can be a defensive captain for the Cincinnati Bengals, but then I don't want to be. <laughs> Why not? Because those guys hurt you when you play out there. Here's Fred Silver. Offense, number 87, offside. Second down. 87 is Jay Saldy. So it's second down again, but now they have 10 yards to go for the first down. Tony Dorsett has gone over the 100-yard mark rushing for the seventh time in his very brief career. Here he is again. He almost broke that one to the 31-yard line. Boy, it sounds trite to say it, Bobby, but he is Mr. Excitement. When he gets his hand on the football, he, he might just as well go 70 as a yard. You're right. And did you see the move he made? He jumped three yards sideways. A little fake. It's a draw. Watch the movie makes it to line. Look at that. I'm telling you, there's no coach in the world that can take credit for that. That is natural ability. Burley's having a field day running down his former pit teammate, Tony Dorsett. So here's a big play now for Staubach on third and seven. They slot Billy Joe Dupree right. It's a double wing. Staubach's got a man. First down. Tony Hill at the 40-yard line. And just a very simple out pattern. He had the linebacker coverage over there, Reggie Williams, and he just clean beat him at the sideline. Absolutely. Sam, well put. Turn about fair play. That's exactly what Cincinnati was doing, trying to put a running back or a, a receiver on a linebacker. Tony Hill, who is, a, to say the least, a gifted receiver, just he's supposed to beat Reggie Williams in all those cases. Reggie Williams owns a dog. That's a great name, and the dog's name is Endangered Species. <laughs> First down, Dallas. So a nice third down conversion by the Cowboys at their own 40-yard line. And he throws it out here. He's got Dupree at the 43. Look at him. Is he a tank to the 45? 
And Marvin Cobb had all he could do to wrestle him out of bounds. I'll tell you one thing that's good about Billy Joe Dupree. He's got a heck of a coach. That's Mike Ditka, who's one of the all-time NFL tight ends ever. And this is the other half of the play that, that Drew Pearson caught just a minute ago. This is the underneath part of that play. Billy Joe Dupree just out in the flat. And with his size, that's 6'5", 245 against 5'10", 195. They've got 63,179 in the house today, about 1,700 no-shows. That's five consecutive passes now that Staubach has completed after a horrendous first half, and Dorsett goes nowhere. What a fine defensive play by Wilson Whitley, 75, whom Mike Webster, the Steelers' all-pro center, calls the strongest tackle in pro football. He from was, the, at least when he was playing the 3 4 as a nose tackle. From the University of Houston, a Lombardi winner two years ago, first round draft choice by the Bengals, and he just beat the trap block. All he, he got across the line of scrimmage before the guard could get to him. So here's another big third down play for Dallas. Their conversion rate has been very, very good today. They have a third down and seven now at the 43 yard line. They're seven out of 10. That is remarkable. What's considered good, Bob? About 35%? 40% is terrific. Uh-oh, Staubach doesn't like the defensive alignment and calls time up here. They led the entire NFL in third down conversions, 53%. That's a great testimonial of the shotgun, isn't it? For the offensive line. And Roger, third and seven. Got a man in the seat. It's Tony Hill, 35-yard line. And just a beautifully thrown pass by Staubach. That's all you can say. He threaded the proverbial needle, put it right in the team of the zone. Well, he was 6 for 15 in the first half, and in the second half, he's throwing a lot better. Watch the spiral on his ball. That is a bullet. Right to Tony Hill. First down. Let me correct something Bob and I said earlier about Tony Dorsett having seven days of rushing over 100 yards. He's had 11. Not seven, but 11. And this is just his third season in the National Football League. First down, Dallas. At the 35 of Cincinnati. Cowboys lead it by eight points. Screen on the far side. He's uh -oh. got blockers. No, Riley with a great defensive play. Great play. And Drew Pearson just caught the 300th pass of his National Football League career here in Dallas. A flag is down. And he is just the 10th active player to have accomplished that remarkable feat. Personal foul on the Cincinnati Bengals. Little late hit. I thought he had six points here, but Ken Riley made a magnificent play to recover off the block of 67, Donovan to make First the tackle. Number 75. Oh, Whitley, yes. Down. Coming in late. Excellent call by the official. Right on it. The damage had been done by Riley, who, as Bob Trumpy pointed out to you, made an, just a superb play, avoiding the block of Donovan to make the stop, but Whitley ruined it all. So it's now first down to the 13 of Cincinnati. And they flood the... The left side, Dorsett now reverses his field, and is dragged down for a loss of a yard. I thought he was going to come full circle and come back. Well, he almost did. Reggie Williams messed that one up on a blitz. And he got back in the backfield before Tony Dorsett could do anything. You'll see Reggie Williams, 57, coming in there. Plenty of pursuit. Tony Dorsett changes his mind, and he still gets back almost to the line of scrimmage. That's not bad. He lost a couple on the uh, carry, so it's second down and 12 from the 15-yard line, and both Tony Hill and Drew Pearson split left. I imagine he'd go to Hill in this situation. He's the leading receiver and also the leading touchdown maker for the Dallas Cowboys. Let us see. Draw to Dorsett. Ten. Knocked forward to the 8-yard line. So it'll be third down and five. Ross Browner from behind. Knocked Dorsett two yards forward. Dorsett's not a bad second choice, though, Sam. Would you agree with me if you're not going to go to Tony Hill? I think Dorsett is a good choice any time. Yes. From first to fourth down, from a yard to 15. It doesn't make any difference. Once again, the acceleration, the ability, with a great deal of speed to cut laterally. I mean, uh, you can't coach anybody to do that. You, you just come in a uh, football with it or without it. So it's third down and five. Staubach has an important call here. Hill lined up in the backfield, now splits left. Preston Pearson, the lone setback, 26. Single coverage. Staubach throws it over the middle. It's incomplete. He tried to set it 
up for Preston Pearson as they had the screen set up. But the rush came from the linebacker, I believe, number 53, Bo Harris, wasn't it? Yes, and also a total blitz by Cincinnati, taking a chance on defense, blitzing everybody and leaving single coverage on the outside receivers. There was just a mob of people there. So Raphael Septian is on. Danny White will hold and spot the ball at the 16-yard line. It'll be a 26-yard attempt by Rafael Seption. Try to make it an 11-point difference for Dallas. The kick is up. It is good. Seption has kicked a 26-yard field goal, and the Cowboys now go back on top by 11 points. Next Saturday, it's a firm and spectacular bid in live coverage of the Jockey Club Gold Cup. You'll say, you saw it on CBS Sports. Well, a game being played in San Diego and the Chargers trying to win their fourth of the year. O.J. Simpson has scored a touchdown in that game. Ex-Cardinal coach Don Cleo, huh? Boy, they're having some fun down there in San Diego. What a fine football team. Here's Hart on a first down from the 14-yard line. Pat Tilly deflected. Tilly was open. I'll tell you, that secondary for L.A., they really fly around. Don't they? They're getting excellent linebacker play right now. They got back into the pattern. They actually screened the ball away from Pat Tilly then. Uh, they got such good, good drops. Yeah, that, that's what uh, Tampa Bay did against them last week, and now they're doing the same thing this week. Excellent drop, then. You know, and the reason they are able to do that, Gary, is because they're they're playing the run so well, it allows them to loosen up a little bit and uh, realize that uh, Hart's going to have to put the ball up. There's what O.J. Anderson's facing. That forward wall, the linebacking core of L.A., the second-best defense in the NFC. Second and ten. Hart. He gets it off to Wayne Morris, and he goes there one with another flag on the play. Wayne Morris, I tell you, he's taken off an awful lot going into the air. That's dangerous. Pat Thomas making the tackle. But as you have been told many, many times, we have a flag on the play, and it's going to be holding against St. Louis. I've lost track. How many penalties is that now? Every positive play they make, if something goes wrong on it, is snake bitten. Ten penalties against St. Louis. So that'll be half the distance to the goal if Jack Youngblood does, in fact, elect to take it. Every game you go into, and look at a man talking about frustration. Every game you go into, you talk about over and over again, don't beat yourselves. And boy, the Cardinals have been so guilty of this and their losses, haven't they? The last two weeks in particular. Holding. Number 71, offense. That's Joe Bostic, who's playing in the position vacated by Dan Deardorff. It's good to see Dan last week, wasn't it? He's come along well. It is. Uh, boy, I tell you, talking about somebody missing somebody, we believe they can, they have to be missing him tremendously. Not to take anything away from Bostic. He's done a pretty good job. But you just don't replace a guy that was voted the best offensive lineman in the National Football League the last three years. His heart steps out of that trouble. He has Paris. Gary Paris couldn't get turned around, and I'll tell you, Hart did an excellent job just keeping out of that end zone and being sacked for his safety. Now you talk about the holding penalty on Joe Bostic. I tell you, playing against an all-pro defensive end like Jack Youngblood, I think they should allow him to hold as a rookie. Look at the pressure here. You see the pressure. Boy, they really converged on him, and he steps back up. He did a remarkable job escaping that. But he threw the ball on the wrong side at Gary Paris. You know, one thing Hart has done the last two weeks better than I've seen him do is scramble around a little bit. Not scramble, but avoid people. Just get an additional second or so. He is now in a tough situation. You see it. Third and 17. 4.04 to go, third quarter. Back from the end zone again. Steve, what a catch. And that'll be a first down. Dave Steve with a remarkable catch. What a great play. I'll tell you what, what a tremendous play this is. Pressure coming, having to throw the ball like this, and look how accurately the ball is thrown, and what a tremendous catch Dave Steep makes. And that's got to give them a real shot in the arm. 
instead of having to kick out of their own end zone, they've got a first down out across the 25-yard line. And there's the stats on Jimmy. He had only 13 yards and a half. Boy, that's deep. He can make it. What a catch that was. Dave coming in here with eight catches for 144 yards. He had six last week. And here comes Anderson out across the 30 to the 31-yard line. And he gets five yards. Dave Elmendorf. I'll tell you, Otis is finding out that they hit a little harder in the Dave National Elmendorf Football League as he gets up slowly again. He has been punished. He's got a bad leg, doesn't he, Gary? He's had a knee that's bothered him. Dallas. 24, Cincinnati, Cincinnati 13. 31, Dallas, Rafael Septian had a 26-yard field goal to Dallas's. Dallas wins that. That means we have a three-way tie for first in that Eastern Division. Four and one, Washington, Philadelphia, and Dallas. Second down, five for the Cardinals. There's Morris again trying to go up and over. You know, you can get into a habit of that once in a while. And in the last couple, three weeks, he's done a lot of that. Dave Elmendorf. Making the tackle again. And it's going to be third down and still three yards to go. Thomas Lott now comes in for St. Louis in the backfield, and Anderson will check out. And five defensive backs in for Los Angeles as Jack Reynolds comes out. You must have noticed something. Maybe Anderson was banged up a little bit. Get Lott in for the pass play. So another third down for Hart. He's trying to hit Gray, and Gray again, he just can't shake Pat Thomas. That's a play that just hasn't developed that often this year. Last week, it was Lamar Parrish that was covering Gray so well on it. That time, it was Pat Thomas, and the Cardinals are going to have to kick the football. Jim going off there, he didn't like, uh, he tried to make a play throwing in. He, the man was covered. Gray was covered. He threw the ball at him, hoping that Gray would be able to react to the ball. Gray picked up the ball too late to be able to react to it. That's why Jim's a little disappointed in the, in the pass. Attendance today, 48,160. What a beautiful day this has been for football. A little kicking. Other than that first kick, he has kicked very well. At the 31, Eddie Brown, and Brown dragged down from behind that time. That was a 37-yard boot. And at the 34-yard line, Los Angeles will have it. Roy Green was the man down to make the tackle on Eddie Brown. 144 to go in this third quarter. The Rams hanging on to that 14 to nothing lead. Chargers third leading quarter, the 49ers four. 17 to 9. 30 seconds to go in the third quarter. Dick Stockton along with George Allen. The only scoring in the second half was a one yard touchdown run by O.J. Simpson. The extra point was missed. Clarence Williams has scored, and Fouts has hit Joyner earlier on a 24-yard touchdown strike. First and 10 at the 31. Fouts up the middle. Kellen Winslow again. Good catch. Gets about oh, wow. 70 yards on the play. Watch, watch Winslow again. Uh, fight off the, the holdup. They let him off right here. He didn't, he didn't jam him enough. That pass has been open all day. That, that pass has to be stopped by the underneath coverage by the linebackers. That'll be the last play of the quarter. As you saw Jefferson, or as we should say, Winslow with that hand catch for the basketball player. So we've got a contest going. That's the end of the third quarter with the score. San Diego 17, San Francisco 9. We now pause for a word from your local station. On the near sidelines, and it appears to be either a knee or an ankle. Well, he has ice on his knee uh, as he sits on the bench. He stretched out. Uh, certainly, the uh, Raiders do not need to add any other names to that long list of injuries. Is the knee. Second down play, Van Egan. Look at him fight for yardage. Gets almost to the 30-yard line. Stopped at the 29. But one tackler isn't doing it when Van Egan has the pumpkin. We had to trace the success of the Oakland offense. If you look at Dalby on the sideline, you see the ice pack on his left knee right there. Well, I tell you, he's got to be a discouraged young man. I, I think, Dick, we've seen more knee injuries, more early injuries this year than, than I could ever remember in the NFL. To such key players, I mean, big names, one after another from Charlie Waters in the preseason and Bill Berge. Guard for the Rams. Oh, Van Egan, did he get that 
football to the 30 yard line. I oh, don't think so. I don't think he did either. The Denver defense just swarmed him. That's that's the kind of Denver defense we've been used to seeing over the years. You want to find out what it's like to run up into that kind of an egg beater? Watch Mark Van Egan earning his money. Give you a chance to see him in action here. Number 30 getting a block. Derek Jensen as he goes in on Louis Wright. And that was Louis Wright, the cornerback. Boy, how many times do you see a cornerback get the first hit behind the line of scrimmage? And then he got plenty of help from his friends. That very big play by the defense. They're going to measure it, bring it in from the sideline. Well, the only way this is a first down is if they put the yard lines down wrong. Yeah, well, that's a possibility. <laughs> and people would tell you that anything is possible in this stadium. Well, they marked him accurately, and it'll be fourth down and about a half a foot. Trying to console Dave Dolby on the sidelines. Talk about injuries. Uh, certainly one of the things that we have to be considered about, or would have to be considered here, the Raiders did more work on conditioning and running than they had ever done in the history of, of their franchise this year, and yet they've had more injuries than ever before. John Madden did not believe in all that conditioning and all that weight work in the offseason. There's some thought that maybe uh, too much, too quick, maybe part of the problem with the Oakland Raiders and their injury problems this year. Up church at the 31, Ray Guy to kick. the 10-yard line. A reverse to West. He's in trouble. Down at the 8-yard line, 61-yard kick by Raymond Guy. You won't see many kicks explode off the foot of a kicker like that. Now watch the head of reverse call. Church going to start away, hand the ball to West, coming back. But the ball was kicked so deep that it broke up the timing of the reverse. West had no choice. Turned back to go the other way and ran into a host of tacklers. Watch Ray Guy. Watch that ball just explode off that leg. What a powerful leg he has. He's a powerful athlete. You know, he can throw the ball 50 yards without moving his feet. Just keep his feet on the ground. He'll throw it from the 50-yard line into the end zone. Morton Incomplete pass. Incomplete pass. Signal was given. It is not a fumble, but Morton just did get that arm going forward. That had safety written on it. Then it had a possible fumble. Tom Flores thought his team had another six. Flores extremely disappointed. Jim Tunney, the official, with his eye right on the quarterback, said that Morton had started the forward motion of his arm. Give you a chance to look at it from the end zone. Morton getting pressure right there from Hendricks coming from the backside. Got to wonder if Hendricks didn't get a hold of that ball before it started forward. Save the play, gentlemen. Save it. Let's look at that one again. Morton then on second and ten from his seventh. He's going to go back into his end zone. Great protection. Finally finds Jensen open. And down he goes after a four-yard pickup at the 11-yard line. Now let's go back to the play that started this series. Was Morton's arm in motion? Was it a fumble touchdown for Oakland? Now the rule says the quarterback's arm must start forward to have it be declared a pass. It doesn't look to me like Morton's arm starts forward, Dick. You get a chance to look at it here. You said it early. It looks, in fact, to be a fumble. Hendricks coming on the blitz from the top of your screen. I oh, take it back. That's the last play there. We, we missed the other one. I kept waiting for that. <laughs> Where's Ted Hendricks? Where is he? That's the end of the third quarter. We'll see if we can search and locate that play again for you. We'll watch the Look at the entire... Well, the Chargers have their fans, but George Allen, they haven't done much on offense in the second half. No, I think that uh, the 49er defense has done an outstanding job considering the field position they've had today. Now, they're going to have to stop Winslow first. Since Jefferson is out, they're going to stop Winslow short and join her deep. Start of the fourth quarter, second and two at the 39-yard line. Winslow is in the slot, and Artie Owens is stopped short of a first down on a fine play by Archie Reese. 
Gordy Saracino also hit hard, a linebacker, the rookie from Stanford. So it'll be third and uh, about maybe less than a yard. You know, Dick, before we said that it looked like it might have been a bootleg play when, when uh, Fouts runs a bootleg, and many quarterbacks, they don't tell anybody else. They just make the fake and keep the ball on their own. That way you get better deception. So they picked up the first down here. First and 10, Dwayne Board and Al Cowling's in for the pass rush. First and 10 at the 41-yard line. Burton, number 87, to the top, and number 18, Charlie Joyner. Bo Matthews, number 41, the big back out of Colorado, is in the lineup, and he's on the receiving end of this pass, and the linebackers in good, good hitting. There was perfect defense by the 49ers. Charlie Cornelius, formerly of the Miami Dolphins, made sure Matthews didn't get away. But what about the rest of that play? Well, they need you need inside-outside coverage, and that's what they had. The two linebackers sandwiched them inside-outside, and that's when you get a fumble, when you get two men hitting the ball carrier like that. Second and nine at the 42. Bounce. Dumps it off to Artie Owens. Owens to the 45. That's all. It'll be third and about seven. Willie Harper, strong side linebacker with Gordy Saracino, makes the stop. Third and six now. Ball at the 45. Bounce has completed 19 of 27 passes for 175 yards. One TD and an interception. And here's a big play for the 49er defense. Let's see if they stop number 80, Winslow. Let's see who he goes to. Wide receivers to the left here. Third and six. Bounce complete to Arnie Owens. First down. Right up the middle, and San Diego could be knocking on the 49ers' door. They went to the back, who was formerly a wide receiver. He was a running back at West Virginia in college. Wide open. They're looking for Winslow. See, he's watching Winslow. The middle linebacker's looking for Winslow over here on the, on the right of the screen. Wide open. Good execution. 24-yard pickup for the Chargers. First and 10 on the 49ers, 31. Top of your screen is Larry Burton. Joiner, number 18, the other wide man. Marty Owens going wide and loses a couple. Well, you know, one thing the 49ers defense has done today, they have stopped the Charger running game pretty good. They haven't hurt them much running the football. We figured at the top of this game, George, that the Chargers, who did it all through the air last week, lost to the Patriots, would try to establish and get back to the running game they had against Buffalo a couple of weeks ago, especially in the light of the fact that the 49ers are not a strong defensive team. But they didn't do that at the outset. 33-yard line. Second and 12. Second back is Owens. He's getting a lot of work. They'll have third and long here the at the 32-yard line. Saracino and Cowlings make the play. Well, next week, the 49ers will face the Seattle Seahawks at Candlestick Park. And Seattle could be awfully hungry because Kansas City's chief leads Seattle 17 to 6 in the fourth quarter. Bob Martin, number 54, has come in. Four linebackers as Hardman leaves. Third and seven at the 27. Again, George, a big defensive play. This could be the turning play in the ballgame right here. Winslow was in motion. Fouts dumps it to Matthew. He held onto it apparently. He's short of a first down penalty marker bound from the back. Penalty marker down. Gerard Williams makes the stop. Matthews almost dropped the ball, but he held onto it. This is a big penalty right here. It's against the Chargers. There you see Matthews, who is perhaps the only big back in the San Diego arsenal, and they've used him in the brief time he's been in this game as a pass receiver in kind of a halfback screen or a fullback screen. 
holding against San Diego. Well, the Chargers have had tremendous field position in this ball game. They haven't been able to take advantage of it. They're uh, they're passing up a possible opportunity here with this with this penalty, whatever it is, when the officials make up their mind. 49ers looking, and they've declined this thing. Number 24, offense, holding, refused, fourth down. They have declined it, so it's fourth down. And so, in essence, what they're doing is they're giving Jarella a better shot at the field goal instead of giving yes. the Chargers an extra play. Well, they, they don't want to give them. That shows a lot of respect for Fox. Fuller will hold. It'll be a 41-yard attempt for Jarella. And maybe the reasoning is that Jarella may be a little rusty. Yes, uh, I think also they they may think that Jarella can't kick that far. We'll find out something here. He had an earlier field goal block. Penalty marker down. The kick is no good. It hit the upright and came but down, the, but the penalty. The 49ers are offside. It's a first down, then. It'll be a first down for San Diego. So all of it's backfired. Look at Roy Jarella. The kick wasn't good, but it won't matter. He can go to the sidelines, and Fouts comes back. And so a uh, key penalty, and the plan see, backfired. See, when it's fourth and one, never be offside. You're not going to make that much difference getting in there. That, we'll see a, who it's on. I, that's a sin. Interior lineman, defense, offside, first down. Well, it's the interior lineman. I was going to say might have been inexperienced by one of these guys, but they didn't really pinpoint him. 49ers have 70 yards and penalties now. First and 10 at the 17-yard line. 10.50 to go in the game. 17-9, a big break for the Chargers. Clarence Williams gets to the 15. I'll tell you one thing. The 49ers have held very well. They have. They have. The defense has been on the field under adverse circumstances, and they're still holding up. Now, whether they can continue is, remains to be seen. Scott Hilton made the play, a penalty marker. We've had a lot of penalties in this game. This one will be against the Chargers. It'll be holding. John Jefferson, number 83, has just checked back in the game. Let's watch him now. They, they didn't put him in there to block. 67, offense, holding, Ed White. first down. Veteran from Minnesota. So there's Jefferson. Let's watch Jefferson. They went to him early in the ball game. In fact, their first play. And the pass rushers, Al Cowlings and Dwayne Ford, number 79 and 76 respectively, have come in there for the 49ers. First and 20 now at the 27-yard line of San Francisco. And Fouts wants to talk it over. So they're going to use one of their three timeouts right now with 10.43 to go in the game. The Chargers have the lead 17 to 9. This may be important for them. They want some more points. This is the ball game right here. Yeah. This is the ball game. Even a field goal is going to make it up. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sure, because they missed that point, you know. Yeah. President Carter, of course, will address the nation on Monday night. From the 34-yard line, a first down. Pat Hayden back to throw. Lots of time. He's got his tight end, Terry Nelson, and he has gone to him time and time again. Ken Green making the tackle. First down, 18-yard pickup. Unbelievable how many times they've gone to the tight end. They just, they seem to, he finds that little opening, doesn't do anything, uh, you know, as far as trying to free himself, but just finds a little opening in the zone. Nice reception again, Terry Nelson. A lot of time to throw on that one. A minute 12 left now in the third quarter. A first down from the 47 of St. Louis. Cullen Bryant got a block on Dawson. And he gets inside the 45 to the 42-yard line. Let, let's check that Kansas City game now. We have a fourth-quarter score, and the Chiefs have built their lead up, haven't they? Well, Kansas City, 17 to 6. Steve Fuller, the rookie out of Clemson, the quarterback. Who said rookie quarterbacks can't play, huh? Four-yard pass to Mike Williams, their last score. Hey, Clemson had some football players last year, didn't they? Jerry Butler, Joe Bostic, Steve Fuller. They're all playing well in the NFL, aren't they? Gain of five on that last play. Here's Wendell Tyler. Tyler inside the 40 to 39 and another fly. 
Bob Pollard making the stop. The Rams getting some fresh backs in there again. They've been alternating throughout the course of this game. Tyler and Bryant started, but then they've come in with Eddie Hill. They've used Peacock. I tell you something, that official threw that flag about 30 yards that time. That was one of the best throws we've holding. seen so far today. Rams. That's going to be holding against Los Angeles. Seventh penalty against the Rams. 22 seconds left. I'm not going to touch that line. He was a long way downfield. He was way down in the secondary, and he threw the flag. There's Ray Malavese again. Holding. Number 83, offense. 83 is Terry Nelson, the tight end. Malavese will be 49 years old on November 8th. He's quite a defensive coordinator here for Chuck Knox. Second and 15 after that hold. Hayden again, lots of time, and he's got his man. That's Ron Smith. Smith with the catch, and that should be a first down. They're awfully close to it. Well, they can't accuse Pat Hayden of being a dump-off quarterback today. He's going downfield with the football. Most of his completions have been the interior there, right in the middle of the field. Well, that's the end of the third quarter with the score. The Los Angeles Rams, 14. The St. Louis Cardinals, nothing. We now pause for a word from your local station. We'll update the scores of the game still in progress right after this kickoff return. Five yards deep, Deacon Turner. 10, 15, breaks away to the 19-yard line, and down he goes. All right, here we go. Game still in progress around the national 24-13 Dallas. From the eye formation, Anderson to pass on first down. Isaac Curtis came down with it at the 30-yard line. That's the talent that has distinguished Curtis as one of the greatest receivers in the National Football League, something that has been lacking from the Bengals' offense in 79. I agree. I've never seen anybody in professional football with better hands than Isaac Curtis. He's the only guy I ever, I've ever seen that can catch the ball when it's passed him. He has that kind of ability, which is hard to understand, but even more difficult to do. They got to keep getting the ball to Isaac Curtis. I like that. Hard to understand, but even more. That's very good. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but I like the sound of it. Big series here for Cincinnati. Nothing doing on that carry. Archie Griffin stopped right at the line of this line of scrimmage by Aaron Kyle and the Manster himself, not Monster, but Manster, Randy White. There's one thing about your line, Sam, that this is a key series for Cincinnati, yes, but somehow you got to know that and not let Dallas know it. There's <laughs> Randy White getting through there, yes. It is a key series, and I expect Cincinnati to continue to throw the football. That's what they've had the most success with. Second down and 10, three wide receivers as Kreider joins Curtis and Bass, and Charles Alexander is the setback all by himself as they slot Bass to the left. And Don has had a marvelous afternoon. Anderson throws it to Isaac, and he overthrew him at the 45-yard line of Dallas. The rookie, Aaron Mitchell, who had to start at the last minute in place of Benny Barnes. Barnes, of course, you Cowboy fans know, has had a chronic foot problem, bone spurs, I believe, and he just hasn't played a lick today at all, and so the responsibility has fallen on the shoulders of this Nevada Las Vegas rookie Aaron Mitchell and playing on this AstroTurf probably does not help someone with sore feet you know the Dallas Cowboys don't even practice on AstroTurf Sam they practice on grass Tom Landry doesn't like AstroTurf or tartan turf as this is this is tartan. slightly different third down and 10 now from the 32 of Cincinnati well if this is a big series and this is an even bigger play Interception. He's going upfield to catch the football. When he makes his break, he's got to come back to the football. Take nothing away from Mitchell, though. Good coverage, and I imagine that's a pass that Kenny wish he had back. He'd like to have two of them back, the one to Randy Hughes in the first quarter that really turned the tone of this football game around. 36 yards on the return by Mitchell. 
The Cowboys are in business at the Cincinnati 13-yard line. Now they've got a chance to really put the heat on. Dorsett. Outside, inside, then outside again to the 10-yard line. He's enough to drive you crazy, isn't he? Well, he, he worked hard for his yardage. There's no doubt about that. And the Dallas offensive line is a is a line is an offensive line that's been a very much under publicized line. But last year the offense ranked second overall. Only the Patriots beat them third in the run, third in the pass. They led the FC in rushing, passing, led the NFC, the NFL in scoring, 384 points, 342 first downs and 78. That's a club record. That is a good offensive team. You know, they love Dorsett so much back in Alec Griffith, Pennsylvania, Bob, that the radio station there carries all of the Cowboys games. They're on the Cowboys radio network, would you believe? Just so they can keep track of the uh, most illustrious Alec Griffith native. Alec Griffith, Pennsylvania? You bet. Larry Brinson, nothing. Ran into the stone wall of the 10-yard line in the person of Jimmy LeClaire, the middle linebacker, and I know you think very highly of him, Bob, having played with him for, what, six, seven years. One of the toughest middle linebackers I've ever come across. That's Eddie Edwards. I think he's got a leg cramp and nothing more than that. Hopefully that'll pass. It's from the heat. That's what it is, a leg cramp. And Mike, Mike White, the rookie out of uh, Albany State, has come on to replace him. Edwards wanted to stay in there. Anyway, as I was saying about Jim LeClaire, he is one tough cookie in the middle. Third down and seven now for Dallas. So as Anderson had a big third down play a moment ago and was intercepted, Staubach has one now. Looking for the quick pop, it wasn't there. Now throws it over the middle. Touchdown to Tony Hill! See the play again, and Tony Hill is at least the third receiver in the receiver progression for Roger Staubach. He looks everywhere, and once again, it is rifle, flat rifle. And Tony Hill can take some abuse because Marvin Cobb hit him right in the chest and he hung on to the football. And he caught that football right between Cobb and Bo Harris, the linebacker. They appeared to have excellent coverage, but there is no coverage on a pass like that by Staubach. Agreed. He couldn't have thrown it any better. Septi on to make it 31 for Dallas, and he does. Now the Cowboys can feel comfortable, and they have rebounded very well. Dan Fouts has just talked to Don Coriel, first and 20 at the 27-yard line. Chargers haven't done much in this half, but this is very important because well, if the 49ers fall farther behind, as you look at the penalties, it's going to be tough for them. Well, this series could decide the ball game. This is a critical series for both clubs. 120 yards and penalty in the game. First and 20. Bounce. Complete to Jefferson. Dan Buns makes the stop. So Jefferson comes in and immediately catches the pass at the 21. Well, they lined up Jefferson in the slot on the left, left slot. And he comes over the middle, just runs a little angle pass. And Fouts hits him, picking up part of the yardage. Was first down. Good jump to pick up because at least they're getting in the better field goal position. Second and 14 now. Fouts again. Has some pressure by Collins. Dumps it off to Kellen Winslow. And Winslow's going to go into the end zone for a touchdown. Kellen Winslow on a superb play and run. And the 49ers. Now with their backs dramatically to the wall. One yard touchdown play. Winslow's second touchdown reception of the season. Well, he, he was looking downfield and Winslow was open and it shows the good athletic ability of Winslow after he catches that ball. He can really run with it. Six touchdown toss by Fouts. Jarrell on the point after. So just under 10 minutes remain in this game. So Kellen Winslow, who has been quite a workhorse today, with Klein out of there, perhaps more as a wide man as a tight man, scores this touchdown to make it 24-9. With Sonny Jurgensen, I'm Gary Bender. We come now to the start of the fourth quarter.
14 nothing. The Rams on top. They have the football and Cullen Bryant advances the football inside the 35 to the 33 yard line. Calvin Favron seen a lot of action in this game for the Cardinals in place of Mark Arneson and we wish him well. He's back home and trying to rehabilitate a knee. He's on the four week injured reserve list. He's hoping to get back in that four week span. Well you can believe they miss him. He's a heck of a football player Mark Arneson. Good he man. He's after people, doesn't he? He sure does. Good person. From the 31 yard line now, second down five. Wendell Tyler. And Tyler has the first down, but flags all over the place. He's to the 25 yard line. I think this may be a record for flags today. Let's <laughs> see who this one's all about. It looks like the Rams. Tyler's upset about it. Discussion going on. We've just started this fourth quarter. If you've joined us late, You've missed first a lot drive. of flags. <laughs> the first drive of the game. The Rams took it 75 yards, scored on a one-yard plunge. They came back to score at the 106 mark of the second quarter and an 84-yard drive and a one-yard smash by Wendell Tyler. That's all the scoring we've had. The Cardinals missed a 31-yard field goal in the third quarter. And now the penalty against Los Angeles. He's stepping it off against the Rams, the 10 yarder. Let's see who it is. We might have that on replay. We'll see here in a minute. Illegal shift, number 84, offense decline. Holding, number 78, offense accepted. Now we got two penalties in the play. Yeah, that's a good explanation. Yes, I it like was. That. Jackie Slater, 78. Ron Smith was 84. Anyway, after the penalty, going to bring up second down, 13 yards to go. That's Jesse moving back towards the line of scrimmage. Hayden back to throw. Lots of time. Jesse wide open at the 20-yard line. Stone's got him. What happened was Carl Allen fell down. Good observation. He did. Jesse came back in motion along the line of scrimmage, and uh, you see him right there, who is moving at the bottom of your screen. He went up the field, and exactly what happened. Uh, he fell down. You see him getting off the ground there, and Jesse was wide open. And fortunately, you know, Kenny Stone came over and made the play. If not, uh, he would have scored. 20-yard pickup for Ron Jesse. 49 catches a year ago for Jesse. He's battled back from some knee surgery and he's quite a football player. He was a great athlete at Kansas. He was an indoor long jump champion. Great leaper, great leaper. And this is Tyler straight up the middle. And Tyler driving to the 12-yard line. Great second effort on his part. Bob Pollard eventually downed him. But Tyler only weighs 188 pounds, but he was carrying him on his back. Going to be just short of that first down. Tyler's played well for them today. He's done a good job. Second down, three yards to go. Second and three. 13.50 remaining in this one. Tyler has 69 yards on 15 carries. It's interesting, you know, a guy starts fumbling. There's a lot of things that go into that. He's had that wrap. He had it at UCLA. He's had it here, but he's held on to it today. He's done a good job for him today. Thank you, Derek, yes. Waddy in motion. Give to Tyler again. And Tyler inside the 10. And he may have the first down. To a first and goal for the Rams. They'd like to put a clincher on with a 14-0 lead. Very important, too, Gary, because if they do score here, first I think it Rams. would put uh, the Cardinals kind of out of range unless some miracle happens. But uh, they need to force a turnover right here. They need a fumble. They need an interception. You know, you look at this team, the Cardinals, the first three games scoring very well. They had 43 points through the first three games. They had seven last week, thus far oh, none. Up they just hit a drop. First and goal at the nine. Give to Tyler again, and Tyler is fumbles the ball. And who's got it? St. Louis. And that's what we were just talking about. He fumbles it at the five, and the Cardinals are still alive in this game. They needed a turnover, and they got the turnover. Take a look at this. You notice how careless he's careless with the football right here. He takes it up. Look at him. Oh he's got it out in his arm. 
The contact comes in, and guess who forced the fumble? Calvin Favron came in and made the hit on him, knocked that ball loose. And that's probably ruined what Tyler felt was one of his better afternoons in the National Football League. Steve Niels was in on that play, too. I think he came up with a fumble. Favron made the hit on him to jar the ball loose, and Niels came up with a fumble recovery. And so at the four-yard line, the Cardinals still are alive with 12.41 remaining. They trail 14 to nothing. They've got to get something going on this drive. Here's a give to Anderson, and Anderson out to the five, and that's all, a gain of one. Larry Brooks, an all-NFL second-team pick a year ago, and San Francisco is falling in the rears in that game, aren't they? A 20-yard touchdown pass to the number one draft choice. Kellen White Winslow, the stop. big tight end. Dan Fouts, a 20-yard, 24 to nine. Boy, San Fouts Diego is having a good year, isn't it? Oh. How many quarterbacks are already over 1,000 yards? I was looking at that yesterday. Two of them in the NFC already. It's unbelievable. Look at this, Dallas. The short week of practice didn't hurt them at all. 31 to 13, they lead right now. Dana won on that last play. Second and nine from the five. Hardy's been in the end zone a couple of three times in this game. He just got rid of that one. Making his cut was Tilly, but he just wasn't open at all. Pat Thomas over there defending. Jim unloads it. Jack Youngblood was the guy putting pressure on Hart, and it comes to a third down. They're going to have to put it up. they got to throw the football now. They can't. They can't make up 14 points running the football. He throws it here, but he just threw the ball away. He grounded the ball. He got away with it. That's what a, a veteran can do. He's allowed to do that. He got to let you do that once in a while and not get caught. Keeps you alive anyway. Hard six of 20 now for 80 yards. Third down and nine. They need a big play. And this is where it's going to have to come. Hart rolling around, and he hits Steve, but that's not going to be enough for the first down. Steve is hit by Dave Elmendorf. He's upset about something. The ball at the 10-yard line. It's fourth down, still four yards to go. I tell you, that Ram defense is doing an excellent job. They had everybody covered. Jim moved out of the pocket, made the completion, but not enough for the first down. They're going to have to kick it away. 11.25, and time now is slipping away for the Cardinals if they're going to come from behind in this one. Eddie Brown goes back with his punt. Steve Little. There's Brown. Brown has really done a good job in returning punts. And they're going to come away with this with kicking from the end zone. Little, they're going to get good field position again. Brown, in 77, set an NFL record for punt returns in a season. What is in a game? And here he has it. At the 45 of St. Louis, trying to get ground, gets away from Bill Morrell, a flag on the play, and he goes out of bounds at the 37-yard line, a 34-yard kick that time by Steve Little. You're going to have a clipping. Uh, a block was made right back where he was, and a man, he really didn't clip. He just kind of pushed in the back. One of the Cardinal players coming down got pushed in the back, and I think they're going to call it clipping. Seen a lot of that, as you know, you can't block below the waist anymore. Well, he just kind of pushed him in the back then. Whatever their interpretation is of uh, this particular. There it is. Wait a minute. Cardinal. Clipping? <laughs> well, that's Clipping. offsetting penalties. Well, I got to learn those rules. That's a what? They give you all those hand signals. A personal foul against one and clipping against the other. Personal foul, number 84, kicking team. That's Dave Steve. Personal foul, <laughs> clipping, number 72, receiving team. Receiving team will retain the ball. Thank you very much. 72 is Kent Hill for the Rams. He's a first round draft pick out of Georgia Tech. So they're going to have the ball. Well, where are they going to have the ball? Where'd he go out of bounds? Still trying to locate the football. There it comes. It'll be a first down for the Rams. 10.49 left. Next week, the Cardinals go to Houston, Los Angeles to New Orleans. We're going to have a timeout right now with 10.49 left. So the Rams, with that 14 nothing lead, they'd like to get the clincher. We'll be back in a moment. Here's that questionable call again involving Morton and the Raiders. It would appear that Morton is cocking his arm, but never 
starts forward. He gets caught right there. The shoulder is pushed forward by Hendricks, and apparently that's what Hendricks, or that's what Jim Tunney declared to be a forward pass. John Madden saying, no, I think that was definitely a fumble. Tough call for Jim Tunney, the referee, but it appeared the Raiders were denied a touchdown. Great throw, and Haven Moses out to the 31-yard line, but a flag is down, and that one may be called back. A perfect strike by Morton, but he may have been helped out with an illegal block. day for the Denver Broncos. Morton back. You see Phil Yaw, 77, working to get pressure. Morton has time to throw it, puts it right on target. But as the ball is going over, a flag was headed toward the line of scrimmage. They'll mark it off halfway home. We talked earlier about Ken Stabler and the beautiful pass he throws. As we look from behind, Morton, this would be the referee's view, in fact. Watch the great arm action and the perfect spiral as he zipped that ball about 30 yards in the air and right on the string to Moses and the flag. <laughs> oh, that's an artistic shot, gentlemen. We caught it all. Back at the five-yard line. Oh, almost a safety is up, Church, on a reverse. is brought down at the three-yard line. The Raiders force the Denver punting team to come on. Phillips and Phil Yaw made the tackle. Morton dropping back. It looks like a little statue play almost. Upchurch coming all the way from the outside, but the Raiders are just flying across that field. 58, Monty Johnson there to make the tackle. Another look at it. You get an idea of how close he came to being grabbed on the goal line there, but that's great pursuit from the defenders. Now you're going to have to kick it right into your living room. There you go. Prestridge hangs a high spiral. Larry Brunson at the 45. 40, 35, flags are down, and so is Brunson at the 24. And the clip was out at about the 35-yard line. Ken Brown made the tackle. Feared that Lester Hayes might have been the man who clipped. 42-yard kick, 21-yard return. It'll be called back. Injured John Matuzak, big defensive lineman of the Raiders, and he has been a cheerleader deluxe. Reminds me of Rod Carew of the California Angels when he was out with the broken thumb. He was he made up signs to help his team along. Look at he's even doing a little training work. He's going to have his club ready. Of course you'll see Rod Carew against the top pitching staff in baseball the Baltimore Orioles. That'll be Wednesday night but it all begins the playoffs Tuesday night on NBC. The Pirates won it today. They'll meet Cincinnati. He said that cheerleading stuff work. He used that wet towel on his face. I, I think he might be the biggest cheerleader I've ever seen. <laughs> That's a, there's the address again for your tax deductible contribution for our Olympic athletes, U.S. Olympics Post Office Box 1982, Cathedral Station, Boston, Mass. From midfield, Sabler blowing long. to the goal 
line. The attendance today, 52,632. Over 54,000 tickets sold, about 1,900 no-shows. Tom Flores sees the ball at the one-yard line, third and goal. The Raiders lead 14 to three. They score a touchdown here, and the Broncos will need another miracle comeback, and they may have used theirs last week. Saves the ball in the Raiders' possession back at the five. Oh, my. And that's the first time that the switch of Sylvester to center has backfired on them. He's played very well in there, as has Vela, but he has not played that much center. Bad snap to Kenny Stabler, who's out of there a little too quick. Stabler wisely covers the ball, but it's going to be fourth and about four, and they're going to have to go for the three points instead of the seven. Now that could be the break that the Broncos needed because a field goal here would allow Denver with two touchdowns and the extra points to tie the game. Eleven and a half minutes remaining as Jim Breach, he's three for five this year, tries one from the 12. It'll be 22 yards. Oops. Don Latimer invaded the backfield prematurely. That'll be half the distance to the goal if it's against Denver. To the two and a half. Defensive lineman pointing over and saying someone moved. As, oh, as the Raiders. Must have done. Another mistake in this game. And now it'll be a bit longer for Breach, but certainly well within his range. I don't think a kicker really minds moving five yards there. If he's out around the 40 yard range and moves five yards, then, then he'd get a little upset. But it does make him think a little more. Sometimes coaches don't like those kickers to think too much. So from 27 yards, maybe 28 as Hum kneels. Low but good. Line drive three for the Raiders. You gotta believe that Jim Breach is counting his blessings while taken cleanly by his holder Ray Guy and on the ground very comfortably, or Dave Hum actually. The kick is low and just barely over the arms of the outstretched or onrushing defensive lineman. And Breach has to be very grateful that that one was not blocked. 11-17 left, two touchdowns. So they have answered Cincinnati's offensive thrust with one of their own. That's caught out of bounds, and Seption will have to kick it from the 30-yard line. Chris Barr. But it is a commanding 31-13 lead for the Cowboys as Seption kicks it again. Deacon Turner at his eight-yard line. 25 and runs right into the grasp of Bruce Bruce Hover, the special teams captain of the Cowboys. Again. 76 on the kicking team. Offside, re-kick. Set his hat himself a day, I can tell you that. He looks like he is rounded into shape after missing four preseason games in the opener in St. Louis. Nathan Poole, number 35, is deep with Jim Browner and Deacon Turner. Dorsett unofficially 113 yards rushing, 18 carries, 26 catching the football, two receptions. At the 13, it's Turner again, 25. Knocked down at the 30-yard line and a very fine tackle by Dennis Thurman. 11 seconds to go in the third quarter, so this should do it. Unless uh, an incompleted pass stops the clock for some reason. Griffin goes in motion, the lone setback, gets the pitch, it's Pete Johnson getting up ahead of steam to the 35 and 40, they wrestle him down. That's not a bad play, Bob, you get him going with a head of steam and he is really incredible to bring down. You're right, it's something like Kansas City runs too, they run Archie Griffin in motion, he blocks the corner. Well, I don't think Fred Silva would want to talk to Bob Brunig, nor would Brunig want to listen if it were against Dallas. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's a big one too. 32 to the 16. That's too many yards, uh, Mr. Silva. Unless the infraction came behind the line of scrimmage. Now they're adjusting it to the 17-yard line. 17 and 15 or 32 where I went to school. I think that might do it. Number 58, personal foul, clipping. First down. 
Roy Girella, Ralph Berniska, Crohn's disease. It has weakened him. He has lost a lot of weight. He is in pain. And as a result, Girella was signed by the Chargers. He kicks off to the 33-yard line goes Paul Hofer. So the 49ers have 949 to get something going again. They'll have to score in a hurry as you look at the last series. Well, they're going to have to throw the ball and, and get one, one big play in there. They, they can't just use up too much of the clock. They got time to come back. Charger defense is in a position where they can tee off and rush their quarterback, and that's what they love. Jones, Leroy Jones, is at his best in this situation. Walsh has said that he dies on every play, even though he makes some flippant remarks sometime and appears calm. He knows he's not under any pressure to win at this point. O.J. in motion, first and 10 at the 34. DeBerg will go to the air, flips it to Wilbur Jackson. Jackson, 35, and that's all. And Ray Preston, who was a reserve and was Don Good injured with a shoulder, has played very well this season for San Diego. We talked about their depth. You're looking at Leroy Jones, who has played very well with Kelcher out of there. Preston at the linebacker spot. You know, when a, the quarterback dumps it off to the back in a flat, and the defense plays it right, the back really takes a pounding. A straight-up pounding at that. Second and eight. Steve DeBerg from San Jose. Phil Francis, number 48, is in there now. He's out for a pass pattern, and he grabs this one, but doesn't get much as he is written out of bounds by Mike Williams. So it'll be third down. Well, the bird's doing the things. He's throwing short, quick passes. Has time to get them off. They need a first down here to keep the drive going. The bird had a very rough season last year. 45% completion. But coming into this game, he was at, well, almost 60%. a little bit more finesse. Last year he tried to drill it through people. He's got 36 staring him in the face at the 38-yard line. The bird steps up in the pocket, completes it to Brewer, and Brewer has a first down at the 45-yard line. He was wide open. A good pattern. Good, good throw and a good catch. The bird drilled it right in there. So at the 45, a first down. Brewer Flipping goes off and McAfee comes on. See, I thought Brewer didn't drive for the first round there. He kind of fell his way. Paul Hofer, number 36, and Phil Francis, 48, are both in there. It's the setback. Let's see what Solomon does on there. Number 88. Well, he hasn't done much. They haven't gone to him today. Eight catches for 144 yards and two touchdowns last week. He's third in the conference. Roll out by the bird. He's looking. And he drills it. Tough play because there was a defender right in front of Schumann. He's fortunate that wasn't intercepted because he threw it right to the defender. Play never really developed. And that is where a quarterback, I guess, has to really throw it away and not try to get it through anymore. Throw it out of bounds and throw it, throw it over his head. So it's second and ten at the 45-yard line. The 49ers faced with their fifth straight defeat. They'll play host to Seattle next week at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. But they've been competitive, no question about it. O.J. Simpson back in the line. And Simpson on a pitch. Tries to go around outside and gains a yard, that's all. And that's Ray Preston again with a good play coming up from linebacker. They need a big play here, Dick, to get back in the ball game. 49ers took the lead 3-0 on Worshing's 33-yard field goal. But then, before the half was over, the Chargers put 17 points on the board. Simpson's touchdown, cut the lead, but the extra point was missed. And then, following a very tough penalty on fourth and one on a field goal attempt, offsides, opened the doors for Fouts to hit Winslow, and it's 24 to 9. Third and seven here. Willie Buchanan, who had bruised ribs, is back in the game right now. They're chasing the bird. The bird. Throws to no one in particular, and no penalty marker is thrown. The closest man to him was Freddie Solomon, who was about 10 yards away. Well, DeBerg didn't have a chance. He was, he did a good job getting out of there. They run the stunt. They 
drive him out of the pocket. Now he has to throw off balance. Your attention, please, Jack Harpo. Please report to security. Gate up on the plaza. There you're looking at Dan Melville, who will kick from the 32-yard line. He's averaged 35, nearly 36 yards in four tries. Fuller is single safety. Tough play at the 15-yard line, going outside. Fuller down the sideline, and he's finally ridden out of bounds by number 20, Owens. James Owens drove him out of bounds. Good move to the outside by yeah. Fuller. And, and Fuller, many, many uh, returners with a signal for a fair catch. 7.07 remaining in the game. Chargers lead. Bottom left corner of your screen, Blair Bush flipping on Thomas Henderson. It's legal between the tackles, but not legal out there. Replay like that, Bob, convinces me that not only are the camera people doing their job, but so are our producer, Barry Stoddard, and director Dick Klein in the truck having a nice time. I'll afternoon. agree with that, yes. Don't forget, we'll have that Olympic address for you in just a moment. Hang on right after this play. Oh, they tried the draw. Gave it to Charles Alexander. Nothing was there. Now, here's... So it's a second down now after that long walk off and the failing on the draw play. And about 24 yards to go, the nickel defense by Dallas. Dennis Thurman, the fifth defensive back, a flag is down. Anderson throws it out here. He's got uh, his tight end, Dan Ross. First catch of the day for him, I believe, the rookie out of Northeastern. But he was the one to jump. He may have been. It, they're going back to the line of scrimmage again, and if so, yeah. Oh no, they're pointing to Dallas. Oh. Bruce Thornton offside, the uh, Illinois rookie who led the Big Ten in sacks last year. He was also the Big Ten's most valuable player. You know, as a defensive lineman, you know who the last guy to do that was in the Big Ten? Dick Butkus. Ah, uh, you peaked. No, I just guess. Oh, okay. Dick Butkus. Bruce Thornton. Number 77. Defense, number 77. Offside, over here. second down. Hey, I'm serious. I just guessed. I want to star for my forehead. It, it was Dick Butkus. Dick Butkus. How did you know that? Well, I said. Fourteen minutes and 16 seconds left in regulation time. Now we have been informed that either it's cooled down on the field since the opening kickoff, or the temperature just never got as high as we've been telling you, but it's down considerably. So maybe that's why everybody still has a breath of fresh air and some life. And if we've misled you, we apologize, but they now say the temperature is probably closer to 90 degrees on the field. No, we have not misled the people. I was down on the field before the game started, Sam. It was very, very uncomfortable with that. Uh, this turf, this tartan turf, seems to absorb the heat, and it reflects off of it, and it was very, very hot down there. And now that it's in the shade, it's gotten a lot cooler. Well, we thank the Cowboys PR director, Doug Todd, for that information. I bet he runs around with a thermometer, doesn't he? <laughs> Here's a third and 13 for Anderson. Dumps it over the middle. Fighter at the 34-yard line. That won't even be close to a Cincinnati first down. They'll have to give it up again. Andy Hughes comes in, and all they got is probably the third best, uh, uh, the third best safety in professional football, and Randy Hughes playing strong safety. Pat McAnally kicking to uh, Steve Wilson, who's back in single safety. McAnally spirals this and drives Wilson back to his 22-yard line on the Ooh. run. And a great play downfield by Scott Perry, number 32. Los Angeles Ram cheerleaders here with 10.49 remaining in this game. As the Rams with a 14 to nothing lead. And that reminds us to remind you that tonight on CBS we have 60 minutes, a brand new edition. Archie Bunker's place then is followed by One Day at a Time. There's more great comedy on Alice, Vanessa Jefferson's, and Pernell Roberts stars as Trapper John M.D. All tonight on CBS. Oh, what a lineup, huh? Great lineup. Better believe it. Fidel Castro with Dan Rather on 60 Minutes. Archie Bunker, he's something. I kind of like Dallas myself. From the 44 and a half yard line, the St. Louis end of the field. 10.49 remaining in the game. First down, Los Angeles. And carrying the ball is Elvis Peacock, and Calvin Favron was there to make the tackle. Favron is a super quick player out of Southeast Louisiana State. He was there. Second, second round draft pick. 
and he was a defensive end in college and when he came into the preseason camp they couldn't block him he was one of those guys who was so quick six foot one 225 pounder it's an adjustment for them to make standing up you know where he's been down in the three-point stance now he has to stand up and play and he's made the adjustment Dana one second and nine Hayden oh, yeah, oh, he's got yeah, time. Yeah. I mean then Niels comes up he gets it off to Peacock that'll be incomplete Steve Niels dumped Hayden he had time and all of a sudden Steve Niels came pouring through gave him a pretty good hit Niels has a sack this year Hayden getting up and he's okay well they had good coverage that time that's why Pat had to throw the ball in the flat to Peacock he wanted to go downfield but uh, everybody one was covered he dumped the ball off no completion Pat Hayden 5'11 180 fourth year man out of USC Rhodes Scholar and a young man who completing all kinds of studies here in the offseason at Loyola University. He and Vince Ferragamo. Ferragamo wants to be a doctor. They're both going to school. Both quarterbacks in the offseason. Third down, nine. Hayden hit again and hit hard, but he got it off to Charles Young. The ball is fumbled. Picked up by Roger Worley. And Worley to the 30. Worley is going to bring it out. He fumbles the ball. Now he's got it. <laughs> Looks like Ken Green came up with it. I'll tell you, Hayden really got hit when he released the football. Charlie Davis is shaken up for St. Louis. Look at Hayden. Boy, they hit him about chest high and thrilled him. Well, he made a good pass, and he Boy, made the completion. He looked like he hurt his hand some. He looked, looked down at his hand. Let's take a look at it and see. You'll see the rush here. They had a blitz on. You see Eric Williams come around. You see right there, they jumped right in his face. He made the completion, made an excellent throw to Charlie Young. Green knocks the ball loose again. This time the Cardinals come up with a football. Roger Worley comes across, picks it up, put it away. Roger, put it away. He does put it away, but he's not used to carrying a football, and he fumbles the thing. Cardinals end up with the oh. ball at 41, and now Hart has to fall on it. <laughs> Is this a comedy of errors, or what's going on? Well, it's been elusive <laughs> football as far as the Cardinals are concerned the last two weeks. Five fumbles last week. They've had 12 turnovers coming into this game. Unreal. Give you a little trivia thing here. O.J. Simpson is the second back in the National Football League history to rush for 11,000 yards, right? Right. He had 83 today. Who was the other one? Jim Brown. Oh, smart, aren't you? <laughs> that was a safe guess. From the 41, second down, still 10 yards to go. Hard again, stepping up, Tilly, and depending on the play, Pat Thomas. Those down and out patterns on the sidelines, they've covered him every time. They have uh, excellent coverage that time by Thomas, and he made a good throw by throwing it a little out of his reach, and it goes incomplete. So it's third and 10. You know, if you look at the Cardinals, as far as one phase of the game as we look now at Bud Wilkinson, one phase of their game that's been taken away from them is that very play. I don't believe they've completed that one out of six or seven times the last couple of weeks. They're playing a good defensive team. That's what they're facing. Looks like the blitz is coming. Now backs off again. Third down. Hart looking for the first down. And he's got it. Pat Tilly. Tilly with the catch. That'll be a first down at the 35, and the Cardinals are still alive with 8.55 remaining in a 24-yard game. I'm telling you something. It's great experience, and this is just a tremendous throw right here by Jim Hart. What an accurate throw. This man's really not open. He just throws the ball perfectly. Just beats Eddie Brown. What a great pass, great reception. It's still alive, as you said. So Pat Tilly now for two catches, but for 46 yards. First down at the 35. Hart with a lot of time, and then he's hit as he releases it, and that one's up for grabs. Intercepted. Here comes Dave Elmendorf, his second interception of the day. And he's out to the 40. Just as Hart looked like he had time to throw, he was hit as he released the ball, and that ball was just a wounded duck. There was nothing he could do about it. Well, that's something you had to pay the price as a quarterback holding the ball. He did have two people open, but because he got hit, that's a gift interception. Believe me, when you get hit, 
nothing you can do about it. A year ago, the Rams had 28 interceptions. They had had only two prior to today. You think injuries aren't contagious? That's one of the Raider Rests. Lovely lady, Gwen Thompson. And she is going to undergo knee surgery next week. So even the pretty have fallen here in Oakland, 79. But they lead 17 to 3. Larry Canada takes it to the 20, the 25, and the big back from Wisconsin gets it to the 30-yard line where the Broncos have some business to do. And they've handed the ball to Craig Morton, who relieved Norris Weiss early in this one. Great guy kicked that one right through the ceiling. Canada did a good, did a good job of staying on his feet. The three points did not hurt Denver as much as the seven, obviously. They still, they had to get two touchdowns to go ahead as they were behind by 11 points. This just makes it a tie if they get their two TDs. They have 11 minutes, eight seconds to do it. Morton, nine for 20. As a man, Moses, first down at the 45-yard line. One of those patterns that the M&M &M gang work on, and they almost do it blindfolded. Morton to Moses, and they beat the rookie at the corner, Henry Williams. Well, that's the M&M &M connection, and one of the very famous uh, passing combinations in the league. And you can see Williams giving Haven Moses all kinds of room on that side. You just cannot give good receivers that much room, or they're going to eat you up. and tries to float one over the top to Odoms. Odoms is indeed able to get his hands on it, but Lester Hayes right there to bat his arms. Ball bounced high. That's the tip drill. Monty Johnson doing a great job of pulling it in. And there's a break. 10.55 remaining in the game. Oakland has the ball again, and they'll protect or try to do that. For Run all the 1 o'clock finals for you. Here they are. Houston, a big win over Cleveland, 31 to 10. Washington by 9 over Atlanta. The Jets upset Miami. 24-14, New Orleans beat the Giants. Biggest upset of the day, Pittsburgh by uh, losing to Philadelphia by three. We'll continue in a moment. Dorsett for four yards quickly over the middle. Once again, Philadelphia 17-14 over Pittsburgh. Continuing, Minnesota beat Detroit 13-10. These are all final. Buffalo keeps Baltimore winless, 31-13. And Tampa Bay still undefeated by four over the Bears. Still in progress. Oakland at Oakland leads uh, Denver now 17 to 3. Kansas City is going in front of Seattle at the Kingdom at 17 to 6. That's fourth quarter score. San Diego starting to blow out San Francisco 24 9. That's in the fourth quarter. The Rams still 14 nothing over the Cardinals. You are up to date. 31 13 is the score here in Dallas. The Cowboys in command. Second down. Staubach rolling, running. Yard line. Chased out by Mike White, Mac Mitchell. Mike White. Oh, Roger. Roger looks like he got hit. And he has some protection on his ribs, too. I think it was just the fact that a 270 pound defensive tackle landed on a 36 year old, 200 pound quarterback. But he can still scramble with the best of them. Kind of a half rollout looking for Billy Joe Dupree. Dupree was covered very well. Mike White. Young man out of Albany State in Georgia proved to be the strongest Cincinnati Bengal player ever. That, yeah, stronger than Whitley. Stronger than Whitley. Based on what? They use the Nautilus equipment, and Mike White can lift more than anybody, so he's the strongest. I'm impressed. And I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> Third down and two now for Dallas. And again from the shotgun. Inside handoff, Dorsett. He's got room. Down and more. Cuts it back and flags it down. As he reaches. 
reaches the 50-yard line. Reggie Williams made the stop, along with Louis Friedman and Marvin Cobb, and a flag is down. And it's a clip, and it was an unnecessary clip. I couldn't see who did it, but it was a clip on an offensive lineman coming through from the back. Blocking below the knees. Okay, I'll buy that. Close enough, Bob. For 89 offense, illegal touch. Oh. Third down. Well, it's Billy Joe Dupree, and it's third down again, but now instead of two, it's seven yards to go. Look at him move. He's smooth, isn't he? Runs through more tackles than any running back I've ever seen, I do believe. 19 rushes, 114 yards, and he always makes every yard look easy. Scott Perry replaces Jim LeClaire, so they pull the middle linebacker out, a fifth defensive back. And they flood the right side offensively here in a double wing formation. Staubach throws it out here to Tony Hill, and he overthrew him. Good coverage by the strong safety Marvin Cobb. And so the... Penalty against Billy Joe Dupree, not only on Lusby, the rookie from Arkansas, is single safety back at his 30-yard line. He's a pretty good football player, isn't he, Bob? Uh, Lou Holtz thought he was. He's the leading punt returner in the history of the Arkansas Razorbacks. They, and Lou, know, Lou Holtz knows a lot about talent in football, and he liked that young man when he was playing for Lou down at Arkansas. He's got a 40-yarder to his credit this year, and that's longer than anything that Cincinnati had in punt returns last year. He avoids the first couple of men, and down he goes at the 35-yard line. So far, his 14 carries and 53 yards. O.J. Simpson crosses another barrier. Jim Brown, the only other player to reach the 11,000 mark, and he's got to be happy with his performance today. Brown did it in 170 games, and Simpson, 126. First and 10 at the 35, Lydell Mitchell is in the game, number 26. He was acquired from Baltimore for Joe Washington before last year, seeing his first action. But carrying the ball is Clarence Williams. And Williams gets to the 40-yard line before he's stopped by Bob Martin, number 54. When we played uh, Baltimore, we felt we had to stop Lydell Mitchell, number one. We had to stop him running. We had to stop him passing. He was their leading pass receiver. We had to stop him in short yardage. He's coming back. They got Wilkerson back. The club should be getting stronger. Lydell's a fine football player. He can also block. Over 800 yards to lead the club in rushing last year. He had a staff infection in his knee at camp that hampered him. Second and five at the 40 out of the eye. The up back is Williams. And it's Clarence Williams. And good play by Archie Reach, Reese, number 78. He's played a fine game. In fact, the 49ers as a team That's deserve credit. A, yes, they do. The 49ers have stayed in here in spite of having some bad breaks go against them. Some of the bad breaks are their own fault, like being offside on fourth and one. Here's McCrary getting taken out on this play by Reese, the tight end. Now, the Chargers should want to keep that clock going. Grind it out. Don't take chances. Keep the clock moving. 24 to 9, San Diego leading for 545. 545 to go. Jefferson in motion. They go to Joyner the other way on a screen pass. He has a first down at the 47-yard line. Cowlings makes the tackle. Good reverse move by Dan Fouts with Jefferson going the other way. Russ Washington. Let's, let's watch Washington and Archie Reese, 70. I would say he's holding them. Well, they're holding each other. Well, they're both holding each other. The defense can use their hands. The offense can't. First and 10, 47-yard line. Every first down is money in the bank for the Chargers as we wind down to the five-minute mark in this game. Williams going wide. Coming in a good defensive play. Hartman. Cedric Hardman. Nice play by Cedric. Uh, the 49er defense has shut down the Charger running. They haven't hurt them running the football at all. They made a couple of yards on the draw. The one fast trap. But In the final analysis, uh, if there's a plus to come out of this game for the 49ers, it is their best defensive showing of the year. But they're trailing nonetheless 24-9. Not only because of the defense, 24 points, the offense mistakes and penalties have hurt them. 
Four minutes and 15 seconds to go in the game. On a draw play, Williams, head down, gets to midfield. It'll be third and about eight yards to go. Jimmy Webb, number 74, and Bob Martin, 54, make the stop. Martin was picked up by the 49ers after Walt Michaels decided that he didn't want a disenchanted player on hand. Martin is a very sound player. He's consistent, especially good against the pass. That's how you get a good player once in a while. Uh, one year we picked up Danny Bugs that way, Dick. The Giants let him go. It turned out to be our top receiver. Bounce, two touchdown passes, great completion percentage, and a lot of yards for Fouts, who is one of the best in the league. In motion, McCrary. He's got Matthews out of the backfield. He goes to the tight end, McCrary. McCrary battles his way to the 45. It'll be fourth and three yards. Let's look at that young tight end now. I tell you one thing. Watch the poise that Fouts has going back to pass. Now, here's McCrary. He's slow blocking, faking the block. Fouts just dumps it to him. And he's hit pretty hard. He's from Clark College in Georgia. That's in Atlanta. So now Jeff West will punt. His last kick, 55 yards. He'll kick from the 40. Freddie Solomon is back there with Tony Dungy. Dungy to the right. Solomon to the top. 245, clock running. That's what you want, the high kick. Solomon calls for a fair catch, and a ball going in for a touchdown. So a touchback, and the 49ers will get the ball again, as you see West saying, well, I couldn't have just hang in there. 2.34 to go in the game, 24 to nine, Chargers way ahead. Even Darth Vader is alive and happy in Oakland. Well, there is a way to cure bronchitis. <laughs> and Lester Hayes, 37. He's 5'11", but was a high school center. Look at him leap from behind and bat it right out of the midst of Odoms. And then intercepted by Monty Johnson. Oakland has the ball again at the 26-yard line. Hayes was a high school center at 5'11". Shows you why. Straight ahead. And the Raider game plan has been that all day, Merlin. Well, it certainly has, and the uh, turnover, by the way, the first of the game, and the Broncos uh, themselves looking now, in fact, need to have a turnover. They've got to get that ball back, and one of the things that they have done so well over the past few years is to take the football away, give their offense field position, and I don't think there's been a, an offensive team in football more opportunistic than the Denver Broncos, but they need the football to score, and they need it quickly. And time working against the men in the white jerseys from Denver. Taped up on the sidelines. Jensen in motion. Van Egan to the 30, where it'll be third down and six. Tom Jackson, the speedy linebacker, 57 from University of Louisville, made the tackle. What are those, the Polaroids? Those are Polaroids of the game, and uh, it shows the position of each of the players uh, as he started to play. Those pictures are taken that give the, the players a chance to look at uh, what is being done, what uh, formations are in defensively. Dan Fouts has hit that brilliant rookie, Kellen Winslow, 20 yards for a touchdown, and the Chargers open up a 24-9 lead against the 49ers. 49ers after their first win of the year. Stabler on third and six. Dumps it away to Jensen. Jensen started to move upfield when Stabler looked him off, and he faked out his receiver. And the rookie went for the head fake by the passer, and the Broncos will get the ball right back, and Oakland was able to chew up only about a minute on that possession. Got to wonder if maybe they won't go to try and block one of Ray Guy's punts. He had one blocked earlier against uh, San Diego during the year. He does not get many blocked. He gets it out of there pretty quick. We talked about Guy's powerful leg, and we all know about that. We told you that he can stand on the 50 and throw the ball into the end zone. I asked him how far could he throw a pass, a long pass. He said, oh, I can hit 80 easily. He probably can. May have the strongest arm in the NFL. Ten men. Charging Guy. Upchurch at his 30. Looking for that one block, 35, 40, 45, 46. <laughs> Is he exciting? He fumbled the ball, and the Raiders say they have it, but we have no official signal yet. Yes, we do. We, one of the officials signaled the Raider ball, and Upchurch comes out of there furious. Threw his helmet did Upchurch, and Red Miller in some disbelief. And they have to cart the verbal 
actually attacking Upchurch off the field. Was it Derek Jensen? Number whoa, Upchurch is just angry. That ball apparently stripped away by Derek Jensen, number 31. And the Oakland Raiders, of course, at a very critical point in the game when it looked like Denver might be getting some momentum back by return. Watch it for yourselves at home. Just some great running here by Upchurch. Eludes a man here, jumps right over the top of another. There's Derek Jensen pulling on the arms, popped it away. Get an idea of the emotion of the rest of have that football. The ball did appear to be pulled free before he hit the ground, and Stabler going for six has Dave Casper. Stabler had called when they fumbled the snap in the last sequence. Swenson and Latimer down the bottom of the pile. It'll be second and goal from around the one. Stabler having a little trouble with his footing. Actually had to dive to give that handoff to Van Egan. But, uh, Stabler is showing you why he still is a dangerous man with that football in his hands. Watch him here. A little late. He, he got his feet hooked in there somehow. Just barely able to get that ball handed off to Van Egan. Oakland leading 17 to 3. And Danny Stabler has his fangs ready at the two yard line, second and goal. Play action. Casper. Almost a one hand grab. Stabler said, Ooh, give me one more chance. Well, he'll have a third and goal at the two. Just watch the end of the play. Casper up, gets a hand on it, and I think if he could have got a little, maybe one more finger on the ball, he would have been able to stop it. Merlin Olsen, I, I'm going to throw this at you. You see how you'd react. Throw ten of those to Casper. I say he catches five of them. Not many would, but I think he'd catch five of them. He really is an amazing receiver and such a great athlete that he gets up there and makes that unbelievable catch. Yeah, you expect him to catch everything. Third and goal at the two. Van Egan, no way. He loses a yard, and the Bronco defense pressures the Raiders, and the field goal unit comes on. A very important attempt by the rookie Jim Breach, another former California player. If he kicks this one, the Broncos will be down by more than two touchdowns and only eight minutes to play. He is connected on his only try, 27 yards. Broncos reacting very well to the pressure near the end zone, but they're giving up the big play. And Stabler has hurt them with the passing game today. Van Egan's hurt them on the run, and this field goal could also hurt them tremendously because it puts it out of the range of two touchdowns, and there's not that much time on the clock. Hard shell there with a towel over shoulder. 21-yard attempt. Good. Looking to Dave Elmendorf, his second interception. Sonny, let's look at it again. Well, you look at this, and you'll see what causes the interception. It's the pressure. You see right there, just as he released the ball, he got hit. He had somebody open. But look what happens. The ball is underthrown. Well, you're not guilty as a quarterback of throwing that. I can't count that as an interception for a quarterback. I got to give it to the offensive line. We have a new quarterback for the Rams. Vince Ferragamo has come in. He gives off to Elvis Peacock, and he gets the eye. We've just been told by our producer, Howard Reifschneider, they're X-raying the finger on the throwing hand of Pat Hayden. Remember we saw him when he came off the field. He was taking a look at it. It must have uh, either hit somebody's uh, shoulder pad or helmet. You do that in your follow-through a lot of times, and uh, possibly that's what happened. 
you know, he broke his thumb in the playoffs against Dallas. And now that that was index finger this time, though, I believe. That's open to 42, second down and eight. There's Ferragamo stats. He came in last week against Tampa Bay in the fourth quarter. Out of Nebraska. You have the Peacock again. Peacock to the 45, the 50, the first down to the Cardinal 46 yard line. Steve Neal drops it. Elvis Peacock. You got a feeling he up. If he ever gets healthy, no telling what this guy would be like. Take a look, a little counter. You saw him take the little counter step. He actually out, outruns the block that time. Gets outside Bill Bain in uh, at guard, and he outran uh, Bill Bain that time to get outside. And enough for the first down. You know, Hayden left the game, Sonny. 14 of 24, 170 yards. Pretty good afternoon. I was impressed with his play today. I was uh, he able to move the ball on the ground, and that really helps Pat Hayden when they're capable of doing that. From the 46, the first down. This is Ferragamo, and boom, almost intercepted. Nice play by Ken Green. Green all over the place. Here's a fourth quarter score in Oakland, leading Denver. A surprise. This is a surprise. Uh, 20 to 3. It's unbelievable. You know, that's kind of unreal. I didn't expect them to come back and play this well. They got what, Kansas City beat them last week. Right, and Denver came from behind on the arm of Craig Morton last week, and now they're having offensive problems, it looks like. And Kansas City doing a job on Seattle, too. They're leading 24-6 to six right now. They're in the fourth quarter. Yeah, Seattle's had their problems. Second and 10. There we go. Fourth round draft pick in 1977. He just got rid of that one. Man covered on the far side all the way, and he just tossed it out of there. There's the score you just mentioned a while ago, Sonny, the Kansas City-Seattle game. And that is a final. Kansas City has won. It's just been handed to us, the final score. And they're three and two. Boy, Marv Levy's done an excellent job there. He's got a good young team defensively, and that doggone wing T seems to be working for him a little bit. A lot of your time remaining. A lot of criticism, excuse me, Gary, but a lot of criticism last year about that wing tee, but it's been successful for him. There we are, time remaining in the score. The Rams have never been able to put the clincher together, but the Cardinals have never been able to get on the board. It's been a battle of no scoring in the second half. There's Charles Young. And he's to the 31-yard line and has a first down. Perry Smith defending on the play. Just a real good throw here by Vince Ferragamo. I like this young man. Good throw here. He gets a blitz, has single coverage, delivers the ball well. You see how close Smith was to making a play, but not quite do it accurately. Enough for the first down. You know, you wonder what's happened to Young. He had some sensational years. In 74, he caught 63 passes. That led the NFC. He had 55 catches in 73. It's hard to catch that many when you're sitting on the bench. <laughs> Last year he had 18 catches. Here is on the far side Eddie Hill. Hill inside the 30 yard line to the 27. The Rams in a position where they like to be. The 14 nothing lead. Time starting to tick away and they're moving the football. Here's Eddie Hill, number 24. The last two times they've had the football, uh, the Cardinals have forced him to turn the ball over. They stopped them down inside of their five yard line once. And then they got the fumble by Terry Nelson, and Worley picked it up. They put a stop to him a couple times. They need it again. Second it down. Six. Six. Hunt, hunt, hunt. Paragamo, big guy, six foot three, 207, cranking up, throwing down the field. Jesse running out of room. He couldn't stay in and make the catch. Carl Allen defending on the play. Ron Jesse. With 5.02, as you see the scoreboard clock here. The Rams now, Sonny, this is really kind of surprising. They have 351 yards in total offense. 166 rushing, 185 passing. They've had the ball so much, uh, you know, uh, really because uh, they've been able to uh, control the ball. They haven't made any mistakes that have really hurt them. Yet, on the other hand, the Cardinals have. Cardinals 195 yards, 109 passing, 86 rushing. Aragamo back, look out, pressure, and he's got a man, Bill Waddy. Touchdown. Bill Waddy went up, had to wait on that football, but he got it. 27-yard touchdown strike. 
Roger Worley defending on the play, and that may be the clincher they've been looking for. Two people coming off the bench. Vince Ferragamo looked to his right, then went back and threw to his left, and Waddy just makes a, a good catch. He steals the ball from Roger Worley, and it, he was in the end zone when he made the catch. Therefore, they get a touchdown. A future doctor. A little happy, huh? Vince Ferragamo. He's studying in medical school. Be a doctor someday. They must have the smartest core of quarterbacks in the history of the NFL in Hayden and Ferragamo. One a doctor, another a Rhodes Scholar. I was always talking about that, but Kilburn and I were in Washington. Uh, we <laughs> well, you were smart in other ways. <laughs> we had to go the other way. That's right. Correct. <laughs> Point after. And it's a 21 to nothing game. And so, the Los Angeles Rams on a 60 yard drive in eight plays. A 27-yard touchdown pass from Ferragamo to Wadi. 4.55 left. Tonight on NBC. Over the middle to Don Bass to the 50-yard line. Aaron Kyle made the stop, but a flag is down. And before I leave this idea of the movie in the Disney's wonderful world, you read where NBC is number one in the ratings last week. How about that? Number 77. First down. Excellent vision, Trumpy. You know, you talk about the great week that NBC had in the ratings. Hopefully, it'll be onward and upward from there. Of course, we believe that NBC gives you the best coverage of the National Football League week in and week out. We know we have the best baseball coverage anywhere. And our playoffs begin Tuesday night from Riverfront Stadium, Cincinnati. The Pirates and the Cincinnati Reds. Then Wednesday night, the American League, Baltimore and California. Here's Alexander to the 25-yard line and not a step further. Stopped there by Larry Bethea and Randy White, and Bethea playing more and more in the second half here, as is Bruce Thornton, 77. Next week, Dallas goes to Minnesota, who finally put one together today, so I imagine Tom Landry, because of the heat down on the field, saving some of his defensive linemen. Well, we've got a great game next Sunday, don't we? I hope to tell you we do. You and I are going to Denver to do uh, San Diego and the Denver Broncos at Mile High Stadium. Pittsburgh and Cleveland. These are our 3.30 games on NBC next Sunday. That should be a great football game with first place hanging in the balance. Both teams lost today. Ten flags are down. Ross dragged down from behind as he reaches the 45. I believe it's a legal procedure. I don't think it could be anything else. There was so much movement there before the ball was snapped <laughs> by Blair Bush. I thought Trumpy was on the field. No, I, no, I think they're going to call it on Don Basto. Not only did he move, he didn't even make any attempt to go back. Whoa, on Dallas. On Dallas. We keep the play. That surprises me. I'll never learn. Defense number 79. Offside. Refuse. I hope to tell you. So they take the play and we'll look at it, Bob. Harvey Martin, Randy White, never got back. They're all jumping there. Well, we get the play. I think we dodged a bullet on that. I should say the Bengals dodged a bullet on that one. Third down and one. What was that use of the first person pronoun? I guess when you play for somebody for 10 years, Robert, it's hard to divorce yourself and nobody out there can blame you. And you distinguished yourself 10 glorious years with the uh, orange and black of Cincinnati. Yeah, but I wore more black and blue than I did anything else. That's why I got out. So a first down conversion by the Bengals on a turning clock. 10.20 to go in the fourth quarter. It's 31 to 13 Dallas. The Bengals need a strike and they need it in a hurry. One thing I do like about the Cincinnati team, though, they're not folding. They're trailing. 31-13, but they're still staying with their offense, still with the spread formation, and still throwing it to Don Bass. From the 45 of Cincinnati, Bass goes wide left. Isaac Curtis just out of your picture to the right. Fakes the draw. Throws the home run to Isaac. And he almost caught it. It hit his hands, I believe. He had Aaron Mitchell turned around. And it may have grazed his hands, although I don't think he saw it. Close. Very, very close. One of the most difficult passes for passes this year for the last two weeks. Well, I do think that they've been primarily a passing team this year. You'll see how close this is to Isaac Curtis. Oh, just an inch more reach on Isaac Curtis. I think he would have caught it. Answer my question, can you? Well, behind 31 to 13, that's all they're going to do for the rest of the game. Now, but how about earlier? I think they passed the ball with pretty good frequency. 
the middle, too high for Jimmy Corbett, the tight end. Let me answer. 17 for 32, 181 yards. One touchdown, two interceptions, and I just can't tell you how big the interceptions were. The one in the first quarter by Randy Hughes turned the whole momentum of the football game around. And the one in the third quarter by the rookie Aaron Mitchell stopped some great momentum by Cincinnati as they were coming back. Oh, what was that? Did he try to one-hand that football? He certainly did. That thing was dead in his hands, and he caught it, tried to catch it with one hand. Well, wait a minute. I don't understand that. He ought to be fined, if you'll allow me to say it, for having tried to do something like that on a pass that did not necessitate a one-handed catch. Well, let's see the play first, Sam, before we find him. Let's see what happens. That was well within his reach. Oh, that was well goodness. within his reach. No reason to try one hand on that one. I know he's not happy in Cincinnati and wants to be traded, but that he's very happy about it. Yeah, the question is, will Paul Brown, Homer Rice, or anybody else say something to Isaac about it? Well, if they don't, they should. McAnally will have to punt when they should have had a first down. Anderson put it right in Curtis's hands. He elected to use but one hand and couldn't hold it. Oh, did he boom that one? Right into the end zone. Yeah, yeah. Don Coriel took over last year, and the Chargers finished 8-4 and four under his helm. 7-1. and one. This has been a hot ball club. Two minutes and 34 seconds remaining in the game. 24 to 9 the score. Chargers have scored only once in the second half, but it was a big one. Fouts to Winslow, the rookie end from Missouri, the top draft choice who has sparkled today. First and 10 at the 20 for San Francisco. And confusion in the penalty as Wilbur Jackson is really put down hard by Don Good, who's back in the game. So we're seeing a lot of the walking wounded such as Lydell Mitchell and Don Good getting a chance late in this game, George. That's that's uh, good football on Jackson's part. Uh, it was obvious the Chargers were offside. Jackson kept going and picked up additional yardage. You never know what's going to happen, so you don't stop. Fouts has completed his last nine passes in a row. That's pretty 79 good. 79 and 99 offside defense. Well, First two down. years ago, I remember seeing the San Diego club when Fouts was a holdout, and they went with James Harris and Munson and Olander, and Fouts all of a sudden ended his holdout. He played against Seattle. It looked like he hadn't missed a step, and you knew that this quarterback had a little more than just uh, just good talent. Speaking of Olander, John Madden told me Olander beat him one day up here. I was here for that game. I think it was 12-7 here at San Diego Stadium. The bird back to throw. And he completes it to Phil Francis, the back. It is a first down for the 49ers. It also stops the clock with 2.21 remaining see, at the 35. See, it's hard to get back in the ball game just, just throwing short passes. You're running out of time. You have to get a big, a big play in there. You have to hit a bomb. Their one big play was a 46-yard strike from DeBerg to Paul Hofer, who was caught from behind, actually had to wait for the ball. And that's where the 49ers really generated something, but it's been the only big play they've had all day on offense. First and 10 at the 35. OJ going outside. And gets close to a first down. Leroy Jones was a man who missed him at the line of scrimmage. And Keith King, number 57, who was a safety, moved to linebacker, made the tackle for San Diego. There's the two-minute warning coming up right now. We haven't had the official whistle, and there it is. The score is 24 to 9. San Diego on its way to its fourth victory in five games atop the Western Division of the AFC. The door set, breaks the tackle, and stumbles to the 25-yard line. Anderson, we understand, has some leg cramps and may not be back. We're gathering together some scores and try to run down the game still in progress. That's fourth quarter now. Oakland has taken a 20-3 lead over Denver, so there's an upset at the Oakland Alameda Coliseum in progress. Kansas City, it's final. They went up to the Kingdom. They are an amazing football team, and they really blistered Seattle. San Diego is romping over San Francisco 24-9. And nothing changed in the Rams' cards. It's been 14-0 from the first quarter on. The Rams leading. Second down five. Ron Springs replaces Dorsett and gets the football. First down as he reaches the 32-yard line. Bo Harris 
made the stop. And that play was the play that the Dallas Cowboys scored their first two touchdowns on. The tight end trap. They like that play. Jay Saldy on Wilson Whitley. Ron Springs right up through the middle. Ron Springs was running back at Ohio State after Archie Griffin. Not quite as except as, as, as successful, but still a very good running back. And a good draft choice for Dallas. We have 8.22 to go in regulation time. Sam Nover and Bob Trumpy at the Texas Stadium. An 18-point lead for Dallas. First down for Staubach. He's got Springs and Laidlaw behind him. Oh, this kid is something. Laidlaw to the 43-yard line. He's got two touchdowns today. And he got a quick nine yards on that carry. Finally healthy, and he's replacing Robert Newhouse, who is their starting fullback and been their most consistent fullback over the last few years. A power play up through the middle. Good blocking by the Dallas offensive line. I think Samurai could make a few yards on that play. Not to change the subject, Bob, but if Tom Landry wins today, and it looks, uh, looks like he will, he will need just one victory to tie Paul Brown for fourth place on the all-time coaching list which is a remarkable accomplishment and rather ironical in as much as Landry is on the far side of the field and Paul Brown for so many years was on the sidelines of Cincinnati and now is sitting somewhere up above us. No, right below us. Oh, right below uh, us. Two great football coaches. There's no denying that. Inches shy of a first down with Scott Laidlaw. <laughs> Robert Newhouse has not played a moment today. Because of a knee injury, did not play in Cleveland, but they really haven't needed him. That's the great thing about having depth. You can let those injured uh, have a little extra time to heal. Brinson and Laidlaw have done the job. Wilson Whitley met the ball carrier Brinson head on at the line of scrimmage, and I just don't know. Yes, they say a first down. So the Cowboys now can go to work on the clock. They've been working on the Bengals all afternoon. It'll be under seven minutes to play when they run this play. And Dallas is well on its way to gaining another 400 yards totally on offense for today and keep their average. Robert Shaw, the Cowboys' number one draft choice, center out of Tennessee, 6'4", 245, replaces the veteran John Fitzgerald. Giving him a risk. When you were leading uh, fourth quarter action by 18, 20 points, you liked this time too, didn't you? Sure. Springs through a nice hole to the midfield, striping across. Or they sprung Springs very nicely, no pun intended. <laughs> Duran made the stop. And as I said earlier, one of the most unpublicized offensive lines, Donovan, Scott, now Shaw in at center, Rafferty. Oh, they're all going out. Donovan's gone, Scott's gone. Andy Frederick, 71, is in there. Burton Lawless, 66, has moved into the offensive line. Rayfield Wright playing right tackle. He's not, I don't think you can consider Rayfield Wright a backup. He's been to the Super Bowl five times. It's not bad. Well, anybody who's been on the Dallas Cowboys for, what, eight or nine years has been to the Super Bowl five times because that's how many times Landry's taken him there. Oh, good stop right at the line of scrimmage. A flag goes into the pile. Jim LeClaire just butted heads with the ball carrier Brinson on the carry and stopped him cold in his tracks. And a flag is down, as I mentioned, with 5.55 to go in the game, and it's holding against Dallas. 52, holding. Second down. And that's a rookie mistake by Robert Shaw. He's been penalized 10 times for 76 yards. And Staubach has gone the distance, even though Dallas leads 31-13. Second down, 11. Throws it out here. It's caught by Tony Hill. No, they say he trapped it, and Hill doesn't like it. Good call. Good call. We're going to have to look at that one again, but Tony still continues to argue. Ken Riley had the coverage. His momentum carried him to the ground, and he didn't quite hang on to it. It bounced on the ground, and that's not a reception. This is a good call by the officials. Both officials call it the same. Timing pattern by Staubach. Good protection. Into the black part of the field, huh? Well, unfortunately, yep. because of the shadows, we can't show it to you. Well, the man didn't want us to know. <laughs> what can I tell you? That's fate. They're so lucky. With a capital F. They just did not want us to confirm that one one way or the other. And again, of course, we apologize, but there's nothing our cameras can do with the shadows here in and out of the sunshine at Texas Stadium. Third down, Staubach. Yes, 
Yes, it should be. That is a penalty when you spike it like that. It's called delay a game. This was a dying swan by Roger Staubach. Dying swan by Roger Staubach because he was flushed. He couldn't hang on to the football. That's the toughest spot to be. An official that makes the call on the side of the team that the call went against. Well, Preston Pearson gave him an earful, didn't he? And there was no flag, so there is no personal foul. I think that may have been an oversight. Well, that's just an automatic thing, delay of game, spiking the football like that. So Danny White, who's had himself a great day, as has Pat McAnally. White's average 49 yards a punt. McAnally, 50. Good high spiral by Danny. Lusby at his 13-yard line, fair catch right in the sun. And so they'll spot it there, 44 yards on the punt by White. Stand by after the game because we'll be talking to some of the San Diego players and uh, find out about the improved defense for the 49ers. I'm sure the 49ers defense surprised the Chargers today. Schumann is in motion, fourth and four at the 41-yard line. And a fumble picked up by Johnson. He fumbles, picks it up again like he dribbled the ball, and he's down at the five-yard line. Gary Johnson, as if he were on a basketball court, dropped it and picked it up. The bounce went his way. Fumble by... See, Johnson knows the rules. Johnson knows the rules. <laughs> I have to put a number on that play. The bird never had the ball. Watch 79 pick up a ball. There's a, it's like a rugby game. Everyone is there, and he picks it up. It looks like a rugby match. Look at that bounce right in the hands of Gary Big Hands Johnson. And the Chargers are inside the five and could get some more points. Johnson looked like he played fullback in high school. He rambled, but he got ahead of steam going. He was tough to bring down. First and goal at the four now. That's alert play on his part. One thirty five to play. Hank Bauer short yardage gets inside. You know how many times and I know George you you were once accused of this against the Giants and that was getting an extra point rolling up late in the game. But I think anyone who really knows what the game of football is all about you owe it to your team first of all. But second of all the way football is today you have to score as many points as possible for tiebreakers. Well, uh, you just let the clock keep going, and if, if you score, you score. If you don't, you don't. We took time out one year because Larry Brown had a chance to get a, a thousand yards at home. We wanted him to get the thousand yards at home. Less than a minute to play. Second and goal with the two. The fans want another touchdown. Hank Bauer will not get it, I don't believe. He was stopped short. Stop short of the goal. A yard. It'll be third and goal. Bauer going off left tackle. Coriel's telling him to go ahead. See, the fans want to see him score. Less than a yard. Just a foot or so. Clock running. 21 seconds. This will be the last play, perhaps. Third and goal at the one. Will the Chargers end up in a flurry? Hank Bauer, touchdown! Chargers get the points with eight seconds to go. San Diego Chargers leading 30 to nine as Hank Bauer scores with eight seconds remaining. And for Bauer, it's his first touchdown of the season. He has two hands in that football, which you want him to do. Down in there, you want to protect the ball. You don't want to lose it. Many backs carry the ball with one hand. Here it is again. And Bauer goes over the top. That's the way to score. If you go low, there's too many bodies down in there. You can't score. You've got to go over the top, jump as you reach the line of scrimmage. Roy Girella adds the 31st point. So it's now 31-9. to nine. This game was close into the third quarter, but it isn't anymore. Take a look again at the Rams' third touchdown.
touchdown. Billy Waddy makes the play in the end zone against Jawaji Worley. Good catch, excellent catch by him. He just protected the ball. It wasn't a very uh, accurately thrown ball. He got it to the man, but he just made an excellent play out of catching it for the touchdown. There's the statistics on that last drive, that short kick taken by Kurt Allerman. Kurt Allerman. And the Cardinals have the ball at the 40-yard line. Corral has kicked off those line drives all day. That's been their strategy. It's kind of unusual, too, because if somebody can uh, cut one of those things off, they get good uh, field position. They also can return the ball very quickly before the covering team can get down. I assume that's by design. From the 40-yard line now, the Cardinals down 21 to nothing. They've got to kind of salve some injuries now as here's Pazarkowitz, the new quarterback, off to Gary Parrish. And Parrish, the tight end of the 42-yard line. Steve Pazarkowitz in at quarterback for the first time this year on his first pass, completion of 18 yards to Gary Parrish. Good call here. You, you see him hide the ball, just a little screen, throws it off to Gary Parrish. Makes a good run with the football afterwards. He showed me a little moves there, huh? That's his fourth catch of the year. Prozarkowitz, one for one for the 79 season. Boy, he had a great game in the preseason against Atlanta. Four touchdown passes. And now from the 41-yard line. Prozarkowitz throwing again over the middle. He's got his man and Dave Steep. Steep making the catch inside the 40. They're going to mark the ball at the 36-yard line, and it'll be four yards short of the first down. Nolan Cromwell with the tackle. That's something I think the Cardinal receivers, uh, I like what they do. They, they recognize the blitz, and when they recognize the blitz, they, they alter their pattern. They run a little slant pattern, and Steve picked it up well and made the completion. He's a leading quarterback in the league right now, two for two for the season. Pat Hayden, by the way, the x-rays on his index finger on his throwing hand have proved negative. That's good news. He better get back on the field because Paragama just did a touchdown pass. He'll make it get well. Theotis Brown, nothing doing on that play. Jim Youngblood. Jim Youngblood ran to stop. Well, the basketball season getting underway in fine fashion. October 12th right here on CBS. The Lakers against the Clippers, and I'm anxious to see Bill Walton play for the Clippers. Going against Magic Johnson of the Lakers. Bill Walton is healthy, he's happy, and when he's ha healthy and happy, no telling what kind of season he could have. I tell you one thing, you have to be alert when you're on the floor with Magic Johnson because he can he can embarrass you with hitting you with a basketball. Boy, that's going to be a good team in Los Angeles. The big guy in the middle and Nixon and Johnson at the guard. Back to throw Pazarkowitz, throwing far side. He just got rid of that one. Jim Childs was the man over there, Pat Thomas. I got to say something about Thomas. He has really played well today. He's covered everything they've thrown his way. Looks like to me that he he's he's reading the pattern so well because every time someone has run an out pattern, he has read the pattern perfectly. Looks like to me if Charles had gone up field that particular time, he would have run right by him, but yet the pattern was designed to go out and he was there. He must be reading the receivers. We have a fourth down now. And they're just gonna try to get something going. Fourth and six. 2.41 left of the game. Zarkowitz scrambling around across the grain intended for Theotis Brown. And guess who was there again? Number 53, Jim Youngblood. He has two interceptions already this year. He's really come on. He's played that left linebacker spot as well as anybody will play it. And so, taking over on downs, the Rams with 2.36 remaining. Dollar duck followed by the world premiere, the kid from left field. A big double bill for you fans at home tonight on NBC. Robert Dion, the star of Benson, also appearing along with Ed McMahon on that show. Guy going to hit wow. him right out of the stadium from the 35. That kick about 74 yards in the air. So a touchback to the Broncos is Guy having a great afternoon. 20 to 3, the Oakland Raiders lead the Denver Broncos. If you join us late, Stabler hit Dave Casper. Roger Harbo is the man who's been giving us those spectacular shots right off the grass. Really giving you a feeling that that's his camera at work now. Oh, what a great uh, advantage to have that kind of field camera available to give you folks at home that kind of shot. Morton 
with only seven and a half minutes remaining. Hits Riley Odoms, 33-yard line first down. Let's go back and review the scoring for you. Stabler to Casper, a 30-yard touchdown. Got the Raiders 7-0 in front in the first quarter. Jim Turner missed a 32-yard field goal for the Broncos in the second quarter and then connected from 19 yards to make it 7-3. But just after the kick by Turner on the ensuing kickoff, Larry Brunson, a 50-yard return set up. An Oakland Raider touchdown just before the half, scored by Mark Van Egan, the first rushing touchdown for the Raiders this year, 14 to 3. They didn't score in the third quarter. Fourth quarter, a pair of field goals here by Jim Breach, 27 and 21 yards, have made it 20 to 3. And Denver has only 6.45 left to catch the Raiders. So the other score, 24 to 6, Kansas City leading Seattle. Tumay makes the play on John Keyworth at the 35-yard line. A lot of changes made. You watch Norris Weiss, who's still maybe saying to himself, hey, I think I could have done a better job in there, but that's the, that's the problem you're always going to have when you're rolling two quarterbacks in and out. Morton has not done badly, but he just has not been able to punch up that many points. And certainly the clock ticking down now, 17-point deficit. Broncos not looking too good right now. Second down and eight. Morton steps up and hits Rob Lytle for a first down at the 45. He's hammered by Lester Hayes and Rod Martin. Going back to that score you saw earlier, Kansas City late in the game beating Seattle 24 to six. That would make the Chiefs three and two. And Ted McKnight, running back for the Chiefs, has had another big day. He's run one for 84 yards and another 24-yard touchdown run. Ted McKnight helping the Chiefs to a 24 to six lead, and there's only a minute and a half left in that game. Chiefs had a big victory last week against these Oakland Raiders. Certainly uh, chewed them up on the ground. I think uh, may have inspired some of the defensive changes we've seen today. Four-man rush, different, alley, different alignment of uh, the defenders on many different situations. First down from his 45. Morton to throw. Deep for Moses. Incomplete down at the Oakland 25. Another note of interest, Merlin. O.J. Simpson today rushing for 83 yards, and that game still underway in San Diego. He has passed the 11,000-yard mark in his career. Of course, only Jimmy Brown has exceeded that total. O.J. Simpson has scored a touchdown, and he's nearing the 100-yard rushing mark today. Second and 10 for the Denver Broncos with five minutes and 12 seconds left. Time permitting, NFL 79. We'll have scores and highlights for you. Jim Brown finished with 12,312. Thank you, Joe Costanza. Up church right. Vince Kinney to the left. Reception this afternoon is 10th career. Monty Johnson uh, alternating with Villapiano early in the game. Monty coming in on passing situations, and you saw why right there, right on top of number 24, Otis Armstrong, and he had a good shot at that one. Morton uh, looking downfield, finally went to a secondary receiver and gunned it. I don't think he realized that Monty was that close to him. Well, big upsets today. The Jets handed Miami its first loss. Philadelphia handed the Steelers their initial defeat of the season. And this would be a mild upset if the Raiders won at home. They were the underdog today to Denver. Morton rolling out of pressure. He's got some running room, and he also has some time, but not for long. Broken up at the 32. Davis and Tatum converged on Moses. There's a case where Morton didn't get his real good spiral off. Problems because he had run back to the line of scrimmage. In fact, the official looking to see if he was over the line of scrimmage. I think that scared him. You get a look at Taven Moses running all by himself, sees that Morton has time, breaks back to him, which is a receiver's responsibility, but should have kept coming. I think had he kept coming, he might have had a chance at that one. Watch Morton now. Morton running for his life. Watch him come to the sideline and then look for the official at the top. Oh, he, let's see if he, he goes right there for his pocket, reached for his pocket, and then checked him again and said, No, he's all right. They're going to go for it. It's do or die for the Broncos. Fourth and ten at their own 45 with less than five minutes remaining. Morton. Not 
not even close. Steve Watson, number 81. And the Raiders are going to send Red Miller's Broncos home a loser today unless Denver can come up with some turnovers. It's been a very stout defense by the John Matuzic less Oakland Raiders. 4.51 left. Oakland still in front. 51 left and Oakland takes over on downs at the Denver 45 yard line. Silver and black will be back. Someone prophetic with that sign today. It's 20 to 3 as Van Egan to the 42 yard line and the Broncos tackling Van Egan in the ball. Randy Gratishar and Bernard Jackson leading the charge. Got to believe that Van Egan and the other backs who handle that ball and they're going to have both hands on it or at least have it locked away because every Bronco defender will be trying to strip it. They'll try and stack them up, hold them up and take the ball away from them. Four minutes, 25 seconds left is Booker Russell, 34. Rookie from Southwest Texas, actually in his second year. 4-17. That's all that remains. And Raiders trying to finish with the ball. They have a 20-3 lead. Defense is shut out. Inside the 40 to the 39, where it'll be third down and four. Under four minutes left. Monty Johnson, a key interception today. A former hockey player from Bloomington, Minnesota, and at Nebraska. The old linebacker, chance to smile. He deserves it. He and that defense have done a fine job today. I think we ought to pass a few bouquets to the offensive line for the Raiders, though. Playing without Shell, playing out without Mickey Marvin, playing without Dave Dalby the last half of this game. And they've done a fine job of opening holes for Van Egan, running backs, and an excellent job of protecting Ken Stabler today. It may well have been the difference in the game. Oops. Stabler on a one hop, and he hits Raymond Chester down at the 28 yard line, but we have a flag down. Chester another catch for the Raiders as they've used that two tight end offense very effectively not only the blocking power to adds with Casper and Chester in there but they're both such outstanding receivers. Watch Stabler the ball dropping there hard to tell whether there was a late snap or whether Stabler just mishandled it put it right on the money there you just, you just drilled that one in holding call you see Tunney. Microphone obviously not 63. working today. 63. I, th I think maybe he signaled 63, which would be the old captain Gene Upshaw, one of the one of two starters still in that uh, offensive line for the Raiders. The other one being Henry Lawrence. Official word, Merlin. Jim Tunney lost his transmitter, so we'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, be, he'll be able to parlay that into one of his uh, funny moments on his speaking tour. He's an outstanding uh, public speaker. Draw play. Clarence Hawkins. And he loses back at the 48-yard line. Bruce Radford, number 78, a rookie from Grambling, a third-round pick, made the tackle. He's quite an outstanding young athlete. He, at 260 pounds, Radford ran a 4.740. That's almost fullback speed. But he is young. They've got to get him running in the right direction. And uh, he's not always doing that yet, but has great potential. It's got to be a frustrating day for these Broncos. They, uh, they felt very good coming to this game. They were healthy. Uh, looking across at Oakland, uh, they had to figure Oakland, uh, with all of their injuries and all their problems coming off a bad start, uh, not going to be that good an opponent today. And that was a mistake. The Raiders, as we said, uh, putting it together today for the first time probably in the year, other than the win over the Rams, which was not that impressive a showing for them. They capitalized on some Ram errors to, uh, to punch that one in late in the game. But today they have played excellent football and, and certainly uh, would appear to be making this divisional race a much more competitive one. Great guys, statistics uh, speak for themselves. 48-yard average. Upchurch, the only man back at the 10. Spiral, he kicks the wind right out of the ball. 11 yard line, up church is tackled. John Huddleston from the University of Utah, along with Clarence Hawkins, to make the tackle a 45 yard kick. Now that showed you the power of his leg because any punter would tell you he just didn't really hit that one cleanly and still knocked it 45 yards. 
football today and of course this coming week is a sports fans delight on NBC you'll see the playoffs both the National League and American League 8 o'clock Eastern Time Tuesday night the Pirates and the Reds at Cincinnati Wednesday afternoon at 3 then the American League game one from Baltimore's Memorial Stadium the Angels and the Orioles 8 o'clock Eastern Time of course we'll have the playoffs throughout the week and then a full slate of NFL action next Sunday including Pittsburgh at Cleveland. defensive end as opposed to right defensive end uh, one of the main contributors on that sack or not near sack which got to wonder if Morton, if Morton would like to go back and uh, do that over again he came very close to getting that ball intercepted 254 left Oakland 20 Denver 3 our thanks to Bill Breslin and Len Shapiro player identification Rick up church to the right He wants to impress the coaches. And Norris Weiss is now the quarterback of the Denver Broncos. He started. Did not really uh, do that badly, but the team did not score any points. And so Craig Morton, when it was 7 nothing, took over the reins, but couldn't rally his team today. 2.38 left. Weiss, plenty of time. Hits. Jensen, who in turn was knocked hard by 53, Rod Martin. Well, that's a painful two-yard gain. Lester Hayes coming up from his corner position, put a shoulder into him at the same time. This has been a very physical football game. 
One of the things that we have noticed in the early going of this season is that the, the Raiders had not been dominating people. They've been known as a dominant kind of a team, but you see the two quarterbacks, Morton on the right, Weiss on the left. Morton's turn to watch as Weiss is working now, but got to be frustrating. And the coach says, hey, now go in and win it. There's two minutes left to go, and down by a very heavy one-sided score. When we come back, and Oakland will show you the Western Division standings of the AFC. It's 27-3. Eight seconds remaining in the game, and these last couple of minutes have taken a long time. And so, if we do have time permitting, we're going to hope to talk to one of the Chargers. Eight seconds to go. Paul Hofer finally picks it up. The clock is going to wear down, and this is going to be it. Game is over. Game is over, and the Chargers come back after their loss to New England as Don Coriel wins another one. He is now 12 and 5 coaching this club. At the end of the game, the final score, the Chargers 31 and the 49ers 9. We'll be back after this word from your local station. Six remaining in this game. We want to thank our statistician, Dennis Manishin, our spotter, Chuck Panama, for our help today in this booth. We have 236 left, and the Rams have a 21 to nothing lead. A first down at the 37 yard line. Yeah, and I want to thank Ozzie Lang. He's been giving me all the scores here, and we have another final. San Diego 31, San Francisco 9. And fighting for some yardage is Eddie Hill. Hill to the 39 yard line. It's Kurt Allerman in there now at a linebacker spot, making the stop. And we have a timeout called. Hey, do you understand this timeout? What are they doing? Okay, we're going to call a timeout here, take one of them, because we want to score 21 points. Now they're going to explain why they called the timeout. <laughs> what was that? By the Cardinals. They called the timeout. Right. They have two remaining. Two remaining timeouts. They want to force a fumble. Uh, stranger things have happened. And of course they'll have the two minute warning coming up in a moment. I tell you Bud has had some. More pleasant Sunday afternoons than this one today. It's got to be very dismissed. His team just has not played well today. You know you could since you know they played two tough teams. Dallas Pittsburgh. They gave the game away last week against the Washington Redskins. To come out here today, you, you're asking an awful lot for them to bounce back and play with a lot of enthusiasm. I don't think they have here. Boy, they've got six playoff teams in the first eight weeks. This is the third and five, so it's not going to get any easier. Here's Eddie Hill. And Hill out to the 44-yard line. Well, this team might have uh, left their best football on the field after those losses. That'll do it to you sometimes. You lose. They thought they had the Pittsburgh game one. That's the one that really hurts. One of the big problems is, I feel it in all football teams, and being part of it for the 18 years that I've played, is that you, you think it's going to get easier, right? It doesn't get easier. I don't care what, who your opponent is, it just doesn't get easier. Two minute warning. The Rams on their way to their third one of the year. Today's game, capably produced by Perry Smith, directed by Tony Verna. And we hope you've enjoyed this telecast. We're going to update you on scores. George Allen. 49ers, you thought, had a shot for a possible upset in this game. For a while, it looked like they were serious about it. A good defensive effort. There was one key play. Well, I, th I think that uh, the 49ers made more mistakes today than we've seen them this year. They haven't been making this many mistakes. They uh, they put a lot of pressure on DeBerg. He was, he was sacked. When he did throw, he was rushed. They had penalties. They were offside on fourth down and, and one after Jarella missed the field goal which later resulted in a touchdown. And uh, 
They didn't, they didn't play as good a football as I thought they'd play today. I thought they had a chance. The Chargers are a fine football team. Fouts impresses me with his poise. He uses his passing game as well as anyone I've seen in the league. Tampa Bay remains undefeated, 17-13. Buffalo, 3-2 and two on the year, defeated Baltimore. They haven't won. Kansas City over Seattle, 24-6. So the Chiefs are up and coming. Minnesota beat Detroit. The Vikings are now in second place, two games behind Tampa Bay in the Central. Washington, impressive at 4-1, and one, defeats Atlanta. New Orleans defeats the Giants. They are still winless, 24-14. Miami loses its first game. The Jets win, 33-27. Philadelphia, they're looking good, too, at 4-1, and one, defeating Pittsburgh, 17-14. Houston sends the Cleveland Browns to their first loss of the year, 31 to 10. So there's a big jam in the Central Division of the AFC. Those are the scores in the National Football League. And of course, it'll be the New England Patriots and Green Bay Packers tomorrow. And George, I enjoyed working with you in this game and hope to see you again. Th thank you, Dick. I did too. We had a good ball game and, uh, and the 49ers, if they don't lose their confidence, will come back and knock somebody off. I think everyone in the Bay Area realizes, George, that when Bill Walsh and his regime took over, they were in a lot of trouble because they were starting from scratch, perhaps as an expansion team in many cases. And so any kind of progress is appreciated. I think their defense is improving. I like the, I like the way their defense is playing. I think they get better every week. So the final score, the San Diego Chargers 31, San Francisco 49ers 9. San Diego remains atop the division in the west of the AFC. For George Allen, this is Dick Stockton saying so long. The NFL on CBS. I don't think he caught it. You watch this ball hit the ground and up in his hands. Run it back one more time there. Maybe watch the ball. You see that? The back end of the ball was the ball that hit the hit first. I think that's a good call. You may be right. Nice work by our director, Richard Klein. First down, Cincinnati the other way. Pete Johnson gets outside, breaks a tackle, and falls to the 25 yard line. I don't know if they run that play with any great frequency, but the last two times they've run it, Johnson has picked up 7 and 13 yards. I think it ought to go in the playbook permanently. Damn, they do, but Pete Johnson is hurt. They can't give him the ball 25, 30 times a ball game. They got some uh, new people in there. Jack Thompson at quarterback. Isaac Curtis is out. Steve Kreider is now running at flanker. Don Bass at split in. So the throw in Samoan, who has scored three touchdowns, all of them on the ground, in carrying Cincinnati through their last two games after Anderson went down. At the 25-yard line, he has a first down. And to give the Charles Alexander to about the 27. Tripped up in the middle of the pile. Also, Dallas has made a number of changes. Bruce Thornton made the stop along with Cliff Harris. I see that Mike Hegman, number 58, is in at left linebacker. So Landry and Homer Rice both looking at as many players as possible with this one pretty well decided. Dallas leading 31 to 13, and we're under four and a half minutes to play in the game. So it looks like the Cowboys will keep pace with Philadelphia and Washington at four and one. San Diego has beaten San Francisco 31 to nine. That game is now final. Second down, Thompson over the middle. Alexander. 35 the first man missed him then Aaron Kyle came up to make the tackle secure so San Diego has won by 23 let's pause briefly for station identification this is the NBC television network KMOL TV channel 4 San Antonio Sam Nover Bob Trumpy back in Dallas we are obviously running very late we apologize there will be no NFL report show tonight We've given you all of the scores, and uh, the wonderful world of Disney will follow our broadcast immediately. Sam, you mentioned that San Francisco score. That's the first time that San Francisco has really gotten blown out this season. They've been in every football game they've played. 
Good offensive team. Struggling on defense. Gave Dallas all they could handle. They sure did. 21-13 decision at San Francisco. There's Omar Rice. You know, one of the nicest men you'll ever meet. One of the most diligent men you'll ever meet. And he really doesn't deserve an 0-5 football team. I did meet him yesterday, and I concur with everything you said. I've never met anybody who works harder and is a nicer man in my entire life, except maybe for the guy across the field, Tom Landry. Of course, Cincinnati is where his roots are. He started uh, in Fort Thomas, Kentucky as a player. Later coached at Highland High School, University of Cincinnati. He's run the gamut there, hasn't he? Yes, and, and I don't want to make enemies of the people in Texas, and I hope Daryl Royal isn't missing, but the guy who invented the triple option or wishbone was Homer Rice. He <laughs> called it Homer's triple. Daryl Royal called it the triple option or the wishbone. And as I said, I hope Daryl Royal is not listening. So back to the game. We have a first down Cincinnati. Under three minutes to go in regulation time, and the throw in Samoan Jack Thompson has run the ball with the exception of one pass. Here he is again. Harvey Martin. Oh. Right side. It's intercepted by Thornton. Down he goes at the 25. Harvey Martin calls the interception by Thornton. Let's look at it again. Well, there's not many people left in the stadium, but they certainly do like this. Blindsided. There you see Martin. Oh, that's uncomfortable to even watch. And a nice reception by Thornton. Dallas has got it again. Well, I imagine since Homer Rice is the disciple and Tom Landry is the teacher, Tom Landry is going to try desperately not to get it in the end zone here to did, rub it in. Did you notice who Thornton took the football away from? Vern Holland. Yes couple of linemen contesting for it. Danny White now in at quarterback. Staubach is done for the day. He's had a nice one. Late law and Ron Springs in the setbacks and Springs gets the football spins to about the 21 yard line. This Ram and Cardinal game here at the Coliseum produced by Howard Reisnyder. Our director is Jim Zuman. Our associate producer is Ray Ball. And Brooks Graham, the manager of the field operations. Is he Mexican? <laughs> and the technical director is Steve Cunningham. He wouldn't go out and eat Mexican food with he us went, last night. Really disappointed me. And Andy Bass, our audio technician. Gentlemen, thank you. Well, we've had some excellent pictures today, haven't we? From the 44, third and five, two minutes remaining in this game. 87 is Drew Hill in motion for the Rams. Here's Eddie Hill. They've got three Hills on this team. Kent, Eddie, and Drew, they call him the big, small, and the medium-sized hill. The big one is Kent Hill. The medium size is Eddie, and the small one is Drew. I thought you'd like to know that. Thanks, thanks a lot, Gary. <laughs> Fourth down coming up now. You know who made that tackle? He got that love to hit people. That's Kurt Allerman. Allerman, right? He's been their special teams former or player deluxe. He's just been outstanding. He along with Johnny Bearfield. And now the Rams will have to kick the football as Willard Harrell will go back. He'll be joined there by Thomas Lott. Well, this is the last year for the Rams here in the Coliseum. They moved to Anaheim in 1980. I don't know how far that is from here, but uh, they'll be shifting the site. A lot of activity last night. The game played here, UCLA, Ohio State. The field's in good shape, but boy, by the end of the year, there's a lot of football games on this field. Here's Ken Clark to kick. Got a fourth quarter score. Oakland leading Denver 27 to 3. That's unbelievable. Harrell back of the 20. Clark to kick inside the 30. He's going to kick it away from him. He really isn't either. From the 20 yard line, I said that twice today, and he's kicked it to him both times. And Harrell's going to get out of bounds at the 23 yard line. A 36 <laughs> yard kick, and the official gets dumped. <laughs> And so with 145, the Cardinals have a last chance to get on the board. The NFL on CBS is a presentation of CBS Sports. Dan Fouts, this is Dick Stockton with George Allen up in the booth. You've showed tremendous poise today. Congratulations on a victory in between some tough games. Well, thank you very much. It was a tough game. We're playing the 49ers and uh, they're an up-and-coming team. They're excellently coached. Uh, anytime you play a team that hasn't won a game, they, they, uh, they're going to be tough because they got a lot of pride and they're going to come at you. And 
Uh, our hats are off to the 49ers. Yeah. Was their defense surprising to you, judging from what you saw in the films? No, uh, we thought they might blitz us a little more. They, they played a little bit more conservatively. We were in trouble there when J.J. went out. We had to revamp our game plan, yeah. but uh, Dad, we took care of things at halftime. This is uh, George Allen. They used a 34 defense. Did you expect that 34 defense? No, we didn't, George, but we've uh, seen it enough this year that we were prepared for it. It just took us a, a couple of minutes to adjust to it and, and uh, take advantage of it, but we, that was a surprise. Let me just tell you something. I like the way you, you control the offense, the way you use your long passing game, your short passing game. I like your poise. I think you're going to be a great quarterback, and good luck to you. Thank you very much, Coach. Thank you, Dan Fouts. Okay. Fine quarterback of the San Diego Chargers. From the 23-yard line, Steve Bazarkowitz with a first down and a little screen to Gary Paris. Paris out to the 30, 31-yard line. And he's caught a couple of passes since Bazarkowitz has come in. Kevin McLean making the tackle, number 50, out of Colorado State, who is probably their best special teams performer. 13 tackles and 14 assists a year ago. And that'll bring up second down and three, just across the 30 to the 31-yard line. Zarkowitz getting some playing time. He started one game last year for the Cardinals against the New York Jets. Gary, it's over with. <laughs> is it? <laughs> On a second and two, Zark is back again. He's got Otis Anderson. Anderson, well, he's had some trouble a couple of times. He's cut, and the feet have gone out from under him. He may have lost his first down by giving ground. They may measure to see. As he started back, he lost some ground, and a timeout is called by St. Louis. That's their second one. And they're going to maybe measure to see. And while they're measuring, we're going to go away, and you'll hear this. 25, 164 yards, two touchdowns, one interception, was not sacked today. And while the stats may not be all that impressive, well, that, those stats are not right. The ones I gave you are. Well, that's not all that impressive. His first half was 6 out of 16. So you subtract that, he had a great second half. Wilson in motion. Oh, boy. LeClaire arrived at the same time the ball was handed off. I like that. Cincinnati still playing with a vengeance. 158 left. Trailing 31 to 13. We have reached the two-minute warning in this. All winning by rather large scores late in the game. This is how the AFC Western Division standing should look tomorrow morning. The Chargers beating San Francisco would be in the lead with Denver and Kansas City tied for second. And uh, you fans that have been watching the Kansas City Seattle game here in Oakland, Tom Flores Raiders have a 27 to 3 lead over Denver. We're at the two minute warning break. At the they have responded to that challenge and uh, they've given Denver. stature back I think their fans and from their competition as well Norris Weiss who started the game replaced by Craig Morton has just hit Riley Odom's six catches now for Odom's first down play from his 32 Weiss on the scramble oh is he hit Willie Jones number nine to stay tuned to NBC for those of you who have just joined us the wonderful world of Disney featuring the one million dollar duck stars Dean Jones will follow immediately after this game except in mountain and Pacific time zones where it will be seen at its regular time and that in turn will be followed by an excellent world premiere the kid from left field some corn and gather the family around two outstanding motion pictures for you on this Sunday night on NBC one minute and ten seconds left. Twenty-seven to three. The Oakland Raiders have just out defense Denver today. Weiss. Fumble. No, incomplete the pass as Mike Davis timed his tackle on Ron Egloff and the ball popped free again. For those of you who have not been with us throughout, it's been the Raiders seven nothing in the first quarter on a stabler to Dave Casper pass. And it was 7-3, 14-3 at half as the Raiders scored just before the intermission. And they've added two field goals and a fumble 
recovered in the end zone by Monty Johnson to make it 27-3. Let's run down all the scores for you. 31 to 10, Houston beat Cleveland. Browns first loss. Washington's now four and one with that victory. Big upset as Miami lost for the first time to the Jets, 33-27. We'll add the rest. Third down, 15. Weiss, nope, the whistle blows it dead. He was in the grasp of Willie Jones again. Jones with back-to-back -back sacks. And if they can get one more sack, Dick, they will have equaled the production of the whole first four games of the season. That's six sacks coming in, already five sacks in this game. Other final scores in the National Football League. New Orleans beat the winless Giants 24-14. Philadelphia hands the Super Bowl champion Steelers the first loss of the season. Minnesota edged Detroit 13 to 10. It was Buffalo now three and two beating Baltimore. Baltimore winless. Prestridge's kick headed toward Brunson. He wisely let that ball drop at the 42 yard line. There is a flag down. While they discuss the penalty options, let's continue the summary of the scores in NFL on this fifth week of the season only unbeaten team in the league is from Tampa Bay they won in Chicago 17 13 they're 5 and 0 oh. Kansas City with another impressive victory back to back they beat Oakland 35 to 7 last week and 24 6 today over Seattle and San Diego 4 and 1 after defeating San Francisco 31 to 9 the 49ers yet to win Dallas winning big against Cincinnati at home 31 13 fourth quarter and the Rams have a 21 nothing lead at home against the Cardinals in the fourth quarter so you're up to date right to the moment on all the scores here 26 seconds left Oakland 27 to 3 over Denver and the Raiders will play it from their own 42 yard line and this will just be an exercise in running out the final seconds. Certainly an emotional victory for a team that had to win today. And had they lost this game to the Broncos uh, they really might have had to just start thinking about building for next year as it is uh, they will start to get their wounded warriors back into action. Shell may come this next week. Whittington would be nice to uh, to hope that uh, this divisional race is going to be a good one and the Raiders certainly have done a lot to help ensure that in their performance today. Stabler going to fall on the ball and the Broncos will decide whether they want to call time. They're not going to. Our executive producer on NBC's football, Don Olmeyer, coordinating producer Ted Nathanson. Today's telecast produced finally by Larry Cirillo and directed magnificently by Ted Nathanson. Technical director Wayne McDonald, associate director Jim Marcioni. Tom Flores has his second win. Red Miller's Broncos did not score a touchdown today. The final They've done, they've done a lot of things in the second half. The first half, it was all Tony Dorsett. Second half, it's all been all Roger Staubach. You know, oddly enough, the Cowboys earned that 3-1 uh, and one record this year uh, and were outscored 80-74. to 74. Let's start running through the scores that we have. I believe everything is final now. These are the late games. Oakland has upset Denver and decisively 27-3. Continuing, Kansas City, a big win over Seattle at the Kingdome, and Marv Levy's got the Chiefs rolling. Also, well, we'll get back to him in a moment. Third down for Danny White, threat formation. Throws it out here, he's got a man, Tony Hill out of bounds. Inside the 10-yard line, it'll be first and 10 Dallas, or first and goal Dallas. That's kind of rubbing it in, Sam. I think so. Third down and eight. Leading 31 to 13. Go to the shotgun. There's nothing wrong with it. Steve Pazarkowitz has retreated back to the huddle as you see him coming into the picture after visiting with Bud Wilkinson. And so the Cardinals are going to move into Houston next week. Boy, that's going to be a tough one. Next, coming up here on CBS, 60 Minutes. I'm looking forward to that. Dan Rather with Fidel Castro. And some of, uh, I guess, some enlightenment on what's happening down there in Cuba. I'd like to know, wouldn't you? I hope he can get us a Cuban cigar. It'd be better than that thing you've been smoking up here, I'll tell you. You got to get some new cigars. I can't work with you anymore. Maybe That's... Dan Rather will get me one. <laughs> 
from the 33-yard line. Third down, a yard to go. They just missed it a moment ago. Pazarkowitz got some time. He's got it off to Anderson. He's got the first down, same play they went to earlier. First down at the 37, and time ticking away. Joe Harris was the man that made the tackle. Joe Harris going to make the stop. Cardinals have another play called. You see the time remaining, upper right-hand portion of the screen. Zarkowitz, tender for Theotis Brown. No, thank you. I don't want it. That's a reject, isn't it? Brown, the number two draft pick out of UCLA. I'll tell you one thing about Pazarkowitz coming in here. This is good game experience for him. Come in and try to crank up and get something on the board. I mean, he's five of eight, but it's an impossible situation. I mean, uh, to come in and throw, everybody knows you got to throw the football. It is. It's, it's, it's the most difficult position you can be in as far as throwing the football when everybody knows it. And yet, you're going to have those situations, and he's learning from it. Second and ten. Steve, and Steve's had a pretty good afternoon for St. Louis as that catch will be just short of the first down, his third catch. So the Rams have beaten the Cardinals. First down. They said he stepped out of bounds at the 12, not inside the 10. So I was right the first time. Springs to the five-yard line. Jimmy LeClaire made the stop, and the Bengals have not given up. And I think that's a great test to some of their character. Not all of them, but some of them. I agree. This is a very talented football team. They have 13 first-round draft choices on this football team, and eventually they're going to win. Question is, when? Minute 24, and the clock continues to run at the five-yard line. Second down at about three now for Dallas. Briefly recapping, Chris Barr's 48-yard field goal in the first quarter gave the Bengals a 3-0 lead. They were driving for more points when Randy Hughes picked off Ken Anderson, returned at 68 yards. Laidlaw went in for the touchdown, springs down to about the one-yard line. He did not get in, I don't believe. And that really set the tone for this football game because then it was 7-3 Dallas. Instead, it might have been 6-0 or even 10-0 Cincinnati. Here are your 1 o'clock finals. Houston, 31 to 10 over Cleveland. Washington beat Atlanta, 16 to 7. The Jets in a big upset over Miami by six points. New Orleans defeated the hapless Giants at the Superdome by 10. The biggest upset of the day, the Steelers lose for the first time at Philadelphia. Minnesota by three over the Lions. Baltimore losing again at five straight. Buffalo wins by 18. Tampa Bay 17-13 over Chicago. You are up to date. First down, goal to go. Springs has earned the touchdown. He got it. Well, he earned it, Bob. I think he got all the yardage except for the one pass to Tony Hill in that drive. Yeah, but in all honesty, I see Homer Rice looking across the field at Tom Landry wondering, hey, Tom, uh, listen, we're down and out. Why you want to rub it in? But take nothing away from Dallas. Their offense has played well all day long. 37 points, certainly the most points they've scored this season. And so the Cincinnati Bengals have paid a visit to Texas Stadium in Irving, Texas, for just the second time in their history. And they have met with uh, almost the identical result. They lost 38-10 here in 1973. And if Seption puts on this extra point, they are in danger of losing 40-13. And he did. And they do. And Kenny Anderson threw three interceptions six years ago. Today he's had two. Has run it out of bounds on the far side, and there's two seconds left stopping the clock. The executive producer of NBC Sports is done. Do we replay? If there's time on the clock Defense, or not. 12 men on the field. Oh, well, no wonder One they got. Untimed down. No wonder they got uh, held us to 13. Uh, held That's the Bengals right. to 13 points. That's They've been playing with 12 guys. guys. You've done that we and us stuff today. Yeah, they're losing 38 to 13. I don't mind saying we. Yes. The Eagles.
Bengals not the only team today pulling a surprise. The Steelers not the only unbeaten going to defeat at Shea Stadium. The Jets on the arm of Richard Todd here completing a 71-yard strike to Wesley Walker are knocking the Miami Dolphins from the ranks of the unbeaten. In this fifth week, the Cleveland Browns also going down to the Houston Oilers. We'll look at all of that today on the Budweiser NFL Report, brought to you today by Budweiser. That's called being a pro, Don. You're just going to have to come back week in, week out. Uh, there's just nothing about it. I'm being paid to play football and play safety, and uh, it's more my personal pride than anything else. It's going to make me come out there and play harder than I have been playing. That's the only thing I can do. If you uh, let it get to you, you're just you know, going to be fooling yourself. If you're not ready to play football, it's, things will only get worse. I always try and play for personal pride. When things really get bad, that's when you really got to keep looking down a lot more inside of yourself than probably ever before. You know, and especially after a thing that happened to me today, I was there, and it really bothers me worse, you know, that I, I was there and I should have made the play. And uh, that upsets me worse than just being beat physically. think so at all. I think when things go bad, it, it comes a time when you just have to take care of your job. It's very easy to start looking and pointing a finger and seeing what everybody else is doing. I don't think anyone's that secure in this team that you've got to take care of your job. If 45 people have a good day, then we're going to win. What's happening is we're having 38 having a good day one game and then 30, another 36 another game. And Jay Simpson in his last appearance in San Diego, 16 carries today for 89 yards. That helped set up this field goal by Ray Worshing of 32 yards and make it 3 to nothing Niners. But the Chargers came right back. Dan Fouts throwing to Kellen Winslow. Watch Winslow. Watch this run. Boom. The fine rookie. He caught seven passes today for 72 yards. Uh, one touchdown. This is Fouts again to Winslow. This sets up the first uh, Charger touchdown. Fouts was 26 of 34 today. There's Clarence Williams getting the score. That made it 7 to 3. Here's Roy Jarella, his first uh, uh, appearance in a Charger uniform. That made it 10 to 3. Steve DeBerg quarterbacking for San Francisco. A good interception by Don Horn. He takes it back down. This is just before the end of the first half. It will set up a 24-yard touchdown pass from Fouts to Charlie Joyner. Joyner makes a great catch here. Now watch what happens. Joyner comes up with the ball. Kellen Winslow comes over and says, I'll take that. Takes it over to the goal post. Going to give you his Bill Walton imitation of a stuff shot here. Well, it's a little quick pop we have over the middle where tight end goes one-on-one -on -one to linebacker and have the backs come out and draw him out from uh, the middle. And this one right here is my, has to be one of my favorite plays where I come up under the uh, linebacker's coverage and it's a little delay we have and Charlie Joyner got me a fine block and looked like I got into the end zone before they caught him. I only got, got to him one good time. <laughs> I wish I could have got to him a lot more. Here's a great play. Here's a play I like to get one in every game. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice pickup, but I, I really like your job of dribbling. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's showing this uh, real fine pass out there to uh, Jefferson. Uh, here comes week. up right now. I think it's uh, one coming over the middle. It was right after that pass. Watch him catch one right there over the middle, and he took a real hit. Now, he hit the ground before he dropped the ball. Actually, he was unconscious. It did knock him out. Here's a quick screen. Uh, that us see, that's out to Greg McQuarrie. Uh, we threw that uh, several times during the game. And here is a quick hitting run in there to uh, Clarence Williams being about eight or nine yards. And here we are down at the goal line. You look a uh, beautiful blocking here on the right. You see Hank? Bauer. Hank Bauer made a beautiful uh, block there, and it made a fine block. And here's another uh, run, a real fine run by Artie Owens. Artie Owens is very quick, very fast, pass receiver, as well as a runner. 
And again, Dan here is fading back, throwing the football, and he got it already. Now that'll be bringing uh, Kellen Winslow underneath that ball. And here Dan back throwing the ball, delays it, and oh, this is a crossing pattern. That was the one right before the half. That was a very, very fine touchdown pass and, uh, and split backs in this particular case. Here we would block to give good backside protection. We'd block our half back here. Danny, of course, drop back and throw the ball. Now, what we'd do, what we did in this particular case, this is a Charlie Joyner. Um, uh, no, no, pardon me, J.J. J.J. was inside. In fact, he was in the slot. He was in the slot in this particular case. And he came down here and he ran a post all the way across the field. And then uh, Charlie Joyner came down and ran his post right behind him. So we had two crossing patterns deep right in the end zone. We wanted this ball. We only had 11 seconds to go when we started the play, and we wanted that ball thrown into the end zone where it's going to be a touchdown or incomplete so we could kick a field goal if uh, we didn't make it. And then um, we had Larry Burton here on this side here, and he started downfield, and he was coming all the way underneath here. And at this time, we were checking our half back and bringing him out in this area. And um, uh, J.J. was uh, covered very closely. They really jumped on J.J. Uh, as Charlie went across the field, he was able to beat his man, who was man-to-man -man coverage at that time. And actually, no, you couldn't see it in the film, but uh, Larry Burton was just wide open. There wasn't a person within, well, probably uh, 10 yards of him. Now, uh, as Danny comes back to read that, he will read from one, two, over to three, to an outlet over here to his back. But uh, the uh, people who had underneath coverage here jumped on our back. They probably figured it was a screen pass, swing screen of some kind. Uh, and Danny looked and saw that J.J. was covered and saw that Charlie had, had his man by a step, so he fired that ball. There, a perfect pass. Charlie made a great catch. And he didn't have to come all the way over. Now, if Charlie had been covered, then he would have come to a third third man over here, and he would have found Larry Burton right there, just wide open for a touchdown. It's a crossing pattern, unless you uh, get a uh, look at some of this close-up film. Here you see uh, an interception by uh, Woodrow Lowe on that particular case. He just went in there and took his DeBerg dropping back and uh, watched the line rushing, the great pressure that they put on that pass. So he has to get it off in a hurry defender was to their receiver. And here again are our people taking off, just like sprinters, chasing them on a rollout and a great sack. Here's your line again. And then there they go. They just sack. take off it like sprinters. The sprinters. They're, they just... And here they come again. You see all kinds of games up front with a crisscrossing, and here you find uh, another interception. Uh, let's see, uh, this is probably the opening kickoff. Gardy Owens uh, taking that ball and just ramming it right up the middle, and it went for 40. His 88-inch reach is 20 inches more than Marciano, 12 more than Lewis, 4 more than Ali, and 2 and a half inches more than Primo Conera, who left the circus in the 1930s to become the heavyweight champion. Every day, Jones works out for three hours and runs five miles. From 270 pounds, Ed wants to be 240 for his first pro fight in November. Too Tall is being trained by Murphy Griffith, who is satisfied with his progress and amazed by Ed's punching power. Just impacts alone. The guy, I mean, he, he's just strong. He's, he, he comes with strength, he comes with power. And this uh, left, left jabs, normal left jab, when you hit a man with, that, that really would break a guy, raise him up, he knocks guys down with this thing. And uh, the right hand is tremendous. With him, it's a joke to a lot of people because, you know, oh, this big guy, he's big like the rest of them. He's clumsy. He can't box. He can't fight. He ain't going to never make it. But you know what? I'm going to tell you something. I'm going, I'm going on the air right now, and I, he, I'm going to say this. This big guy going to make a lot of them guys' mouth open. He's going to surprise a lot of people when they first see him. <laughs>
It's no accident that so many Sugar Ray Leonard fights have been on television. And the reason they've been is because he gets the viewers. I mean, ratings. Uh, uh, these fighters are not on television by accident. They're on because the viewers turn in specifically to see them fight. Uh, and that's the same case with uh, comedy programs they put on. Uh, Sugar Ray Leonard is the greatest attraction in boxing today. And he will draw millions and millions of television viewers. And for that reason, the networks will put him on more than they would uh, some other fighters. Is Sugar Ray going to be boxing's next cover boy? Sugar Ray is boxing's cover boy. Sugar Ray Leonard, pound for pound, is the greatest fighter in the world today. Major League Baseball presents Big League Tips. The next time you go to a ball game, go early and watch the players run. Most of them will be pitchers running sprints in the outfield. The reason pitchers run so much is to strengthen their legs, because legs get tired more often than arms. When a pitcher's legs begin to tire, he starts releasing the ball too soon, and his pitches come in high. Strong legs are a must for a major league pitcher. Baseball fever. Catch it. Preceding announcement furnished by Major League Baseball. Now it's up to Daryl Porter, and the man who has sat and looked for 19 years in hopes that someday that he would see his ball club be the Western Division title holder, Gene Autry, has to be a man that is awfully proud as Porter sends it to Carew. This ship do it. He knocks it down. He goes to Tanana. It's down. It's over. The Angels win. Right, Tanana mobbed by his teammate. Carew, his teammates making their way to the dugout as the Angels, for the first time in 19 years, win the Western Division title of the American League. There's got to be some tears of joy and happiness as throngs of field come onto the field as the Angel back in the clubhouse right away. But the Angels defeat the Royals by a score of 4-3. to three. And it took a gutsy performance by Frank Tanana to do just that. Tanana, suffering from tendonitis throughout the course of the year, missed three months of the season, but he came back to pitch one of maybe the greater games of his career. And right now, the Angels going into the clubhouse, Bill Rickney has joined. There's a man, he's been in baseball for 50-some years, Jimmy Reed, a roommate of Babe Ruth, and he is now on a winner. For well, many times, they have been counted out. They have been down to the ninth count, but they have gotten back off of the floor, and they have said, yes, we can. And as you saw on a banner tonight, it is yes, they will, and yes, they did. Kansas City, Seattle. George Brett is going to score on this hit by Amos Otis, but watch what happens. Oop. Is he out or safe? March to the top in the American League East has featured a little bit of everything, but watch this catch by Al Bumbry off wood. Take a look again. Bumbry robs Hobson with a great effort. Nice catch, Big Al. Ken Singleton takes a walk over and says, was not a bad effort. Eddie Alexander reminding you that the Pittsburgh Pirates are the National League Eastern champions, beating the Chicago Cubs 5-2. to two. Let's, grab, uh, let's grab Captain Willie Stadio. Captain, congratulations on another chance to go back into the playoffs. Amen. Well, these guys have worked hard. We uh, won it from spring training day one. But we had an outstanding ball club. We knew we had to go out and do it. Nobody gave it to us. We did a hell of a job. You know, here's the guy, of course, along with John Sanders, who got that final out. Kentucky, tremendous year. 
Well, thank you very much, Eddie. It's, uh, it's a culmination of a lot of hard work on the part of a lot of people, and I'm just really glad to be a part of it. There's so many great guys in this ball club that have done so much to get us where we are right now. And it was a hell of a battle, I'll tell you. Those Montreal Expos, they just they didn't give us a break. I tell you what, Eddie, we were watching the end of the ball game, Teak, when, the, when he popped it up, and then you jumped about almost as high as the ball. Do you realize that when he popped that ball in the air? You just jumped sky high. Hey, I knew it was ours then, baby. All it's got to do is come down, and I've never seen one not come down. <laughs> they always come down. Ken, let me ask you something. Do you feel like about 85 right now after 162 games scheduled? Well, I'll tell you, it feels good right now. I'm ready to start those playoffs tomorrow. Let's get them going, because I am ready. Okay. Chuck Tanner, congratulations on a penny. Well, thanks a lot. I just talked earlier, and I said, out of way, Gar. Way to go, pal. I said, it's the greatest throw I've ever had in, ever had in baseball, and... I'm dedic I dedicate, my mother said we're going to win it, so I want to dedicate this championship to my mother and my dad. You don't know this, but everybody out in the stands uh, turned 85 during the course of this year. <laughs> well, it was a hard-fought pennant. Montreal was great, and we just had to work hard. And down to the last day last year, we went down to the next to last day. Really gratifying. Best 25 men I've ever managed. Hey, you're smoking the victory, sir. You got the champagne. Mm -hmm. Is this, is this one of the happiest, if not the happiest, moments you've had in baseball? Well, my first, my first year up with, with uh, Oakland, when I was a rookie, we won the playoffs. Or we, we won our division, and we were in the playoffs. But really, this means a little bit more to me. I, I think this is a harder-fought uh, race this year. It comes down to the last day. Montreal was playing tough, and, and uh, setback after setback, we just kept fighting back. When we were down, we were down. And, woo! I was... I wish somebody would warm that up, John. I wish somebody would warm that up when they put it on there. Well, this, this is how you celebrate a championship, you know? This is it. This is what you got to get. This is what you play for. I don't know why you play all these months to get cold beer and cold champagne thrown all over you. Well, I tell you what, let's do it at least one more time when we win the World Series, okay? That sounds like a great idea. Ed, congratulations on a pennant. Thank you very much. It's the greatest feeling I've ever had in my life. You know, well so observed. I was just saying a few minutes ago, we may be 25 or 30, but most of us feel like we're 85 covering you guys this year. Uh, about that last week, I think we've all gained about 10 years, but uh, the guys really held in there well. We all played outstanding baseball, and we had to beat a great ball club, and we did it. That Sister Sledge song really came true, didn't it? Everything works. We are a family, and there ain't no stopping us now. I think we're going to carry it right on into the, the playoffs and the World Series with us. We I've never seen a happier bunch of guys. They've got a lot of ways to go yet, but I'll tell you something. You think they won the world championship right now? They earned it. They deserve every bit of happiness that they've got right here in Three Rivers Stadium right now. A long season, 98 victories it took them, but we made it. We're number one, and we're going to the playoffs in Cincinnati. We have the young rookie manager of the Angels and Jim Fragosi against the old veteran of the Baltimore Orioles and Earl Weaver. The difference is experience, but much alike in their attitude and approach to the game, win at all costs. Will you try and take advantage of his inexperience? No, I don't think that's possible. I remember going into uh, 1969 as a rookie manager, and uh, we won three straight that year. In 1970, I was a sophomore manager, and we won three straight that year. Think he might try and take advantage of your inexperience? Well, I really don't think so. All he can do is if his players don't pitch well and they don't play well, there's nothing he can do. This year we caught the Angels when they had injuries. We caught them when Carew was off. We got one ball game where Nolan had to quit. Uh, Nolan Ryan had to quit early because of a groin injury. Uh, so really, what has transpired during the course of the season is no true judge as to what can happen. We were three and nine with them uh, over the season, but uh, we start out fresh here. We're our record's 0 and 0 right now, and uh, we've got to win three out of five games. Jim Hill for CBS News in Baltimore. Well, here we are at Riverfront Stadium for another championship series with the Pirate family. And part of that key family here for the Pirates was a big trade that was made uh, early in the season. A trade, Frank Tavares for Tim Foley. And Tim, did you ever think you'd be here and this would feel so good to be on a championship ball club? It's unbelievable, Nelly. You know, we were together in spring training and uh, they kind of buried me in, in, with the Mets. Uh, they decided to go with a young kid at second base and move Dougie over to short. And, and I, I kind of knew that they were going to do that. I didn't have a contract, and, and I just I stayed ready. I had a lot of faith in the Lord, and uh, 
brought me to the Pittsburgh Pirates, and it's just, I really fit in over here. It's really been fun for me. It's something that, uh, you know, it's been nine years, ten years in the big leagues, and this is my first, and boy, I'm excited. Well, coming in from the airport uh, yesterday, I was talking with your wife, Jeanette, and she said, uh, you know, this has got to be the greatest thing that has happened to Tim and I, you know, since we've been together. She said, I just can't tell you how much this has meant. All the sacrifices now seem worth it. Oh, there's no doubt about it. You know, uh, I've never really had the abil the great ability to hit the ball out of the ballpark or, or the ability to steal a lot of bases or do the fancy things fielding, but I've always been able to be a steady player. I've always been able to make the play in the field, turn a double play, and 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 play a basic game uh, of offense. And, and finally this year it's paid off. I haven't had to go outside myself. The little things that I've done have, have, have helped this ball club, and it's, you know, like I say, thank the Lord he brought me over here because it's really fun. Well, were you able in, in the past with the other ball clubs, with the Mets and with the Giants and, and Montreal, were you ever able to uh, exploit all of the talents that you've had, especially the fundamentals of playing shortstop? Well, there's, there's no doubt that I tried, but I, I tried to go over my head all the time. When you're 30 games out after the All-Star break, you, you lose sight of team goals. And uh, let's face it, the kind of player I am, I have to be a team man. I have to go out there every day and, and hopefully do something offensively or defensively, which is not that fancy, to help win a ball game, make a double play or make a play in the hole. When you're saving runs in a 7-2 defeat, it doesn't mean much. But when you save a run in, a, in the final game of, a, uh, of the pennant stretch and, and, uh, and you win 3-2, to two, then it means a lot. And, and it's really meant a lot this year for me. The guys have picked me up day after day, you know, made me feel like, like I was a big part of this ball club and, and it, it's really been great for me. You know, like I said, Jeanette has struggled along right with me. You know, it's been a long time for her too. She said, as many sleepless nights as I've had, and it's just been great. In in uh, coming over here, they knew that you could probably do the job defensively, but you've been such a pleasant surprise with your bat that uh, no one here really expected to have uh, that kind of a, a batting average and the RBIs out of you, even though you were hitting in second place, trying to sacrifice guys over, give yourself up, you still came up with that high batting average. That had to be quite a, a personal achievement for you and a lot of satisfaction. It sure was, Nelly. You know, I think it's, uh, again, you go back to winning's contagious and hitting's contagious, and the guys over here have done it. Uh, you know, look over the last 10, 11 years, this is this is the sixth division title they won, the Pittsburgh Pirates. So and they've never come lower than third, so it's contagious, and hitting is contagious. The, the ball clubs they've had in the past, the great ball clubs, have been known as hitting ball clubs. This ball club right now is known as an all-around ball club. We can play a little defense, we can throw some pitching at you, and, and we can knock your brains out every once in a while. So it's just contagious. I fit in, and I've got great people around me. I can't say enough for Omar and Dave how, how they've helped me this year. I know, I know if you're a pitcher, and you look over there in the on-deck circle and you got 2-0 and on me and you see Dave Parker, you're going to lay that next one in there, at least try. So it's been great for me there. Uh, Omar's done such a great job on the bases that, uh, you know, it's exciting. I can do something every day. I can, I can really go hard day in and day out to do those little things, and, and they pay off. Well, it certainly has. And I, I tell you, you've become such an integral part of this Pirate family and, and molding this infield together. It's, I know it's been rewarding for you and it's been rewarding for me because knowing you from spring training, I, I can really, really tell you that I'm, I'm proud of the year that you've had and, and uh, glad that you and Jeanette and everybody are happy to be here in Pittsburgh and part of this family. Thank you, Nellie. It's, you know, it's like I say, it's been great. It's been a long year and hopefully it's not going to end for another couple of weeks. Well, Tim, great, great talking to, uh, to you and uh, we'd, we'd like to come back and talk to another member who has traded to the Pirates, made such a, a key effort and, and uh, contribution here with the Pirates, Bill Madlock, and we'll be back with that Bill Madlock piece right after this message. We're here with Bill Madlock, another part of this big Pirate family this year. Well, Bill, I know going into uh, spring training or even coming out of it, you had to feel as though you were going to be on a pennant winner this year, but I don't think you thought it would be with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Well, no, I didn't because uh, at the end of last season with the Giants, we felt uh, with one year experience because we did, uh, you know, fade in the last two weeks of the season last year. And I felt that I was going to be in it in the Western Division with the uh, Giants because we felt we had the best team. With one year experience, we feel we would do it before it's Pittsburgh. No way. How, out there, actually, what happened with the Giants uh, to, to preface what has happened with the Pirates? Well, I think the you know main thing, they don't have the family, you know, force attitude. And I think one thing did they the players not as confident in themselves as a as a ball team i think that that's what makes a you know a good ball team believing in yourself as a team i think this team probably works together not just on the field off the field better than any team i've ever been with 
with, with San Francisco, then I, I guess it was the fact that the players just didn't really relate with one another or, or pull for one another, hoping that somebody would get that big base hit or the pitcher would pull you out of a situation. Oh, right, because you got to look at your talent was not you know, near as great, and I think uh, some of the guys like a Jack Clark and uh, Daryl Evans and a Vita Blue, they put a lot of pressure on you. And with, like myself, they put a lot of pressure on here. Here, if I don't do it, it doesn't really matter because we got a Dave Parker, Willie Starks. We can go all down our lineup. I don't think there's any lineup that in the major league can put a better eighth hitter than we got on the field as uh, Phil Gardner. So it's just a matter of taking the pressure off every guy and go out and play comfortable and relax. You made a statement, uh, oh, I guess it was a couple of months ago to me. You said that I don't believe this clubhouse. I don't believe how the guys are, are so loose, so relaxed, and have so much fun playing a game that uh, in other places, gee, it was it was almost a chore to come to the ballpark. All right, because I, like I told you, it's the first time I really enjoyed playing baseball, you know, by taking as a job in something like four years. It was the last time when I was in Chicago. The guys, you know, the, they're relaxed because they made it because I could have been in a bad situation when I came with a Pittsburgh because if everybody known there was a two job for three, for, I mean, two position for three guys in which the guys on the team made me relax. It's, you know, it's kind of hard to get uh, uptight on a team like this because guys like Stargell and Parker, they won't let you. You always relax and they make it that way in our clubhouse. Was it true in the past that you were actually the key guy on, on the ball clubs uh, that, with which you played? Uh, you had to more or less be the number one leader and show them how things are done. And that, that's, a, that's a lot of load to carry. Right, that's a tough job, especially for me when I was coming off like some like two or three years in the big league. They always looked up for me, you know, the drive in the big runs or, uh, you know, steal the base. And uh, like I said, I'm not the kind of guy who can uh, carry a team on my back like a Dave Parker or Willis Sturt. I can help a team win a penny, but I cannot carry a team uh, to a penny because I'm not that kind of ball player. And I know it, uh, but like I said, when you with team who expect that you go out there and try to do too much, and which I think I did a couple of times. Well, here you've been able to, I think, utilize almost all of your ability. You, we knew that you could hit, and we knew that you could play in the field because you were, you were a fine second baseman, now moving to third, you've adjusted there well. But the thing I think that surprised a lot of people in baseball is the fact that you, you stole 32 bases this year. All right, I guess the main thing because uh, you know, I made some mistakes on the base pad, but I think Chuck uh, had uh, you know confidence to give me a you know a free will for his run. I think the toughest thing to do is stealing bases. Uh, look down at third baseman and say, "So you got to go on this pitch." I think that's the toughest thing to do for us, Chuck. He said, "If you get a jump and go, and he had confidence in me as a ball player, not just a, uh, you know." for his running base, he had confidence with me defense because I think he had me just perfect when I came in because uh, when I first came in, he was taking me out after seven innings so I wouldn't get in a certain situation to, you know, feel uncomfortable at third base because I hadn't played in two years, so I got to give him credit for that, uh, the way he handled me for his running the base and defense. Well, being part of this family, uh, I know has really, really helped you. You've stated the fact that, hey, if I'm here next year, he said, I might lead this league in hitting. Uh, that's got to be a very positive attitude for you. Right, because, you know, Dave and I always, you know, get on each other because uh, he's telling me now that, you know, since I didn't hit 300, I'm the second leading active <laughs> ball player, you know, for his hitting. But I feel with a team like this and uh, the players I'm surrounded with, I think I can only get better. And I think uh, in San Francisco, which um, had a good team, but it's very difficult to play. The situation a little tough out there, not just for me, for the other ball players, but a team like this, uh, a young team like we got, who knows uh, what we can do for, you know, a long time because most of the guys on the team basically are 28, 23. So we got to should have a good team for a long time to come. Well, it's fantastic, and I know I'm, I'm proud to have you as part of the Pirate family, and you've done so well. Uh, best of luck throughout these championship series. Let's bring a championship back to Pittsburgh, and now we're going to throw it right back up to Milo for all the rest of the pregame festivities. All right, Nellie, thank you, and for the interesting guests, and with the atmosphere in the background, the University of Kentucky Wildcat Band entertaining the folks, as you know, Kentucky right across the river here, and they're getting ready for a sellout crowd to cheer for their Reds, and I hope the folks back in the tri-state and around Pittsburgh feel the atmosphere here tonight and fill up three rivers just the same way for the possible three games that'll be played on the Pirates' home ground. As we go to this ball game here tonight, we've got the two winningest pitchers for their respective clubs. Tom Seaver with 16 wins, the Candy Man with 14. Tom Seaver got off to a rocky start, but then at one time he won an 11-game winning streak. His credentials speak for themselves. There's no doubt that he's a pitcher to have ready for this kind of a game. They were fortunate that they clinched it a couple of nights before they didn't have to use him. Candelaria has had some problems, not only in the last 10 days, but all year long. The back really gave him problems. Then it was the elbow. Now, more recently, a rib cage. He's been treated for that rib cage. 
He seemingly has not responded to it. He says he's ready. And there's been some talk. Is he just trying to make himself ready for this game? I say if John Candelaria went to Chuck Tanner yesterday and said he was ready, that's exactly what he meant. What a lift he could give us and this rest of this club if he could beat Seaver here tonight and take the first game in this 1979 playoff series. Now we have more talk down in the field, and Nellie's ready with old scrap iron Phil Garner. Nellie. Well, we're here with a... Uh... Well, we're here at Riverfront uh, with another key member of that uh, fantastic pirate defensive infield, Phil Garner. Phil, you're not a stranger to these uh, championship playoffs. Well, I think it's the first time, really, Nelly, because the first time I was in the playoff situation was with Oakland, and we played against Boston, and actually that whole year, I was so frightened that I don't even <laughs> remember what was going on, so this is really my first time. Well, how about uh, the difference in clubs? We always heard that that Oakland club fought with one another, and uh, except when they went on the field, and then they, they really came out and played hard. Here, it's more of a family atmosphere. Well, we have a similar type of uh, jiving, uh, jousting each other, whatever you, you have, uh, name calling and uh, just ri general ribbing of each other when somebody does, uh, does something wrong. I think people in Oakland just took it more to heart and took offense by a lot of the things that were said, and, and there were blows always thrown. But uh, here we, we don't do that. But uh, who's going to fight Dave Parker and who's going to fight Starzl? I'm not going to. I don't think anybody else wants to either. But I think we do uh, approach it with a little more gentleman uh, attitude here than we did in Oakland. Well, how about what is what is Madlock and Tim Foley meant to this ball club? I, I know you made the move to second base and have done a tremendous job, but, but those two trades had to be the key to this year. Well, I think you'll see the results of it right now. We're right here, uh, whereas last year we were home watching this uh, show this time. I think, uh, you know, we had the personnel to do it, but I think they just put us over the hump. Uh, what can you say? The, the, the record, the people who followed us the last couple of weeks or the last couple of months know what Bill Madlock has done at third. He made a, an outstanding transition, I thought, from uh, playing second the last couple of years, moving to third and doing a great job at Pittsburgh, where uh, I'm beginning to wonder now if it was my bad hands or if it was really the field that was giving me trouble. I don't know, because he's played so well over there. But Tim Foley's done an outstanding job, which we only wanted him for his defensive uh, purposes, but he's been a great offensive punch for us. So uh, I think that's, uh, I think they've just put us where we are today. In, in making the move to second base and then back to third and back to second, was there any, any part that was most difficult for you? Well, I think uh, it requires a lot of energy any time to move around, Nelly. I think you, you talk to 100 ball players that play in the infield position, their main concern is playing one position and staying in that one position. You don't really mind if you can play several different positions moving around, but it does require uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, mental exercise, if you will. When you're playing second, you've you got to constantly go over in your mind, well, where am I supposed to be on this play? Am I going to be the cutoff? What's going to happen if the ball's hit to me? And if you're uh, switching over to third, then you have to review everything over in your mind about your third base play. And the same thing as shortstop. And I think that the moving around, you're constantly going over those things in your mind, and uh, it's constantly requiring more energy. It takes, a, after a while, it gets to be uh, tiring to you. And if you're in one position, things come to you second naturely. You don't have to constantly run those things through your mind. So that's a big difference. And with, with, the, with the type of atmosphere that's been in the clubhouse, uh, the loose atmosphere, <laughs> more or less the easygoing atmosphere, it's had to make it easier to make those type of, of personal sacrifices, changing positions and sometimes giving yourself up with a bat uh, to better the club. That's had to make that decision just a little bit easier. Well, when you're winning and everybody can see the fruits of those efforts uh, in, in the results of a winning ball club, I think everybody's a little bit uh, happier with uh, bunting somebody over or diving for a ball and getting somebody out. Uh, it just it, Everybody's happy when you're winning. But I think uh, we were doing that even when we weren't winning early in the year, and I think our persistence in that area made us uh, made us uh, winners in the, in the end. Well, Phil, I'm looking forward to you thrilling me and thrilling all of our Pirate fans tonight. I know you guys are going to make a good showing. Looked like a fastball down, and this little guy is strong. He's kind of, I hate to use the word physical fitness. No. Right field. Collins is go. going back, maybe out of here. It is a home run. Collins has it. Moreno's tagging up. It looks like it'll be deep enough. We're going to have to show you find that. These busters are awesome. Everybody knows it. Here he proves it once again. It's probably 395 to 400 feet to the wall. Where Concepcion's going to have to hurry. He got up tight with the bag at third base. Chop almost over his head. Long throw. He is out. Well, but he might butt, but he'll get killed out there if he comes in that close. Field. This ball may be out of here. It is home run for Starzl. 
three-run shot. And there are the Pirate fans, the Pirate Oh, foul Missed tip. Missed it. The throw to first oh. base and end our championship series by the score of five to two. Garner in the third inning and a tremendous home run by. Well, Nellie Browns, when you look to a hero, you go to first base on this club, don't you? You certainly do, not only to first base, but I also have to go back and say the Candelaria did the job that we needed tonight so much. And our pitching, as you say, in a, in a big series is the whole key, and we did it tonight with our pitching. First Candelaria, then when Romo got into trouble, Tocovi came in and got that big double play, and then Jackson and Robinson did the rest. And the versatility that we pointed out of being able to lift a Foley, go to a pinch runner, and Stargell put the icing on the cake with a towering home run over the center field fence. And I'll tell you this, there were great plays on both sides. Sure, it was a disappointing loss for the Reds, but their fans saw a heck of a ball game here tonight. You fans watching back in the five states saw the Buccos win a big, big ball game here on the strength of Stargell's three-run homer, and here are the happy totals. For the Bucks, 5-10-0, they leave seven. The winner, Jackson, the safer Robinson, winning RBI Stargell. Remember, Garner had homered earlier in the game. And for the Reds, 2-7-0, they leave seven. The loser was Hume. We beat the ace out of their bullpen. So that gives us another lift, and we... The fact that their big pitcher, Seaver, was not around for a winning decision, that also gives you another edge. And that also wraps up Pirate Baseball for tonight. Be with us again tomorrow, won't you, at 3 o'clock from Riverfront Stadium when the Bucks again meet the Cincinnati Reds in the championship series. John Sanders, how about the big play tonight? I tell you what, it, they just don't make it easy. Do they? <laughs> we sit here for three and a half hours, and it comes down to the bottom half of the 11th inning. The big play, oh, we have to go to Willie Stargell, because the captain of the Buccos, he did it. With a couple men on base, we are in the top half of the 11th inning, following base hits by Foley and Parker, and this is a hit, and he got all of it. The deep center field, no doubt about it. I don't know what the center fielder was doing, but it was gone. And Willie Stargell circles the bases. He had 32 home runs during the regular season. This one in the playoffs reminds me of a night not too long ago in Montreal when we were playing at about 2 o'clock in the morning, and he did it in the 11th inning. His three-run homer in the 11th inning tonight. Look at those happy fans. The Pirates have won it. Game one goes to Pittsburgh. Now, Eddie Alexander was in Riverfront Stadium for tonight's game, and we go to... Uh, we're not ready with Ellie Alexander at this point. We hope to have some more from Eddie later. We will, of course, have complete highlights of the game, including another look at that winning home run from Willie Stargell coming up later on Eyewitness Sports. What can you say, but... Whew. That puts the Pirates in the catbird seat. It really does. They got past Tom That's Seaver right. tomorrow in Cincinnati and then Eddie come back to Pittsburgh. Eddie oh, Eddie, Eddie is ready? By. Yes, Let's check in. Fact. Wait a minute, five. I'm sorry, five and two. I kept thinking it was three, three in the 11th inning. What did they say on TV about the, huh? on the swing? Yeah, he just throws the We are on that. the air, and we've got Tim Foley to my left and uh, Don Robinson uh, to my right. And I want to tell you something, Mr. Robinson. I'm not going to uh, tantalize you with any trite phrases. I just want you to open up your lips and say something to the people back in Pittsburgh because they want to hear from you. Oh, it's a tight, great feeling tonight. Uh, you know, it's putting in a pressure situation, and, you know, I like those kind of situations. And, you know, the pitch to bench, I thought the 2-2 two -two pitch was a strike. Uh, it was a close call, and I didn't get it. But I wasn't going to dare let bench hit a 3-1 homer off. I mean, tie the game up. I would rather face Knight and let him hit the ball out. But, uh, you know, I, I made a good pitch tonight and struck him out. I said to myself, if you don't get Mr. Knight, we're going to walk back, and you're going to lead the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i tell you what, uh, I looked to see who was on deck. Uh, I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to make sure I wasn't going to give him a good pit pitch to hit. Uh, can't really talk right now. I'm a little excited. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, I made a, three good pitches on him, and I'm glad I got him out. Hey, here's the guy carrying a diaper bag over here. Tim Foley, you went over to talk to your wife, and what happened? I gave her a kiss, and she gave me the diaper bag. I don't know. I guess, <laughs> Hold that thing up yeah, there. What is this? Know, I got What's diapers and here? everything else. Uh, I'll tell you, though, but uh, it's a good feeling. I'll tell you what, for, for two guys that are supposed to be hurt, uh, Candy and, and Don pitched pretty well, didn't they? You know, it's just a, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, when you have as much inside of them, inside is those two guys have and they really do it's just a compliment you know that that they go out there and give you that kind of effort every time and it's just a great feeling to have them on the same ball club five to two is the final score we win game one go get a shower guys congratulations don you, tim congratulations eddie alexander from riverfront stadium we're going to get them in game two tomorrow with bibby against pastore back to you <laughs> he gets any more excited we'll all be in trouble <laughs>
I'm excited about this one because I was here in 69, 70, and 71. We were in the playoffs in the World Series all three years, and uh, I know the, how the crowd's going to be. They're going to be up for it. This year, I just feel like a visiting ball club coming back or coming to another uh, ballpark. And so now I don't have any real strong sentimental feelings. I feel uh, comfortable being a visitor, and, and I'm just here to play baseball and, and beat the Orioles. So well, this is the organization that I come up in, I sort of grew up in, to speak of. Uh, yeah, it's special. I'd like to beat them. Well, the year I had for him that year, and I was uh, traded for Reggie Jackson, and I thought I was coming off a, a outstanding year for myself where I hit 25 home runs. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a little war between us. And uh, just to go out and show them that I'm worthy of uh, uh, playing for any major league team in baseball. All four players had mixed feelings on leaving the Orioles, but there's one thing they do agree on. They're very happy to be back, especially in the visitors' dugout. Jim Hill for CBS News, Baltimore. Well, here at Riverfront today for our very special pregame guest, we have the hero of last night's game, Captain Willie Stargell. Willie, how did it feel running around the bases last night? And what went through your mind knowing that you just put us three runs up in a ball game? Well, I tell you, Nelly, we looked like it was scheduled for one of those things that we've been accustomed to all night, playing those all-nighters. And that's one thing I didn't want to do. But I'd been doing a few things mechanically wrong at the plate earlier in the game, and uh, Bob Skinner and I talked about them. And that's basically what I wanted to do, was just get fundamentally right, pick out a couple of zones, and wait for that particular time. And when the pitch was coming, I knew it was in my zone, and I just wanted to make sure that I was mechanically right. So I was more impressed about doing the things mechanically right. When I hit the ball, I knew it was gone. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me that that was the uh, runs that we needed to put us in the game and, and out in front. But uh, I think basically what we try and do is, is keep as close as we can to our game plan, not to try and do anything fancy. I know the first time up, Tom struck me out on some pitches that were bad and uh, the mechanics weren't there. And that's what I was striving for. And, you know, the excitement and everything, uh, you have a tendency sometimes to get away from that. But it's so important that you do remain mechanically sound, and that's what I wanted to do, and I was very pleased with my efforts. So running around the bases as a result of hitting a home run, I was excited, of course, and the fact that we uh, had come from behind uh, in so many occasions, and we wanted that ball game, and especially here on the road, and we were able to put it together because Candelaria and the um, Teak and, and Don Robinson and Grant Jackson did tremendous jobs in relief. And, uh, it was just a gutty performance, the defense again, and then Garner taking uh, command of the first inning, hitting a home run, and then we got the triple by Omar and the sacrifice fly by Tim. So these are the combined efforts of things that we've been putting together all year, and this is why we're so happy with the things that we've been doing all year. When, when you were rounding that base, did, third base coming in home, did your feet ever touch the ground? Could you feel the ground as you were rounding it? What went through your body? I, I really don't know. I was just real excited, especially when I came around third and I saw the uh, gathering of all the guys. And then it really meant something because, I mean, uh, we collectively has done so much to uh, to get where we are and, and everybody's just rooting so hard for each other. And to get the kind of response from the guys, uh, it, it does make you feel good. And I'd be lying to say otherwise. Even after all these years and the many thrills that you've had. After all these years, Nelly, uh, before the game yesterday, my mouth was dry and I had goosebumps and butterflies. And, and Skin and I was talking about it. Even me with my old self, I'm still uh, feeling the effects of things that I did as a, as a youngster. And I would hope that each and every one of our guys experience the same thing. I don't want anybody going out there knowing that they're not excited and, and that it's not thrilling because... It is to me, and I'm sure it is to everyone else. You're known as, as the big leader on this ball club, and I know you've stated there's been many leaders on this club throughout the year, but you lead in a little different way, uh, at least I think so. You lead on the field. You, are, you lead by example, and, and not so much by word of mouth. And uh, ha Has that been, been by design, or that's just uh, the way you are? Well, when Danny Murtaugh asked me to be captain, I, I asked him what did he want me to do because I didn't want to be anything than what I already am, and that's the individual that I am. And if I can have something that I possess that people feel that I possess can help someone, fine, then I'm all for it. 
because I like to treat people the way I like to be treated. If some of the guys see me doing something that I need to be, you know, told about, then I want that kind of rapport. Because when it gets to the point where I know everything in life or in baseball, then I become a very selfish individual. And I think giving and taking is something that we all have to do. And if my role, since I've been around longer and I've probably seen and experienced probably a lot more, maybe the guys will have a tendency to come and ask me about different things, but there is certainly no dictation or anyone setting any rules down. Uh, we know what we have to do. Most of us are, are men and responsible individuals. So basically we know what we have to do and I only know how to play the game one way and I'm gonna make an all out effort because I feel that each day should be enjoyed as much as I possibly can and I'm gonna give that all out effort and some days are better than others, no question about it, but I think that's the challenge and the excitement that, that we have in playing this game. Um, the days when you want to do well and you don't, but you have to look forward to coming back out here the very next day to, to prove to yourself that certain things can be done. And if guys think that my example is a, is a good example, then fine. But um, I just feel, that, and I feel very strong about this, that I'm just one of 25 men that want to play a major role in whatever our results are this year. Well, you and 24 others are going to be out there today. Best of luck to you. Continued success. We're so proud of you. What we have with us is our special guest, manager Chuck Tanner. Chuck, you made a very gutsy decision last night in going with Candelaria in a situation to where you could have really been second guessed had Candy not pitched well. What was uh, the story behind the Candelaria start last night? Well, a couple days ago, he pitched about one third of an inning. And the day before that, I was in the bullpen with him watching him throw and he just threw the living daylights out of the ball. And I knew he'd be all right. And that one that one outing on the mound really helped him. He said he was ready. And the way he can throw, he's a money pitcher. I knew that the pressure wouldn't bother him. I knew the big crowds wouldn't unsettle him. And he's as great as anybody. I think he's as great as Tom Seaver. And we had to put the big man out there against their big man. Last night's win. We go in today's game uh, one up. And if we can win today, then it's one out of three for the next series. What, what does that do for a ball club spirit? And what does, does that do for you managerially speaking? Well, it really, uh, we win today, it's going to really help us because the pressure really has to be on the other ball club, Cincinnati. They can't, make, they can't afford a mistake. They're going to have to go with everything that they have to try to win the next ball game. And if they would happen to do that and have to go with everybody, it could really hurt them for the following day. So we come out here 2-0 and go back home. We'll be in excellent shape. Last night's game, very typical of the type of games <laughs> that we've had for the last, oh, two months and just had to battle back You've got to feel that, that the spirit in the clubhouse, the 25-man theory that uh, you've had and Willie Stargell has had, that has so much to do with the spirit on the ball club. Well, I think so. They know, all know they're going to play. If the situation arises, we're going, to, we're going to use them. We have faith in everybody. That's how we got here, and that's the way we're going to continue to play. Well, Chuck, good luck today. Continue good luck. Let's bring a championship back. The Reds scored first in the bottom of the second. With runners on first and third, starting pitcher Frank Pastore flies to center. The sacrifice fly bringing home Danny Dreesen for the 1-0 Cincinnati lead. In the Pittsburgh fourth, with the bases loaded, Omar Moreno bounces into a fielder's choice with shortstop Tim Foley scoring from third to even the game at one. In the top of the fifth, Phil Garner lined one to right field. Dave Collins charges and slides and appears to have made the catch, but it's ruled a trapped ball and a single for Garner. Now, after Garner was sacrificed to second, Tim Foley ripped a double inside the third base bag past Ray Knight all the way to the corner, easily scoring Garner, giving the Bucks a 2-1 lead over Cincinnati midway through the game. It could have been more, but in the top of the seventh, with Ed Ott on second, Moreno lined a single to left. Foster makes the charge and sends a perfect strike to Johnny Bench, who puts the tag on the sliding Ed Ott. With Pittsburgh still leading 2-1, to one, the Reds came up in the bottom of the ninth. After Cesar Geronimo had struck out, pinch hitter Heidi Cruz doubled to right center field. Pittsburgh now going with top reliever Kent Tocoldy. And Dave Collins swings and sends a base hit toward the gap. Parker cuts it off, but Cruz rounds third and comes home with a tying run. So it's extra innings for the second day in a row. Top of the 10th. 
Omar Moreno on second after a single and a sacrifice, and Dave Parker comes through off Doug Bear with a single to left. Foster will try for a play at the plate, but Moreno is just too fast, and it's 3-2 Pittsburgh. From there, it was all Don Robinson, putting the Reds down in order in the bottom of the 10th. And when Ray Knight skied to Parker in right field, Pittsburgh had a quick 2-0 lead in this best-of-five series with Game 3 Friday at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh. Mark Goldberg, Channel 4 Sports. Valley Bryles, we try out heroes by the half dozen, don't we? Boy, isn't that the truth? And it's been what it what it's taken all year. Everybody picking everybody else up, no matter, hey, am I a starter? Am I a reliever? Do I play left or right field? It's whatever it's taken all year. Everybody's filled in and done the job that's needed to be done at that particular moment. So Don Robinson, who's played the role of a fine starter his first two years in the big leagues, now called upon to relieve. Saves it for Jackson last night, wins it today. And boy, the happy totals are right here that bring the Bucks home 2-0. 3-11 and 0, 9 left. Robinson the winner. And for the Reds, 2-8 and 0, they leave 11. And of course, the loser for them in that 10th inning was Bear. We owed him one, you know. He's been tough on us the last two years. Parker had the winning RBI, and Moreno, who started the 10th with the base hit, scored the winning run. Boy, what a position to come home in, 2-0 and oh, in a best three out of five. We now might only have to win one out of the next three. All of them are at home. We can now gamble on our, our pitching. We'll have a, a starter for sure that'll be announced tomorrow. So we're in a good position, more than you'd want to be, and it's been timely pitching, good defense, and timely hitting. It's just been an outstanding series here. Boy, two great games, and that wraps up Pirate Baseball for today. Championship Series. Today, from Baltimore's Memorial Stadium, it's the California Angels against the Baltimore Orioles. Today's game is brought to you by New Formula Nitol. Remember, on those occasional nights when you have trouble falling asleep, there's Nitol. By Chrysler Corporation. See the mileage makers at your Dodge or Chrysler Plymouth dealers. By the Miller Brewing Company, brewers of Miller High Life. If you've got the time, We've got the beer. And by Goodrich, we're the other guys, the leader in high performance radials. 
Partly cloudy in the mid 70s in Baltimore, Maryland. Over 50,000 fans again cramming their way into Memorial Stadium for game two of the American League Championship Series. The crowd, the Orioles, still a flush with the joy of victory last night. The dramatic pinch hit home run by John Lowenstein, the first pinch hit homer in American League Championship Series history. Hello everyone, I'm Dick Enberg and welcome to Baltimore for game two of the American League Championships. John Lowenstein providing that pinch homer last night and the Angels trying to recover from the emotional down that that created. The Orioles just trying to get their feet back on the ground. Working with me, a man you enjoyed throughout the course of this NBC baseball season every Saturday, Wes Parker and Wes today. Ironically, when Palmer and Ryan, you can't say anything but great things about their performance last night, but today we're seeing the top pitchers for both staffs. We are as far as uh, percentage is concerned, one loss percentage in ERA. It's amazing that Flanagan and Frost are actually better in that regard than Ryan and Palmer, and we saw such great pitching last night, but we may see better pitching today. There's another interesting contrast because Frost is a big city boy. He came out of Long Beach, California, which is just south of Los Angeles. He's used to the big city life, went to Stanford University, played basketball and baseball. Then you have Flanagan, Mike Flanagan from a little suburb town in New Hampshire, grew up on a lake and uh, traveled, uh, didn't, didn't travel, didn't play baseball in, until uh, later on. And uh, here you have a country boy against a city boy, and it's just something you're not used to seeing. In fact, it wasn't until he started playing baseball that he actually did travel. So it, it should be a good matchup, and the Angels really need this game so much, Dick. They've got to come out of here with a split because no team has ever come back after being down 2-0. And well, the Angels are in the hole. They have to beat the man everyone's talking about winning the Cy Young Award, the winningest pitcher in the major leagues, Flanagan, who won 23. They do have a common denominator, Frost and Flanagan. If they're effective today, their off-speed pitches will have to be working for them. Nothing off speed about this gentleman, George Sparky Anderson, joining us in our NBC booth. Sparky, the emotions of the two managers now. You got Earl Weaver, a feisty, fiery guy who you saw. He just bolted out of the dugout. That was totally unlike Weaver to meet Lowenstein before he got to third. And then Jim Fergosi at 37 trying to rally his troops. Now, just give us a feeling what might have happened in the last 12, 14 hours. Well, Dick, last night was a rough night for both managers. Let's face it, the game on the line all night from the sixth inning on, it was tension. Both managers heard all night they had a lot of jelly to sell I'm sure they woke up today and they're still not sure which one that, who won but I'll say this Earl Weaver knows that he hasn't finished the Angels he has to put the nail in the coffin he has to win two more games Jim Fergosi will change his tactics a little bit today for one reason he'll come and talk to his ball club and say look it we've won three straight many times this year Baltimore's not invincible we can beat them let's go just do it and show everybody but the Angels have had difficulty winning in Baltimore. They're one and six this year. Interesting note, when the Orioles won last night, that made six playoff series. They've won the first game all six times, but only three of the previous five times did they go to the World Series. For the second straight day, Dan Ford gets the Angels rolling early. He rips this one against Mike Flanagan. The Angels are off to a one nothing first inning lead. But it was to be one of the few chances the men from Anaheim would have to smile on this day. Orioles came up with four runs in the bottom of the first. Eddie Murray singled in Al Bumbry. It's tied 1-1. Then Pat Kelly goes up the middle, too. The Orioles had the lead for good 2-1 at this stage. Then there's the play that broke the Angels back. Doug DeSensei singles to right, scoring John Lowenstein. And when Dan Ford throws the ball into no man's land up the left field line, the fourth run of the inning crosses the plate. The Orioles appear to put it out of reach in the second. Eddie Murray greets reliever Mark Clear with a shot to right. A three-run homer. The Orioles lead 9-1. to one. But the Angels hustle back. They score in the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth to pull back to within one run. In fact, Carney Lansford pulled them to within a tying run. Lansford comes up with a pop fly to right that manages to fall in. It scores Willie Davis. This makes it 9-8 as Davis crosses the plate. Then with the bases loaded and two outs, the final out as DeSensei tags out Dan Ford. The Orioles win it 9-8. They lead two games to none with game three set in Anaheim Friday night. Sent 
say a heady play. Knew the man was coming from second. And he just blocked Ford away. Ford, of course, doing all he could, trying to run, knock the ball free, but the game ends. A tremendous comeback, but it ends as it did last night for the Angels. They take the loser's walk back into the clubhouse. The Orioles jump in front. Two games to none in the American League Championship Series. A partisan crowd of 52,108 at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore enjoyed two different games. Early, it was all Orioles as they cheered a 9-1 to lead. And then it was a matter of starting to swallow harder and harder. Earl Weaver symbolized it. He couldn't even look as the Angels scored one in the sixth, one in the seventh, three in the eighth, two in the ninth, and the game ended with the bases loaded as Baltimore wins it 9-8. to During the year, we were four and eight with the Reds. Did not do well at home, which is an oddity. We finished one and five in the six games. We'd like to stop that string right here today in the most important game so far in this 79 calendar baseball season for the Bucks. Two balls, two strikes. Fly ball. Left field. Foster is there. Remember, he got a speed march in at third. They'll send him home. The throw will be late, and it is 1-2-0 Pirates. Moreno has scored. Sacrifice fly and an RBI. Now, that was hit about, you're going to look at it, he's about 280 feet down the line. He was, and without, without Foster being able to get behind the ball and get enough momentum to come into the ball and make a throw, he had to almost make it flat-footed, and with the speed of Omar, he beats the play. Here it is again. He just didn't get much on it either. Kind of dribbled in the bench. There are plenty of good general admission seats remaining for the 1979 World Series games to be held here in Pittsburgh. The series begins here on Friday, October 12th. That's a week from today. It's an 8.30 game in the evening. Continues Saturday, October 13th at 1 in the afternoon and on Sunday afternoon, the 14th, at 4.30. Tickets are going fast, so you stop by the Pirate Ticket Office right here at Three Rivers Stadium. Only place you can get them and pick up yours. In the bottom of the third, Stargell, Milner, and Madlock. That might be a little look into the future. He's going to get some votes. Is he ever? And the fact that the spotlight was on our club those last two weeks and all those guys in from around the country who vote he had to pick up some support strike from Norman who came on in the second and struck out Parker in relief of Mike Lacoste smashed it look out Al Monchek. strike two Willie Stargell, the Pirates' all-time home run leader. And the fans here know it, too. No balls, two strikes. Couple of veterans here head on. Norman on the mound, Stargell in the batter's box. One ball, two strikes. Norman is also the type of pitcher that does not throw his screwball to left-handed hitters, and that's why sometimes he has more trouble getting out left-handed hitters than right-handed hitters. There's a drive. The ballpark will never hold it. It's going, going, and it's a club level, a towering home run. Superstar, super surgeon, and bombs away.
Look at that power, the follow through, and the moment it leaves the bat, Willie knows where it's headed. Freddie Norman has to know too. He made a bad pitch. And you just watch where he sees it go and lands way up into the mezzanine. The crowd asked for and got another salute from the cap of Willie Stargell. They wouldn't let him sit down in that dugout. Black batting with nobody on in front of him and one away and Ed Ott on deck as you looked into the dugout and there's a drive way back into left that one's going gone out there knowing that it takes as he takes another bow recognizing the cheers of the fans he just got all of that ball too and Freddie Norman now is not being particular gave it up to a lefty and now is giving it up to a righty Boy, this crowd is really buzzing now now well, we got the long ball in the third from Stargell and Madlock and both home runs jumped out there was no doubt about either one of them why 11 0 for one pirates leading four to nothing bottom of the fourth inning game three and the bucks looking to make this the deciding game of the series shot through the left side this club fired up came out early this crowd that had to wait 49 minutes because of rain they were fired up from the start. Burt just gets a good pitch to hit, and it, if you throw a, a pitcher that kind of ball, even he can hit it. So Norman made a big mistake, gave Burt a fat pitch, and uh, he took advantage of it. While Evan is on, Al Monchek conferring with the Dutchman at first base. That is hit number four for the Pirates. stepping in 0 for 1. He had a sacrifice fly in the first. Drove in our opening run and then Bly Levin, or excuse me, then Parker struck out in the second. Bly Levin's at second now with two away in the bottom of the fourth. Pirates leading 4 nothing. We're in our jackpot inning. $800 on the line. Norman struck out Parker to end the second. Do you recall, uh, Nelly, what the pitch happened to be he struck him out on the same pitch that he that he took for a ball right here it was that breaking ball down and away right there so now he's got uh, the advantage on Norman two balls no strikes with Stargell waiting on deck maybe that's how he's supposed to pitch to him wait till he gets two and oh and then <laughs> come in like he did before to get him and fouled off to the left Yes, indeed. It's turning out to be a very nice afternoon at Three River Stadium for game three of the playoffs. Reds trying to force a game four. And if it's necessary, it would be tomorrow night here at Three River Stadium. Pirates hoping that this will be their last game of the National League playoffs and hoping that their next game will be game one of the World Series. Pirates in front, four to nothing. Last half of the fourth inning. The single. He went to second on the Moreno sacrifice bunnies He's there now with two away. And uh, Dick Stello talking with Freddie Norman about going to his mouth. It might make it a three and one count. I'm not sure if he was warning him whether he told him he went and going to charge a ball. Yep, three and one.
Norman and Dick Stello, second base umpire, barbering back and forth a little bit as Norman is visibly upset with the call. Norman, while on the pitching surface in that dirt area, went to his mouth to a three and one. And Parker walks. First walk issued by Norman. Pirates have two on, two away. And their pitching coach, Bill Fisher, is going out. The Pirates and the Pirate fans standing in anticipation of Willie Stargell. Stargell with uh, four home runs during championship play. He had uh, two a couple of years ago. Let's see, 1974, I think it was. And has had two in this championship series against the Reds. Freddie Norman needs to get out Willie Stargell. He leads off the top of the next inning. And the first pitch is fouled away, strike one. A great year Willie had during the regular season 31 home runs and more and more they've got to be thinking about Stargell in terms of most valuable player in the National League it's a big hitter for Norman to get again he leads off the next inning plus they cannot afford to give up any more runs they're already too far in the hole base hit down the right field line fly level will score five nothing Parker has the green light Relay back in will not be in time. Stargell doubled and the Pirates lead six to nothing over the Cincinnati Reds. Stargell has driven in three of the six runs, has six RBIs in this three-game series so far against the Reds. Boy, how often can Willie continue to do it? Time after time, getting that big base hit. Here he drives the ball between Dreesen and a bag down the right field line. By the time Collins can retrieve it, Parker has scored all the way to first, and Captain Willie Stargell, the guts of this ball club, the glue that holds us all together, our number one leader has indeed delivered again. Oh, and great, uh, great work, too, from our camera crew as they had the shot right down that right field line, got a good look at it. And they're going to make a pitching change. Johnny McNamara in his first year as the manager of the Cincinnati Reds. It's been a great year for the Reds, but now the Pirates have grabbed the first two games of the playoffs and have taken a six to nothing lead in the fourth inning of game three. And so Freddie Norman, after working two full innings and giving up four runs so far, is going to be lifted. It looks like it's going to be another left-hander the newcomer to the Reds, Charlie Liebrandt. They recently disabled Bill Bonham the first day we were in Cincinnati. And they activated uh, this left-hander, Liebrandt, to take Bonham's spot. So while we've got a moment here and you look at the crowd here at Three River Stadium, the Pirates would like to take this opportunity to extend their most sincere thanks and appreciation Nelly to all pirate fans for their fine support during this 1979 season well, they certainly have and you can see that it's the second highest total in three rivers history in 1979 has been a great year so far and we have a shot of making it a fantastic year 1980 could possibly be even better That complete game victory. The one that'll put the Pirates into the World Series. He is strung right now tighter than a banjo string. His heart is pumping. I know. I've been there. You know that that heart is pounding in that chest. He knows what he has. Strike! Oh, and one. Burton knows in the back of his mind, there certainly ain't no stopping me now. One ball and one strike. Boy, he's letting it go. No sense waiting for it. He won't have to pitch all next Wednesday or Thursday. Now we're 
down to a strike. Outside, two and two. This crowd is absolutely ready to tear three rivers down. 2-2 two -two pitch. Check swing foul up into the seats on the left side. It ends the way it is now. Look, yeah, yeah, he's finally decided it's time to go into that charming smile of his. Oh, he did a great job managing this club. Crowd pulling for fly 11 to end it. Nobody on. Two away. Ninth inning. It's yeah. over. have won the National League pennant for 79 and this total board tells it we were out hit eight to seven but won at seven to one bench had their only run a home run Lylevin went all the way in as thrilling a victory as he will have pitched in his career I don't care about some of those games he pitched in the other league he's going to have to put this one at the top of the list put that right at the top of the list and his wife was going to put that money in the top of her pocketbook. <laughs> oh, is that the way it works? I think so. Yeah, you've been there, too. Yes, sir. Well, what a way to finish it. Holy Toledo, what a season. And how about those 79 battling bucks? Well, they're tearing up this field. I don't mean that literally because they're just celebrating down there. It looks like a big disco at Three Rivers. And the Pirates have won the flag. As usual, a number of heroes. The pitching, the timely hitting, and the defense did it. That was the script they followed all year. Why change it for the championship game? And so for Nellie Bryles, this is Milo Hamilton. We're heading for the clubhouse. We'll be down there shortly. Let's join the celebration with Eddie Alexander and John Sanders. Let's go to the Pirate Clubhouse. 
Eddie Alexander along with John Sanders and John I want to tell you so we're going to try to get Bill Madlock over here again we just had Bill a second ago but the National League champions the Pittsburgh Pirates 1979 and it looks like a rematch of 1971 with Baltimore depending on whether they can beat California or not hey, I just remember one thing that was said before this ball game started we're going to get him over here in a minute Burt Blylevin said before the ball game he hoped he was the one jumping up and down on the mound at the end of the ball game and he was and we're talking about Burt Blylevin as Chuck Tanner comes in John, looky here Chuck congratulations oh thanks a lot what a great bunch of men we have they all contributed it's just been a fantastic year and now we're in the world series and we still have one more thing to do and we'll work at it and give it all we have and i said earlier i'd have to say this that and i really mean it sincerely the good lord helped us uh, he was with us all the way and Everything worked just right for us. We had a fellowship of Christian athletes meeting before the game. It was just terrific. <laughs> Did you see the wives dancing on top of the... Yeah, I, I thought that was great. I loved it. Uh, John, who do you have over there? Congratulations against Kevin. This is Phil Geiner, who in the third inning of this ball game made a heck of a play to cut off a run. And I think that one play, I remember that play, and I know you remember that play, too. Well, at that situation, it was a tight ball game, and we couldn't afford to let them get something on the board because it might give them a little breathing room and it might give them a little courage. So we had to keep them down. So I was going to try to catch that ball no matter what. Yeah, I remember what you said Sunday after we won it. You said, this is my biggest thrill in baseball. That was Sunday. This is well, Friday. This, it keeps getting bigger, John. It keeps getting bigger and better. Terrific game. Great series. Let's go Thank get them. You. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. John, here he is. Tim Foley. Come in the middle, Tim. Congratulations, big guy. Thank you. It's great. Oh, man. Just great, great feeling. You know, it's it's unbelievable. We worked hard, we battled, we got some great pitching, and we won. We Let won. me ask you something. Did you see the wives all congregating on top of the uh, dugout? I told, I went to Bird after they were dancing, and I said, Bird, I said. Uh, if you were going to lose this game before, I said, you can't now because we can't come out here tomorrow. Now, remember, he just said something. John Sanders just said something to Garner about saying last week, hey, that was my biggest moment. It keeps getting bigger, doesn't it? It's unbelievable. You know, it's just we battle from day to day, get better and better, and it's just more fun every day. One of my MVPs in the family, Tim Foley, and look at this scene over here with Burb Levin and the captain. Captain, of course, just voted the most valuable player of the playoff series, but he don't want to talk about that because family was on top of the locker room today. Well, it is. If I receive the award, I'm very warm and moved by. And if I could chop it up in 25 pieces, that's the way it should be because it's been a total team effort all year. I'm just so happy that I'm part of this ball club and hopefully we can just go to Baltimore and and do the things we've been doing all year. <laughs> Look at this right here. What is Willie this? Jr. What is this? <laughs> we are family. Yes, indeed. That's exactly what it is right here. Bert, let's get you in for just a second. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, it's flying. Bert, congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank the good Lord for everybody being healthy this year and uh, had a tremendous year. Just one pitch away from a shutout, but it doesn't matter, does it? No, not with a 6 nothing lead. You know, you just got a rear back and challenge, but I didn't want to walk anybody. And, it turned out super. I wore my Sunday go to meet and suit, but it doesn't look like it's going to last long. <laughs> hey, got it. hey, Bert, one more thing. Hey, Bert, before the ball game, you said you wanted to be the guy jumping up and down on the mound at the end of the ball game, and you did. What does it really mean to you after oh. your years in the major leagues to get this opportunity? It's quite a thrill. You know, when, I, when Bench hit that home run, it was 6-1, to one, I told myself, Rare back throw the ball because I want to be out here in the ninth inning. And uh, when I struck out Geronimo, I saw Otter jump and I jumped, and it's <laughs> super feeling. I haven't felt that good since 1969. <laughs> Congratulations again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eddie, as you pointed out, it looks like we could be going back to Baltimore. That's of course, right. that Get ball it, game is tonight. Get and we'll see what happens out Get there. But right now, I think the feeling in the locker room here. Let's take a look at this. We we'll get the trophy guys. if we can. Let's take a look at this trophy for just a moment. This is the trophy. And this is the first year for the Warren Giles Trophy that goes to the winning team in the National League. And this year it's the Pittsburgh Pirates as we get ready, ready to go back to the World Series for the first time since 1971. And I think, Ed, I don't know, you and I were both here on Sunday when they wrapped it up during the, uh, the regular season. A little bit different atmosphere. They're excited, they're happy, but it's, you know, it's not quite the same, would you say? I would say that uh, it's a little more subdued because of the fact they've got over the shock now of being in the playoffs. Now they're starting to look ahead to the ultimate goal at the end of the rainbow, which is perhaps a world championship. And I think that's the one of the reasons why they're taking it a little calmer, even though they still have a champagne bottle there. <laughs> yes, they do. A terrific victory. The final score here today was 7-1. to one. We hope you've enjoyed the locker room because we've enjoyed being here all the regular season. And we've got the third season to go. 
That's the World Series coming up, Eddie. Quick note, though. Milo Hamilton. Milo Hamilton, come over for just a second before we wrap it up because it appears the way the rules are this year on radio and television that that was your last game of the season. Well, evidently, uh, it's kind of uh, a downer. Uh, it's hard to believe, I suppose, with all the excitement, but uh, I'm so happy for this club, for the Galbraiths and Pete Peterson and Chuck Tanner and all the players and all the coaches and for the fans, but uh, to know that uh, it was my last game, uh, it just uh, is, is, I don't mean ever, but this season, because somewhere along the line, somebody decided that the local announcers weren't going to do the World Series this year, and I, that is really, uh, that's tough to take. It is tough to take, and I know it's tough for you to talk about it also. And let's bring in Nelly for just a moment, because he was your sidekick in crime whenever there was television. And Nelly, uh, your last game of the season, but boy, did the family have fun today. Boy, it certainly did, and to, to be a player and participate in it is one thing, and then your first year announcing, you end up uh, getting in a, in a pennant race. It, it's exciting on both ends, and I'm really proud to be part of this package. I just think that it wouldn't have been fair if we couldn't have got the announcers who have really helped to bring this family to its ultimate goal right here. Eddie Alexander along with John Sanders, Milo Hamilton, Nellie Bryles, and Lanny for Terry up in the booth probably still. We're going back to you. Appropriately, in the last game we came home and we saw on your on the top of your dugout the family on the top of theirs the Cincinnati Reds and what a tribute there. Yeah, it was a very very, very good feeling to see everybody so happy here today. We come here, we wanted to uh, try to wrap it up. They wanted to go any further, and it was a thrill to see the wives getting out, just getting down and booking a little bit. I still got chills when I think of the Grand Slam against the Philadelphia Phillies. What a what a what a big hit for your your season, of course, the, one of the cappers for the whole season. Well, that might have got everybody started because we was a little down at one time. We, Got a little tired physically. We come back, and I got the coach was four for four, and I pinched it and got lucky and hit a grand slam. And uh, I seen to get everybody started, and we just took it from there and just went on in. Yes, indeed. Thank you, John. Right. John, come on in just a moment and talk with uh, Jim Bibby because. Uh, Thank you, Eddie. I, I remember how happy you were oh, just last Sunday. You've got to be every bit as happy or happier. You what? Now. I think I went past that little <laughs> interval at that time. I'm even more happier now than I was last Sunday. You talked at that time about how long you've been working just to get to this point. Is there any way that you can describe the feeling you have knowing that you've got the World Series ahead of you? i tell you what, you know, like uh, when I pitched my no-hitter in 73 uh, against Oakland, you know, I thought that was got to be one of the best feelings I've had in, the, in the, my major league career. But, hey, it doesn't even compare to what we did today and what we are headed forward to. one of the most dramatic series in baseball playoff history. Game one, John Lowenstein breaks a 3-3 tie with a two-out pinch hit home run in the 10th inning. Baltimore wins game one, 6-3. 
2, Memorial Stadium, Baltimore. Rallying from a 9 to 1 deficit, the Angels face his loaded ninth inning trail, only 9 to 8. Downing chopper to DeSensei for the final out. Baltimore hangs on to win 9 to 8 and leads two games to none. The scene shifts to the Golden West. Anaheim Stadium, Anaheim, California. A sellout crowd of well over 43,000 fans. The Baltimore Orioles, two outs away from the World Series. Dennis Martinez to Rod Carew, ninth inning. Line drive, left center field, up the alley for a double. The Angels, a come from behind team all season long, have the tying run at second base. Don Stanhouse comes in to relay for Martinez. Pitch to Bobby Gretz, two on, two out. Bumbry charges, he has it. No, he drops it. Carew round third, and the Angels have tied it at three apiece. Dean Autry and his special guest and the fans at Anaheim Stadium look for another Yes We Can Win as the slogan reads in Anaheim. Al Bumbry, a man who will catch that drive the next 100 times, somehow can't keep it in the leather. Carew scores, the game tied. And now Larry Harlow, an ex-Oriole up. He slices the line, drive to left field. Lowenstein charges, downing round third, and the Angels win four to three. Unbelievable ninth inning spurred by a frenzied crowd at Anaheim Stadium. The Angels are alive as they record another of their many come-from-behind wins. The crowd sustaining a constant roar had one final volley in victory. But the Orioles, stunned last night, are still ahead in this fight, two games to one. And they're here again today for Game 4 of the American League Championship Series. NBC Sports presents Game 4, the American League Championship Series. Today from Anaheim Stadium, it's the Baltimore Orioles and the California Angels. Today's game is brought to you by IBM Office Products Division. By Dean Witter Reynolds, one investment firm you'll be glad to hear from. By Chrysler Corporation. See the mileage makers at your Dodge or Chrysler Plymouth dealers. And by Light Beer. Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. It says on the calendar. The calendar reads early October, but the weatherman has presented a midsummer perfect 80 degree baseball afternoon, not a cloud in the sky over Anaheim Stadium as the sellout crowd filing in to see game four of this dramatic American League Championship Series. Hello, everyone. I'm Dick Enberg, and welcome to Anaheim Stadium. Those of you who have followed the pattern of this series, the first three games, must agree with the press from around the world covering this and the newspaper and radio television personnel who say that maybe on its way to the greatest series ever. The first three games, hard to argue. Wes Parker is with me. Wes, today, game four. The Angels still alive, but everyone, with all the excitement last night, forgets it's the Orioles that lead in the series two games to one. Well, they, they've still got the best chance to win it, and you've, you've got to like their chances, I'll tell you that. But uh, we're going to see the number four pitches from both clubs today, Scott McGregor and Chris Knapp. And uh, we're going to see some good pitching from both these guys. Even though it's down to the fourth starters, Dick, uh, they're still very capable. The Baltimore pitching staff, as we know, is loaded with good starters, and McGregor will be no exception. He's a lot like the old Dave McNally type. Uh, Baltimore fans will remember him from the early 70s. He will be facing, though, a predominantly right-handed hitting lineup on the part of the Angels as they try to counter his effectiveness. Now, for the Angels, it'll be Chris Snap going today. He's had a bad back, a herniated disc. He only had a 5-5 five and five record this year, but he is 11-1 and one in Anaheim Stadium. Very tough in this ballpark. If he gets into any trouble at all today, I think that Dave Frost, who got knocked out in the second inning of the second game, will be pitching right behind him and would be brought in very, very quickly. We should remind you fans, Anaheim Stadium in day games, the ball carries very well. The dimensions are much, much shorter than the numbers on the outfield wall would read. We're liable to see some home runs hit today. 
Yeah. Well, the old sage veteran skipper last night, <laughs> Sparky Anderson, it was a joy for us to see that you have a lot of kid left in you. You enjoyed that game as much as any of the fans at Anaheim Stadium. Well, Dick, let me say this. I was in the 75 World Series with the Boston Red Sox when Carlton Fist hit the six home, uh, six inning, uh, six game home run that won that ball game for him. Then we went to the seventh game. But I have never in my lifetime been associated in a thing like this where you've had the Baltimore crowd that's just been ecstatic in Baltimore with Wild Bill, and then you come to Anaheim. And I have never myself ever been around professional sports where there's been this much enthusiasm. And to me, this is going to do more for baseball than that World Series of 75 did. The Angels and the Orioles, the winner to meet the Pirates in the World Series, the Orioles one game away. It's going to be a pleasure in the American League the next few years to look at some of all these good young ball players, Rice and Lynn, Connie Lansford and Eddie Murray. These guys in three, four years from now are just going to dominate the game. You've got a few over in Detroit, too. Line drive. That's a base hit into the right field corner. Ford trying to cut it off. One run scores. A long single by Murray. It's two to nothing. Baltimore. Murray drives in his fifth run of this series. And a reminder that football is here with us again tomorrow. National Football League action. A battle for first place in Cleveland between the Steelers and the Browns. The Jets with their big upset win in Miami last week are at Baltimore. Colts hungry for a victory. And San Diego and Denver. Tough battle in the West. And at 4.30 Eastern time, 1.30 in the West, Seattle at San Francisco. All tomorrow on NBC. 37-year-old Jim Fergosi. Great baseball season for the young skipper. McGregor one out away from giving Earl Weaver another pennant. <laughs> the Baltimore players are kind of working their way up to the front there, Dick. They're getting ready to make the charge. Brian Downing, one for three today. The last man in the way of the Orioles celebration. McGregor's thrown plenty of those. A five hitter for Scott McGregor working on a shutout. Top scoring team in baseball. Strike two. And now it's match point. Two strikes, two outs, ninth inning, eight to nothing, Baltimore. It just wouldn't be. He's, he's warming up Dick for Pittsburgh. <laughs> All over. Scott McGregor, a five-hit shutout. The Baltimore Orioles are the American League champion.
precious opportunity to play in a World Series is in the hands of the Orioles. Let's go to Wes Parker and Skipper Earl Weaver. Thank you very much, Earl. I've got Earl Weaver in a mad clubhouse as usual. And Earl, your first pennant since 1971. How does it feel? Oh, very good, very good. What a job they did all year long. They just didn't quit. They made believers out of everybody. Did you have any idea in spring training that this club was going to be as good as it's turned out to be? Well, 102 and then three out of four in the playoffs. That's what we were working for. That's what we put it together for, and they did the rest. Earl, it's kind of ironic. You're going to be going to the World Series playing the Pittsburgh Pirates, who you lost to in 1971. Any ideas about the Thank rematch? You, what well, do you think about the rematch? We're going to talk to Jim Russo and Earl. They've been with him, and uh, I hope that uh, we can win it in seven this time. That was a great series. One of the best ball clubs you've ever coached? Uh, it's got to go up there, the number of victories and the stats. They broke the home run record, and we led the American League in pitching, and I don't know what else they could accomplish other than what they've accomplished up to this point. We saw you pacing back and forth throughout this series. Earl, is that just superstition, or were you really in agony? No, no, I'm a nervous fella. I get nervous opening day, and I won't quit now until the World Series over. How many day in and day out. you got to do that in April, May, June, anytime. How many cigarettes do you think you smoked during the games in four games? Well, uh, believe it or not, it wouldn't be that many, but enough. Okay. Enough that I shouldn't be doing it. I know that. Earl, best of luck to you in the World Series. Thanks. All right, Earl. Earl Weaver, obviously very happy, very excited. Baltimore having won the championship. They're going to the World Series. They had such an outstanding year. The relief, knowing that they did not blow it in the playoffs with their fine record, they are going on into the World Series. We'll see if we can get some other players. Al Bumbry. <laughs> How you doing, Al? I tell you, today I feel great. I wasn't feeling very good last night, but today I feel great. Al, those things can happen, and you bounce back, and that's what you have to do in this game. You can't let one thing get you down. Yeah, well, that's true. I, I'm sort of hard on myself, and I think I took a little hard last night, but the guy said, don't worry about it. You will win today, and it came out that way, so I feel great now. Now, you played in the 1971 World Series. Is that right, or no, did no, you? No, no, no. That was before me. I, this is my first World Series. Okay, you missed that one. Now you have a chance to go with the Pirates. How do you feel about that, Al? Well, I tell you, when you get to the World Series, you don't worry about any team. And right now, I feel wonderful. <laughs> Let's see who else we have. We are going to go back to Dick Enberg. I'm sprayed. We're going to get some more players up here. We'll talk to Scotty McGregor in just a minute. Back to Dick Enberg for now. All right, we'll let towel, uh, West Parker towel off. Meanwhile, here at Anaheim Stadium, half the crowd remains. They're still standing and chanting. the best season in California Angel history and their 19 years is over. They chant. See them hugging each other and saying, hey, we helped them best we could. And certainly that was true. But the Baltimore Orioles are best in the American League. They win three games to one and a fancy shutout today by Scott McGregor. 8-0 on a six-hitter. Championship Series was brought to you by Chrysler Corporation. See the mileage makers at your Dodge or Chrysler Plymouth dealers. By the Miller Brewing Company, brewers of Miller High Life. If you've got the time, we've got the beer. By Atra, for closeness with comfort, it's Gillette's best shave. And by Prestone Antifreeze, the antifreeze more people trust than all other brands combined. A reminder, we're going to be back with more of the clubhouse scenario of the Baltimore Royals, the champions of the American League, right after these messages from your local station. The Angels have come out of the clubhouse to say thank you to their beloved fans.
different celebration going on inside the clubhouse here. As you can see. Go, Doug. You do it, baby. Doug DeSensei is my guest. And uh, Doug, you made one super play. I think it turned this game around, perhaps the series. You were playing close to the line. Why? Well, in that situation, uh, you know, you don't want to give Jimmy Anderson an extra base hit. It, it, his best thing right then is if he gets a base hit, he's going to, you know, you're going to get one run. But if he gets a ball down the line and gets by me, there's two and sets up for more runs. And at the time to score, I wasn't going to give him that. I was going to give him a base hit down the line. But it, let me tell you, he, you know, he hit the ball right over the bat. He hit it on the button. I was just lucky to get that ball. All right. Now, how's your leg? We saw you pull up. Did you injure yourself? Yeah. Um, well, I came around first after hitting the ball going to second. The dirt gave way, and I pulled something right in the back of my knee. And it, you know, I was, I wasn't gonna come out of the game for anything today, though. No, there was no way. All right, are you healthy enough to play in the World Series? Now, this is what it's all about, isn't it? Let yeah, me tell you, we're gonna go. You know, we're going now, and and nothing's gonna keep me from playing that either. It's been a year that I've been playing like this, and and nothing's gonna stop now. First playoff, first series, undoubtedly the greatest thrill of your life, right? Oh, there's no doubt, no doubt. I mean, this team's just been been fantastic all year, and and the Angels just uh, last night they came back and beat us and showed that you know what they're made of. They didn't win the West by not not being a great comeback team and a competitive team but it also showed today that we didn't let that game disturb us we had the confidence we knew what we had to do and we went out and did it today go see if you can get some of that stuff in your mouth okay oh, okay all right <laughs> pat kelly <laughs> pat what a series what a season it's been for you a great thrill to hit that home run thank you wes i tell you it's just a, a great ball club first of all i'd just like to say as a christian and a child of god I give praise to the Almighty because he was with us from the first day to the very end, and I just thank him because he's worthy to be praised. 35 years uh, old. Uh, how many years in professional baseball, Pat? I go back to 63, so I'm in my about 14th or 15th year. And this is your first playoff or a World Series or any kind of a championship? That's right. I, I was close once, but we're there now, and I just thank God, really. What a feeling, huh? It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> this is a great club, best club I've ever played for, and I tell you, they're just super and and they're worthy of the, the, to be where we're at right now. Okay, Pat, nothing like winning. Congratulations on a super season. Good luck to you in the World Series. Thank you, Wes. Thank you. All right, let's talk to Scott McGregor. Thank you, Scotty. Scotty, the winning pitcher in today's game, the number four starter for the Orioles, if you can believe it. I bet you can't believe that yourself, Scott. Uh, I'm just glad to be here. We got, you know, a lot of good pitching on the ball club, and I think you can put any one of our guys out there, and they're going to do a good job. Dennis did a good job last night. I just got eight runs today. You tried to keep the ball down most of the game. You got three excellent doubles plays, didn't you? Well, those are the pitcher's best friend. You know, you can put a couple of those together, especially one with the bases loaded and one out. That's, you know, that really helps. That's the way I pitch. I got to keep the ball down, and they uh, got the ground balls. Scott, it was such a big game, and the Angels looked like they might be establishing some momentum yesterday with that big win, the crowd behind them. Did you have any trouble sleeping last night and thinking about this start today? Oh, definitely. <laughs> I slept in about 2,000 positions last night. <laughs> you know, I, it's tough, you know, but I knew that there'd be plenty of adrenaline flowing today to keep me going. I'll crash on the plane back home. <laughs> did it did it seem kind of strange to you after growing up in Los Angeles and El Segundo just about 30, 40 miles from here to be pitching in a really your home park and having so many people rooting against you? Well, I know there's about 30 people up there that were rooting for me and I can feel it. You know, I, I'm so glad to be able to do it here. It's just a dream come true to be able to pitch in your hometown and to clinch it to go to the World Series. It's okay, the Pittsburgh Pirates are waiting for you, but for now, just enjoy it. Thanks a lot, Scott. Okay, Wes, thank you. The Orioles, obviously, a very happy bunch of ball players. Dick, let's go back up to you. All right, Wes, great job. And with us up in our NBC booth, the chairman of the board, Gene Autry. I know that you have a final reaction to the, your best season as the owner of this team that's been your family. Well, uh, Dick, I would say one thing that uh, we were beaten by a great team and a fine manager, fine management, and uh, we have no. Uh, uh, comments to make for our uh, for uh, that team. They were great. They just played better than we did. And uh, the ovation, though, that our players got, I just wish that when I was a performer on the stage or in the rodeo arena, I would have gotten a reception like these players did. Well, I think part of that applause, sir, comes from the fact that the people are not only thanking uh, the ball players, the ball club, but they're thanking you for bringing this community a championship team. <laughs> well, I didn't do as well as I would like to. Naturally, uh, Sparky over there knows that, but there's times that things go against you and don't win, and uh, I know that. And uh, I'm just happy that we brought them along as far as we did. 
considering the fact that we had so many injuries uh, on our ball club. Uh, I don't think that we played uh, uh, half the season with all of them healthy that could play. Well, thank so, you for taking some time, sir, to being with us. And uh, I know that the Angels will be a factor again next year. Wes Parker, there are a lot of things to remember about this series. The crowd at both Baltimore and at Anaheim, certainly a part of the story. And I'll never forget John Lowenstein galloping around the bases with his pinch home run. And uh, nor the feeling that the Angel fans had when their team came back as they had wished last night. But it's Baltimore into the series against Pittsburgh. Well, Dick, it is, and the Cowboy can be so proud of Jim Fergosi and the job he did, and the job he did for putting this club together. It's just a great all-around job. Thank you, Sparky. And Wes Parker, Dick Kenberg, the chairman of the board, Gene Autry, thank you for being with us. The final score, the Orioles 8, and the Angels nothing. Baltimore to the World Series. The executive producer of NBC Sports is Don Olmeyer. The coordinating producer of baseball's league championship series, Michael Weissman. Today's game produced by Michael Weissman and directed by Harry Coyle. Technical director, Dick Roker. Associate producer, Bill Peters. Associate director, Richard Klein. Tomorrow, the NFL moves into week six of the exciting 1979 season. NFL 79 starts today with reports from around the league and updates from college and NFL football. Then it's great National Football League action. Check the listings for the game and the time in your local area. It's all right here on NBC, the network of the 1980 Olympics.